public hearing this morning in the impeachment showdown. Congressional lawyers from both sides will lay out their closing arguments for and against impeachment. The Constitution says that Congress shall have the sole authority when it comes to impeachment. And so the question is, with the evidence we have, can we make a sound conclusion? I think we can. The president's supporters, including elected Republicans, say there is no case and not enough support. Through most of 2019, Nancy Pelosi said she opposed impeachment, not because the Mueller facts weren't strong enough in her view, but because it wasn't bipartisan. The president attacking the Democrats with multiple tweets over the weekend, maintaining his stance that this is all a witch hunt. Are you worried, sir, about the stain that impeachment might have on your legacy? No, not at all. It's a hoax. The Speaker of the House saying this is all about being true to what our founding fathers wrote in the Constitution. This is about the Constitution of the United States, so don't mess with me. All of this as the Department of Justice and the Inspector General are set to release a long-awaited report on the FBI's investigation into President Trump's campaign.
And good morning. Welcome to ABC News Live. I'm Tom Yamas, live here on Capitol Hill this morning. In just about 30 minutes, the impeachment hearings will continue here in the House. Right now, you are looking live at the Longworth hearing room here in Washington. In today's hearings, we will hear from lawyers from both the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats will argue the president abused his office for personal political gain, while the Republicans will say there's no evidence of such a crime. Today is just one step in a long process, as we know. Impeachment is the step the House uses to charge a senior government official. The next step after this would be a trial in the Senate, and then the Senate would need two-thirds of the vote to actually remove the president from the office. Inside the Longworth building now, you see the press assembled there as we wait members of the Judiciary Committee to enter, as well as those lawyers from both the Democrats and the Republicans. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll take you through exactly who is facing questions today, what it all means for the country and the president, and how the supporters plan to defend him. I want to begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mary, I want you to walk us through what we expect to hear today but also what happened over the weekend because there was a big debate within the Demo Democratic Party on whether they should narrow or widen the scope of the articles of impeachment. Yeah, well, Tom, here this morning, they are essentially going to turn this hearing room down the hall for me into a high-stakes courtroom. You are going to see lawyers from both parties outline their evidence and make their case for whether the president should or should not be impeached. Now, over the weekend, Democrats were hunkered here inside the Capitol. There were a lot of long hours, a lot of pizza, as they are preparing for this next crucial phase. Because, of course, they are laying the groundwork today and preparing to draft articles of impeachment against the president. What you will hear from the Democratic lawyers today is why they they feel that the evidence is rock solid. They will make the case that the president has abused his office for his own personal political gain, while Republicans are essentially going to pick apart the same evidence to do the exact opposite. They are going to argue that there is no proof that the president was trying to get a leg up in the 2020 election. And the Republicans will likely continue to rail against the process because they believe that this entire thing has been unfair. Even though, of course, the president is refusing to mount a defense, he's declining to send anyone uh, to represent present him here at today's hearing. Now, you ask about the scope, because what there are a lot of unknowns here, right? And one of them is exactly what are the charges going to be against the president? He is likely to be charged with abuse of power, bribery, and obstruction. But it is still unknown whether obstruction will go beyond the Ukraine matter to look at obstruction of the Mueller probe. A lot of Democrats feel there is a pattern of behavior here from the president and that he should be held accountable for a wide range of that, while other Democrats, including uh, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, has said that they need to stay squarely focused and narrowly more on just the Ukraine issue. It presents a real challenge for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi because, of course, she is very much in charge of what's happening here. She has to walk this fine line between the political and the legal. She has to show that the president uh, hit, hit the mark for impeachable offenses, but she also wants to satisfy the differing views of all of her members, including, of course, those key moderate Democrats from Trump districts, Tom. Now, Mary, we were talking about the closing arguments today and the hearings that will happen here. What's your sense? Schiff clearly was signaling that he maybe wants us to become more narrow in scope, as you mentioned. And, and viewers and, and constituents at home, Americans, will they get lost if they start to introduce the Mueller investigation now so late into this process? Well, and that's the fear from a lot of Democrats who are saying, look, just, just keep things narrow. Focus on what we really have direct evidence of. Because a lot of this, remember, is a PR battle. What you're seeing today is really the last best chance that Democrats have to try and sway public opinion, to convince Americans and convince voters that the president should be impeached. So I think the evidence that you will hear being presented from the Intelligence Committee will mostly be centered squarely uh, on the Ukraine matter. And, and I, I, it seems they're trending in that direction, but they genuinely are having a real debate right now about just how broad these articles of impeachment should be, Tom. All right, Mary Bruce live for us today on Capitol Hill. Mary, thanks so much for that. I want to bring in now Representative Debbie Lesko, a Republican from Arizona. She's on the House Judiciary Committee. Representative Lesko, thanks for joining us this morning. My question to you is, what will we hear from the Republican lawyers today? Well, considering that 17 of the 24 members of the Democrat Party on Judiciary Committee already voted this year for impeachment, Al Green's impeachment resolution, uh, I expect we're just going to hear a bunch of the accusations, unfounded accusations that we've heard all along. 
Um, do we know what exactly the Republican lawyers, their, their strategy is going to be up against the, the, the lawyers for the Democrats? I think they're going to point out first how unfair this whole process has been, how it's been pushed through. Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats want this done by December. They don't care if there's evidence or not, and that there is no evidence of any impeachable offenses. And that's the bottom line. There's no evidence. None of the Democrat fact witnesses were able to identify any crimes that were committed. And I think it's important for the American people to know that since Donald Trump got elected, members of the Democratic Party and their allies have wanted to impeach Donald Trump. First, they came up with the Russian collusion story, which turned out to be not true. Then they came up with, you know, obstruction of justice. Then they came up with quid pro quo. Then they did polling and said, oh, we better not use quid pro quo. We better use the word bribery. So this whole thing has been a farce. But, but even the president's own ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland said there was a quid pro quo, and that's what he thought. My, my question to you in is: In fact, he said it was. A, he presumed there was for the aid. You've, you've read the transcript of the, of the call mm -hmm. with the president of Ukraine. Do you yes. think it was a quote perfect call? I think that there was nothing impeachable at all. And I think it's totally justified for President Trump to talk about interference in the 2016 election by Ukrainian people, because that did happen, no matter what people said, there was some interference. Also, I think it's totally acceptable for him to talk about Hunter Biden's role in Burisma, which was a corrupt company, known corrupt company, and even Obama administration's own state department how was concerned about Hunter Biden working for Burisma. I think that is all legitimate, especially when you're giving so much aid to a foreign country. But, but the question is, what does Hunter Biden working for a private company in Ukraine have to do with withholding military aid from that country? Much well, needed military aid. Well, Burisma was a known corrupt company. And then it said, that, actually it was the New York Times article that said that Burisma brought on not only Hunter Biden, but two other big Democrats in order to influence it so that they wouldn't be investigated against in corruption. I mean, this has to do with corruption. They were known uh, to be a corrupt company. Uh, even um, uh, Marie Yanovich, the former uh, ambassador to Ukraine, said corruption was what Ukraine did. I mean, it was very well known. So for the president to ask about corruption, he thought all along that it was a corrupt company, or I mean a corrupt uh, country. Uh, I think it's totally legitimate for him to ask about this before he hands over a bunch of taxpayer dollars to Ukraine. You said the entire process has been biased and politically motivated with no basic standards of due process afforded to President Trump. The president has had a chance, the White House has had a chance to partake in these impeachment hearings in the House, and yet they, they've refused to do so. So when you say there's no due process, talk to me about that. Why do you think that? Yeah, let's, let's look at it. The resolution that the Democrats pushed through said that the president could only ask witnesses things in the Judiciary Committee, not the Intelligence Committee, where all of the witnesses were going through. Well, what did we have so far in the Judiciary Committee? We had a bunch of liberal law professors talk about their opinion. What is he supposed to ask them? What's your opinion? I think he already knows the answer. And today we have a staff member, a staff member, a liberal Democrat lawyer who has known contributor to Democrats. And what's he going to ask him? What's your opinion? I mean, he did not have the, the chance The Republicans to also ask. have two attorneys, so just like the Democrats today, though. I mean, yeah, you, 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 not, you have the same we're not impeaching anyone. Um, finally, what, what have you heard from your constituents here? Have, have oh. you heard from them, from, yeah. from Arizona? What are they telling you? Well, it depends on who, who talks to me. I mean, people that support Donald Trump think this is a total travesty. People that hate Donald Trump, you know, don't like me because I'm supporting something. But the most of the people think this is a total waste of time, that Congress is not getting anything done. They want us to work together, Republicans and Democrats, and actually work on things like securing the border, lowering health care costs. I mean, they just are sick of it, quite frankly. The Republicans have argued these impeachment hearings are political theater, mm -hmm. whereas the Democrats say this is a plausible check on the president's power. 
If the president is not checked at this point, what's to stop the president from asking for more favors, as we heard in the impeachment hearings last week from governors or from other world leaders that could be politically motivated? Let's just look at this, okay? You've had Democrat members since the president has been elected calling on him to be impeached before there was any evidence any of anything. Then you had 17 out of the 24 Democrat members on Judiciary Committee have already voted for impeachment. Why are we even having this hearing? Why don't they just go from step one, I want to impeach the president right after you get elected, to let's impeach him? Okay, Representative Debbie Lesko, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. So much. I want to go now to our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl, uh, who's covering the president for us. And Jonathan, the president had a busy Sunday. Uh, he started a tweet storm with more than 100 tweets, the first uh, about an actual so MMA fighter, Tito Ortiz, true. and then and later really sort of putting Democrats in a submission hold over 99 Thanks other so tweets. Uh, on and on and on. Clearly, the president is very much, very much has this impeachment process on his mind. Uh, most of these were retweets of uh, others condemning, uh, you know, conservatives, uh, many media personalities, Fox News and others, uh, who were uh, condemning the process here, this impeachment process. Uh, the president, uh, you know, the, the, the public stance from the White House is that the impeachment process is a complete scam. It, there's nothing to it. Uh, it's on fair. Uh, the White House has decided not to participate. As you know, uh, uh, Chairman Nadler had offered a, uh, as you were just talking about, uh, had, had offered to have the White House have a lawyer uh, take part in the questioning here. They have turned that down. Uh, and in turning it down, they also uh, issued a letter uh, in response. This was on Friday, uh, uh, Tom, uh, from the uh, White House counsel uh, to uh, Chairman Nadler, saying, in part, as you know, your impeachment inquiry is completely baseless and has violated related basic principles of due process and fundamental fairness. Uh, so the White House position is that this uh, entire process is political. It is aimed at Democrats who uh, want basically what you just heard in, in, in that interview. Uh, but um, even as the White House says they've got nothing to fear here whatsoever, clearly, Tom, and, and you know the president well, uh, clearly this is something very much uh, front, of, front of mind for him. John, talk to me about Rudy Giuliani and what's the sense inside the White House right now? Because as all of this is happening right here in Washington, you have Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney in Ukraine and Hungary, working with a conservative TV outlet. He says to keep investigating Ukrainian officials and what happened in Ukraine, speaking with former prosecutors. The president, over the weekend, John, it, it's, it sounded like he was supporting this. Uh, he has sounded uh, uh, several times like, like he's uh, supported Rudy Giuliani. He's, he's also... Uh, at, at various times uh, over the past week, uh, suggested that, uh, that, that Giuliani has other clients and other things, and he doesn't necessarily know exactly what Giuliani is up to. But I've got to tell you, Tom, if you talk to senior officials in the White House, to a person, privately, they will tell you that they uh, they, they wish Rudy Giuliani would just go away and never be seen in public again related to any of this. There's great frustration. Uh, but. Uh, it does not seem that that frustration extends to the person at the very top, to the president himself. And it, and it doesn't seem like he's going away anytime soon. All right, no. Jonathan, thank you so much for your insight. I appreciate it. I want to bring... I want to bring in uh, Kira Phillips right now. She's going to talk to us uh, about another major development that's happening as the impeachment proceedings are going on right now. We're expecting a, a report from the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, and, and this has to do with the FBI investigating the Trump campaign in 2016. The president was tweeting about this all weekend as well. It's something that sort of consumed him, we know. Uh, what can we expect from the report, Kira? I mean, there's how many reports are there to keep track of? We have a lot, right? And right. this is just one more to add into the mix. So my Michael Horowitz has been looking into the FBI's action. This goes back to the election. And it, Trump all along has said, the FBI has been after me, politically biased. Um, he's ripped, as you know, former FBI Director James Comey uh, uh, time and time again, saying that they had an agenda. What Horowitz has been looking into is, was the Trump, Trump campaign working with Russia to interfere in the election? Were they trying to dig up dirt on, on Hillary Clinton? And he's been looking at this for two years, and it comes down to a name, Carter Page. A lot of people wondering, okay, who's Carter Page? All right, let's go back a number of years. He was a, a Trump campaign uh, aide. He specifically focused on foreign policy, and the FBI was surveilling him. So what's at issue here 
is was the FBI doing that legally? Did they have enough uh, basis to be able to, to surveil Carter Page? And that's what we're going to find out today. I can tell you, Michael Horowitz, uh, he, he doesn't mess around. I mean, he is known to be a partisan player. You can go all the way back to when he was a federal prosecutor. And I don't know if you remember this case, the, the Dirty 30. It was the New York uh, Police Department, Precinct 30, when they were dealing drugs uh, and seizing them and dealing them. And it was Michael Horowitz that was in charge of a lot of those uh, convictions. He carried them out. He is known, he knows how to deal with abuse of power. And Kira, and though the president has talked about this, we don't sense from our reporting so far that it's going to go as far as he wishes it would go, correct? That is correct. Look, Trump and his allies have a lot at stake here. Um, and, 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 and it's because they feel like they've been beaten up by a biased FBI. And Michael Horowitz is going to come forward and say, yeah, there were some things that were done wrong, but overall, the essence of what the FBI did, I'm okay with. All right, Kira Phelps for us. And for more on this now, I want to go to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas, who has been working this story for several years now and knows uh, so much more about some of the details. Pierre, talk to us about what did the FBI do right? What did they do wrong? And what do we think we're going to learn today? Well, the key is whether that uh, foreign surveillance intelligence warrant was lawfully executed. Did they have enough evidence to pursue uh, this kind of warrant, which allows the Bureau to exert extraordinary authority over someone's life? It allows them to monitor communication. It allows them to listen into phone calls, to look at emails, all those sorts of things. Uh, we are being told by our sources that the inspector general will say basically that the search warrant was uh, legally obtained, uh, but the inspector general will also point out that there were a number of flaws uh, in the FBI's investigation. Things like uh, a, a FBI attorney, a former FBI attorney, altering uh, an email or document associated with the pursuit of the warrant. Uh, omissions, things left out, um, all those kinds of things which were untoward. But the bottom line is that the search warrant, the evidence for it came from multiple places, and the inspector general, according to our sources, concludes that it was a lawfully executed search warrant. Pierre, from speaking with your sources, what is your sense? Will this put a, a final period on the 2016 campaign and whether the Trump campaign did anything wrong, whether the FBI did anything wrong, and, and whether the president was ever treated unfairly? Tom, I think that both sides are going to have things that they will point to and embrace in terms of people that support the president, people that support uh, the FBI's investigation. Uh, I do think it will answer that basic question. Was this a legally obtained search warrant, which all these questions flow from? But uh, there is still more investigations going on. Uh, the attorney general has uh, authorized a, uh, another investigation to look at the origins of the Russia probe, and that has now become a criminal investigation, Tom. All right, Pierre Thomas for us. Pierre, we thank you for that. I want to bring in now Devin Dwyer as we uh, look live again at, at the Longworth House building where these impeachment proceedings are going to take place today. A reminder, we're just about 10 minutes away from the House impeachment hearing taking place right here. And Devin, some interesting data has come out over the last couple weeks and really the last couple days about how the impeachment is playing out throughout the country because there's a big political gamble here when it comes to Democrats. There sure is, Tom. And public support for this has started to slip. We've heard Republicans talk about about that opposition to impeachment and removal of President Trump is on the rise. Take a look uh, at the latest from uh, our friends at 538. This is their impeachment tracker. It's an aggregation of all the polling out there uh, on impeachment and removal. You see right here, for just uh, under 47% of Americans say they support impeachment. That's down just from last week, Tom. We've seen a steady, er steady erosion of support for impeachment. But take a look uh, at the state of Wisconsin. This is a state uh, that Barack Obama won by seven points in 2012. Donald Trump narrowly won it in 2016. This is the kind of place that's making Democrats nervous. You see in October uh, where support and opposition stood, but look at that opposition rising, support uh, for impeachment slipping. One of the reasons why we're seeing uh, top Democrats in the House telling me last week they expect Democrats will actually vote against impeachment. So impeachment uh, is the likelihood here. They will impeach President Trump, but they will see some Democrats peel away from that. Uh, that is going to give some Republicans ammunition in this battle for public opinion. And states like Wisconsin are so important because the president hits that hard straight, able to win the election. We we think it'll be another close election, and we'll have to wait and see this time around. So, so all those battleground states are going to be so important. 
important. How is impeachment playing out in purple districts? Do we know that already? We do. We're starting to see some signs that voters there are tiring of this. They're very happy with how things are going. They're not convinced that maybe they don't like President Trump's conduct. Our latest polling from Ipsos shows 70 percent of Americans think they don't really like what they see. But that's true of so much of President Trump's behavior, a lot of his policies, a lot of his yeah. rhetoric. People don't really like it, but they don't see a direct impact on their lives. Therefore, they're not really on board the impeachment and removal train right now. So a big uphill battle for Democrats. All right, Devin, thank you so much for that. And with that, I'd like to set up our next discussion. I want to bring in Barbara Comstock. She's our ABC News contributor, former representative from Virginia, and Yvette Brown. She is uh, one of our uh, contributors as well, CEO of uh, Democracy for America. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. So Yvette, I'm going to start with you. You just heard Devin, what he had to say. It's not playing so strongly in purple districts. We saw those polls coming out of Wisconsin. This is now the second so far. Are Democrats starting to get worried? You know, I think they should. Uh, here's the thing. The longer th this thing stretches out, I think the, it's going to be more problematic, which is why I'm glad they're moving forward. I would say watching the polls, though, is not the right strategy, right? Democrats are in this because it is the right thing to do. You had civil servants who have worked on both sides of the aisle testify very clearly about what happened in the Intelligence Committee. Now the ju Judiciary Committee has the big responsibility of tying that to impeachable offenses. And so what I would say to my colleagues uh, is don't look at the polls at all, right? Make sure you're focused. This is about the president abusing his power, uh, abusing the office, and stay focused. Uh, Barbara Comstock, I want to bring you in. Have Republicans been doing something right? H has their strategy worked for voters, do you think? Or, or do you think voters uh, maybe have gotten confused over the impeachment proceedings? Well, what do you think is working and not working for Republicans? Well, I think Republicans have taken on what Bill Clinton did in 1998, and they understand this is a political war, and they are fighting a political war. You, you talked about the president and his 100 tweets yesterday. And so I think that is what you are going to see, sort of the, really kind of the threats that if you're going to do this, this is going to be politically painful. And you noted um, the polls. Really, the polls that are going to matter on this for the Democrats are going to be polls, like you pointed out, in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona. You had the congresswoman from Arizona there. So that's really what they're watching, and, and that is why they are making this a political battle. You've seen TV ads have gone up, Republicans attacking some of the Democrats in some of those swing states and swing districts. So I think this is not really going, even though I, I was listening to Yvette, it sounded very much like Republicans in 1998 with Clinton talking about this is the right thing to do, we have to do this legally. But, um, you know, it's, it really is a political battle at this point. And it's going to be, when it goes over to the Senate, they don't have the votes. So this ultimately will be decided by the people next November. Yvette, I, I want to ask you do, you, do you think Democrats should widen the scope for the articles of impeachment, or should they keep this narrow? What do you think is a more effective strategy, especially when it comes to the politics of this? You know, if you had asked me a couple weeks ago, I would have said any offense that you believe um, he has committed, include that list. I believe that coming out of the in today, I believe that coming out of the Intelligence Committee, uh, the, the, the case on Ukraine was made so clearly, so succinctly by nonpartisan members of our government. I think you stick to Ukraine, because I feel like over time, if you try to make that bigger case, you may lose some of those politicians who are watching the polls. You may lose Americans who are a little bit weary of this process. And so what I would say is keep it narrow. It's a really, really tough case to make when you think about the fact that there's very little precedent. There is not a key statute that you can kind of point to. What I would tell my colleagues to do is to make it a narrow case. The facts have been laid out. Tie it to what the framers and the founders talked about, protecting our democracy. Why you cannot skip this step, because our democracy is at stake. We can't guarantee we're going to have a full and fair election if we allow the president to get away with interference uh, and make the case and get out. And I think what, what you're seeing in the poll, polls there, Tom, is people expect, just like TV, for this to wrap up really quickly. The longer this goes on, people are going to get tired. They're going to move on. I think you, 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 the Intelligence Committee has made their case and laid out the facts. I think you bring it home, you take your vote, and you pass it over to the Senate. Barbara, as far as um, we look at I, when we look at I the calendar, agree. you went through this with with. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Barbara. Don't make your point. No, I was saying I would agree that I would agree that it should be the narrow um, 
the narrow issues from Ukraine. And that is what you had, you know, Representative Zoe Lofgren on, who also was involved in impeachment in the past, you know, on this week, on Sunday, and she said the same thing. The problem is Jerry Nadler and some other Democrats look like they want to widen this. And I think if they're going to widen it, um, they, they need to take more time. Again, also, even on the narrow issues, what has been pointed out by the Washington Post, by uh, the a Republican lawyer last week was you still need to have witnesses like John Bolton, like Rudy Giuliani, that there have been a lot of stories on recently, on uh, Mick Mulvaney. And this rush is really a political timetable that the Democrats are working on. So if they're trying to make the legal argument, they this political rush that they're doing kind of hurts their case there, too. I would actually disagree more with that. I actually, I actually would disagree yeah. with that one point. I don't think you need more witnesses. Yes, in a regular situation with a civilian, a regular person who you know has to comply with subpoenas, has to appear, will have their attorney there. Yes, you want all of those things. I actually believe that the Intelligence Committee did a wonderful job of laying out the facts. I don't think there's any dispute, and I don't think the Republicans did any damage to the facts at, of the matter. I think people know that there was a phone call. I think they know that, that aid was withheld. I think they know that what the president did was inappropriate. I think the challenge for the Judiciary Committee going forward is how do you prove that that's an impeachable offense when there is very little precedent, because we have not had this process happen very much uh, in the course of our country's history. All right, we'll have to leave it there. You guys can keep going uh, during the commercial break. <laughs> Yvette Simpson and Barbara Comstock, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. We do really appreciate it. I want to bring in Kira Phillips now, though, just as we approach the, the beginning of the hearing. We're less than four minutes away. So, Kira, I'm going to ask you to possibly keep it tight if that's possible, because uh, I know you have a lot of great reporting. You know, the president has really attacked this, especially the Trump campaign. They've really gone after some of the Democrats who are vulnerable in vulnerable districts, in vulnerable races right now. And, and, and your reporting, from talking to your sources, is you think Republicans feel they're in a comfortable place right now? I, that's what it's seeming to appear. And if you look at Trump and what he... Yesterday was supposed to be a lazy Sunday for him, relaxing, right? A day before this hearing, you know, he wasn't saying much. By midnight, I, I counted it up, almost 105, possibly more, tweets and retweets going off on all the usual suspects, going but, off but on someone, Democrats. But someone might look at that and say that looks like someone who may be nervous, nervous. not comfortable. Point, point well made. Yeah. But, but if he was so uncomfortable and he was so nervous, don't you think he would have representation at the hearing? Don't you think that he would do what he normally does and say, I'll just show up, I'll just be there? But they have chosen, and, and you saw it by, by Cipollini, White House Counsel's letter uh, last week, that he said, no, we're not going to participate. Uh, he didn't directly say, he indirectly said, we're not going to participate in these proceedings. And Trump has said, Bring it on. Let's and, go. And there's the bigger question, too. It's going to affect how this is going to affect some of the Democratic candidates running for president, especially all those senators who will have to sit and be in hearings while, you know, the, the New Hampshire primary and the Iowa caucuses, the other candidates are campaigning for those events. And that is a huge concern is how much of a distraction will this be and how will this impact 2020? Look, Nancy Pelosi uh, and, and, and other Democrats have said we are going to start drafting these articles of impeachment and we are going to get this wrapped up before Christmas. I don't know, how many days do we have now? I mean, time's a ticking. It is moving pretty fast, but then again, we know this process and we know this president and anything is possible. Right, the end of the year is right here, quickly approaching, and then we have the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. Kira Phillips, thank you too much. Thank you to our entire team who's been reporting this morning on these impeachment hearings. A reminder, if you're just joining us here on ABC News Live, on your phone, on your computers, we are less than 30 seconds away from the start of the House impeachment hearings today. What we believe will be the closing arguments here in the House, attorneys for both sides will be fighting and presenting evidence and talking about either why the president should be impeached, the Republicans, of course, defending that as well. Our entire live team coverage on our broadcast network is going to start shortly. It'll be with chief anchor George Stephanopoulos. We thank you for joining us on ABC News Live. We're going to have continuing coverage throughout the day. We expect this to go five to seven hours, so it's going to be another long day here on Capitol Hill. For now, we join our network and chief anchor George Stephanopoulos. This is an ABC News special report. The House impeachment hearings. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good morning and welcome to our special coverage of the impeachment of President Trump. It is a critical day for the inquiry with closing arguments from both sides as the House drives towards a final vote on impeachment by Christmas. That is the scene right now in the committee room we've come to know quite well, a 1100 House Longworth building, the home of these impeachment proceedings.
just a few minutes, the, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Gerald Nadler, will gavel in the hearing for the final formal presentations. Counsels for the Judiciary Committee will outline and debate the law, the standards for what constitutes an impeachable offense. Counselors for the Intelligence Committee will outline and debate the facts and the evidence. The key questions. Did President Trump abuse his power when he pressured Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden and the Democrats? And is he violating his constitutional oath with his blanket refusal to cooperate in any way with this impeachment investigation? Our senior congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce, is there on Capitol Hill. And Mary, after this marathon day of hearings, the Democrats will get down to the final drafting of these impeachment articles. And George, today's hearing is likely their last chance to try and convince the American public that the president abused his power and should be impeached before they introduce and vote on those charges. Now, Democrats have spent the weekend hunkered down here at the Capitol preparing for this final push. Today, they're going to turn this hearing room into a high-stakes courtroom. At the witness desk will be these three congressional lawyers. And Democrats are going to systematically go through their evidence, outlining their case and why they feel the evidence rises to the level of impeachment. Democrats say they have a rock solid case. They feel that the president pressured Ukraine to investigate his political rivals to try and gain an advantage in the 2020 election. While Republicans today are going to do the opposite, they are going to pick apart that same evidence and say that there is no proof that the president was trying to get a leg up in the 2020 election. And they will likely continue to rail against this process, which they say has been unfair to the president, even though President Trump is refusing to mount a defense, he is declining to send any legal representation to this hearing today, George. Okay, Mary, thanks very much. Let's go to our chief White House correspondent, John Carl, for more on that. As Mary said, John, the White House so far refusing to send anyone to this hearing, but the president, well, he was busy yesterday, more than 100 tweets. Uh, this is very much on the top of his mind. More than 100 tweets beginning just after midnight on Saturday until just after midnight last night. 100 tweets either directly about this process or indirectly uh, criticizing what he is calling over and over and over again a witch hunt, a hoax. Uh, and although the White House has declined to take part in this hearing, make no mistake about it, George, the Republicans on this committee and the Republican counsel for this committee are very much operating in lockstep with the White House and are representing uh, the White House view at this hearing. Okay, John, thanks. And our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, this is one of those split screen days in Washington. While this hearing is going on, we're awaiting the release of that report, the Inspector General report, on the origins of how the FBI handled the Russia investigation. That's right, George. Extraordinary day here uh, in Washington. The reputation of the FBI literally on the line. The inspector general is expected to answer the critical question. Was the search warrant that allowed the FBI to look into the communications, even listen to the phone calls of a Trump associate, was that legally obtained? We'll get the answer to that. Our sources are suggesting that the uh, warrant was lawfully obtained. But the report, we're told, George, will have a number of damning allegations against the FBI, including that one FBI attorney altered uh, a document and also that there were evidence uh, some evidence of bias against the president and the FBI so we're waiting that report George okay Pierre thanks very much I'm here with the rest of our team here in New York World News anchor David Muir we're seeing the councils there getting ready to make their presentations huge day for them George pivotal day for this closing argument as you mentioned some familiar faces for the American people the millions who've been watching these hearings Daniel Goldman uh, will be back. He's prosecuted Russian crime and crime families here in the U.S. Worked 10 years as a U.S. attorney for the SDNY uh, here in New York. He'll be joined by Barry Burke, also hired for the sole purposes of investigating this president. On the Republican side, you're going to see Steve Castor return. He's Congressman Jim Jordan's chief investigative counsel. He'd done a lot of the questioning uh, on the closed door depositions. Uh, the American people are very familiar with his face as well. One face that uh, we'll see uh, new to us, but not new to Congress, uh, Ashley Hurt Callan. She'll be doing some of the questioning for the House Judiciary Committee on the Republican side. She's been a congressional investigator for more than a decade. The Judiciary Committee is going to go first. Expect an hour of presentation from the Judiciary Committee, 90 minutes from the House Intelligence Committee. Of course, there will also be open statements uh, by the chairman. I'm here with our legal team as well. Kate Shaw, constitutional law professor at Cardozo Law School. Kate, one of the big debates the Democrats are still having is the scope of the impeachment articles. How wide to go? And I, I think we'll all be looking for clues in today's presentations, whether we have a sense of some broad narrative that begins before 2016 and extends through this July 25th phone call and the events before and after, or whether it's going to be very narrow and focused. And I think, you know, each side will make a choice in terms of its opening presentation um, that might give us some clues about that. But of course, it's all going to come out in the drafting. And I, and I don't know that even the committee itself yet knows how it's going to proceed. It, it, it does appear that they have not reached a final decision uh, yet, Dan. But one of the words you keep hearing from at least Democrats on the committee talking about patterns 
patterns of behavior. Right, the and so, so the more you hear about patterns, the more you think that they're going to try and incorporate some of what, what happened uh, from the Mueller report rather than just Ukraine. And, and that's the, the real question here is, remember, up to this point, meaning before that Ukraine call of July 25th, Democrats had decided not to move forward with impeachment proceedings. And now, after the Ukraine call, they decide this is too much. Nancy Pelosi says we now must move forward. The question now is, do they bring that together? Do they say, you know what, because this was ongoing, doesn't mean we, were, we weren't going to do it before, but this is now part of such a disturbing practice that we are going to incorporate it at least into the telling of the story even if it's not a separate impeachment article. And Melissa Murray, well, the other thing you've heard, who's a professor of uh, constitutional law at NYU Law School, the other thing you're hearing Democrats talk about in recent days is the necessity to protect the next election from foreign interference, of course, foreign interference on the minds of the founders. Well, I think this is incredibly important for this idea of pattern and practice, like linking it to the Mueller report, a past election, and the idea that we would also do this going forward in a prospective election. So again, this idea that interference, foreign interference in elections is the key player here. And I think this is what we'll see hit upon hard today. We see Chairman Nadler, Chairman Gerald Nadler has now taken his seat there in 1100 House Longworth Building. Congressman from New York, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, he's tangled with President Trump in the past when he was Assemblyman in New York City. They tangled over a real estate project that Mr. Trump wanted to develop on the West Side. And of course, he's been the leading uh, voice for impeachment on the Judiciary Committee, wanted to pursue impeachment even before House Speaker Nancy Pelosi did when the Mueller report was first, uh, was first produced by Robert Mueller, and that's why we expect that behind the scenes he has been pushing for more focus on the, that obstruction evidence that was contained in the Mueller uh, report. Uh, Cecilia Vega, no doubt the president will be watching again this morning. He certainly will. I expect we will see a continuation of those tweets. And going back to now, there one thing he said over the weekend that they believe they have a rock solid case, and if this was a court of law, it would be presented to a jury and a guilty verdict would be given to them in three minutes flat. On the other hand, you have Republicans like Mark Meadows saying this weekend, I don't see a single Republican deflecting. We may very well be full circle by the end of this, and back we where we started. the gavel. Let's go to Chairman Nadler. He will make his opening statement. Doug Collins, the ranking Republican from Georgia, for, will then follow with his opening statement. Taking his time getting ready there, wants to get settled, still holding the gavel. The House Committee on the Judiciary will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee. To object. Objection noted. The quorum is present. We are conducting this hearing on the impeachment inquiry into President Donald J. Trump. Presentations from the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Judiciary Committee pursuant to House Resolution 660 and the special judiciary committee procedures that are, that are described in section 4A of that resolution. Here is how the committee will proceed for this hearing. I will make an opening statement, and then I will recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. After that, we will hear two sets of presentations. We, we will hear 30-minute pre opening arguments from councils for the majority and the minority Chairman, of this committee. Bruce, you're there in the committee room. We couldn't quite make out what this protest is about. Any sense? No, Georgia, uh, we also can't hear exactly what he's saying, but it's notable so far in all of these hearings, we have not seen actually any interruptions from inside the room like that. They have Obviously, been keeping uh, things pretty locked down here so far. Okay, let's turn back in. Audiences here uh, to observe, but not to demonstrate, not to indicate agreement or disagreement with any witness or with any member of the committee. The audience is here to observe only, and uh, we will maintain decorum in the hearing room. And again, I will say, here is how the committee will proceed for this hearing. I will make an opening statement, and then I will recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. 
After that, we will hear two sets of presentations. We will hear 30-minute opening arguments from councils for the majority and the minority of this committee. Then we will hear 45-minute presentations of evidence from majority and minority council from the Permanent Select mm -hmm. Committee on Intelligence, followed by 45 minutes of questioning by the chair and ranking member, who may yield to council for questioning during this period. Finally, all of our members will have the opportunity to question the presenters from the Intelligence Committee under the five-minute rule. I would note that the President's Council was given the opportunity to participate today, but the White House has declined the invitation. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. No matter his party or his politics, if the President places his own interests above those of the country, he betrays his oath of office. The President of the United States, the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader of the Senate, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the Chairman and Ranking Members of the House Committee on the Judiciary all have one important thing in common. We have each taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. If the President puts himself before the country, he violates the President's most basic responsibility. He breaks his oath to the American people. If he puts himself before the country in a manner that threatens our democracy, then our oath, our promise to the American people, requires us to come to the defense of the nation. That oath stands even when it is politically inconvenient, even when it might bring us under criticism, even when it might cost us our jobs as members of Congress. And even if the President is unwilling to honor his oath, I am compelled to honor mine. As we heard in our last hearing, the framers of the Constitution were careful students of history and clear in their vision for the new nation. They knew that threats from, to democracy can take many forms, that we must protect against them. They warned us against the dangers of would-be monarchs, fake populists, and charismatic demagogues. They knew that the most dangerous threat to our country might come from within in the form of a corrupt executive who put his private interests above the interests of the nation. They also knew that they could not anticipate every threat a president might someday pose, so they adopted the phrase treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors <coughs> to capture the full spectrum of possible presidential misconduct. George Mason, who proposed the standard, said that it was meant to capture all manner of great and dangerous offenses against the Constitution. The debates around the framing make clear that the most serious such offenses include abuse of power, betrayal of the nation through foreign entanglements, and corruption of public office. Any one of these violations of the public trust would compel the members of this committee to take action. When combined in a single course of action, they state the strongest possible case for impeachment and removal from office. President Trump put himself before country. Despite the political partisanship that seems to punctuate our hearings these days, <coughs> I believe that there is common ground around some of these ideas, common ground in this hearing room and common ground across the country at large. We agree, for example, that impeachment is a solemn, serious undertaking. We agree that it is meant to address serious threats to democratic institutions like our free and fair elections. We agree that when the elections themselves are threatened by enemies foreign or domestic, we cannot wait until the next election to address the threat. We surely agree that no public official, including and especially the President of the United States, should use his public office for private gain. And we agree that no President may put himself before the country. The Constitution and his oath of office, his promise to America's citizens, require the President to put the country first. If we could drop our blinders for just one moment, I think we would agree on a common set of facts as well. <coughs> on July 25th, President Trump called President Zelensky of Ukraine and asked him for a favor. That call was part of a concerted effort by President Trump to compel the government of Ukraine to announce an investigation. Not an investigation of corruption writ large, but an investigation of President Trump's political rivals, 
and only his political rivals. President Trump put himself before country. The record shows that President Trump withheld military aid allocated by the United States Congress from Ukraine. It also shows that he withheld a, well, a White House meeting from President Zelensky. Multiple witnesses, including respected diplomats, national security professionals, and decorated war veterans, all testified to the same basic fact. President Trump withheld the aid and the meeting in order to pressure a foreign government to do him that favor. President Trump put himself before country. <coughs> and when the president got caught, when Congress discovered that the aid had been withheld from Ukraine, the president took extraordinary and unprecedented steps to conceal evidence from Congress and from the American people. These facts are not in dispute. In fact, most of the arguments about these facts appear to be beside the point. As we review the evidence today, I expect we will hear much about the whistleblower who brought his concerns about the July 25th call to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. Let me be clear. Every fact alleged by the whistleblower has been substantiated by multiple witnesses, again and again, each of whom has been questioned extensively by Democrats and Republicans alike. The allegations also match up with the President's own words, as released by the White House, words that he still says were perfect. I also expect to hear complaints about the term quid pro quo, as if a person needs to verbally acknowledge the name of a crime while he is committing it for it to be a crime at all. The record on this point is also clear. Multiple officials testified that the president's demand for an investigation into his rivals was a part of his personal political agenda and not related to the foreign policy objectives of the United States. Multiple officials testified that the president intended to withhold the aid until intended to withhold the aid until Ukraine announced the investigations. And yes, multiple officials testified that they understood this arrangement to be a quid pro quo for the president's personal <coughs> political benefit. President Trump put himself before country. The president's supporters are going to argue that this whole process is unfair. The record before us is clear on this point as well. We invited the president to participate in this hearing, to question witnesses, and to present evidence that might explain the charges against him. President Trump chose not to show. He may not have much to say in his own defense, but he cannot claim that he did not have an opportunity to be heard. Finally, as we proceed today, we will hear a great deal about the speed with which the House is addressing the President's actions. To the members of the committee, to the members of the House, and to my fellow citizens, I want to be absolutely clear. The integrity of our next election is at stake. Nothing could be more urgent. The President welcomed into foreign interference in our elections in 2016. He demanded it for 2020. Then he got caught. If you do not believe that he will do it again, let me remind you that the president's personal lawyer spent last week back in Ukraine meeting with government officials in an apparent attempt to gin up the same so-called favors that brought us here today and forced Congress to consider the impeachment of a sitting president. This pattern of conduct represents a continuing risk to the country. The evidence shows that Donald J. Trump, the president of the United States, has put himself before his country. He has violated his most basic responsibilities to the people. He has broken his oath. I will honor mine. If you would honor yours, then I would urge you to do your duty. Let us, re let us review the record here in full view of the American people, and let then let us move swiftly to defend our country. We promised that we would. I now recognize the ranking Mr. member of the Mr. Judiciary Chairman. Committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Collins, have for his opening consent? statement. Mr. Chairman, have the gentleman from consent? Georgia is recognized. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. After the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. So you're not going to recognize a possible motion before me? Unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman. It's unanimous consent request. It's unanimous consent. It's unanimous, unanimous consent request. request. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. We'll entertain that later. Point of order, Mr. Chairman.
The gentleman from Georgia is Mr. Ready. Chairman, I have a point, point of order. order. The gentleman will state his point of order. Mr. Chairman, last week you were furnished with a proper demand for minority hearing pursuant to Clause 2J1 of Rule 11. In a blatant and egregious violation of the rules, you are refusing to schedule that hearing. Therefore, I insist on my point of order unless you are willing to immediately schedule a minority hearing day. That is not a proper point of order in today's hearing. As I have told the ranking member several times now, I am considering the minority's request. It's not to be if considered, Mr. Member, Chairman. The gentleman will suspend. If the ranking member thinks we would be violating the rules of the House if we considered articles of impeachment before holding a minority day hearing, his point of order would be timely at a meeting where we considered articles of impeachment. That is not the purpose of today's hearing, and the point of order is not timely. The gentleman from Georgia. Well, that got us started again. The chairman completely not answering a question. It is timely, and it's frankly not up to his discretion, but again, again, we've not really cared about that from the start to begin with. So um, my question is, is just schedule the hearing, but undoubtedly that's not what they want out there. So let's start over. Now that the chairman is recognized and we've got that point. You know, there have been famous moments in impeachment. There have been famous moments in impeachment as we've gone forward. There are famous lines from Nixon like, what did the president know and when did he know it? From the Clinton impeachment, there was, I did not have sex with that woman. What would be known about this one is probably, where's the impeachable offense? Why are we here? I tell you, this may be, though, become known as the focus group impeachment. Because we don't have a crime, we don't have anything we can actually pin, and nobody understands really what the majority is trying to do, except that it interfere and basically make sure that they believe the president can't win next year if he's impeached. The focus group impeachment takes words and then takes them to people and say, how can we explain this better? Because we don't have the facts to match it. A focus group impeachment says, you know, we really aren't working with good facts, but we need a good PR move. That's why we're here today. This is, this is all about, as I said last week, a clock and a calendar. And it really became evident to me that this was true because last Wednesday, after we had a long day of hearing here, the next morning, before anything else could get started, the Speaker of the House walked up to the podium and said, go write articles of impeachment. She just quit. She just stopped. Go write articles of impeachment. I appreciate that the majority practiced for two days this weekend on this hearing. I appreciate that the fact that you've got to try and get it right to try and convince the American people of your problem, but your speaker's already undercut you. She took the, the, the thrill out of the room. You're writing articles of impeachment. Why couldn't we just save that time today, and if you're going to write the articles of impeachment, go ahead and write them? Well, there's probably a reason for that, because the chairman laid out some amazing claims none of which I think after this hearing today, the American people can honestly look at and see that there is overwhelming evidence, there is a proper reason he abused this power because as the speaker, another statement she said, that to do impeachment you have to be so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, all of which we are not. So why not? Why are we here? Well, I think we can do this. Let's look at, let's look at the three things that typically are associated with making your case for a crime. Let's do it against what the majority has said. I think they have motive, they have means, and they have opportunity. What's their motive? It's November 2020. It's been said over and over and over again. The chairman said it again this morning. It's been said all along that we have to do this because if we don't impeach him, he'll win again next year. The reason is shown as clearly as last week on the jobs report in the economy. And as I had a, a man come up to me in the grocery store this weekend, he said, keep doing what you're doing. He said, I've never seen an economy this good. He said, Our, he said people are working, people are being taken care of, and this is just a fatal distraction on a president that they don't like. Motive is easy. November 2016, they lost. January 2017, just a few minutes in, the Washington Post confirmed what every Democrat had been talking about. Now's the time for impeachment. We see tweet after tweet saying, now let's get at it. It's amazing that they start with impeachment and then they spent two years trying to figure out what do we impeach him on? Well, the means became what we see now. The means is, is to always talk about impeachment, to always say this president's doing something wrong, to say he is illegitimate, as the chairman has said before, that he's not even a legitimate president is to constantly tear down at a president who is working on behalf of the American people. 
the sham impeachment, when we go through this, I think the chairman said something that was interesting. He said that the president should not be above the law and should be held accountable for the oath of their office. I think Congress ought to be held accountable for their oath of office as well and not to do what we're doing right now, and that is run a process that doesn't fit fairness or decorum, to run a process and a fact pattern that you're having to force against a president you don't like. But what was the opportunity? The opportunity came last November when they got the majority and they began their impeachment run. They began in the process, even uh, as selecting the chairman, the chairman said that I would be the best person for impeachment. This is November of last year. Before we had any hearings, before we had even were sworn in to this Congress, for anyone, the media or watching on TV or watching in this room, for anyone to think that this was not a baked deal is not being honest with themselves. You see, presumption has now become the standard instead of proof. It should cause anyone to begin to question because the entire case is built on a presumption, or as we found out last week from three scholars, that inference is okay. If you just infer that that's what they mean, then we'll take that. That was an interesting line. You know, it was interesting. They made their whole case built on Gordon Sondland. You're going to see that a lot today. He testified that he presumed that the aid was connected to an investigation, but he said nobody ever told him that. When Sondland even asked the president directly, he said, what do you want? The president said, I want nothing. I want Zelensky to do what he ran on. Ukraine did nothing and got the aid anyway. But you know how I know that this is also a problematic experience? Just look over the past three weeks when the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, who, by the way, is absent today, I guess he can't back up his own report, but he started his own hearing by making up the factual call when he made it up, he started the fairy tale that we're having today. If you can't even put the transcript in the right context, just read it. Chairman Schiff couldn't even read the transcript. He had to make it up because if he didn't make it up, it didn't sound as bad. It didn't sound as bad. He said, listen, he, he said, let's make up some dirt. That's not what was said. The transcript, the chairman misled the American people as an attorney, as a chairman, as a member of Congress who swore an oath to tell the, basically to be honest with the American people and to uphold the Constitution. That was such a massive malpractice I've never seen. Because you know why? Again, they don't care about what actually was in the transcript. They don't actually care what happened. And we heard last week from witnesses, they don't even care that the aid was released. They're simply looking at the facts to make it fit their narrative. Well, what else happened? You know, this is also the Chairman Schiff who also said that he had seen collusion in plain sight. That it was already there before the Mueller report ever came out, that all of this was going to happen. But you know, I guess maybe I might need to just not stop uh, commenting on Chairman Schiff and his guidance because I may end up on the next uh, phone records subpoena as we go forward. You see, we've taken a dangerous turn in this Congress. Subpoenas are fine, properly done, and should be done properly, but they should never be at the expense of a political and vendetta. Professor Turley testified last week, presumption is no substitute for proof. The current legal case for impeachment is not just woefully inadequate, but in some respects dangerous and the basis for impeachment of an American president. Today, what we were supposed to get was like what I'm, I love my friends on the, on the majority of this uh, committee said, Mueller. When we got the Mueller report, it didn't go real well. So we had a lot of hearings, didn't go real well. Then we finally got Bob Mueller, and they said, this is going to be the movie version. In fact, what happened, they did, uh, my colleagues on the majority had uh, live readings from Capitol Hill. They made dramatic podcasts. They even wrote a comic book rendition that breathed life into the Mueller report. And it didn't work. So they brought Bob Mueller. This was the movie version. They told us Robert Mueller's testimony would be the thing that people watched and would be convinced. Guess what? They wasn't convinced. In fact, it fell flat. But you know, today, I guess, is the movie version of the Schiff Report. Except one thing, the star witness failed to show up. Mr. Nunez is here. His staff is here. The leading headline is there, Schiff Report. But where's Mr. Schiff? And Mueller, Robert Mueller testified. The Ken Starr Report, Ken Starr testified. The author of the Schiff Report is not here. Instead, he's sending his staff to do his job for him. I guess that's what you get when you're making up impeachment as you go. So as we look forward here, there's going to be plenty of time to discuss the factual case for this and the statements that are not being made. What is very detrimental to me, though, is this. 
This committee is not hearing from a factual witness. This committee is not doing anything past hearing from law school professors and staff. We've not been given, the, the chairman said something about the president not being able to come. Show me where he would actually have a proper process in this that's not talking to staff and not talking to law school professors. When we could actually have witnesses that will be called by both sides. But I want to say this in the ending. I love this institution. I was here as a 19-year-old kid, as an intern, almost 32 years ago. This institution as we see it today is in danger. We see chairmen who are issuing subpoenas for personal vendettas. We see committees such as the Judiciary Committee that has held many, many substantive hearings has been the very center point of impeachment being used as a rubber stamp because we get not our marching orders from this committee and what it should be doing, but from the Speaker and the Intelligence Committee chairman. We're not able to do what we need to do because we're a rubber stamp. I love this institution, but in the last three days, I've, over the last few or four, three or four days, I've seen stuff that just bother me to no end and should bother everyone. The Speaker of the House, after hearing one day of testimony in the Judiciary Committee, said, go write articles. Facts be damned. Al Green, another member of the House majority, said we can keep impeaching him over and over and over and over again. Adam Schiff, when he told us he wasn't going to come, instead hide behind his staff, he also told us that we're going to keep investigating because they know this is going nowhere in the Senate and they're desperate to have an impeachment vote on this president. The economy is good, job creation is up, military is strong, our country is safe. And the Judiciary Committee has been relegated to this. Why? Because they have the means, they have the motive, and they have the opportunity. And at the end of the day, all this is about is about a clock and a calendar because they can't get over the fact Donald Trump is president of the United States and they don't have a candidate that they think can beat him. It's all political. And as we have talked about before, this is a show. Unfortunately, today, the witness who is supposed to be the star witness chose to take a pass and let a staff answer for him. With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. Gentleman will state his point of order. Mr. Chairman, Clause 2J1 of Rule 11 requires you to schedule a minority hearing day, not to consider it, not to meet to discuss it, but to schedule one, and to schedule it at a reasonable time, not after articles have been drawn, not after there's been a vote on articles of impeachment. I inquire and insist, Mr. Chairman, that you immediately schedule a minority hearing day or tell us why you are uh, uh, the gentleman, ignoring the rules. The gentleman, uh, we've, we've, already gone, we've already gone through that, but I will repeat, that is not a point, proper point of order in today's hearing. As I've told the ranking minority member several times, I'm considering the, the minority's request. If you think we would be violating the rules of the House if we considered articles of impeachment before holding a minority day hearing, that point of order would be timely at a meeting where we considered such articles. It's not the purpose of today's hearing, and the point of order is not in order. Mr. Chairman, Mr. since Collins, I've been, I, since I've been implicated in this, I'd like to ask without objection, our comments have not Without objection, there All other objection. opening statements will be included in the record. Reserve my point of objection on that. Okay, the point of objection. I have a question. You've, right, you've brought my name into this. The gentleman. You have brought my name into this. The gentleman will suspend. The gentleman is recognized. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's telling me that you're considering something you have nothing to consider, and you have told me that, I'll admit on record, is nowhere close to actually following your duty as a chairman to follow the rules. And so I think the point of order is very well taken. I think the issue that we have is not, I think your timing is, I mean, show me please in the rule, have your parliamentarian show me in the rules where you come to a time of actually being able to deny this up at a certain point. Uh, further reserving the right to object. As I, as I have said. Further the, reserving the, the right as to as object. As I have said, the point of order would be in order at the meeting where we are considering our further reserving the right to object we will now hear presentations Mr. chairman i appeal the decision of the chair there is no decision to appeal there was not a ruling in a motion we will you now hear presentations There's a ruling you on the rule. point of order well, you, you made a ruling on the point of order you made a ruling on the point of order mr chairman you can't then not allow us to appeal the ruling of the chair the gentleman will suspend here on the judiciary committee it was not a cognizable point of order
It was not, it was not a cognizable point of order. It was not in order at this time to make that point of order. There is no ruling to appeal. To appeal. But, but Mr. Chairman, it's now the rule was for the obligation, not the These procedural fights obligated. usually happen behind closed doors, but it's happening in public right now. As you hear, the Republicans would like a hearing before any final votes in the articles. We are doing what we have to do under the rules. We will now hear presentations Mr. of evidence. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman is but the Chairman has the votes on this we'll committee. He's going to move forward to the witnesses. Evidence. I have a parliamentary inquiry. I haven't removed my objection yet. I will not recognize a parliamentary inquiry at this time. We will when now hear presentations of evidence from councils to the judiciary. Is this hearing? when we just hear staff ask questions of other staff and the members get dealt out of this whole hearing? And for the next four hours, you're going to try to overturn the result of an election with unelected people giving the gentlemen testimony? will suspend. This order, this one of the president's strongest allies in Congress, there, Matt Gates from Florida. In an orderly fashion, the gentleman will not yell out and he will not attempt to disrupt the proceedings. We will now hear presentations of evidence from councils to the Judiciary Committee. For up to 60 minutes, equally divided. I've not Barry removed my Burke objection will present, yet. Barry Burke will present for the majority, and Stephen Castor will present for the minority. Each of you will have 30 minutes to present. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your time has expired. Mr. Burke, you may begin. Mr. Chairman, you do realize I've never withdrawn my objection. Gentlemen will suspend. I've not withdrawn my objection. You've not asked my talk to my objection. I want everybody to have an opening statement. Gentlemen will. Yeah, I'm objecting to your opening statement comment. Nothing else. Mr. Burke is recognized. Steamroll continues. Mr. Burke has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Collins, and all the members. Before I had the great honor of being a counsel for this committee. My young son asked me a question. He said, Dad, does the president have to be a good person? Like many questions by young children, it had a certain clarity, but it was hard to answer. I said, son, it is not a requirement that the president be a good person, but that is the hope. And it is not a requirement that the president be a good person. That is not why we are here today. That is not the issue. But the very document that created the awesome presidency and its powers that we have made clear it is a requirement that the president be a person who does not abuse his power. It is a requirement that the president be a person who, not, who does not risk national security of this nation and the integrity of our elections in order to further his own re-election prospects. It is a requirement that the president not be a person who acts as though he is above the law in putting his personal and political interests above the nation's interests. That is the lesson of the Constitution. That is the lesson of the founders. They were concerned that someone would be elected president who would use all the power of that office to serve his own personal interests at the expense of the people who elected him. They decided there needed to be a remedy because they had suffered the abuses of King George where they had no remedy. The remedy they, they imposed was that if a president commits a grave offense, a high crime or misdemeanor, this body has the power to impeach that president. They wanted to ensure that a president could not serve his own interests over that of the nation. It flows from the very oath that all members of this body must take to support and defend the Constitution and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That is why we are here today, and it is an unfortunate occasion that these proceedings are necessary. But the president's actions have left no choice. The founders were very clear in spelling out what they saw to be the greatest abuses that would raise the most concerns for our nation. They spelled them out as warning signals that if a president violated or committed one of these, that would be a reason to potentially impeach that president. They were abuse of power, betrayal of the national interest, corruption of elections. And what is so extraordinary is the conduct we're going to be talking about today of President Trump didn't violate one of these, but all three. 
First, the evidence is overwhelming that the president abused his power by pressuring, it, by pressuring Ukraine and its new president to investigate a political opponent. The evidence is overwhelming that the president abused his power by ramping up that pressure, by conditioning a wanted White House meeting and a needed military aid that had been approved in order to get that president to investigate a political rival. It is clear and overwhelming that in abusing that power, the president betrayed the national interest by putting his own political prospects over the national security of our country. It is clear that the president risked corrupting our elections by inviting foreign interference to knock out an adversary to help his prospects in re-election. <coughs> It is why in debating the Constitution, James Madison warned that because the presidency was to be administered by a single man, his corruption might be fatal to the republic. And the scheme by President Trump was so brazen, so clear, supported by documents, actions, sworn testimony, uncontradicted, contemporaneous records that it's hard to imagine that anybody could dispute those acts, let alone argue that that conduct does not constitute an impeachable offense or offenses. This is a big deal. President Trump did what a president of our nation is not allowed to do. It is why last week the constitutional scholar, Professor Michael Gerhardt said, if what we're talking about is not impeachable, then nothing is impeachable. President Trump's actions are impeachable offenses. They threaten our rule of law. They threaten our institutions. And as James Madison warned us, they threaten our republic. Let me begin where we must, with the facts and evidence. First, it's important to understand why Ukraine was so important to our national security. Ukraine was under attack by its aggressive and hostile neighbor, Russia. They had already encroached on its territories. The Ukraine was at great risk that Russia would again take further territory or try. Europe had a stake in this and so did we. I'm going to turn to an expert on this, Ambassador Taylor, who is one of the most highly decorated diplomats and recognized diplomats for over 40 years. He served our country honorably, and he was appointed by President Trump himself to be in charge of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. The Russians are violating all of the rules, treaties, understandings that they committed to that actually kept the peace in Europe for nearly 70 years. That rule of law, that order that kept the peace in Europe and allowed for prosperity as well as peace in Europe was violated by the Russians. It, it affects the world that we live in, that our children will grow up in, and our grandchildren. This affects the kind of world that we want to, to see abroad. That is Ambassador Taylor explaining why Ukraine was so important and explaining why the president's actions so significantly risked hurting our national security, our national defense policy, and our national interest. Now, you've already heard there is significant proof that President Trump himself told the new president of Ukraine, President Zelensky, that he wanted him to investigate a political rival, former Vice President Joe Biden. And you'll hear a lot about that today. But that proof is only the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more events and meetings and contemporaneous text messages, emails, other documents that show this happened and happened exactly as it is alleged. And it is clear that in this scheme to pressure Ukraine to investigate a political rival, the person at the center of that scheme was President Donald Trump. The facts cannot be disputed. President Trump used the powers of government for a domestic political errand to put his political interests above that of the nation. I'm going to turn to another expert. I'm going to turn to, Ms. to Dr. Fiona Hill, the National Security Council Senior Director in the Trump administration, and she's going to explain what happened. But it struck me when yesterday, when you put up on the screen Ambassador Sondland's emails and who was on these emails, and he said, these are the people who need to know that he was absolutely right. 
because he was being involved in a domestic political errand. And we were being involved in national security foreign policy, and those two things had just diverged. And that tells you what the evidence shows. The president put his own domestic political interests over the nation's national security and foreign policy. A president cannot abuse his power to secure an election. He cannot do that at the expense of the American people. That is an impeachable offense. The president has tried to make excuses for his conduct, why it's not wrongful or corrupt or an abuse of power. But the truth holds together. It makes sense. It's consistent with the evidence. When someone is offering an excuse that is not true, it is not consistent with the evidence. It does not make sense. It cannot be squared with what the facts show. And you will see these excuses do not make sense. The facts are clear that President Trump put his own political and personal interests over the nation's interest. I'd like to go through what you are going to see about the president's scheme and you're going to hear about today from the facts that we have. First, you're going to hear that President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, pushed Ukraine to open an investigation of his political rival. Mr. Giuliani, prior to the July 25th call, he made public statements that Ukraine should investigate the vice, former Vice President Joe Biden. He tweeted about it, putting pressure on the new president. He, he went to Ukraine and later went again with the assist and direction of U.S. officials who were told to aid the president's personal lawyer uh, on the president's behalf. You'll hear that President Trump told his aides that he was relying on for Ukraine that he wanted them to, quote, talk to Rudy. What you're going to hear is that his close advisors had just gotten back on May 23rd from the inauguration of the new president, President Zelensky. They told President Trump, we were impressed. He was elected on an anti-corruption platform, a reform platform. You should schedule a White House meeting. It's very important. This is very good for the United States. And the president's response was, talk to Rudy, who had been out there claiming what the Ukraine, Ukrainian president had to do was investigate his political rival. You'll hear that President Trump's advisors told President Zelensky that President Trump would not schedule the wanted White House meeting unless he announced a Ukrainian investigation of former Vice President Biden. There are documents, there's sworn testimony. This happened, and there is no question from the evidence that the president did this. And President Zelensky desperately needed a White House meeting, both to show Russia that the U.S. was still supporting Ukraine and for his own credibility as a new president. You'll hear then, to ramp up the, pre the pressure, what President Trump did is he told his agencies to withhold military and security aid that had been approved and was supposed to be released to Ukraine, hundreds of millions of dollars, in order to put more pressure on Ukraine. All the agencies involved, State Department, Defense Department, National Security Council, said it should be released, that it had been approved, it was going to be released, until President Trump personally stopped it. And again, contemporaneous evidence and documents show it and prove it. People said that they were shocked. Ambassador Taylor said he was in astonishment. Your witness said that it was illogical to do this, and the president never offered an explanation. But ultimately, it was discovered why he did it. Then on the July 25th call, President Trump explicitly told him he wanted, to conduct, he wanted him to do two Ukrainian investigations, one of a U.S. citizen and his political rival, and the other about the origins of the of interference in the 2016 election, some conspiracy theory that Russia, who all the intelligence agencies agreed, interfered with the 2016 election, that maybe it was Ukraine. Again, another investigation intended to help the president politically. That is it. And you know the president cared about the investigations that would help him politically and not Ukraine and not the national security interest. And you don't have to take my word. I'm going to play uh, something from uh, David Holmes, who had worked in the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine and was speaking to Ambassador Sondland, who, who, Donald, who President Trump appointed, 
Ambassador Sondland had just come to the Ukraine on the 26th. He met with President Zelensky. He went to a restaurant with Mr. Holmes, the U.S. political affairs counselor in Ukraine. <laughs> and, and he called President Trump on his cell phone, and Mr. Holmes could hear that call, and then he spoke to Mr. Sondland. Let's see what happened on July 26th, the day after that call. I heard Ambassador Sondland greet the president and explain he was calling from Kyiv. I heard President Trump then clarify that Ambassador Sondland was in Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland replied, yes, he was in Ukraine, and went on to state that President Zelensky, quote, loves your ass. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to do. That is sworn testimony by David Holmes, who heard it from the president himself. And it was clear to everyone, the most experienced people in government, who Donald Trump himself appointed in their positions, they knew what was going on. Let's look at a text message from Ambassador Taylor around this time on September 9th. He said, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. Again, that is President Trump putting his own political and personal interests over the nation's interests to hold aid desperately needed by Ukraine in order to combat Russia and show the support he did it to help his own campaign. Now, there have been excuses offered by the president. I'd like to briefly talk about those excuses. The first excuse offered by President Trump is that the aid was ultimately released and President Trump met with Mr. Zelensky. We heard it today. The challenge with that, though, as an excuse, is the aid was only released after President Trump got caught doing the scheme. On September 9th, the committees of this House started their investigation and announced they were investigating his conduct with regard to Ukraine. Two days later was when he released the aid. And he also, there also was a news article, which we'll talk about in a moment, by the Washington Post on September 5th, exposing his scheme. And it was only after that that he met with, Mr. with President Zelensky, not in the White House, but in New York. Another excuse offered, the president was motivated by general corruption concerns. And again, the evidence shows that is not true that that's what caused him to withhold the aid. President Zelensky, in fact, was elected on an anti-corruption platform. He was a reform candidate. His own people told him again and again, President Zelensky is a hope, he's doing it the right way. They urged him to be supportive. On his call with President Zelensky on July 25th, President Trump ignored the talking points that were prepared to talk about corruption. He only wanted to talk about two things, the two investigations that helped him politically. Every intelligence agency unanimously supported releasing the aid to Ukraine that was appropriate. They did a study, a corruption study. They said, release it. The White House never provided an explanation. The aid had already been approved, and it was not for any corruption issues that President Trump withheld it. The next is Ukraine was not pressured. And the argument about that is, well, today, they, they haven't said they were pressured. Well, Ukraine was pressured then and still is pressured. They are desperately in need of the, of the United States support as they battle uh, the threat of Russia. So, of course, they have to be careful what they said. But contemporaneous documents, emails, texts from the Ukrainian officials themselves show the pressure they felt, showed they knew what the President Trump was doing, showed what they had to do. This is one from Bill Taylor to, again, Ambassador Gordon Sondland and, Kurt, and, and Ambassador Kurt Volker. Gordon, one thing Kurt and I talked about yesterday was Sasha Donilak, a senior aide of President Zelensky, point that President Zelensky is sensitive about Ukraine being taken seriously, not mere, merely an instrument in Washington's domestic re-election politics. They not only felt the pressure, they got the message. They were not going to get a White House meeting. They were ultimately not going to get military aid unless they furthered President Trump's re-election efforts. That is a corrupt abuse of power. Another argument that's made is that Trump never said quid pro quo. And what you're going to hear is on a call with Ambassador Sondland after a Washington Post article came out on September 5th, which we will look at. After that, there was a Washington Post article that came out that, again, exposed the Ukrainian scheme. Days after that, President Trump was on a phone call with Ambassador Sondland and without prompting said there was no quid pro quo because he got caught. 
So he's offering his defense. But even Ambassador Sondland in his sworn testimony didn't buy it because ultimately then President Trump not only was not dissuaded, he again described what he wanted. He didn't want Ukraine to actually conduct these investigations. He wanted to, them to announce the investigations of his political rival to help him politically. He continued, and, and you'll hear more about that. Um, again, none of these excuses hold any water, and they are refuted by testimony, contemporaneous records, and more. Now, some have suggested that we should wait to proceed with these impeachment proceedings because we've not heard from all of the witnesses or obtained all the documents. But the reason we have not heard from all the witnesses or documents is because President Trump himself has obstructed the investigation. He's directed his most senior aides who are involved in some of these events not to come testify, to defy subpoenas. He has told every one of his agencies with records that could be relevant not to produce those records to us, to try to obstruct our investigation. Now, this is evidence that President Trump is replaying the playbook used in the prior Department of Justice investigation. In that investigation, he directed his White House counsel to create a false, phony record and document and lie, denying that President Trump had told him to fire the special counsel. He did many other things to try to interfere with that investigation. He attacked the investigators and, and witnesses and called them horrible names, just as he has done here. And President Trump thought he got away with it. On July 24th was the day that special counsel, the special counsel testified before this committee and the House Intelligence Committee, the 24th. It was exactly the following day, the 25th, that President Trump spoke to President Zelensky in furtherance of his Ukrainian scheme. He thought he got away with it. Not only that, he thought he could use his powers to interfere with that investigation so he could do what he wanted. He could act like he was above the law. And if he got caught, he would again use his powers to try to obstruct the investigation and prevent the facts from coming out. And that's exactly what he did. But fortunately, fortunately, because of the true American patriots who came forward to testify despite the threats by President against the people who worked in his own administration, they told the story. They on their own produced documents that provide uncontroverted, clear and overwhelming evidence that President Trump did this scheme. He put his political reelection interests over the nation's national security and the integrity of its elections. He did it intentionally. He did it corruptly. He abused his powers in ways that the founders feared the most. No person in, the, in this country has the ability to prevent investigations, and neither does the president. Our Constitution does not allow it. No one is above the law, not even the president. And one of the concerns and requirements of finding an impeachable offense, is there an urgency? Is there a sense that you have to move because it could be repeated? Well, again, first, all the constitutional experts who testified recognized that obstructing an investigation <laughs> is an impeachable offense. But here, the offense we're talking about that's being interfered or obstructed with is interfering with this very election that's coming up. And I submit to you, given what happened with the Department of Justice investigation, given what's happening here, if, in fact, President Trump can get away with what he did again, our imagination is the only limit to what President Trump may do next or what a future president may do next to try to abuse his or her power to serve his own personal interest over the nation's interest. I'd like to turn back to what the founders most cared about when we talk about the ABCs of, of potential presidential abuses. It is extraordinary that the president's conduct was a trifecta, checking all three boxes. Let's begin with abuse of power. What that means, it's to use the power of the office to obtain an improper personal benefit while ignoring or injuring the national interest, or acts in ways that are grossly inconsistent with and undermine the separation of powers that is the foundation of our democratic system. Now, 
these, this question of whether a president engaged in abuse of power came up before when this Congress considered the impeachment of President Nixon. And after action was taken, President Nixon famously said, if the president does it, it is not illegal. And this body rejected that because that's not so. That goes directly contrary to what the founder said. But President Trump has said the same thing in responding to the prior investigation by Department of Justice and defending his conduct. Here's what he said. Then I have an article two where I have the right to do whatever I want as president. That he has the right to do whatever he wants as president. That is as wrong as when President Nixon said a similar thing. That is not what the Constitution provides. That is not what the country demands. He does not have the right to do whatever he wants. Turning to the second abuse of power most concerned, betrayal of the nation involving foreign powers. The American people have suffered that foreign influence when President Trump treated military aid that had been approved <coughs> taxpayers' dollars and decided to treat it as his own checkbook to try to further his own reelection chances. That reflects what the founders were concerned about. And finally, corruption of our elections. The framers knew that corrupt leaders or leaders acting corruptly concentrate their powers to manipulate elections and undercut adversaries. They talked about it frequently. That is why the framers thought electoral treachery, particularly involving foreign powers, was a critical abuse and, a, and that could support and lead to impeachment. Now, the American people learned last election how dangerous foreign intervention in our elections can be. <clears throat> Let me show another clip from President, from candidate Trump on the, on the uh, campaign trail. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. And Russia was listening. Within approximately five hours, five hours of President Trump's invitation to Russia to interfere in our election by trying to hack and obtain the emails of his political opponent. Russia, in fact, tried to do that for the first time. The very officers who were then indicted by the Department of Justice for that conduct, they took candidate Trump's <laughs> invitation. Now, the American people learned a lesson. President Trump, unfortunately, apparently learned a different lesson. Let's look. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. Uh, they should investigate the Biden. So this was President Trump answering a question about what did he want President Zelensky to do. So even after he got caught, he is saying, again, this vulnerable nation, dependent on U.S. support militarily and otherwise, Again, he's telling them what to do. And unlike in 2016, when he only had a campaign platform, which to extend the invitation to a foreign power, now he has the levers of government in his control to not only request it and invite it, but to pressure that country to do it. And that's exactly what he did. And you'll hear more about that in the presentation for the House Intelligence Committee. And what's most striking as we come back to this issue that the framers were concerned about, is there a continuing risk of wrongdoing? The fact that President Trump did this after he was caught shows the risk, shows the risk of what will happen if this body doesn't act. He really does believe he can act as though he were above the law. He really does believe, as evidenced by this conduct, that he can put his personal and political interests over the nation's interest, over the nation's national security interest, over the nation's integrity of its elections. So of course we do have an election coming up. That's not a reason to postpone this discussion, that's a reason we must have this discussion, to make sure it is not interfered with, to make sure this president doesn't do it, to make sure future presidents do not do it. It is the hope 
that in these discussions, you can put aside political rancor, disagreements, and have a fair discussion about the facts and this conduct, not just as it relates to President Trump, but as to the presidency itself and future presidents. My son, our children, our grandchildren, they will study this moment in history. They will read all of your remarks. They will learn about all of your actions. And that is not a reason to vote for or against impeachment. For that, of course, you must vote your conscience. But that is a reason for us to have a fair debate about what the undisputed facts show, to recognize that it is wrong, it is very wrong, and it cannot happen again with this president or any president. It is a reason to talk about whether we want our children and grandchildren to live in a country where the president elected by the people can put his own personal and political interests over the interests of the people who elected them. It is a reason for these debates to, again, fairly focus on the facts and to make sure the presentations we're going to hear will not distort the record, focus on process points, raise extraneous matters that really are intended to distract rather than focus on what the conduct was at issue here. It is a reason to focus on the facts and what is in the country's best interest. History, future generations will be the judge. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Mr. Castor, you, Mr. Are, Chairman, Mr. you Chairman. are recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yeah, Mr. Castor is recognized. Mr. Order. Castor is recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Mr. Castor is recognized for 30 minutes. Point Mr. Order. Chairman, the point witness has violated Rule 17, and my point of order should be heard. Point of order. The General witness has used language which impugns the motives of the president and suggests he's disloyal to his country, and those words should be stricken from the record and taken down. The uh, point of order is not sustained. Witnesses are not subject to the rules of decorum. Appeal the, the ruling of the chair. The, in the same way members are. The topic of the hearing is the president's misconduct, so none of us should find it surprising that we are hearing testimony that is critical of the president. I do not find that the witnesses' comments are disorderly. I find they are pertinent to the subject matter of this hearing. The witness would be able to continue, except that his time has expired. Mr. Castor is Mr. Recognized. Chairman, it's not— the gentleman Mr. Will Chairman, my point of order is not that his words are disorderly. They are unparliamentary. They the, violate the rules of the House. The point they should of, be taken down. This is not about his conduct. He's talking about the, the motives the will and suspend. the character of the President the of the United States. The gentleman will suspend. The rules of decorum apply to members of the House, not to witnesses. The gentleman may proceed. So I appeal the ruling of the chair. That is not a ruling. There, it is was, a rule. it is a there was no. There was no. It is a ruling on a point of order. It's appealable. It's subject to a vote. That is a rule. Subject to a vote. And that's a that's a rule. The point of order is not sustained. Point, appeals the ruling of the chair. Appeals the ruling of the chair. I move to um, table the the, uh, the. The motion is made to table the appeal of the ruling of the chair. The motion. Move the motion to table is made in writing. Motion to table. Move the motion is made, motion made in writing. Motion table is not in debate. It's not. It, all in favor the motion to take. All in favor the motion to table will say aye. 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 We got point whoa, 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 opposed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. No. The motion to table. She has to put it in writing first. Then you can call the vote. The motion to table is. At least you're following the rules. The motion to table is sustained. Roll call. The, roll call. Roll call. The, the clerk will call the roll. And Mr. Nadler. They're going to be having aye. a vote now Nadler, on the chairman's longer. ruling uh, that longer, the objection aye. from Lee, the House aye. Republicans aye. there is out of order, Mr. saying Cohen, that the witnesses was impugning Cohen. the reputation Mr. of the Mr. president. As you heard Mr. Chairman Nadler say there, the House rules Mr. apply Mr. to Mr. members of Congress, Mr. not to the witnesses. Uh, Mary, clearly, Mary Bruce up there on Capitol Hill, clearly a strategy here from House Republicans to disrupt this hearing and make it go as long as possible. Yeah, what we are seeing here is some good old-fashioned squabbling over the rules, and Republicans are very intent, as they have been in previous hearings, 
they're trying to delay the proceeding here. here. They are using essentially every procedural tool they have to try and delay. In this case, they are insisting that the witnesses have been impugning the president of the character, uh, excuse me, the character of the president. But of course, uh, Chairman Nadler pointed out, well, this is a hearing about the president and his actions, and he says that those rules don't apply to witnesses in the same way. Now, of course, they're going through the roll call vote, so, so they, they allow Republicans to delay things a little bit here, but I suspect they won't be able to, to pull this off for very long. Right. One of the iron rules of the House, despite the hundreds of pages of procedure, is that whoever has the majority of votes generally wins uh, in yeah. the House. You see that on both sides, both among Republicans and Democrats. So they're going to go through this vote right now, party line vote, uh, Democrats and, and Republicans. Uh, let me talk to our legal team first, though, about the Democrats' presentation there. Uh, basically, uh, Dan Abrams, a highlight reel of the last couple of weeks of hearings. Yeah, and I, and I think that it may feel a little bit like a letdown uh, because of how powerful the law professors ha had been the other day. Meaning, when we started the day, when we were listening to the law professors, I was thinking that was not going to be particularly interesting. It ended up being far more interesting than I expected. I expected today would have been more interesting. And I'm, I find this to be less interesting than I expected. And I think that's because of the expectations. And by the way, as a political matter, the expectation game is critical. I saw, our, I saw our law professors <laughs> nodding yeah. their heads there as you were talking about the law professors. The vote is complete. Let's go back to the room. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. May I make a parliamentary inquiry? Mr. Castor is recognized. Mr. I will not recognize a parliamentary inquiry at this time. Mr. Castor is recognized for 30 minutes. Good morning, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, members of the committee, and members of the staff. My name is Steve Castor. I'm a congressional staff member. Uh, I serve with the Oversight Committee on the Republican staff with uh, Mr. Jordan. I'm also, for purposes of this investigation, I'm a shared staffer with the Judiciary Committee and Mr. Collins and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and Mr. Nunez. Um, it sure is atypical for a staffer to be presenting, but again, thanks for, for having me. Uh, the purpose of this hearing, as we understand it, is to discuss whether President Donald J. Trump's conduct fits the definition of a high crime and misdemeanor. It does not such that the committee should consider articles of impeachment to remove the president from office, and it should not. This case, in many respects, comes down to eight lines in a call transcript. Let me say clearly and unequivocally that the answer to that question is no. The record in the Democrats' impeachment inquiry does not show that President Trump abused the power of his office or obstructed Congress. To impeach a president who 63 million people voted for over eight lines in a call transcript is baloney. Democrats seek to impeach President Trump not because they have evidence of high crimes or misdemeanors, but because they disagree with his policies. This impeachment inquiry is not the organic outgrowth of serious misconduct. Democrats have been searching for a set of facts on which to impeach President Trump since his inauguration on January 20th, 2017. Just 27 minutes after the president's inauguration that day, the Washington Post ran a story that the campaign to impeach the president has already begun. The article reported Democrats and liberal activists are mounting broad opposition to stymieing Trump's agenda and noted that impeachment strategists believed the Constitution's emoluments clause would be the vehicle. In the first two years of the administration, Democrats in the House introduced articles of impeachment to remove President Trump from office on several very different factual bases. On January 3rd, the very first day of the new Congress, Congressman Sherman introduced articles of impeachment against the President. The same day, Representative Tlaib said, we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the President. In May 2019, Representative Green said on MSNBC, if we don't impeach this president, he will be reelected. Even Speaker Pelosi, who has said that impeachment is a somber and prayerful exercise, has called President Trump an imposter and said it is dangerous to allow voters to judge his performance in 2020. The obsession with impeaching the president is reflected in House Democrats have used the power of their majority in the past 11 months. In the Oversight Committee, the Democrats' first announced witness was Michael Cohen, a disgraced felon who, was, who pleaded guilty to lying to Congress. When he came before us at the Oversight Committee, he then lied again as many as eight times. 
Oversight Committee Democrats demanded information about the president's personal finances and even subpoenaed the president's accounting firm Mazars for large swaths of sensitive and personal financial information about the entire Trump family. The subpoena was issued over the objection of committee Republicans and without a vote. In the Ways and Means Committee, Democrats demanded the president's personal tax return information. The reason they cited for wanting the president's tax returns, they said, was to oversee the IRS's audit process for presidential tax returns. You can judge that for yourself. In the Financial Services Committee, Democrats demanded and subpoenaed the president's bank records going back 10 years. The Financial Services Committee staff, the Republicans tell me, the information demanded would cover every withdrawal, credit card swipe, or debit card purchase of every member of the Trump family, including his minor child. The reason that the Democrats gave for why they needed such voluminous and intrusive personal information about the Trump family was, get this, financial industry compliance with banking statutes and regulations. Here in the Judiciary Committee, Democrats sent out letters demanding information from over 80 recipients, including the president's children, business partners, employees, his campaign, businesses, and foundation. Of course, the main event for the Judiciary Committee was the report of Special Counsel Mueller, which Democrats would believe would serve as the evidentiary basis for impeaching the president. Despite interviewing 500 witnesses, issuing 2,800 subpoenas, executing almost 500 search warrants, and spending $25 million, the special counsel's 19 attorneys and 40 FBI agents, analysts, and staff found no conspiracy or coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. After the Trump-Russia collusion allegations did not pan out, Democrats focused their efforts on obstruction of justice. They criticized Attorney General Barr for concluding that no crime of obstruction had occurred in the special counsel investigation. But in fact, it was entirely appropriate for the Attorney General to make that call because the special counsel declined to do so. Not surprisingly, the Democrats' Mueller hearing was underwhelming, to say the least. And the sequel with Corey Lewandowski definitely did not move the impeachment needle either. The Intelligence Committee, too, was heavily invested in the Russia collusion investigation. Committee Democrats hired former federal prosecutors to prepare for their anticipated efforts to impeach the president. Now that the Russian collusion allegations did not work out, Democrats have settled on the Ukraine phone call, eight lines the president uttered on July 25th with Ukrainian President Zelensky. But the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Committee of Jurisdiction, wasn't the committee leaving the impeachment inquiry or holding the hearings. Neither was the Oversight Committee, the House's chief investigative entity. The Judiciary Committee was only recently brought back into the mix after fact-finding concluded. Instead, the impeachment inquiry was run by the House Intelligence Committee and these former federal prosecutors. Democrats on the Intelligence Committee ran the impeachment inquiry in a manifestly unfair way. All the fact-finding was unclassified, and that was made clear at the top of every single deposition, but the Democrats took advantage of the closed-door process in the Capitol Basement bunker, the skiff, to control access to information. The secrecy effectively weaponized the investigation, allowing misleading public narratives to form and catch hold with careful leaks of witness testimony. Democrats refused to invite Republican witnesses and directed witnesses called by the Democrats not to answer our questions. In the public hearings, many of these unfair processes continued. Democrats refused to invite numerous witnesses requested by Republicans, interrupted Republican questioning, and prevented witnesses from answering Republican questions. Democrats voted down by virtue of a motion to table, with no notice, subpoenas for documents and testimony requested by Republicans. I'll note that Democrats never once brought any of their subpoenas to a vote before the Intelligence Committee. 
This unfair process reflects the degree to which Democrats are obsessed with impeaching the president. The Democrats went searching for a set of facts on which to impeach the president, the emoluments clause, the, pe the president's business and financial records, the Mueller report, allegations of obstruction before landing on the Ukraine phone call. The impeachment inquiry is clearly an orchestrated effort to upend our political system. According to Politico, the Speaker has tightly scripted every step of the impeachment inquiry. Democrats have reportedly convened focus groups to test which allegations, whether it be quid pro quo or bribery or extortion, uh, were most compelling to the American public. Speaker Pelosi said Democrats must strike while the iron is hot on impeaching the president. The entire duration of the impeachment inquiry from the time Speaker Pelosi announced it on September 24th until today has been 76 days. As Professor Turley testified last Wednesday, this impeachment would stand out among modern impeachments as the shortest proceeding with the thinnest evidentiary record and the narrowest grounds ever used to impeach a president. The artificial and arbitrary political deadline by which Democrats are determined to finish impeachment by Christmas leads to a rushed process and missed opportunities to obtain relevant information. Democrats avoided the accommodations process required by federal courts in disputes between Congress and the executive. Democrats declined to attempt to negotiate with the administration for the production of documents and witnesses. Democrats did not exhaust all their options to entice witnesses or agencies to cooperate, such as allowing witnesses to appear with agency lawyers or initiating contempt proceedings. Sometimes the threat of a contempt proceeding gets you a different result. Sometimes the witnesses choose to appear when contempt is on the table. Democrats even withdrew a subpoena to one witness who asked a federal court to resolve conflicting orders from Congress and the executive either because the Democrats did not want to wait for the court to rule or they didn't like the presiding judge, Judge Leon. Instead, Democrats made their demands and refused to budge. Democrats told witnesses at the outset that their refusal to cooperate in full would be used against them and the president. Democrats threatened federal employees that their salaries could be withheld for not meeting committee demands. These tactics are fundamentally unfair and counterproductive for gathering information in any serious inquiry. This rushed and take it or leave it approach to investigating is contrary to how successful congressional investigations typically work. Congressional investigations take time. There is no easy button. In this job, you must take the information that's offered even if you don't like the terms. You should not say no to taking a witness's testimony because you would prefer the agency counsel's not present. If that's the only means of obtaining the testimony, you should take it. Your priority must not be on blocking information out, it must be on seeking information. In all recent major congressional investigations, uh, for example, Chairman Goodlatte and Gowdy's investigation into the Justice Department's decision during 2016, the IRS targeting investigation, the Benghazi investigation and Fast and Furious, there have been give and take between Congress and the executive. In the goodlatte gowdy investigation, for example, it took two months, two months of negotiations before the committees conducted the first witness interview with Deputy Director McCabe. The Justice Department only began producing documents to the committee after many more months of discussions. In none of these investigations did Congress get everything it wanted right at the beginning certainly not within 60 or 76 days, but with persistence and patience, we eventually did receive enough information to do our work. And contrary to talking points, the Trump administration has in fact cooperated with and facilitated congressional oversight and investigations. For example, earlier this year, the Oversight Committee conducted an investigation into security clearances at the White House. The central allegation put forward was that the White House deviated from established procedures to grant clearances to certain White House staff. 
The Democrats sought to interview career staff who performed these uh, security clearance reviews, but declined the witness initially to appear with agency counsel. The House and the White House were at an impasse. However, after, after a little bit of time, we, the Republican staff, with, with the help of Mr. Jordan, convinced the witness to appear uh, with agency counsel for our own transcribed interview. And the Democrats came along. The subsequent interviews in the security clearance investigation were conducted with agency counsel. The testimony allowed the committee to obtain the evidence, to get to the bottom of what was going on, and it wasn't what was alleged. Nobody outside the security clearance office was handing out clearances, certainly not to senior White House staffers. In this impeachment inquiry, however, Democrats have turned away information that could be valuable to the inquiry by disallowing agency counsel to accompany witnesses. Democrats have turned away information by declining to negotiate in good faith with the administration about the scope of document requests. As a result of these failures, the evidentiary record in the impeachment inquiry is incomplete and in many places incoherent. The failure to exhaust all avenues to obtain information severely risks undermining the legitimacy of any articles of impeachment. As Professor Turley said to the committee last week, I'm concerned about lowering impeachment standards to fit a paucity of evidence and an abundance of anger. I believe this impeachment not only fails the standard of past impeachments, but would create a dangerous precedent for future impeachments. Professor Turley elaborated that the current lack of proof is another reason why the abbreviated investigation into this matter is so damaging for the case of impeachment. The substantive case for impeaching President Trump as a result of an artificial, arbitrary, and political schedule relies heavily on ambiguous facts, presumptions, and speculation. President Turley warned here too that impeachments have been based on proof, not presumptions. The Democrats do not have the proof. Now my Democrat counterparts on the Intelligence Committee are talented attorneys. I'm sure they will tell you a riveting story about a shadow or irregular foreign policy apparatus and a smear campaign designed to extort Ukraine for the president's political benefit. They'll tell you about President Trump and how he put his own political interests ahead of national security by mentioning former, president, former Vice President Joe Biden by name and raising the allegations of Ukrainian influence in the 2016 election on the July 25th call. They'll try to convince you that the Trump administration, the same administration Democrats regularly accuse of being incompetent, orchestrated an international conspiracy at the highest levels. None of this adds up. It may be a great screenplay, but it's not what the evidence shows. The Democrats' impeachment inquiry ignores all of the evidence that does not advance their story. The Democrats' impeachment narrative resolves all ambiguous facts and conflicting evidence in a way that is most unflattering to the president. The Democrats' impeachment narrative ignores public statements from senior Ukrainian officials that contradict the narrative. As you listen to the Democrat presentation later today, I urge you to keep these points in mind. What evidence that has been gathered in the impeachment inquiry paints a different picture? I won't provide a detailed presentation now, but allow me to highlight a few points. First, the summary of the July 25th phone call reflects no conditionality or pressure. President Zelensky never vocalized any discomfort or pressure on the call. Contrary to Democrat allegations, President Trump was not asking for a favor that would help his reelection. He was asking for assistance in helping our country move forward from the divisiveness of the Russia collusion investigation. Second, since President Trump has declassified and publicly released the call summary 75 days ago, President Zelensky has said publicly and repeatedly that he felt no pressure. He said it on September 25th at the United Nations General Assembly. 
He said it in an interview published on October 6th. He said it again on October 10th. And most recently, he said it just last week in Time Magazine. Other senior Ukrainian officials have also said there was no linkage between a meeting, security assistance, and an investigation. If President Trump was truly orchestrating a pressure campaign to force Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Biden, one would think that Ukraine would have felt some pressure. Third, at the time of the July 25th call, senior officials in Kyiv did not know that the security assistance was paused. They did not learn it was paused until the pause was reported publicly in the U.S. media on August 28th. As Ambassador Volker testified, because the highest levels of the Ukrainian government did not know about the pause, there was no leverage implied. Finally, President Zelensky met with President Trump in New York on September 25th at the United Nations. Shortly thereafter, or shortly uh, before that, the, the, the security assistance flowed to Ukraine. Both happened without Ukraine ever taking actions or investigations. The impeachment record also has substantial evidence going to the president's state of mind undercutting the Democrats' assertion of some malicious intent. Witnesses testified that President Trump has a deeply rooted, genuine, and reasonable skepticism of Ukraine stemming from its history of corruption. President Trump is skeptical of U.S. taxpayer-funded foreign assistance and believes that our allies should share more of the burden of Ukraine's defense. Ukrainian politicians openly spoke out against President Trump during the 2016 election. These events bear directly on the president's state of mind. President Zelensky had run on an anti-corruption platform, but he was an untried politician with a relationship to a controversial Ukrainian oligarch. When, Vice, when former Vice President Pence met with President Zelensky in Warsaw, I'm sorry, when Vice President Pence met with President Zelensky in Warsaw on September 1, he stressed to him the need for reform and reiterated the president's concern about burden sharing, especially among European allies. In late August and early September, after his party took control of the Ukrainian parliament, Ukraine passed historic reforms to fight corruption. These reforms including removing parliamentary immunity, which witnesses said had been a historic source of corruption. Imagine if members of our Congress had immunity. President Trump later lifted the pause on security assistance and met with President Zelensky two weeks later. The aid was paused for 55 days. Very simply, the evidence in the Democrats' impeachment inquiry does not support the conclusion that President Trump abused his power for his own personal political benefit. There is simply no clear evidence that President Trump acted with malicious intent in withholding a meeting or security assistance. Indeed, there are, and the Republican report articulates them, legitimate explanations for these actions that are not nefarious, as the Democrats allege. The evidence shows that President Trump faithfully executed the duties of his office by delivering on what he promised the American voters he would do. Democrats may disagree with the president's policy decisions or their manner in which he governs, but those disagreements are not enough to justify the irrevocable action of removing him from office. The Democrats' hyperbole and histrionics are no good reason, 11 months out from an election, to prevent the American people from deciding on their own who is going to be their next president. This record also does not support a conclusion that President Trump obstructed Congress during the impeachment inquiry for many of the procedural defects I touched on earlier. Additionally, as a factual matter, the only direct testimony the investigation has obtained about the president's reaction to the inquiry is from Ambassador Sondland, who testified President Trump told him to cooperate and tell the truth. President Trump has also declassified and released the summaries of his two phone calls with the president, with President Zelensky. President Trump has said that he would like witnesses to testify, but he's been forced to resist the unfair and abusive process. I believe strongly in the prerogatives of the Congress. It's awful to hear President Turley's testimony 
from last week when he critiqued the House for proceeding on impeachment so rapidly and on such a thin record. Professor Turley said to set this abbreviated schedule, demand documents, and then impeach because they haven't been turned over when they go to court, I think is an abuse of power. The impeachment of a duly elected president, as Chairman Nadler said in 1998, is the undoing of a national election. Now, I understand Democrats issued a report over the weekend arguing that contrary to the chairman's statement in 1998, impeachment is not undoing it, uh, an election. I would just respond by saying that I don't think many of the 63 million Americans from all around the country who voted for President Trump in 2016 would agree. By impeaching President Trump, the House would essentially be nullifying the decision of those Americans. And the House would be doing it in less than, le less than 11 months before the next election. There still is no compelling argument for why Democrats in the House must take this decision out of the hands of the voters and do it before Christmas. During the Clinton impeachment in 1998, the chairman said that at bare minimum, the president's accusers must go beyond hearsay and innuendo and beyond the demands that the president prove, prove his innocence of vague and changing charges. I would submit that those words ring as true today as the chairman believed them to be in 1998. The impeachment record is heavily reliant on hearsay, innuendo, and presumptions. Democrats have lobbed vague and ever-changing charges for impeachment going as far back as the president's inauguration. For all these reasons, the extraordinary exercise of the House's impeachment authority is not warranted on the evidentiary record presented. Uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to present this information this morning, and I yield back. And that's the first the yields back. presentation thank by the Republican Council, Stephen Castor. For your presentations, Mr. Burke, you are now excused, and we will invite Mr. Goldman to take his place at the witness table. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Daniel Chairman. Goldman, representing the House Intelligence Committee, will now take the seat for the Democrats. What purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I have a parliamentary inquiry. General of the State is parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pursuant to Rule 7B of the House Rules, the Chairman is allowed to administer an oath, um, not mandated to, but it has been the practice of this committee to administer oaths to witnesses. I'm wondering uh, why we have not administered the oath in this situation. Uh, I'm going to administer the oath to the two witnesses who are now coming up before us to make presentation. The two gentlemen who just uh, testified were not witnesses. They were, staff, they were making opening statements for the committees. We will now administer an oath to Mr. Castor and Mr. Goldman, who are now testifying in the capacity of witnesses. But typically we administer oaths before opening statements. Which we will... No, for witnesses. For witnesses, Mr. Castor, we will that was now something administer. We were going to explain Mr. right there. Parliamentary inquiry. General suspend. Mr. Castor was here with Mr. Burke, presenting the report of the committee. That is the opening statement for the for this committee. They were not witnesses before this committee. Mr. Castor now and Mr. Goldman are witnesses before this committee, and I will administer the oath. Mr. Chairman, if, if they were making presentation, the gentleman on of is members, not recognized. The rules should apply. The gentleman is not recognized. Um, Mr. Chairman, we I have welcome, a point of order. We welcome both of our... Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. Who, who, who I want to bring in Barbara Comstock now, former Republican Mr. member of Congress, also served... Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, despite our repeated requests for access to the evidence, we received less than 40 hours ago... As counsel to the impeachment committee when President Clinton was impeached. And Barbara, just Mr. give Mr. some commentary Chairman, on what we're seeing lost. from uh, these points of orders and other procedural uh, objections from the Republicans on the committee. Well, it's part of the theme to show that this whole process has been unfair. What you saw with Mr. Castor giving the... His overview was he went through all the various investigations pretty much back to when you know, the president was inaugurated and forward. And they're trying to stress that this is an unfair process. So they're going to continue to bring up procedural issues wherever they can. And the chairman has the, um, the gavel, so he will prevail in all of these. But it does drag out the process, and it gives them their opportunity to make those points again. And you just saw both witnesses did just take the oath. They will be representing the Intelligence Committee, the Democrats and Republicans on the Intelligence Committee. For the Democrats, Daniel Gold. 
Goldman. Remember, he did the questioning yellow, during the Intelligence Committee hearings. One minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your time has expired. Mr. Goldman, you may Mr. begin. Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman you have to recognize. Gentlemen will state his point of order. Mr. Chairman, my point of order is this. Um, in the previous point of order issued by Mr. Johnson of Louisiana, you ruled against his point of order because you said that, that Mr. Burke was a witness. You have just told us he was not a witness, but he, he was, was a staffer. <laughs> As such, a staffer must the, avoid the impugning the motivations. And if you're the gentleman, if, will, so the he, gentleman will. Will you let him finish his point of order? Please? Made his point of order. No, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I haven't completed yet. The, the, the rule requires that members and staff not impugn the motivations of the president. What you ruled was that he was a witness. You've just told us he wasn't a witness. My point of order is that you were out of order in your ruling. The uh, point of order is not sustained. I've already ruled on it. He was not a witness. These two gentlemen I appeal the decision of the chair. That is not a rule. Uh, 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 it most certainly it is. It is appealable. Yes, yes, it is. Ms. Lofgren knows it is. The, the ruling is not. The point of order is not sustained. I appeal the decision of the chair. I move to table the. The motion, the appeal of the ruling of the chair is tabled. Uh, the clerk. Get it. Save it for next time. Uh, all in favor of the motion table say aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. nay. No. No. The motion table is approved. I seek a roll call vote. Roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson. Those who appeared in the last hour were actually witnesses uh, before the committee. Kate Shaw, let's talk a little bit about what we saw in Mr. Castor's presentation uh, right there. But really two separate parts to his presentation. The first part basically laying out all of the different times Democrats sought to investigate the president in search of an impeachable offense, and then a point-by-point -point rebuttal of the Democratic case. Yeah, I mean, on the first point, a lot of scattered statements by individual House Democrats suggesting from very early on that they were searching for some reason to impeach the president. So that was like a lot of the testimony. You know, he talked for 15 minutes or something um, about things that were that happened far prior to these proceedings, um, but obviously trying to make the point that this was an impeachment in search of some crime or, or a high crime or misdemeanor. Um, and then on the second, there was this sort of point by point rebuttal um, that the president's motives were pure, that this was about, you know, stamping out corruption, um, getting the country to heal from the divisiveness of the Mueller investigation. That I thought was a somewhat new argument, that that was somehow motivating the president uh, in seeking out this help from President Zelensky. Um, but, but I think that's right. There's you know, and then there's the that this is all unfair process. I would say that's the sort of third argument that this has been uh, too fast, uh, too thin a record, and hasn't given sort of these procedural well, protections I, I to the president. That to Melissa Murray because he did seem to go into a great deal about that you know a struggle between the Congress and the White House over how to testify, whether to testify, when to testify. Is rule it happens all the time. Well, that's true, and it is a back and forth between the political branches, and they usually come out at some subtle compromise, sometimes with judicial intervention. That hasn't been the case here, but it's largely not been the case because the White House has refused to really participate in a meaningfully reasonable way, which has always been the case. They mentioned Fast and Furious. Um, the Obama White House tried to stop it, but eventually capitulated and gave Congress what it needed to continue that investigation. This, he's suggesting, is a new kind of Fast and Furious, going too fast, going too furiously, all with the intent to impeach the president. Let's go back to the room. The ayes have it, and the motion to table is agreed to. Mr. Goldman, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, members of the committee. We are here today because Donald J. Trump, the 45th president of the United States, abused the power of his office, the American presidency, for his political and personal benefit. President Trump directed a months-long campaign to solicit foreign help in his 2020 re-election efforts, withholding official acts from the government of Ukraine in order to coerce and secure political assistance and interference in our domestic affairs. As part of this scheme, President Trump applied increasing pressure on the president of Ukraine to publicly announce two investigations helpful to his personal reelection efforts. He applied this pressure himself and through his agents working within and outside of the U.S. government by conditioning a desperately sought Oval Office meeting 
and $391 million in taxpayer-funded, congressionally appropriated security assistance, vital to Ukraine's ability to fend off Russian aggression. And he conditioned that on the announcement of these two political investigations that were helpful to his personal interests. When the President's efforts were discovered, he released the military aid, though it would ultimately take congressional action for the money to be made fully available to Ukraine. The Oval Office meeting still has not happened. And when faced with the opening of an official impeachment inquiry into his conduct, President Trump launched an unprecedented campaign of obstruction of Congress, ordering executive branch agencies and government officials to defy subpoenas for documents and testimony. To date, the investigating committees have received no documents from the Trump administration pursuant to our subpoenas. Were it not for courageous public servants doing their duty and honoring their oath to this country and coming forward and testifying, the president's scheme might still be concealed today. The central moment in this scheme was a telephone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on July 25th of this year. During that call, President Trump asked President Zelensky for a personal favor to initiate the two investigations that President Trump hoped could ultimately help his reelection in 2020. The first investigation involved former Vice President Joe Biden and was an effort to smear his reputation as he seeks the Democratic nomination in next year's presidential election. The second investigation sought to elevate an entirely debunked conspiracy theory promoted by Russian President Vladimir Putin that Ukraine interfered in the last presidential election to support the Democratic nominee. In truth, as has been made clear by irrefutable evidence from throughout the government, Russia interfered in the last election in order to help then-candidate Trump. The allegations about Vice President Biden and the 2016 election are patently false. But that did not deter President Trump during his phone call with the Ukrainian president, and it does not appear to deter him today. Just two days ago, President Trump stated publicly that he hopes that his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, will report to the Department of Justice and to Congress the results of Mr. Giuliani's efforts in Ukraine last week to pursue these false allegations meant to tarnish Vice President Biden. President Trump's persistent and continuing effort to coerce a foreign country to help him cheat to win an election is a clear and present danger to our free and fair elections and to our national security. The overwhelming evidence of this scheme is described in detail in a nearly 300-page document entitled the Trump Ukraine Impeachment Inquiry Report, formally transmitted from the House Permanent Selecting Committee on Intelligence to this committee a few days ago. The report relies on testimony from numerous current and former government officials, the vast majority of whom are nonpartisan career professionals responsible for keeping our nation safe and promoting American values around the globe. The evidence from these witnesses cannot seriously be disputed. The president placed his personal interests above the nation's interests in order to help his own reelection efforts. Before I highlight the evidence and the findings of this report, I want to take just a moment to introduce myself and discuss today's testimony. I joined the House Intelligence Committee as Senior Advisor and Director of Investigations at the beginning of this year. Previously, I served for 10 years as a prosecutor in the Southern District of New York when I joined the Department of Justice under the George W. Bush administration. The team that I led on the intelligence community includes other former federal prosecutors, a retired FBI agent, and investigators with significant national security expertise. The report that I am presenting today 
is based entirely on the evidence that we collected in coordination with the Oversight and Foreign Affairs Committees that were gathered as part of the impeachment inquiry into President Trump's actions. Nothing more and nothing less. The three investigating committees ran a fair, professional, and thorough investigation. We followed the House rules for depositions and public hearings, including the rule against agency counsel being present for depositions, and members and staff from both parties had equal time to ask questions, and there were no substantive questions that were prevented from being asked and answered. This investigation moved swiftly and intensively, as all good investigations should. To the extent that other witnesses would be able to provide more context and detail about this scheme, their failure to testify is due solely to the fact that President Trump obstructed the inquiry and refused to make them available. Nevertheless, the extensive evidence that the committees uncovered during this investigation led to the following critical findings. First, President Trump used the power of his office to pressure and induce the newly elected president of Ukraine to interfere in the 2020 presidential election for President Trump's personal and political benefit. Second, in order to increase the pressure on Ukraine to announce the politically motivated investigations that President Trump wanted, President Trump withheld a coveted Oval Office meeting and $391 of essential military assistance from Ukraine. Third, President Trump's conduct sought to undermine our free and fair elections and poses an imminent threat to our national security. And fourth, faced with the revelation of his pressure campaign against Ukraine, President Trump directed an unprecedented effort to obstruct Congress's impeachment inquiry into his conduct. And with that context in mind, I would like to turn to the evidence of President Trump's conduct concerning Ukraine. My colleague, Mr. Castor, just said that it re revolves around eight lines in one call record, but that sorely ignores the vast amount of evidence that we collected of a months-long scheme by the, directed by the President. But I do want to start with that July 25th phone call because that is critical evidence of the President's involvement and intent. It was on that day that he held his second phone call with the new Ukrainian president. The first in April was short and cordial, following the Ukrainian president's election success. But this second call would diverge dramatically from what those listening had expected. Now, just prior to this telephone call, President Trump spoke to Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, who had donated $1 million to the President's inaugural campaign, and who had been directed by the President himself to take on a leading role in Ukraine issues. Ambassador Sondland relayed the President's message to President Zelensky through Ambassador Kurt Volker, who had had lunch that day with President Zelensky's top aide, Andrei Yermak, who appears, throughoutly, appears uh, repeatedly through this scheme as President Zelensky's right-hand man. Ambassador Volker texted Mr. Yermak with President Trump's direction. Good lunch, thanks. Heard from White House. Assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down visit for, uh, we will nail down for a visit to Washington. Good luck, see you tomorrow, Kurt. So even before the phone call with President Zelensky took place, President Trump had directed that Ukraine initiate the investigation into 2016, the debunked conspiracy theory that Ukraine had interfered in the election, in order for President Zelensky to get the White House visit that he desperately coveted. Ambassador Sondland was clear in his testimony about this quid pro quo. Frequently, Frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. 
Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. During this call with the Ukrainian leader, President Trump did not discuss matters of importance to the United States, such as Ukraine's efforts to root out corruption. Instead, President Trump veered quickly into the personal favor that he wanted President Zelensky to do two investigations that would help President Trump's re-election effort. Witnesses who listened to the call described it as unusual, improper, inappropriate, and concerning. Two of them immediately reported their concerns to White House lawyers. Now let me just take a few minutes walking through that important call step by step, because it is evidence that is central to the President's scheme. Near the beginning of the call, President Zelensky said, I would also like to thank you for your great support in the area of defense. We are ready to continue to cooperate for the next steps. Specifically, we are almost ready to buy more javelins from the United States for defense purposes. The great support in the area of defense included the nearly $400 million of U.S. military assistance to Ukraine which one witness testified was nearly 10% of Ukraine's defense budget. And this support comes as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014, when Russia illegally annexed nearly 7% of Ukraine's territory. Since then, the United States and our allies have provided support for Ukraine, an emerging post-Soviet democracy, to fend off Russia in the East. Yet just a few weeks before this July 25th call, President Trump had inexplicably placed a hold on military assistance to Ukraine without providing any reason to his own cabinet members or national security officials. The evidence the committees collected showed that there was unanimous support for the aid from every relevant agency in the Trump administration. Nevertheless, during the call, President Trump complained that U.S. support for Ukraine was not reciprocal, that somehow Ukraine needed to give more to the United States. What did he mean? Well, it became clear, because immediately after President Zelensky brought up U.S. military support and purchasing Javelin anti-tank weapons, President Trump responded, I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. Now, the favor that he referenced there included two demands that had nothing to do with official U.S. policy or foreign policy. First, President, President Trump said, I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say crowd strike. As you saw yesterday, excuse me, I guess you have uh, one of your wealthy people, it says. The server, they say Ukraine has it. There are a lot of things that went on, the whole situation. I think you're surrounding yourself with some of the same people. And he went on later, I would like to have the Attorney General call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. As you saw yesterday, that whole nonsense ended with a very poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller, an incompetent performance. But they say a lot of it started with Ukraine. Whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's possible. Here again, President Trump was referring to the baseless conspiracy theory that the Ukrainian government, not Russia, was behind the hack of the Democratic National Committee in 2016. Not a single witness in our investigation testified that there was any factual support for this allegation. To the contrary, a unanimous assessment of the U.S. intelligence community found that Russia alone interfered in the 2016 U.S. election. And Special Counsel Mueller, who indicted 12 Russians for this conspiracy, testified before Congress that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Dr. Fiona Hill, an expert on Russia and President Putin, who served on the National Security Council until July, testified that the president was told by his own former senior advisors including his Homeland Security Advisor and his former National Security Advisor, that the alternative theory that Ukraine had interfered in the election was false. And although no one in the U.S. government knew of any factual support for this theory, 
it did have one significant supporter, Russian President Vladimir Putin. In February of 2017, President Putin said, second, as we all know, during the presidential campaign in the United States, the Ukrainian government adopted a unilateral position in favor of one candidate. More than that, certain oligarchs, certainly with the approval of the political leadership, funded this candidate, or female candidate to be more precise. And if there was ever, ever any doubt about who benefits from this unfounded theory put forward by President Trump and his associates, President Putin made it clear very recently when he said, thank God no one is accusing us anymore of interfering in US elections. Now they're accusing Ukraine. In the face of clear evidence, not only from intelligence community experts, but from his own national security team, that Russia, not Ukraine, interfered in the 2016 election for the benefit of Donald Trump, President Trump still pressed the Ukrainian government to announce an investigation into this conspiracy theory. And why? Because it would help his own political standing. President Trump even sought to withhold an Oval Office meeting from the president of Ukraine until he fell in line with President Putin's lies, the leader who had actually invaded Ukraine. The second demand that President Trump made of President Zelensky during the July 25th call was to investigate the front runner for the Democratic nomination for president in 2020, former Vice President Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. President Trump stated, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. Witnesses unanimously testified that there was no factual support for this claim. Rather, they noted that Vice President Biden was acting in support of an international consensus and official U.S. policy to clean up the Prosecutor General's office in Ukraine. Despite these facts, by the time of the July 25th call, Mr. Giuliani had been publicly advocating for these two investigations for months, while also using back channels to press Ukrainian officials to initiate them in support of his client, Donald Trump. Ambassador Sondland understood Mr. Giuliani's role very clearly. He testified, Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. To others, Mr. Giuliani was working at cross purposes with official policy channels toward Ukraine, even as he was working on behalf of President Trump. According to former National Security Advisor, Ambassador John Bolton, Mr. Giuliani was a, quote, hand grenade who's going to blow everybody up, unquote. Near the end of the July 25th call, President Zelensky circled back to the pre-cooked message that Ambassador Volker had relayed to President Zelensky's top aide before the call. President Zelensky said, I also wanted to thank you for your invitation to visit the United States, specifically Washington, D.C. On the other hand, I also wanted to ensure you that we will be very serious about the case and we will work on the investigation. In other words, on one hand is the White House visit, while on the other hand, he agreed to pursue the investigations. This statement shows that President Zelensky fully understood at the time of the July 25th call, the quid pro quo between these investigations and the White House meeting that President Trump required and that Ambassador Sondland had testified so clearly about. Numerous witnesses testified about the importance of a White House meeting with the President of the United States, specifically a meeting in the Oval Office, an official act by President Trump. As David Holmes, senior official in the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine said, it is important to understand that a White House visit was critical to President Zelensky. President Zelensky needed to show U.S. support at the highest levels in order to demonstrate to Russian President Vladimir Putin that he had U.S. backing, as well as to advance his ambitious anti-corruption reform agenda at home. In other words, 
the White House visit would help Zelensky's anti-corruption reforms. And that support remains critical as President Zelensky meets today with President Putin to try to resolve the conflict in the East. Now, the day after this phone call, President Trump sought to ensure that President Zelensky got the message. On July 26, U.S. officials met with President Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials in Kyiv. And President Zelensky mentioned that President Trump had brought up some, quote, very sensitive issues, unquote. After that meeting, Ambassador Sondland had a private one-on-one -on -one meeting with Andrei Yermak, President Zelensky's top aide, during which Ambassador Sondland said that they probably discussed the issue of investigations. At lunch right after that with Mr. Holmes and two other State Department officers, Ambassador Sondland pulled out his cell phone and called President Trump. Somewhat shocked, Mr. Holmes recounted the conversation that followed. I heard Ambassador Sondland greet the President and explain he was calling from Kyiv. I heard President Trump then clarify that Ambassador Sondland was in Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland replied, yes, he was in Ukraine, and went on to state that President Zelensky, quote, loves your ass, unquote. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation? Ambassador Sondland, Sondland replied that he is going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to do. After the call, Ambassador Sondland told Mr. Holmes that President Trump did not give a bleep about Ukraine and only cares about the big stuff that benefits the president himself, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. To repeat, and this is very important, Ambassador Sondland spoke to President Trump before the July 25th call with President Zelensky and relayed to Ukrainian officials President Trump's requirement of political investigations in exchange for a White House meeting. And during that call, President Trump asked for the favor of these two, of these two political investigations immediately after the Ukrainian president brought up U.S. military support for Ukraine, which President Trump had recently suspended or put on hold. And at the end of the call, President Zelensky made a point of acknowledging the link between the investigations that President Trump requested and the White House meeting that President Zelensky desperately wanted. And then the following day, Ambassador Sondland confirmed to President Trump on the telephone in person that the Ukrainians would indeed initiate the investigations discussed on the call, which, were the only, which was the only thing about Ukraine that President Trump cared about. Now, it's very important to understand that this investigation revealed that the July 25th call was neither the start nor the end of President Trump's efforts to use the powers of his office for personal political gain. And you have to look at all of the evidence in context as a whole. Prior to the call, the President had removed the former Ambassador Marie Ivanovich to clear the way for his three hand-picked agents to spearhead his corrupt agenda in Ukraine. Secretary Perry, Ambassador Sondland, and Ambassador Volker, all of whom attended President Zelensky's inauguration on May 20th. All political appointees, they proved to be more than willing to engage in what Dr. Hill later described as an improper domestic political errand for the president. On April 21st, President Zelensky won the Ukrainian election with 73% of the vote. And he had two primary platforms, to resolve the war in the East with Russia and to root out corruption. That same day, President Trump called to congratulate him on his win. Even though the White House press release following the call stated that President Trump expressed his shared commitment to, quote, root out corruption, unquote, President Trump, in fact, did not mention corruption at all on this call, just like he did not mention corruption on the July 25th call. Shortly after this call, President Trump asked Vice President Mike Pence to attend President Zelensky's inauguration. But on May 13th, President Trump did an about-face and directed Vice President Pence not to attend. An advisor to Vice President Pence testified that the inauguration had not yet been scheduled, and therefore the reason for the abrupt change of plans was not related to any scheduling issues. 
So what had happened in the three weeks between April 21st and May 13th, when Vice President Pence was originally invited and then disinvited or, uh, or removed from the delegation? A few things. First, on April 21st, 25th, Vice President Biden formally announced his bid for the Democratic nomination for president. Then, about a week later on May 3rd, President Trump spoke with President Putin on the telephone. One senior State Department official testified that the conversation between President Trump and President Putin included a discussion of Ukraine. Third, on May 9th, Mr. Giuliani told the New York Times that he intended to travel to Ukraine on behalf of his client, President Trump, in order to, quote, meddle in an investigation, unquote. But after public backlash and apparent pushback from the Ukrainians, Mr. Giuliani canceled his trip the next day, claiming that President Zelensky was surrounded by enemies of President Trump. At a critical May 23rd meeting in the Oval Office, President Trump said that Ukraine was corrupt and tried to take him down in 2016. The same false narrative pushed by President Putin and Mr. Giuliani. And in order for the White House meeting to occur, President Trump told the delegation that they must talk to Rudy to get the visit scheduled. These comments from President Trump were the first of many subsequent indications that in his mind, corruption equals investigations. In the weeks and months following, Mr. Giuliani relayed to both Ukrainian officials and the government officials that President Trump had designated at the May 23rd meeting to take, to take a lead on Ukraine policy, the directive from President Trump that a White House meeting would not occur until Ukraine announced the two political investigations that President Trump required. And well before the July 25th call, Ambassador Sondland and Volkert also relayed this quid pro quo to the Ukrainians, including to President Zelensky himself. Ambassador Volker conveyed the message directly to President Zelensky at the beginning of July, urging him to reference investigations associate, associated with the Giuliani factor with President Trump. And in meetings at the White House on July 10th, Ambassador Sondland told other U.S. officials and two of President Zelensky's advisors, including Mr. Yermak, that he had an agreement with Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney that the White House visit would be scheduled if Ukraine announced the investigations. One witness testified that during the second of the meetings, Ambassador Sondland began to review what the deliverable would be in order to get the meeting, referring to an investigation of the Bidens. The witness told the committee that the request was explicit, there was no ambiguity. And then Ambassador Sondland also mentioned Burisma, a major Ukrainian energy company that Hunter Biden sat on the board of. To the witnesses that testified before the committee, the references to Burisma was shorthand for an investigation into the Bidens. Ambassador Bolton, as well as his staff members, objected to this meeting for investigations trade and Ambassador Bolton told Dr. Hill, you go and tell Eisenberg, John Eisenberg, the legal advisor for the National Security Council, that I am not part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this. And you go ahead and tell him what you've heard and what I've said. Yet this was not a rogue operation by Mr. Giuliani and Ambassador Sondland and Volcker. As Ambassador Sondland testified, Everyone was in the loop, including Mr. Mulvaney, Secretary Pompeo, Secretary Perry, and their top advisors. On July 19th, Ambassador Sondland emailed Mr. Mulvaney, Secretary Perry, Secretary Pompeo, and others after speaking with President Zelensky. The subject was, I talked to Zelensky just now. And Ambassador Sondland wrote, he is prepared to receive POTUS's call, POTUS is the President of the United States, will assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and will, quote, turn over every stone, unquote. Both Secretary Perry and Chief of Staff Mulvaney quickly responded to the email, noting that given that conversation, a date would soon be set to schedule the White House telephone call. The evidence also unambiguously shows that the Ukrainians understood 
this quid pro quo and had serious reservations, particularly because President Zelensky had won the election on an anti-corruption platform. In fact, a few days before the July 25th call, Ambassador William Taylor, the acting U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine and the former permanent ambassador to Ukraine, texted Ambassador Sondland and Volker, or rather he, he stated in his testimony, on July 20th, I had a phone conversation with Mr. Daniliuk, during which he conveyed to me that President Zelensky did not want to be used as a pawn in a U.S. re-election campaign. But President Trump's pressure campaign on President Zelensky did not relent. And just four days later, President Zelensky received that message via Kurt Volker that he needed to convince President Trump that he would do the investigations in order to get that White House meeting. And as I have described, President Zelensky tried to do exactly that on the July 25th call with President Trump. In the weeks following the July 25th call, President Zelensky heeded President Trump's request, sending his top aide, Mr. Yermak, to Madrid to meet with Mr. Giuliani. In coordination with Mr. Giuliani President and the President Trump's hand-picked representatives, they continued a, this pressure campaign to secure a public announcement of the investigations. Now, according to Ambassador Sondland, and this is very important, President Trump did not require that Ukraine actually conduct the investigations as a prerequisite for the White House meeting. Instead, the Ukrainian government needed only to publicly announce the investigations. It is clear that the goal was not the investigations themselves or not any corruption that those investigations might have entailed, but the political benefit that President Trump would enjoy from an announcement of investigations into his 2020 political rival and against a unanimous assessment that showed that he received foreign support in the 2016 election. And for that, for that reason, the facts didn't actually matter to President Trump because he only cared about the personal and political benefit from the announcement of the investigation. Over the next couple of weeks, Ambassador Sondland and Volker worked with President Trump's aide, Mr. Yermak, to draft a statement for President Zelensky to issue. When the aide proposed a statement that did not include specific references to the investigations that President Trump wanted, the Burisma and Biden investigation and the 2016 election investigation, Mr. Giuliani relayed that that would not be good enough to get a White House meeting. And here you can see a comparison on the left of the original statement drafted by Mr. Yermak, the top aide to President Zelensky, and on the right, a revised statement with Mr. Giuliani's requirements. And on, it says, we intend to initiate and complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes. And here's the critical difference, including those involving Burisma and the 2016 U.S. elections, which in turn will prevent the recurrence of this problem in the future. The only difference in the statement that Giuliani required and the statement that the Ukrainians had drafted was this reference to the two investigations that President Trump wanted and told President Zelensky about on the July 25th call. Now, ultimately, President Zelensky's administration temporarily shelved this announcement, though efforts to press Ukraine would remain ongoing. By mid-August, Ukraine did not make a public announcement of the investigations that President Trump required, and as a result, no White House meeting was scheduled. But by this time, the President was pushing on another pressure point to coerce Ukraine to announce the investigations the hold on the vital military assistance that the president had put in place for more than a month, still without any explanation to any of the policy experts. Our investigation revealed that a number of Ukrainian officials had made quiet inquiries to various U.S. officials about the aid as early as July 25th, the day of the phone call. Inquiries by Ukrainian officials continued in the weeks and that followed until the hold was revealed at the end of August. But this is important. It was important for the Ukrainian officials to keep it quiet, because if it became public, then Russia would know that the U.S. support for Ukraine might be on ice. So by the end of that month, the evidence revealed several facts. One, the president demanded that Ukraine publicly announce two politically motivated investigations to benefit his reelection. 
Two, a coveted White House meeting was expressly conditioned on Ukraine announcing those investigations. Three, President Trump had placed a hold on vital military assistance to Ukraine without any explanation and notwithstanding the uniform support for that assistance from the relevant federal agencies and Congress. Ambassador Taylor testified that this quid pro quo between the investigations President Trump wanted and the security assistance that President Trump needed was crazy. And he told Ambassador Sondland, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for the help with a political campaign. Now, in an effort to move the White House meeting and the military aid along, Ambassador Sondland wrote an email to Secretary Pompeo on August 22nd. He wrote, Mike, should we block time in Warsaw for a short pull aside for POTUS to meet Zelensky? I would ask Zelensky to look him in the eye and tell him that once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place, parentheses mid-September, Z, President Zelensky, should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to POTUS and to the U.S. Hopefully, that will break the logjam. Ambassador Sondland testified that this was a reference to the political investigations that President Trump discussed on the July 25th call, which Secretary Pompeo ultimately admitted to that he listened to in real time. Ambassador Sondland hoped that this would help lift the logjam, which he meant the hold on critical security assistance to Ukraine and the White House meeting. And what was Secretary Pompeo's response three minutes later? Yes. After the hold on military assistance became public on August 28th, senior Ukrainian officials expressed grave concern. Deeply worried, of course, about the practical impact on their efforts to fight Russian aggression, but also, and this goes back to why it remained confidential, also about the public message that it sent to the Russian government. On September 1st, at a pre-briefing with Vice President Pence before he met with President Zelensky, Ambassador Sondland raised the issue of the hold on security assistance. He said, I mentioned to Vice President Pence before the meetings with the Ukrainians that I had concerns of that the delay in aid had become tied to the issue of investigations. Vice President Pence simply nodded in response, expressing neither surprise nor dismay at the linkage between the two. And following Vice President Pence's meeting with President Zelensky, Ambassador Sondland went over to Mr. Yermak again, President Zelensky's top aide, and pulled him aside to explain that the hold on security assistance was also now conditioned on the public announcement of the Burisma Biden and the 2016 election interference investigations. Ambassador Sondland then explained to Ambassador Taylor that he had previously made a mistake in telling Ukrainian officials that only the White House meeting was conditioned on a public announcement of the political investigations beneficial to President Trump. In truth, everything the White House meeting and the vital security assistance to Ukraine was now conditioned on the public announcement. President Trump wanted President Zelensky in a public box. A private commitment was not good enough. Nearly one week later, on September 7th, the hold remained, and President Trump and Ambassador Sondland spoke on the phone. The President immediately told Ambassador Sondland that there was no quid pro quo, but and this is very important, President Zelensky would still be required to announce the investigations in order for the hold on security assistance to be lifted, and he should want to do it. In effect, this is the equivalent of saying there is no quid pro quo, no this for that, before then demanding precisely that quid pro quo. And immediately after this phone call with President Trump, this was the precise message that Ambassador Sondland passed directly to President Zelensky. According to Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Sondland also said that he had talked to President Zelensky and Mr. Yermak and had told them that although this was not a quid pro quo, if President Zelensky had did not clear things up in public, we would be at a stalemate. And I understood a stalemate to mean that Ukraine would not receive the much needed military assistance. 
Needing the military assistance and hoping for the White House meeting, President Zelensky finally relented to President Trump's pressure campaign, and arrangements were soon made for the Ukrainian president to make a statement during an interview on CNN where he would make a public announcement of the two investigations that President Trump wanted. In order for President Zelensky to secure the White House meeting and for Ukraine to get that much needed military assistance. And although there is no doubt that President Trump had ordered the military aid held up until the Ukrainians committed to the investigations, on October 17th, Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney confirmed in public that there was such a quid pro quo. Let's watch what he said. Oh, um, and that was, those were the driving factors. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely. No question about that. Um, but that's it. And that's why we held up the money. Now, there was a report. So, so, so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was on to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is absolutely appropriate. There you have it. By early September, the president's scheme was unraveling. On September 9th, the Intelligence Oversight and Foreign Affairs Committees announced an investigation into President Trump and Mr. Giuliani's efforts in Ukraine. And later that same day, the Intelligence Committee learned that a whistleblower had filed a complaint nearly a month earlier related to some unknown issue, but which the president and the White House knew was related to Ukraine and had been circulating among them for some time. And then two days later, on September 11th, in the face of growing public and congressional scrutiny, President Trump lifted the hold on security assistance to Ukraine. As with the implementation of the hold, no reason was provided. Put simply, President Trump got caught, so he released the aid. But even since this investigation began, the president has demonstrated no contrition or acknowledgement that his demand for a foreign country to interfere in our election is wrong. In fact, he has repeatedly called on Ukraine to investigate Vice President Biden, his rival. These and other actions by the president and his associates demonstrate that his determination to solicit foreign interference in our election continues today. It did not end with Russia's support for Trump in 2016, which President Trump invited by asking for his opponent to be hacked by Russia, and it did not end when his Ukrainian scheme was exposed in September of this year. President Trump also engaged, once this investigation began, in an unprecedented effort to obstruct the inquiry. And I look forward to answering your questions about that unprecedented obstruction. But in conclusion, I want to say that the Intelligence Committee has produced to you a nearly 300-page report. And I am grateful that you have offered me the opportunity today to walk you through some of the evidence underlying it. Admittedly, it is a lot to digest. But let me just say this. The president's scheme is actually quite simple, and the facts are not seriously in dispute. It can be boiled down to four key takeaways. First, that President Trump directed a scheme to pressure Ukraine into opening two investigations that would benefit his 2020 re-election campaign and not the U.S. national interest. Second, President Trump used his official office and the official tools of U.S. foreign policy the withholding of an Oval Office meeting and $391 million in security assistance to pressure Ukraine into meeting his demands. Third, everyone was in the loop, his chief of staff, the secretary of state, and vice president. And fourth, despite the public discovery of this scheme, which prompted the president to release the aid, he has not given up. He and his agents continue to solicit Ukrainian interference in our election, causing an imminent threat to our elections and our national security. Members of the committee, President Trump's regular order, Mr. Words, Chairman. Gentlemen, time has elapsed. Point of order. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Deitch. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. General State is motion. I move the committee shall be in recess, subject to the call of the chair. Uh, I move to motion. table. Move to the motion. Move to table the motion. This is a privileged motion. It is not debatable. All those in favor of the committee recess. I seek a recorded vote. The chair will say aye. 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 Opposed nay. No. no. The ayes have it. The, most, the committee roll call. The clerk will call the roll.
Okay, what you're having there is they're actually voting on whether or not to actually take a recess. It's the first time this has happened during this series of hearings in the Intelligence Committee and the Hatch Judiciary Committee, but it's a sign of what we've been going through uh, today. Mary Bruce up there on Capitol Hill. Uh, we've now gotten through the major presentations from the Democrats. Daniel Golden there echoing what we heard from Chairman Nadler saying that the president abused his office for political and personal benefit. And you've been seeing him go really systematically through all of their evidence, also playing some clear clips from the president and other witnesses uh, in making this argument, trying to outline why they feel that the president abused his office for his own political gain by pressuring Ukraine to launch these investigations into the president's rivals, they say, to get an advantage in the 2020 election. On the flip side, we are likely to continue to hear from Republicans who say that, 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 that those aren't facts. They say that's simply hearsay from much of this witness testimony. And we have heard a lot from Republicans about the process. They are saying that this is going too quickly that it's too rushed. Of course, Democrats say, well, part of the reason that they're moving so fast is, one, because a lot of the witnesses they want to talk to, the White House won't let them talk with. And number two is that they say that because the president is inviting, uh, Democrats argue, foreign interference in our election, that there is a real clear and present danger here and that they need to move quickly with this process. And, George, we know that they are moving very quickly here. We could see articles of impeachment and a vote on them before the end of the week. That sets up uh, the possibility that the House could impeach the president before Christmas. And, and John Carl, Chief White House Correspondent John Carl, you made a, a, a little bit of an appearance there in the presentation by Daniel Goldman. Uh, that question you had of Mick Mulvaney on whether or not the conditioning of the military aid was in part because of these investigations. In general, the evidence presented for withholding the White House meeting for the investigations is more extensive than it is for withholding the military aid. But that direct question of Mick Mulvaney is something the White House has really tried to walk away from. Yeah, and, and I've, you know, I, that, that was an incredible moment in the White House briefing room because I asked him directly the question, which I think is at the center of all of this, which is why was the aid withheld? And he, he was explicit in saying that there were uh, three reasons and that one of those reasons was the president's desire to see the investigation, the investigation into the 2016 uh, uh, elections, not the investigation into Biden, but, but one of those two investigations into Democrats was part of the reason the president directly directed him, and Mulvaney was the person uh, that was directed by the president to hold, uh, to withhold that aid, uh, included uh, the demand for that investigation. So um, th th that was a moment, of course, uh, uh, Mulvaney himself, about six hours after that uh, exchange, uh, denied, uh, effectively denied he said what he said in front of the cameras, but it was a, a pretty explicit statement. And, of course, now he's not appearing under, under oath. Uh, David Muir, one of the key things that we see at issue when we see both the Republican and the Democratic presentations so far was the president actually pursuing an anti-corruption agenda in Ukraine or simply investigating his opponents? An extraordinarily stark contrast today. And the Republicans have been so criticized for uh, pointing to the process, arguing about the timeline, saying we haven't had our own witnesses, even though we know the White House has blocked many of the wit those witnesses. But what we heard from Stephen Castor this morning, uh, he went right to the phone call. This was fairly rare uh, for the argument in defense of the president, but he said... When it comes to that July 25th phone call, it reflects no conditionality or pressure. President Zelensky never vocalized any discomfort. President Trump was not asking for a favor that would help with the reelection. He was asking for assistance in helping our country move forward from the divisiveness of the Russia collusion investigation. And then we heard Daniel Goldman there just moments ago. And you almost want to put this paragraph right next to that one. He said, during the call with uh, the Ukrainian leader, President Trump did not discuss matters of importance to the United States, such as Ukraine's efforts to root out corruption. He quickly veered into the personal favor he wanted from Zelensky two investigations that would help his reelection. And of course, he talked about the witnesses that we heard in recent weeks who described it as unusual, improper, inappropriate, uh, and concerning, but two very different realities. And, and Dan Abramson, you made this point when we were off the air. President, President Trump had two phone calls where President Zelensky never mentioned the word corruption. And as you've pointed out, not a single fact witness yet has been able to, uh, to document the president seeking an anti-corruption or, or even that they believe that the reason that the aid or the White House meeting was held up was because the president had broader concerns about corruption in Ukraine. And remember, not all of these witnesses are called by Democrats. Uh, Morrison uh, was called uh, by the Republicans. You had three witnesses, actually, who were called by the Republicans. You had Jonathan Turley who was called by the Republicans. You don't have a single one who's saying that was the motivation here, was this broader concern about corruption. Uh, so I think you have to look at that very skeptically when Republicans are saying, 
well, you know, this was just, that's the argument they're making, but there's no evidence, there's no witnesses to back it up. And, and on the flip side of that, I would say, when Democrats overstate their case and they say there is a constitutional duty to impeach, you have to be careful about that as well because there is no such thing as a constitutional duty to impeach. They believe it's their duty, it's their opinion it's their duty, but even if you think that there was wrongdoing, that this wasn't about broader corruption in Ukraine, this was about a personal favor, the question still remains what's the remedy? What should happen? Should the punishment be removal from office? Well, and the, and the other the other thing that's at issue, Ms. Murray, let me bring this to you. As you saw Chairman Nadler do it in his, in his opening statement, it's what do the oaths of office for the president and members of Congress require? So I actually would push back on Dan. I mean, it's true the Constitution does not prescribe a duty to impeach, but each of those members of Congress, the senators, all of those officers take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And if the Constitution means anything, it certainly means upholding the machinery and apparatus of democratic government, including the election process. But that's, but that's an opinion and analysis of what their duty should be, right? Of how they should interpret their own duty. But There's that's no, the whole Constitution but the is constitution, an interpretation. Right, but the Constitution, the constitution specific, specific. That's why when you say constitutional duty, it's a nonsensical statement, because it doesn't mean anything. Because there is no such thing as a constitutional duty to do anything. There's an interpretation of what they view as their role here. And I think the Democrats have to be very careful. They have to be saying, look, we think this is bad enough. We think this is so terrible that the framers would have said this is exactly uh, what they envisioned, et cetera. But there just is no such thing as a constitutional duty to impeach. Well, to be clear, that is what they're saying. Like every Democratic witness thus far, especially the law professors last week, were saying this is so grave that it warrants impeachment. Like there could not be Correct. a more Their opinion example. is that it reaches that level. And I'm I mean, saying that's all constitutional interpretation. <laughs> yes. Right. But, I'm, but therefore, there's no constitutional duty. There's no such thing because the Constitution is about interpretation. When we refer to duty, I think of it as like there's a statute that says if you do this, this is the punishment, et cetera. There's no such thing here. It's all about analysis and interpretation. Well, I think one thing we do know is the Constitution prescribes at least some apparatus by which we participate as citizens in the electoral process. And at the very least, what the Constitution must stand for is upholding that machinery. And then that gets to the question of whether or not the president has the right under the Constitution to completely ignore a constitutional process, a process outlined in the Constitution impeachment. I was struck, Kate, by in both Democratic presentations this morning, there actually was no mention of the Mueller report. They do seem to be honing in on a tailored approach. I think that's right. We said at the outset we would be looking for clues about how broad or how narrow they were likely to be in the drafting of the articles. It looked to me as though most likely they're going to go narrow. Not like one phone call narrow, but the, basically the scheme to induce this assistance from Ukraine in exchange for military assistance, White House meeting, White House phone call. Um, and that the 2016 Russian interference and the Trump campaign's welcoming of that, even if there's no provable conspiracy, will, I think, form the backdrop. But it seems to me as though it's unlikely to constitute a separate article of impeachment, that 2016 and obstruction of Mueller is likely not going to be a standalone article at this point. But say. one thing, Cecilia Vega, the Democrats did seem to be going beyond the scope of the phone call and some of the, wit the testimony from the witnesses. You saw those clips of President Trump calling on China uh, to investigate uh, the Bidens. A lot of focus on the, mayor's, uh, on the president's personal lawyer, Mayor, former Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who they pointed out in the testimony today, was actually in Ukraine again last week trying to drum up investigations into the Bidens. Which uh, ended up upsetting many of the president's own allies who called this just sort of theatrical and farcical that he would have the audacity to go to Ukraine in the middle of this uh, this impeachment inquiry, which is his, his relationship with Ukraine is at the very heart of it. And the president uh, basically said that he is one of the greatest crime fighters in the last 50 years, uh, still sticking to his, his attorney's defense. Um, but it is, you mentioned the president's, uh, his own words, and I expect at some point we will very much may hear him, his comments to you in the Oval Office during that interview when he said that he would be willing to accept foreign uh, aid information if a foreign government offered it in advance of another election. It is stark to hear the president's own words being played out and seeing those scenes of the past couple of years with the president when, in fact, they've refused to, to participate in this. And so they're relying on this historical well, record there rather than have anybody from the White House there in that room. But let me bring that back to Dan as well, because it also shows at some level how we're all frogs in a, in a, in a pot of water that the temperature keeps rising. When the president said he might be willing to accept 
information. There was rightfully outrage from Democrats and Republicans alike on Capitol Hill. Now we're talking about the president not accepting, but asking for this information, Republicans in lockstep behind him. Right, and I think that's one of the most important things to note, is that you hear sometimes Republicans say, what's the matter with the president asking Ukraine to assist in an investigation? The problem is there was no investigation. I mean, what the president was doing was he was asking them to open an investigation. He was asking them to announce an investigation. Um, and that's very different than saying, for example, the attorney general, uh, Barr, reaching out to the prosecutor general of Ukraine and saying, look, we have an ongoing investigation. We are seeking your cooperation. That's very different uh, than what you have here. And Mary Bruce, one of the other things you're hearing uh, this morning is that uh, Democrats reminding Repub that Republicans were actually in charge of Congress, actually had majority of control of Congress when the activities of Hunter Biden were publicized back in 2015, yet they chose not to investigate it at all. And I understand you've now heard from uh, the ranking Republican, uh, Mr. Collins, as he's come out during the recess. Yeah, Democrats are speaking here behind me. Congressman Collins came out just before and spoke with all of us. He continues to insist that they're not learning anything new here today. He joked to all of us that he was coming out to wake everybody up. And he's continuing to hammer at this fact that, that Chairman Schiff isn't here speaking out directly. Chairman Schiff isn't required to come and present uh, the evidence that his committee gathered. And yet that has become a talking point for Republicans here on the Hill and also for the president. Because let's be honest, they want to take a stab at Chairman Schiff. They want to have a chance to really push him on this investigation investigation that he has been running. And interestingly, uh, uh, Collins continued to, to talk about the pace of this investigation. Remember, Republicans are arguing that this is going too quickly, that they need to slow down. Well, that's not what the president has been saying. The president has been saying that they need to just move quickly here in the House, get this over with, because he is already looking ahead to a trial in the Republican-controlled Senate, where he feels he will be given more favorable treatment. And I asked Congressman Collins about this sort of uh, difference here. What is it? Do they want to go quickly? Quickly, or do they want to go slowly? And Republicans continue to insist that the president isn't being treated fairly here, even though, of course, he is refusing to send any counsel here or any representation to this hearing here today. They say that the House Judiciary is simply a rubber stamp and it isn't fair because the president wasn't invited to participate in the evidence gathering portion of this in the House Intelligence Committee. And George. let me take that to Barbara Comstock. Barbara Comstock, the, the president is looking ahead to that Senate trial, and we would expect to have much more White House involvement uh, in that process. They clearly have said they want to be able to uh, call witnesses as well, but that's going to mean holding 51 Republican votes on every motion. Well, yes, and what they often forget at the White House is that the Democrat House managers are going to be able to call witnesses also. So there may be, at that point, an opportunity for them to call somebody like Mick Mulvaney or John Bolton, and then you'd have to get the vote of 51 uh, people, which would mean four Republicans, which may not be that difficult to get. So I know the president and the White House is, is focused on their defense, but the House managers first get to present. And so those rules all have to be decided upon by the, the Senate, Democrats, and Republicans together. During the Clinton impeachment, they agreed on those rules pretty much unanimously, and that hasn't been hammered out yet. Yeah, and John Cole, let me bring that to you. How confident is the White House that they actually have? I mean, they're, they're, they're quite confident right now that there aren't 67 votes to convict President Trump on any articles of impeachment, but how, how confident are they that they can hold a majority of senators on all these motions on every article? Well, if you look at what the president himself has had to say about this, it, it, it seems as if he uh, is making the assumption that because Republicans control the Senate, the Republicans will control this process. He's talked about how uh, the trial will be a fair one, therefore he'd be willing to have his, uh, his advisors testify. Uh, but a as you well know, George, the Senate doesn't operate the way the House does. The Democrats are very much in charge of what happens procedurally in terms of this House hearing. When it goes to the Senate, as Barbara pointed out, this really becomes more a question of consensus. Uh, that you, you know, and, and in terms of holding those votes, uh, talking to uh, some of the president's advisors, there is an awareness uh, that they don't have the votes, for instance, to get a motion to dismiss. I mean, one, one of the earlier strategies they talked about was, let's get to the Senate and let's have a trial that lasts, you know, all of, uh, all of one day, simply introducing a motion to dismiss, get 51 Republicans to support that, and, and, and we're done. Well, there isn't that support, because you do Before have... Before you move uh, on on that, because I, I, I agree with that, I was wondering, though, do they, is there, has there been any talk of 
a kind of um, compromise strategy inside the Republican Party. They, don't, they know they don't have votes for an immediate motion to dismiss. Do they think they might be able to go for a week, go for a week or 10 days, and then get the 51 votes to dismiss? What they hoped is to, to see a, a brief trial. They haven't, they haven't uh, set on a specific period of time. I've seen the idea of two weeks floated. I've run it by the people very much running the strategy for the White House on this. They say there's no uh, consensus that that will work. But that is the that is the the hope here is that they can come to some kind of an agreement that that, that sets the parameters uh, for the hearing. There is look there there is interest here, George, on both the part of the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership in the Senate of not seeing this trial go too long. So the assumption is there will be some period of time likely in the range of two weeks they would be agreed to and then they would be able to move uh, to either a, a a final vote on convict or not convict or a motion to dismiss. And a final question on, on, the, on the witnesses. We've heard the president many times say maybe he even wants to testify on this. Rudy Giuliani has said he wants to testify. Uh, is there any realistic prospect though that we're actually going to see the president saying to Republicans yes you can vote to call these witnesses? Uh, well, the president has said that, uh, but in terms of any realistic uh, chance that would happen, I would just call your attention to what happened during the Mueller report where the president said not once, not twice, but over a dozen times over the course of a year that he himself would be willing to testify under oath to the special counsel and it never happened. So I, I, I would take the statements on this very much with a grain of salt, uh, but they are statements from the president that he would like to see his own top people testify, and he's named some of them. He's named Mick Mul he's, he's named uh, a Rick Perry as somebody he'd like to see testify. Mick Mulvaney is somebody he'd like to see testify. Uh, whether or not it actually comes to that, I, I, I would be I would be highly skeptical. And as, as for the president himself testifying, that would be an incredible moment in the chamber of the uh, of the United States Senate. Uh, but, but again, he never took that opportunity when it came to the special counsel. Yeah, don't don't hold your breath on that, Barbara Comstock. I'm told you were shaking your head when I asked that question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to see the president testify. And I think, actually, if Chuck Schumer wanted to play a little, he might say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll get the whistleblower or the Bidens if you give us, you know, Bolton and, and Mulvaney and, um, you know, others that haven't testified. I think that would probably shorten the trial and they would just move along. Yeah, Biden's made it pretty clear he doesn't want to testify. Kate, so this, as we talk about the trial, let's talk a little bit about the role of the Chief Justice. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, he will go in and preside at that trial, more or less in that role as the President of the Senate. Right, so there's very little in the Constitution about the Senate trial, but the one thing that is clear is the Chief Justice has to preside. So that's in the Constitution, but what his role looks like is, you know, is not in the Constitution. And sort of, as I think we're mostly looking to history to sort of understand what it's likely to be. Uh, and I think you're right, sort of he'll preside in a president of the Senate type capacity. Um, in theory, he could make substantive rulings on the availability of witnesses and things like that. In practice, I think that's almost sure not to happen. I think that a majority of the body of the Senate is likely to have to make all of those calls. And you know, I think it's right that the fact that the Republicans control the chamber does not mean it's not, the Senate is not a strictly majoritarian body the way the House is. It's not just majority rule. It's always been, at least historically, a body that's worked a little bit more on kind of compromise Certainly the Clinton trial, at least at the outset, looked a lot like that. The rules were essentially unanimously adopted. Um, but I think the Chief Justice will give some guidance if there are sticking points where they can't get to consensus, but is going to try to keep his head down and sort of stay under the radar as much yeah, as possible. Yeah, and Melissa Murray, he has been so concerned with representing the institution of the court. And even though, yeah, he, he was chosen uh, by George W. Bush, Republican president, trying to insulate it a bit. From partisan politics. Yeah, that has definitely been his modus operandi as Chief Justice. Um, and think Joan Biskovic, who wrote the recent biography of the Chief, has noted that Associate Justice John Roberts would have been very different. He's a dyed in the wool conservative, but as Chief Justice, he has been preoccupied primarily with the legitimacy of the court and keeping the court out of the political fray. And uh, Dan Abrams, in contrast a little bit to William Rehnquist, I remember during the Bill, the Clinton impeachment, he had that very showy uh, He had it <laughs> custom made. Custom yeah, made, yeah, yeah, custom yeah. Custom made row. He was willing to step out a little further. Yeah, and look, I think if you study John Roberts and exactly what, what we've heard, is that he's not going to want to be the story. Mm -hmm. And he makes himself the story by making big substantive rulings. Um, and so I think that some particularly Democrats who are hoping that Ron Roberts is going to be sort of their hero here and that he's going to make rulings to demand that certain witnesses testify, et cetera, 
I think that's a that's a pipe dream because as a practical matter, a majority of the Senate can overrule anything that Roberts decides to do. So in effect, the Senate has all the power. And I think Roberts knows that and doesn't want to be in the position of being the one out front or getting overruled or I think he just wants to play a largely administrative role here. And as so often happens, Mary Bruce, in the Senate, the balance of power will be held by those three, four, or five senators willing, perhaps, to break party lines. A couple of Democrats that Republicans are looking toward, a handful of Republicans, Democrats looking toward. Yeah, and George, we know that they have been watching what's been going on over here in the House very carefully. There's going to be a lot of pressure on them. And many of them have said that they want a longer process here. They want to carefully go over all of this with a fine tooth comb. It's part of the argument uh, for some who are, or some, some of the argument being made by some who are calling for a longer process here is that it would give an opportunity for some of these senators, especially some of the, the key moderates, to say, well, look, look, they are taking a really close look at this. On the other hand, of course, some of the president's top supporters say, you know what, do this quickly, get it over with. But and let's talk a little bit about the schedule now in the House. This appears to be the final hearing. We'll see whether Chairman Nadler uh, gives the Republicans a minority day of hearings. It does seem that he's required to by the rules. But they intend to move towards actually drafting and voting out these articles of impeachment in the committee by the end of the week. George, they have been preparing for these articles all weekend long. There have been a lot of long hours here over the weekend, a lot of pizza being eaten by members of the committee. They are moving very quickly here. We are likely to see these articles, see the charges uh, some point in the coming days, then it seems likely that they will vote these out of the committee before the end of the week. That, of course, then sets you up for the full House to have a vote sometime next week, right before Christmas. But, of course, the big X factor remains, well, how broad are these charges? What exactly is going to be the scope of these articles of impeachment? As we have been discussing. Uh, it looks likely that they may include abuse of power, bribery and obstruction, but the question still remains whether it includes obstruction of the Mueller report, which has notably been getting a lot of discussion so far this morning. Uh, some say that there is a pattern of behavior here that absolutely has to be addressed. Other members that I've talked to warn, look, you don't want this to become a kitchen sink where everything is just thrown into these articles. Keep it narrow and keep it focused. Of course, all of this will come down to Speaker Pelosi, who is keeping a very tight control over all of this. And she she has to juggle back and forth between the legal and the political here. She has to show that the president's actions rise to the level of impeachment, but she also has to try and satisfy all of the varying uh, views of her members, especially, again, those key moderates in Trump and, 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 Mary, one of the other ways both she and the White House, are, White House are trying to deal with that is to show, at least for Speaker Pelosi, progress on other issues. And there's some reports this morning that they actually might be coming close to an agreement, the White House and the Democrats, on this U.S.-Mexico free trade agreement, which I presume Speaker Pelosi Pelosi would like to vote on perhaps even after uh, the impeachment to show that they are actually making progress on big issues. Yeah, Democrats are eager to show that they are not just focused on impeachment, that they can be clearly very uh, uh, laser focused on this issue while also getting other things done for the American public. And it is an issue where it seems that we are likely to possibly see some bipartisanship here, members actually coming together, a word we don't say often up here on the Hill these days, but, but both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue have a lot of interest in trying to get something done uh, on this USMCA trade deal and it does seem like they are making some progress. And Cecilia Vega, one of the things we saw from the president in that series of more than 100 tweets yesterday consistently hitting the Democrats as the do-nothing Democrats, you saw it also in the opening statements here, the Republican witnesses saying, listen, the economy is doing well, the, the Democrats are not, don't want to be talking about that, instead they just want to obstruct this president. And that's something they're hoping that they can sell the room on and also the public watching for sure, not just a Democrats, but not just Republicans, but Democrats as well. Yeah, Kellyanne Conway, before this hearing started, said something in the White House that, that really got at, at the heart of the argument inside the White House right now. She said, why should we show up and play on your turf if we don't even know what sport you're playing? So, yes, they're trying to sell this as the president is doing a great job outside of this impeachment discussion, but they have major issues with the way that this is going down, and they're not going to let up on that. And the White House, in, in their talking points that they've been putting out today, so the Democrats have already made up their mind. Why should we participate in this? So. There you have it. Very clear, David, yeah. Muir, that the president is not going to change his communication strategy through this process. Not at all. And, and look at just the, the headline of Friday, the jobs report. That was something they, they pushed on Friday and throughout the weekend as well. And we know some of the GM numbers were baked into that number, but it still came out much higher than economists uh, were predicting. And so there's this calculation going on about whether or not um, to do a slightly longer Senate trial or, or is a quicker trial helpful for both Republicans uh, and Democrats with the 
Iowa caucus getting closer, the New Hampshire primary getting closer. And as we know, senators will have to be there presiding over this trial at the same time. But the president uh, continues to talk about impeachment, impeachment being a bad word, but knowing that his base is rallying around him and he's got to try to keep that base. Uh, and that economic headline on Friday is one prime example of what they can point to to say this is what matters, not this impeachment. He's raising a fair amount of money on it as well. And John Carl, as we're sitting here, as I said at the outset of these hearings today, the president awaiting the release of that report from the inspector general on whether or not the FBI was le legitimately open the investigation into the Trump campaign back in 2016. We now know it's been transmitted to Capitol Hill. Yes, this is the uh, uh, investigation by the Department of Justice Inspector General, and the president has been kind of, pre, you know, uh, previewing this thing, saying it's going to show that the investigation uh, was started illegitimately, the investigation into Russian interference. Our understanding is that this report does not say that, that this report does not say what the president has been accusing uh, from, from, from the start, although it will have... Uh, some things that will be uncomfortable for Democrats, uh, uncomfortable for the president's uh, enemies, things that the White House will point to about politicization, uh, political bias at the lower levels uh, at the Department of Justice. Uh, but it does not, as we understand it, have that big uh, bombshell that the president's been teasing now for, for quite and, some well, that, time. That's, that's going to be the point, John, because the president has so often said that he believes that he was a victim of illegal spying uh, yeah. by the FBI. Pretty clear that's not what the IG found. Pr pr pretty clear that that is not the conclusion of this investigation. And at the highest levels, right? I mean, the president has, and the president and his supporters keep distinguishing between the people making the decisions and the rank and file, right? And they keep trying to position themselves not to be criticizing the rank and file agents, but instead to be criticizing the people who were in charge. If the IG report determines that the people in charge were not making decisions based on political biases, biases, then that really does undermine the heart of the argument. When focusing on this IG report, we need to focus on the big picture. It's sort of like in a criminal trial when defense attorneys focus on errors in a warrant, right? And they make legitimate arguments about problems there were that existed in a warrant. This should have existed and that should have existed. And prosecutors respond, but okay, but in the end, the warrant was still valid. Um, and if you have to sort of remove yourself and view it that way, which is look at the big picture here and ask yourself, does the IG report say that the entirety of the warrants was effectively invalid because the political bias was so strong? Or are they saying, in the end, the fundamental uh, applications here, the fundamental investigation was valid and there were some problems? And, and of course, Kate Shaw, this actually goes back to three weeks into the presidency. The president put out that tweet on a Saturday morning saying President Obama illegally wiretapped right. me, a, a charge he repeated to me this summer when I was in, was in the Oval Office. It is so clear at this point that the IG did not find anything close to that. Yeah, and we'll see how the president responds. He is clearly so fixated on the origins of the, of the investigation, the Mueller investigation 2016 in general. And I have to think it's not helpful in terms of some of the more moderate senators who are thinking ahead to the Senate trial. So, so the president's seeming inability to move on from those events. Um, and also, I think, to, to move back from a position that this phone call was perfect, right? The phone call with the president of Ukraine. You know, the, uh, one of the themes we were hearing today back to the hearing was that, you know, at least from the Democrats, this is ongoing. This will recur if there isn't some strong message of condemnation sent. Um, and, and I think that so long as the president continues to say that there was nothing done wrong, the message seems to be that there'd be nothing wrong with doing it again. So I think he is aiding that narrative. And that gets to the question, Melissa Murray, whether at some point in the Senate, uh, not only do they have votes on a motion to dismiss, but do some perhaps start to call for a fallback? Even Lindsey Graham mentioned this at, at one point of censure for the president rather than conviction. Well, I think that's, that's a big question. question. The Democrats have talked about this slippery slope. The Republicans have also talked about a slippery slope. Like, we will weaponize impeachment going forward, and this will just be deployed ad hoc. But... The Democrats have hammered down that this needs to be a case of deterrence, not just to this president, but to all future presidents, that they cannot put their own personal priorities ahead of the national interest. And you could stop short, but still accomplish that with a vote of censure. It's not the same as removal, obviously, but it does send a strong message. Whether or not this president or future presidents would heed that message is an open question. And John Carl, when you talk about the issue of, of continued activity by the president, I was talking to Cecilia about this uh, moments ago. We saw the president 
react to the idea of Rudy Giuliani's trip? Remember, Rudy Giuliani said he was working as the president's agent in Ukraine last week. The president uh, did not want to criticize uh, Giuliani at all. We even saw some Republicans over the weekend made uncomfortable by the fact that it's full steam ahead for Mayor Giuliani. Yeah, you've seen uh, some Republicans in the House make that point publicly and privately, George. Uh, you see people uh, very close to the president advising him on this whole process, saying that they uh, uh, are uncomfortable with Giuliani's activities and wish that he would stop. But the president uh, seems to, if not outright endorse it, he emphasizes Giuliani's the greatest crime fighter ever, is what he, what he says over and over again, uh, implicitly, it seems, endorsing Giuliani's activities. We just heard the gavel again. Let's go back to the hearing room. It. The committee will reconvene. When we recessed, uh, we were about to hear from Mr. Castor. Mr. Castor, you are re recognized for 45 minutes. Afternoon, Chairman, Ranking Member Collins, members of the committee, members of the staff. Thank you again for having me back. Uh, and give me the opportunity to testify about the evidence gathered uh, during our um, the impeachment inquiry. At the outset, let me say that the evidence does not support the allegations that my Democrat colleagues have made. And I don't believe the evidence leads to the conclusions they suggest. I'm hopeful to add some important perspective and context to the facts under discussion today. <coughs> The chief allegation that the Democrats' impeachment inquiry has been trying to assess over the last 76 days is this, whether President Trump abused the power of his office through a quid pro quo, bribery, extortion, or whatever, by withholding a meeting or security assistance as a way of pressuring Ukrainian President Zelensky to investigate the president's political rival, former VP Biden for the president's political benefit in the upcoming election. The secondary allegation that has been levied is whether President Trump obstructed Congress during the inquiry. The evidence obtained during the inquiry does not support either of those allegations. The Republican report of evidence lays out the reasons in more detail, but I will summarize. I will begin with the substantive allegation about an abuse of power. The inquiry has returned no direct evidence that President Trump withheld a meeting or security assistance in order to pressure President Zelensky to investigate former VP Biden. Witnesses who testified in the inquiry have denied having awareness of criminal activity or even an impeachable offense. On the key question of the president's state of mind, there is no clear evidence that President Trump acted with malicious intent. Overall, at best, the impeachment inquiry record is riddled with hearsay, presumptions, and speculation. There are conflicting and ambiguous facts throughout the record, facts that could be interpreted in different ways. To paraphrase, to paraphrase Professor Turley from last week, the impeachment record is heavy on presumptions and empty on proof. That's not me saying that, that is Professor Turley. So let me start with the best direct evidence of any potential quid pro quo or impeachable scheme. This is President Trump's phone call with Zelensky for which the National Security Council and the White House Situation Room staff prepared a call summary. According to testimony from Tim Morrison at the NSC, the summary was accurate and complete. NSC staff member, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman testified that any omissions in the summary were not significant and that editing was not done maliciously. President Trump has declassified and released the call summary so the American people can review it and assess it for themselves. I'll make a few points that seem to have gone undernoticed. The call summary reflects absolutely no pressure or conditionality. President Zelensky vocalized no concerns with the subject matters discussed. 
and there is no indication of bribery, extortion, or other illegal conduct on the call. The call summary shows President Trump and President Zelensky engaged in pleasantries and cordialities. The call summary reveals laughter. Simply put, the call is not the sinister mob shakedown that some Democrats have described. President Trump raised his concerns about European allies paying their fair share in security assistance to Ukraine, a concern that President Trump would continue to raise both publicly and privately. There is no discussion on the call, I repeat, no discussion on the call about the upcoming 2020 election or security sector assistance to Ukraine. Beyond the call summary, the next best piece of evidence are the statements from the two participants on the call. President Zelensky has said he felt no pressure on the call. On September 25th at the United Nations, he said, we had, I think, a good phone call. It was normal. Nobody pushed me. On October 6th, President Zelensky said, I was never pressured and there were no conditions being imposed. Four days later, on October 10th, President Zelensky said again, there was nothing wrong with the call, no blackmail. This is not corruption. It was just a call. And just recently in Time Magazine, President Zelensky said, I never talked to the president from a position of a quid pro quo. Because President Zelensky would be the target of any alleged quid pro quo scheme, his statements denying any pressure carry significant weight. He is, in fact, the supposed victim here. Other senior Ukrainian government officials confirmed President Zelensky's statements. Foreign Minister Pristyko said on September 21st, I know what the conversation was about, and I think there was no pressure. Alexander Daniluk, who was then Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, told Ambassador Bill Taylor on the night of the call that the Ukrainian government was not disturbed by anything on the call. President Trump, of course, has also said that he did not pressure President Zelensky. On September 25th, President Trump said there was no pressure. When asked if he wanted President Zelensky to do more to investigate the former VP, President Trump responded, no, I want him to do whatever he can. But whatever he, he can do in terms of corruption, because corruption is massive, that's what he should do. Several witnesses attested to the president's concerns about Ukrainian corruption. The initial readouts of the July 25th call from both the Ukrainian government and the State Department raised no concerns. Although Lieutenant Colonel Vindman noted concerns, those concerns were not shared by National Security Council leadership. They were not shared by General Keith Kellogg, who listened on the call. Lieutenant General Kellogg said in a statement, I heard nothing wrong or improper on the call. I had and have no concerns. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's superior, Tim Morrison, testified that he was concerned the call would leak and be misused in Washington's political process. But he did not believe that anything discussed on the call was illegal or improper. Much has also been made about President Trump's reference on the July 25th call to Hunter Biden's position on the board of Burisma, a corrupt Ukrainian energy company, and the actions of certain Ukrainian officials in the run-up to the 2016 election. Democrats dismiss these conspiracy theories to suggest that the president has no legitimate reason other than his own political interests to raise these issues with President Zelensky. The evidence, however, shows that there are legitimate questions about both issues. With respect to Burisma, 
Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent testified that the company had a reputation for corruption. The company was founded by Mykola Zochevsky, who served as Ukraine's Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources. When Zochevsky served in that role, his company, Burisma, received oil exploration licenses without public auctions. Burisma brought Hunter Biden onto its board of, direction, board of directors, according to the New York Times, as part of a broad effort by Burisma to bring in well-connected Democrats during a period when the company was facing investigations backed not just by domestic Ukrainian forces, but by officials in the Obama administration. George Kent testified about these efforts. Hunter Biden reportedly received between $50,000 and $83,000 a month as compensation for his position on Burisma's board. At the time that Hunter Biden joined the board, his father, the former VP, was the Obama administration's point person for Ukraine. Biden has no specific corporate governance expertise, and we don't believe he speaks Ukrainian or Russian. We don't believe he moved there. So he's getting this gigantic paycheck for what? The Washington Post wrote at the time of Biden's appointment to Burisma's board that it looked nepotistic at best, and the Washington Post said, the Washington Post, nefarious at worst. According to the Wall Street Journal, anti-corruption activists in Ukraine also raised concerns that the former VP's son received money from Zochevsky and worried that that would mean Zochevsky would be protected and not prosecuted. Witnesses in the impeachment inquiry noted Hunter Biden's role on the board and how it presented at minimum a conflict of interest. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testified that Hunter Biden did not appear qualified to serve on Burisma's board. Witnesses testified that Hunter Biden's role on the board was a legitimate concern to raise. In fact, George Kent explained that in 2015, he raised a concern to the office of former Vice President Biden, that Hunter Biden's role on Burisma's board presented a potential conflict of interest. However, Hunter Biden's role did not change, and former Vice President Biden continued to lead U.S. policy in Ukraine. On this record, there is a legitimate basis for President Trump to have concern about Hunter Biden's role on Burisma's board. The prospect that some senior Ukrainian officials worked against President Trump in the run-up to the 2016 election draws an even more visceral reaction from most Democrats. Let me say very, very clearly that election interference is not binary. I'm not saying that it was Ukraine and not Russia. I'm saying that both countries can work to influence an election. A systemic coordinated Russian interference effort does not mean that some Ukrainian officials, some Ukrainian officials did not work to oppose President Trump's candidacy, did not make statements against President Trump during the election. Ambassador Volker testified in his public hearing that it is possible for more than one country to seek influence in U.S. elections. Dr. Hill testified likewise at her public hearing. Contemporaneous news articles in 2016 noted how President Trump's candidacy led Kyiv's wider political leadership to do something they would never have attempted before, intervene, however indirectly, in a U.S. election. In August 2016, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. published an op-ed in The Hill criticizing candidate Trump. Other senior Ukrainian officials called candidate Trump a clown and other words. They alleged that he challenged the very values of the free world 
one prominent Ukrainian parliamentarian explained that the majority of Ukraine's political figures were on Hillary Clinton's side. A January 2017 Politico article lays out in more detail efforts by the Ukrainian government officials to oppose President Trump's candidacy. The article notes how Ukraine worked to sabotage the Trump campaign by publicly questioning his fitness for office. The article detailed how a woman named Alexandra Chalupa, a Ukrainian-American contractor paid by the DNC and working with the DNC and the Clinton campaign, traded information and leads about the Trump campaign with the staff at the Ukrainian embassy in Washington. Chalupa explained how the Ukrainian embassy worked directly with reporters to point them in the right direction. Witnesses in the impeachment inquiry testified that the allegation of Ukrainian influence in the 2016 election was appropriate to examine. Ambassador Volker testified that he thought it was fine to investigate allegations about 2016 influence. Ambassador Taylor said, for example, that the allegations surprised and disappointed him. On this record, I do not believe that one could conclude that President Trump had no legitimate basis to raise a concern about efforts by Ukrainians to influence the 2016 election. Let me now turn to the first assertion that President Trump withheld a meeting with President Zelensky as a way of pressuring him to investigate the former VP. Here, it is important to note Ukraine's long, profound history of endemic corruption. Several witnesses in the inquiry have testified about these problems. Ambassador Marie Ivanovich, for example, said Ukraine's corruption is not just prevalent, but frankly is the system. Witnesses testified to having firsthand knowledge that President Trump is deeply skeptical of Ukraine due to its corruption, dating back years, and that this skepticism contributed to President Trump's initial hesitancy to meet with President Zelensky. Ambassador Volker testified, so I know he had a very deep-rooted skeptical view. And my understanding at the time was that even though he agreed in the meeting that we had with him, say, okay, I'll invite him, I'll invite him. He didn't really want to do it, Volker said. And that's why the meeting kept getting delayed. Another relevant set of facts here is the effort of some Ukrainian officials to oppose President Trump's candidacy in the 2016 election. Some of these Ukrainian politicians initially remained in government when President Zelensky took over. Witnesses testified that these Ukrainian efforts in 2016 colored how President Trump viewed Ukraine. It's also important to note that President Zelensky was a relatively unknown quantity for U.S. policymakers. Ambassador Ivanovich called him an untried politician. Dr. Hill testified that there were concerns within the National Security Council about Zelensky's relationship with Igor Kolomoisky, a controversial oligarch in Ukraine. Although President Zelensky ran on a reform platform, President Zelensky appointed Kolomoisky's lawyer, Mr. Bodon, as his chief of staff. Both Ambassador Volker and Senator Ron Johnson noted that this appointment raised concerns. These facts are important in assessing the president's state of mind in understanding whether President Zelensky was truly committed to fighting corruption in Ukraine. The evidence shows that President Trump invited President Zelensky to meet at the White House on three separate occasions, all without any conditions. The first was on April 21st during the initial congratulatory phone call. The second was via letter on May 29th. This letter followed an Oval Office meeting on May 23rd with the U.S. delegation to the inauguration. During this meeting, President Trump again expressed his skepticism about Ukraine. Ambassador Volker recalled the president saying, these are terrible people and a corrupt country. Ambassador Sondland similarly testified that Ukraine, in the president's view, tried to take him down in the 2016 election. Senator Ron Johnson confirmed this testimony in his submission to the impeachment inquiry. 
Finally, the third time that President Trump invited Zelensky to meet, again without any preconditions, was during the July 25th phone call. Although some time passed between May 2019, when the President formally invited Zelensky to meet, and September 25th, when the Presidents met, the evidence does not show that the Ukrainian government felt additional pressure due to this delay. To the contrary, Ambassador Volker testified that the Ukrainian regime felt pretty good about its relationship with the Trump administration in this period. During those four months, senior Ukrainian government officials had at least nine meetings or phone calls with President Trump, Vice President Pence, Secretary Pompeo, National Security Advisor Bolton, and U.S. ambassadors. The evidence does not support a conclusion that President Trump conditioned a meeting with President Zelensky on investigating former Vice President Biden. Mr. Yarmack, President Zelensky's close advisor, said that explicitly in an August 2019 New York Times story, which was published before the beginning of the impeachment inquiry. In this article, Yarmack said that he and Mayor Giuliani did not discuss a link between a presidential meeting and investigations. Witness testimony confirms Yarmack's statement. Ambassador Volker testified there was no linkage between a potential meeting and investigations. Although Ambassador Sondland testified that he believed there was a quid pro quo, his testimony is not as clear as it has been portrayed. In his deposition, Ambassador Sondland testified that he believed the meeting was conditioned on a public anti-corruption statement, not on investigations themselves, a distinction that during his deposition he was keen to note. Ambassador Sondland said then that nothing about the request raised any red flags. In his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland clarified that he had no firsthand knowledge of any linkage coming from the president and never discussed any preconditions with the president. He merely presumed there were preconditions. I'd also like to address the July 10th meeting in Ambassador Bolton's office with two senior Ukrainian officials. Allow me to submit that here too, there is conflicting evidence about the facts. Both Dr. Hill and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testified that Ambassador Sondland raised investigations during this meeting, causing Ambassador Bolton to abruptly end the meeting. Dr. Hill testified she confronted Ambassador Sondland over his discussion about investigations. Ambassador Sondland's testimony about this meeting, however, is scattered. In his closed door deposition, he testified that no national security staff member ever once expressed concerns to him that he was acting improperly. And he denied that he raised investigations during this meeting. But when he came here to testify in public, he acknowledged for the first time that he raised investigations but he denied that the meeting ended abruptly. He maintained that Dr. Hill never raised concerns to him and that any discussion of investigations did not mention anything specific, such as Biden or 2016. Let me lastly address the allegation that President Trump directed Vice President Pence not to attend President Zelensky's inauguration as another way of pressuring Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Biden. Jennifer Williams, a senior advisor in the office of the Vice President, testified that a colleague, she said it was the Chief of Staff's assistant, told her, the Chief of Staff's assistant, that President Trump had directed Vice President Pence not to attend the inauguration. However, Williams had no firsthand knowledge of any such direction or the reasons given for any such direction. If indeed such a direction was given, it's not clear from the evidence why it was done, because the Vice President's office was juggling other potential trips during that time, and the Ukrainian Parliament scheduled, scheduled the election on an extremely short time frame. It was just four days' notice. Williams explained that there was a window. There was a window of dates, May 30th 
through June 1st, during which the Vice President could attend the inauguration, and that was communicated. And that if it wasn't one of those dates, it would be difficult or impossible to attend the inauguration. Separately, the Office of the Vice President was also planning an unrelated trip to Canada to promote the USMCA during the same window. The USMCA was and still is a significant priority for the administration. Vice President Pence has done a number of public events in support of it. President Trump was also planning foreign travel during this time period. And as Dr. Hill testified, both President Trump and Vice President Pence cannot both be out of the country at the same time. Williams explained that these factors created a narrow window for the Vice President's participation in the inauguration. Dr. Hill testified that she had no knowledge that the Vice President was directed not to attend. On May 16th, the outgoing Ukrainian Parliament scheduled the inauguration for May 20th, only four days later. May 20th was not one of the three dates that Vice President uh, Pence's office had provided for his availability. Williams testified that this early date surprised the Vice President's office because we weren't expecting the Ukrainians to look at that time frame. George Kent at the State Department said that this short notice from the Ukrainians forced the State Department to scramble to find a U.S. official to lead the delegation, finally settling on Secretary of Energy Rick Perry. On May 20th, the date of President Zelensky's inauguration, Vice President Pence was in Jacksonville, Florida for an event promoting USMCA. Finally, on September 25th, President Trump and President Zelensky met during the United Nations General Assembly. The two met without Ukraine ever taking action on investigations, and according to Ambassador Taylor, there was no discussion of investigations during this meeting. I will now turn to the second assertion that President Trump withheld taxpayer-funded security assistance to Ukraine as a way of pressuring Zelensky to conduct these investigations. Here too, context is critically important. President Trump has been skeptical of foreign assistance in general and believes quite strongly that our European allies should share more of the burden for regional defense. That's an assertion he made on the campaign trail, something he's raised consistently since. It's also important to note that U.S. security assistance is conditioned to countries around the world and that U.S. aid, including aid to Ukraine, has been temporarily paused in the past for various reasons and even for no reason at all. Ambassador Volker testified the 55-day pause on security assistance did not strike him as uncommon and that the pause was not significant. Dr. Hill and State Department official Catherine Croft both testified that security assistance to Ukraine specifically had been temporarily paused in the past. In fact, Ambassador David Hale, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the third uh, most senior person at the State Department, testified that the National Security Council had launched a review of U.S. foreign assistance across the world to make sure taxpayer dollars were spent in the national interest and to advance the principle of burden sharing by our allies. Dr. Hill testified that as she was leaving the NSC in July, there had been a directive for a whole-scale review of our foreign policy assistance. She said there had been more scrutiny on security assistance as a result. Another important data point is President Trump's willingness to take a stronger stance in supporting Ukraine against Russian aggression. And and compared to the previous administration. Several witnesses testified that President Trump's willingness to provide Ukraine with lethal defensive assistance, Javelin anti-tank missiles, was a substantial improvement, a stronger policy, and a significant decision. When we discussed Democrat allegations that President Trump withheld vital security assistance dollars from Ukraine, we should also remember that it was President Trump and not President Obama who provided Ukraine with lethal defensive weapons. I make all of these points here because there are relevant pieces of information that bear on how the House should view the evidence in question. Although the security assistance was paused in July, the evidence is virtually silent on the definitive reason for the pause. In fact, the only direct evidence of the reason for the pause comes from OMB official Mark Sandy, 
who testified that he learned in September that the pause was related to the president's concern about other countries contributing more to Ukraine. He explained how OMB received requests for information on what other countries were contributing to Ukraine, which OMB provided in the first week of September. The aid, of course, was released September 11th. Several witnesses have testified that security assistance was not linked to Ukraine's investigations. Ambassador Volker's testimony is particularly relevant on this point because he was a key intermediary with Ukrainian government and someone who they trusted and sought for advice. Ambassador Volker testified that he was aware of no quid pro quo and the Ukrainians never raised such concerns to him. When Ambassador Taylor raised the possibility of a quid pro quo to Ambassador Volker, Volker said he replied, there's no linkage here. During his deposition, Chairman Schiff tried to pin him down on this point, but Ambassador Volker was clear there was no connection. In his public testimony, Ambassador Volker reiterated there was no linkage. Similarly, George Kent at the State Department said he did not associate aid to investigations, and he relayed how Ambassador Taylor told him that Tim Morrison and Ambassador Sondland also believed the two were not linked. Ambassador Sondland's testimony, as we have seen already, is a bit more scattered. In his deposition, he said that he was never aware of preconditions on security assistance or that the security assistance was tied to investigations. Ambassador Sondland then later provided a written statement supplementing his deposition in which he explained for the first time that in the absence of any clear explanation, he presumed a link between security assistance and an anti-corruption statement were, were linked. Ambassador Sondland also attested in his written supplement that he likely voiced this concern to Mr. Yarmack, a close advisor of President Zelensky on September 1st in Warsaw. Mr. Yarmark, however, in a subsequent news account published on November 22nd, disputed Ambassador Sondland's account and said he doesn't remember any reference to the military aid. In his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland reiterated that his testimony was based on a presumption, acknowledging to Congressman Turner that no one on the planet told him that security assistance to Ukraine was conditioned on investigations. Ambassador Taylor is the other relevant actor here. He testified in his deposition that he had a clear understanding that Ukraine would not receive the security assistance until President Zelensky committed to the investigations. However, in his public testimony, Ambassador Ta Taylor acknowledged that his clear understanding came from Ambassador Sondland, who was merely presuming that there was a link. President Trump, too, rejected any linkage between security assistance to Ukraine and investigations. The president's statements in this regard ought to be persuasive because he made the same statement in two separate private conversations with two different U.S. officials 10 days apart. There would be no reason for the president to be anything less than candid during these private conversations. On August 31st, President Trump spoke by phone with Senator Johnson, who was traveling to Ukraine in the coming days and sought the president's permission to tell President Zelensky that the security assistance would be forthcoming. President Trump responded that he was not ready to do that, citing Ukrainian corruption and burden sharing among European allies. When Senator Johnson raised the potential linkage between security assistance and investigation, President Trump vehemently denied any connection, saying, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? In closing the call, President Trump told Senator Johnson that we're reviewing it now, referring to the security assistance, and, and guess what? You, you'll probably like my final decision. He told that to Senator Johnson on August 31st. This statement strongly suggests that President Trump was already leaning toward lifting the aid. Separately, on September 9th, President Trump spoke by phone with Ambassador Sondland. Ambassador Sondland asked the president, what do you want from Ukraine? President, respond, president Trump responded, I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. I want Zelensky to do the right thing. In addition, senior Ukrainian government officials denied any awareness of a linkage between U.S. security assistance and investigations. These denials are persuasive because if there was, in fact, an orchestrated scheme to pressure Ukraine by withholding security assistance, one would think the pause on security assistance 
would have been clearly communicated to the Ukrainians. Foreign Minister Prostyko told the media in November, following news of Ambassador Sondland's written supplemental testimony, that Sondland never linked security assistance to investigations. Prostyko said, I have never seen a direct relationship between investigations and security assistance. Although there is some testimony that Ukrainian officials from the embassy in Washington made informal inquiries to the State Department and Defense Department about these issues with security assistance in July and August, the evidence does not show President Zelensky or his senior advisors in Kyiv were aware of the pause until it was publicly reported by Politico on August 28th. A subsequent news article explained the conflicting testimony that embassy officials in Washington had made in formal inquiries about issues with the aid, while senior officials in Kyiv denied awareness of the pause. The article explained that then Ukrainian Ambassador Chali, who was appointed by President Zelensky's predecessor, went rogue and did not inform President Zelensky that there was any issue with the aid. According to the news account, President Zelensky and his senior team only learned of the pause when it was reported on August 28th. As Ambassador Volker testified, because senior Ukrainian officials were unaware of the pause, there was no leverage implied. The actions of senior Ukrainian government officials while the security assistance was paused reinforces a conclusion that they did not know the aid was on hold. In the 55 days during which the security assistance was paused, President Zelensky had five discussions with U.S. senior officials. On the July 25th, he spoke with President Trump on the phone. On July 26th, he met with Ambassador Volker, Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Sondland in Kyiv. On August 27th, he met with Ambassador Bolton. September 1st, he met with Vice President Pence in Warsaw. And on September 5th, he met with Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Chris Murphy in Kyiv. In none of these meetings did President Zelensky raise any concern about linkage between security assistance and investigations. In particular, the September 5th meeting with Senator Johnson and Senator Murphy is notable because they're not part of the Trump administration and President Zelensky could be candid with them. What did occur during those 55 days were historic efforts by Ukraine's parliament called the RADA to implement anti-corruption reform. Vice President Pence had pressed President Zelensky about these reforms during their September 1st meeting. In their depositions, Ambassador Taylor lauded President Zelensky's rapid reforms and National Security Council official Morrison testified that during a meeting in Kyiv, they noted that everyone on the Ukrainian side of the table was exhausted because they'd been up all night working on these reforms. On September 11th, President Trump discussed the matter with Vice President Pence, Senator Portin, Portman, and Acting Chief of Staff Mulvaney. According to Tim Morrison's testimony, they discussed whether Ukraine's progress on anti-corruption reform was enough to justify releasing the security assistance. Morrison testified that Vice President Pence was obviously armed with the conversation he had with President Zelensky, and they convinced the president that the aid should be dispersed immediately. The president then lifted the hold. In concluding this point, we have considerable evidence that President Trump was skeptical of Ukraine due to its corruption. We have evidence the president was skeptical of foreign assistance in general, and that he believes strongly our allies should share the burden for regional defense. We know the White House was reviewing foreign assistance in general to ensure it furthered U.S. interests, and that OMB researched and provided information about which foreign countries were contributing money to Ukraine. President Trump told Senator Johnson on August 31st, we're reviewing it now and you'll probably like my final decision. He told Ambassador Sondland on September 9th, I want Zelensky to do what he ran on. President Zelensky, who ran on an anti-corruption platform, was an untried politician with ties to a potential uh, controversial oligarch. Vice President Pence reiterated President Zelensky um, that on September 1st, the need for reform was paramount. After President Zelensky paused, uh, I'm sorry, after President Zelensky passed historic anti-corruption reforms, the pause on security assistance was lifted and the presidents met two weeks later. The Ukrainian government never took any action on investigations at issue in the impeachment inquiry. 
Much has been made about a so-called shadow or irregular foreign policy apparatus that President Trump is alleged to have orchestrated as a mechanism to force Ukraine to initiate investigations. The allegation is President Trump conspired to recall Ambassador Yovanovitch from Ukraine so his agents could pursue a scheme to pressure Ukraine to conduct these investigations. But there are logical flaws with these arguments. First, every ambassador interviewed in the impeachment inquiry acknowledged the president has an absolute right to recall ambassadors for any reason or no reason. It's apparent that President Trump lost confidence in Ambassador Yovanovitch, and it's simply not an abuse of power for him to recall her. Beyond that, the Trump administration replaced Ambassador Yovanovitch with Ambassador Bill Taylor who became one of the first State Department officials to voice concerns discussed during the course of our inquiry here. In fact, Ambassador Taylor played a prominent role in some of the hearings last month. If President Trump truly sought to remove Ambassador Yovanovitch as part of a nefarious plan, he certainly would not have replaced her with someone of the likes of Ambassador Bill Taylor. Second, the three U.S. officials who comprise the so-called shadow foreign policy apparatus, Ambassador Volker, Sondland, and Secretary Perry, can hardly be called irregular and certainly not outlandish. All were senior U.S. officials with official interest in Ukraine policy. The three kept the State Department and the NSC informed of their activities. Finally, there is evidence that Mayor Giuliani did not speak on behalf of the president. According to a news story on November 22nd, Mr. Yarmak asked Ambassador Volker to connect him with Mayor Giuliani because the Zelensky team was surprised by the, by the mayor's negative comments about Ukraine. They wanted to change his mind. Both Ambassador Volker in his deposition and Yarmak in an August New York Times article denied that Mayor Giuliani was speaking on behalf of President Trump as his agent. Instead, as Ambassador Volker explained, the Ukrainian government saw Giuliani as a conduit through which they could change the president's mind. The second allegation at issue, of course, is whether the president obstructed Congress by not agreeing to all the demands for documents and testimony. Uh, as somebody with experience with congressional investigations and strongly, you know, I strongly believe in Congress's Article I authority, um, but this impeachment inquiry has departed drastically from past bipartisan precedents for presidential impeachment, as well as the fundamental tenets of fair and effective congressional oversight. First, process matters. The bipartisan rodino hyde precedents guaranteed fundamental fairness and due process to the president. It allowed substantive minority participation and participation from the president's counsel in the fact-finding process. Neither aspect was present here. Democrats denied us witnesses. Democrats voted down subpoenas we sought to issue for both documents and testimony. And I'll note Democrats never brought to a committee vote any of the subpoenas that were issued. They were all tabled. Democrats directed witnesses not to answer our questions. And these sorts of actions delegitimize the inquiry and do not give the witnesses or the president confidence that the inquiry is fair. Second, the president or any potential witness to this impeachment inquiry should be allowed to raise defenses without it being used as an adverse inference against him. Courts have held that the Constitution mandates an accommodations process between the branches. For this reason, congressional oversight is a time-intensive endeavor. It certainly takes longer than 76 days. Here, however, the initial letters from the Democrats instructed potential witnesses that if they did not cooperate in full, it shall constitute evidence of obstruction. Democrats wanted all their demands honored immediately and were unwilling to consider the executive branch's privileges or defenses. Finally, there is no basis for obstruction. The one witness who said he spoke to President Trump about his appearance as a witness, Ambassador Sondland, testified the president told him to cooperate and tell the truth. The president has declassified and released the call summary of his July 25th and April 21st calls with President Zelensky. The White House wrote to Speaker Pelosi to say that it was willing to cooperate further if the House returned to a well-established bipartisan constitutional-based impeachment process. As we know, 
These protections were never afforded. In closing, I'd like to briefly address the Democrats' narrative as articulated in their report. The Democrat narrative virtually ignores any evidence that's not helpful for their case. It ignores, for instance, that Ambassador Sondland's testimony that he presented, um, that there was a quid pro quo, and it ignores the many public statements made by Ukrainian officials. The report presents a story as if the evidence is clear, when in reality, it's anything but. Democrats have gone to great lengths to gather information to build their case, and they've even obtained and released phone records relating to the communications of the president's personal attorney, a reporter, and a member of Congress. There are additional phone records uh, that have not yet been released, and our members remain concerned about the prospect of more phone records being released. There have been a lot of hyper, hyper, uh, hyperbole, a lot of hysteria over the last three months about this inquiry and the underlying facts. I believe a lot of this can be traced back to the anonymous whistleblower complaint. I believe the whistleblower reframed a lot of the facts at issue and caused witnesses in the inquiry to recast their views. And it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to interview the whistleblower. Finally, some have likened the impeachment inquiry to a special prosecutor's investigation. If one accepts that comparison, one should also ex um, expect that like Ken Starr and, and, and Robert Mueller, uh, the chairman should testify. And our, our members, all the committees believe very strongly that Chairman Schiff should, should testify and answer questions. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, the time is yours. The gentleman, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. We will now proceed to the first round of questions. Point of order. Pursuant, gentleman will state his point of order. We've been told that counsel for the Democrats was a witness, and that's why he didn't have to comport with the rules of decorum. And now he's sitting up here. Gentlemen, will state a point. I've been order. a judge, and I know that you don't get to be a witness and a judge in the same case. That's my point of order. He should not be up here. It's not a point of order. We will, pursuant to House Resolution 660 and its accompanying Judiciary Committee procedures, there will be 45 minutes of questions conducted by the chairman or majority counsel followed by 45 minutes by the ranking member or minority counsel. Only the chair and ranking member and their respective counsels may question witnesses during this period. Following that, unless I specify additional equal time for extended questioning, we will proceed under the five-minute rule, and every member will have the chance to ask questions. I now recognize myself for the first round of questions. The, Republican ex the Republicans' expert witness last week, Professor Turley, wrote in an article that, quote, there is no question that the use of public office for personal gain is an impeachable offense, including the withholding of military aid in exchange for the investigation of a political opponent. You just have to prove it happened, close quote. That was Mr. Turley's comment. Now, Mr. Goldman, did the, inve did the investigative committees conclude that the evidence proved that the president used his public office for personal gain? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And in fact, Finding of fact five said President Trump used the, used the power of the office of the president to apply increasing pressure on the president of Ukraine and the Ukrainian government to announce the politically motivated investigations desired by President Trump. And did the evidence also prove that President Trump withheld military aid in exchange for an announcement of an investigation of his political opponent? Yes, it did. And in fact, finding of fact five B said, quote, President Trump acting through his agents and subordinates conditioned release of the vital military assistance he had suspended to Ukraine on the president of Ukraine's public announcement of the investigations that President Trump sought. And did the evidence demonstrate that President Trump undermined the national security interests of the United States? Yes, in many, in several ways. And finding of fact, six said, in directing and orchestrating the scheme to advance his personal political interests, President Trump did not implement, promote, or advance U.S. anti-corruption policies. In fact, the president sought to pressure and induce the government of Ukraine to announce politically motivated investigations, lacking legitimate predication that the U.S. government otherwise discourages and opposes as a matter of policy in that country and around the world. In so doing, the president undermined U.S. policy supporting anti-corruption reform and the rule of law in Ukraine and undermined U.S. national security. And did the evidence also show that President Trump compromised the national security of the United States? Yes. 
In fact, finding of fact seven said, by withholding vital military assistance and diplomatic support from a strategic foreign partner government engaged in an ongoing military conflict illegally instigated by Russia, President Trump compromised national security to advance his personal political interests. And did the evidence prove that President Trump engaged in a scheme to cover up his conduct and obstruct congressional investigators? Yes, right from the outset. And in fact, finding of fact nine says, using the power of the office of the president and exercising his authority over the executive branch, President Trump ordered and implemented a campaign to conceal his conduct from the public and frustrate and obstruct the House of Representatives impeachment inquiry. Finally, the constitutional scholars from our hearing last week testified that the president's conduct toward Ukraine and pattern of inviting foreign election interference was a continuing risk to our free and fair elections. Did the evidence prove that President Trump was a threat to our elections? Yes, it did, Mr. Chairman. And in fact, finding of fact eight says, faced with the revelation of his actions, President Trump publicly and repeatedly persisted in urging foreign investments, foreign governments, including Ukraine and China, to investigate his political opponent. This continued solicitation of foreign interference in a U.S. election presents a clear and present danger that the president will continue to use the power of his office for his first political gain, for his personal political gain, close quote, I would add in the next election. I now yield to my counsel, Mr. Burke, for additional questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Castro, as an experienced investigator, would you agree that it's relevant to look at evidence bearing on the president's state of mind that may help explain the president's actions. I think the evidence that we talked about show the microphone. Use your mic, please. Sir, my only Sorry, question to you is, is, is that a relevant thing to consider? Right, like the call he had with Senator Johnson. Is it, it's relevant to consider. Sir, would you agree that Joe Biden was a leading Democratic contender to face President Trump in 2020? I wouldn't agree with that. You disagree with it. So, sir, it's your testimony it's too early. that President Trump did not view President Biden to be a legitimate contender. I don't know right? what President Trump believed or didn't believe, but it's too early. Sir, as part of your inquiry, did you determine whether President Trump tweeted at all about Vice, former Vice President Joe Biden between January and July 25th, and how many times? I didn't, I didn't look at Twitter. I try to stay off Twitter lately. Did you know President Trump tweet? Uh, uh, tweeted about former Vice President Joe Biden over 25 times between no. January and uh, July 25th? No, I didn't, I didn't look at those tweets. Did you look at how many times President Trump mentioned Vice President Biden in a speech or rally leading up to the July 25th call? Hey, President Trump goes to a lot of rallies. He does a lot of tweeting. I think it's pretty difficult to draw too many conclusions from his tweets or his statements at rallies. Mr. Chairman. Well, sir, Mr. Your Chairman, parliamentary, parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is not recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what is it? The gentleman it? is not recognized. The gentleman, Mr. Burke, has the time. We're going to ignore the rules we are not allow witnesses to ask the questions. Then the gentleman will how many suspend. other rules are you just going to disregard? The gentleman su will suspend. Parliamentary inquiries are not in order. At this time. Well, how about a point, point, of order. point of order? This is not appropriate to have a the witness have a point be a questioner a point of, of order, somebody that was a witness when he was. The gentleman will suspend. It's just the wrong. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will refrain Mr. Chairman, from making. Point of inquiry. Point of gentleman order. Will well, I made a point of order and you won't rule on it. I have not heard a point of order. If the Mr. gentleman Mr. has a state Mr. of point of order. Chairman, point gentleman of order. has a point of order. He'll state your point of order. Yes, Mr. Chairman. There is no rule nor precedent for anybody being a witness and then getting to come up and order. question. And so I have ruled that we would, that the point not, of order is he's inappropriate to be up here asking questions. That is not a point of order. He's here in accordance with Rule 66. With How much 66. money do you have to give to get to do that? <laughs> the gentleman will not cast aspersions on members of staff of the committee. The gentleman, Mr. Chairman, it was a legitimate Mr. Burke, order. Mr. Burke has the time. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. point Burke of order. Has, Mr. Is Burke Mr. Burke the, a member of the committee? Mr. Burke has the time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I have a legitimate Mr. Burke point, of point of order. Mr. Burke has the time. You have to recognize the point, point of order. Point of order. The gentleman will state a point of order. 
This gentleman is presenting his opinions as a witness. He's supposed to present the material the facts will in the report, point of order. not to appear no. for his opinions. Is that right or not? The gentleman, that is not a point of order. It is Mr. Burke's time pursuant to it's Rule 66. It's inappropriate testimony to the to, committee. It is, I have ruled the, the gentleman has the time pursuant Chairman, to Rule 660. Well, Point of order, uh, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will state a point Just of order. Just to help yes, you, that's yes, not in my rule 660. The gentleman will state a point of order if the, he has one. Yes, the point of order is this. Um, we operate by rules. If there's nothing specifically in the rule permitting this, we go by precedent. It is unprecedented for a person to come and sit who you've described as a witness to then return to the bench and begin the the questioning. Gentleman has stated, that is a point of order. The gentleman has stated. Uh, is that a point of order? Yes. Yeah. That is not a point of order, but I will point out, is not a cognizable point of order. I will point out that we are, the gentleman has been designated by me to, to do this questioning uh, pursuant to Rule 666, House Resolution 660, which is part of the rules of the House. Is it, do it, a is soliloquy, a, then. it is in accordance with the rules of the House, and the gentleman's time will resume. Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Castor, you are aware that President Trump announced his candidacy for re-election in 2020, and he announced it the month before the July 25th call on June 21st? Okay. Did you find that? Did you look at that in your investigation as part of looking at President Trump's intent and what he intended on the July 25th call? I mean, the date he announced his—I mean, he's obviously running for re-election. What, what is the date he announced his— intent to run for re-election matter. And, and, sir, you knew that President Biden had already announced his intent to run in April of that year, too, correct? I've, it's been related to me. I, it wasn't, I don't know when Vice President Biden indicated he was going to going to run as I sit here today. Sir, you would agree with me that if the Ukraine announced a corruption investigation of former Vice President Joe Biden, that would hurt his credibility as a candidate. Would you agree with that basic principle, sir? Well, nobody. Yes or no, sir? Would you agree with that principle? Well, I slightly disagree with the with the predicate with with the premise of your question because Chairman, we're talking I, about I Hunter Biden. The question that requests opinion. Evidence the gentleman is not fact. recognized. The gentleman has the floor. Well, I object to the question. The gentleman rule on whether the question's in order or not. The question is in order. The question is in order. The gentleman will continue. Why? The gentleman will continue. It's his time. Let, let's get back to the fact that we're talking about eight ambiguous lines in a in a call transcript. Um, the, you know, the president was not asking for a personal favor. He was speaking on behalf of the American people. He, he said, and I'll read it, I'd like you to find out what happened with the whole situation in U Ukraine. They say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people. Sir, I'm not asking you to read that. Let me, let me, if you want to talk about the transcript, I don't want to talk, I want to talk to you about some of You said it's eight lines. Let's look at slide three, if we may, the reference to Biden. So you see, on the July 25th call on page four, isn't it the fact that President Trump, in his call with President Zelensky, said that he heard that former Vice President Joe Biden had stopped the prosecution of his son? Is that correct, sir, yes or no? It says the other thing, uh, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. A lot well, that is correct. He said he stopped the prosecution. Point of order, he's entitled to answer the question the fully, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman Have you seen that there's, like a, there's a video of the former VP? I think that's what the president's referring to. He's, he was at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and it was a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, the, the former VP was a little bit, uh, audacious in in how he describes he went over to the I'm U only asking you what it says on the transcript is that what it says sir it says the the other thing there's a lot of talk about Biden's son and that Biden stopped the prosecution it says that correct that's what it says here yes and then it also says it goes on to say President Trump asked President Zelensky if you can look into it correct is that is that the words if you can look into it correct That's what it says. And then he says, So President to me. Trump, I write, President Trump was asking Ukrainian President Zelensky to have the Ukrainian officials look into Vice President Joe Biden, correct? Is that correct, yes yeah, or no? I, I, don't, I don't think the record supports that. It doesn't say, can you look into it? 
President Trump is not asking him yeah, to I don't, say that? I don't think it supports that. I think it's ambiguous. Mr. Goldman, you're an experienced federal prosecutor. I know that firsthand. Is this President Trump asking President Zelensky to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden? I don't think there's any other way to read the words on the page than to conclude that. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Castro, Castro, you made the, a point. Well, let me ask you a question. As an experienced investigator, is it your experience that when someone has done something wrongful or corrupt and they're dealing with somebody who's not in the scheme, that they state their intentions to do something wrongful and corrupt? Is that your experience as an investigator? Well, I mean, are you talking about the call transcript? I'm just asking you in general. General? In general. You're saying that a, the schemer yes. would talk about his scheme? Would he generally admit that he was doing something wrongful and corrupt to someone not in the scheme? Uh, no. And you made a big point, sir, in your presentation that on that call, President Trump did not go further and tell President Zelensky that he wanted the investigation announced to help his 2020 election. Well, he, de he definitely did, did you, not did, talk about 2020. Yeah. And Mr. Goldman, would you agree that if, Mr. if President Trump was acting corruptly, wrongfully, abusing his power, that it was unlikely he was going to confess to President Zelensky that he was asking for the investigation explicitly to help his 2020 election prospects? Yeah, in my experience as 10 years as a prosecutor, uh, you almost never have a defendant or a, uh, someone who's engaging in misconduct who would ever explicitly say, in this case, uh, President Zelensky, I'm going to bribe you now, or I'm going to ask for a bribe, or I am now going to extort you. Um, that's not the way these things work. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. And Mr. Castor, getting back to you, you said that um, he said, said about Hunter Biden and talked about it. Hunter Biden had been on the board of Burisma going back to 2014, correct? Yes. President Trump supported Ukraine uh, with, aid, <clears throat> with aid and otherwise in both uh, 2017 and 2018, correct? Yeah, President Trump has done a lot for Ukraine. That's not, yes. And, sir, but isn't it correct that President Trump did not raise anything about Hunter Biden and his father, Vice President Joe Biden, in 2017 or 2018? He only did it the year before his election in 2020 when both he and Vice President Joe Biden were leading candidates. Isn't that true, sir? I think what happened is the president saw this video of the former VP, and I think it... It, it, it coalesced in his mind. Sir, please answer my question. He didn't raise any of these issues in 2017 or 2018. I don't know that he, that he did or he didn't. I mean, that is not something that we've looked at. You have no evidence that he did, are you? Did you? No, but I have no evidence he did not. Um, I mean, this video is pretty All right, um, sir, uh, let, me ask you, let me ask you this. You talked about Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, who was a highly decorated Purple Heart recipient and worked in the Trump administration, correct? Yes, sir. He had a reaction to the call, didn't he? He did. He was listening to it, correct? He did. He was. Let's look at his reaction. <clears throat> he said, I immediately went to John Eisenberg, the lead legal counsel. He said, it is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. That was his testimony, correct? Yes or no? That was his testimony. Yes? Yeah, the yes. And let me ask you this, sir. You, you had said that the Intelligence Committee majority report that Mr. Goldman had talked about, you said it presents uh, as if things are clear, but they're not clear. Is that what you said, sir? That's absolutely correct. And you also worked on, you worked personally, you said worked on the minority report, correct? Yep. Yes, sir. Was it important to you to be accurate in the minority report that you worked on? Was yes. it important to be fair to witnesses to be accurate about what they said? Of course. Was it important to be fair to the American people of course. to accurately report what people said? Of course. Well, let me ask you about somebody else on that call. Let me ask you about Jennifer Williams. Now, she was a special advisor to Vice, to, uh, Vice President Pence on Europe and Russia affairs. Is that correct? Yes. She worked for Vice President Pence, correct? Correct. And you said in your opening statement that these accusations that President Trump was trying to do something for a political purpose, that that was made by people who were pre, had predetermined motives for impeachment. Is that correct? That's some of them, I, but I also indicated that some of these, the witnesses in the impeachment inquiry, I think have revised their views after, after the, the call transcript came out and the whistleblower complaint was released. Are you calling Vice President Pence's special advisor a liar, sir? No, I didn't say that. Are you calling, are you saying she was predetermined to impeach? 
Um, I, I didn't say that. Uh, well, but, well, you know, what the, the question about Jennifer Williams is interesting is... I, I never, didn't ask you, sir. She, she never uh, mentioned anything to her supervisor. She never mentioned anything to anybody in the vice president's office. En route to Warsaw, when the vice president was going to meet with President Zelensky, um, she didn't even raise it as a potential issue that might, you know, catch the vice president off guard. Well, Mr. So her concern that she articulated during the course of the deposition and during the course of the hearing was incongruent, incongruent with the, with the facts and what she did during times relevant. Mr. Castro, let's look at your report, what you wrote in the report about Ms. Williams. So if we could put up slide six, please. And, sir, you made the same point that you tried to make to, to discount her testimony. You said she testified that although she found the call to be unusual, she did not, um, she did not raise concerns yeah. to her supervisor. Right. right? No, nobody no. in America knew about Jennifer Williams' concerns until she walked in the door for her deposition. Sir, sir when you said that although <laughs> she found the call to be unusual, that wasn't accurate. That's not what she said about the call. She didn't say it was just unusual, did she? She said it was unusual. That's not all she said about it, was it? Okay. I mean, she, she, that was, she was that here for nine hours in the bunker, so she said a lot about the call. So that was you in the Mr. In the, Chairman, can we get a copy of the slide deck? We can't see. I just want the to see. The gentleman will suspend. The gentleman has the time. But we can't see the stuff. Can we uh, just get a copy? The gentleman has the time. Uh, I'm happy to read it. Uh, Jennifer Williams testified that, quote, although she found the call to be unusual, quote, she did not, end of quote, she did not raise concerns to her supervisor. Isn't it a fact, sir, that Ms. Williams said a lot more than that? Mr. If we Chairman, I have a point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. The the point of order is the gentleman from Florida has complained that he can't see what the questioner is relying on and would like to see it. And that is not a, point, a cognizable point of order, and it was read to him. The gentleman will proceed. Only half of it was read to him. Irrelevant. Now, let's slow down a bit here. The gentleman, the gentleman. Let's slow down a bit here so that members are able to fully see what is being put in in support of what you're trying to do. We can't do that uh, without being able to see it or read it. Mr. Gates has said that. Now, let's slow down so that we can see or hear uh, what he is referring to. And you're not letting that happen. And that goes to the privileges of the members Mr. Chairman, that you it's are gentlemen, asking Mr. to Chairman, it's sit in on this meeting will and to vote. The gentleman will suspend. The, uh, Mr. Chairman, I can see now. I appreciate the accommodation. It's the, well, the, the, the monitor was turned. Now we can see. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman will resume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in the, here it says that you said Ms. Williams said that she found it to be, quote, unusual and nothing more. Let's look at slide it seven, if we may. More. Let's look at, it says unusual, correct? Isn't right, it but fact? it doesn't say and nothing more. No, it says unusual. Is it a fact, sir, that what Ms. Williams says is she struck her as unusual and inappropriate? Isn't that correct, sir? Okay. That's what she said in her testimony. Okay. And in your staff report, you left out the inappropriate part, it didn't you? It wasn't a block quote. It was, she, she felt it was unusual. She didn't raise the concerns that Lieutenant General Kellogg. So, sir, let me ask you, were you as fair to the American people in describing what Ms. Williams said as you were in describing any, everything else in your report? I, I, I don't have an issue with the way we described Ms. Williams' testimony. Well, let's look at what else Ms. Williams said. Can we put up slide eight? This is from Ms. Williams' uh, public testimony at 34. She said, I, quote, I thought that the references to specific individuals and investigations such as former Vice President Biden and his son struck me as political in nature, given that former Vice President is a political opponent of the President. So you left that out of your staff report too, didn't you? Well, you know, Miss Williams. Sir, did you leave that out of your report, yes or no? I, I, if, you, if you're telling me I did, I mean, I don't, I don't know as I sit here right now whether that's in I'm the I'm telling you, you did. Me. Okay. <laughs> and you have an explanation, sir, where you said, you said Miss Williams said that the call was unusual when she fact, she said it was unusual and inappropriate and of a political nature because it raised Vice President 
uh, the vice president, who she recognized was a political opponent of the president. Her, her views of the call differ remarkably from Mr. Morrison, also from Lieutenant General Keller. That's not my question. My question is, why did you misquote Ms. Williams in terms of what she said? Her. Why did you do it? We did certainly didn't misquote her. So you stand, so from the standard that you apply to your fact-finding in your report, you believe that it was entirely proper to say that Ms. Williams found the call to be unusual when in fact she found the call to be unusual and inappropriate and of a political nature given that the former vice president is a political opponent of the president. Is that your testimony, sir? I mean, we described what Ms. Williams said. Sir, she is that your testimony? No, you didn't. Mr. Chairman, if either you can ask, the you general, can ask. The general, Mr. Chairman, I'm not. He can either ask or answer, he can't do both. General, Mayor, you can ask or answer, you can't do both. Gentlemen, is not recognized. The chairman, the the chairman I make the point of order that he's badgering the witness. He is not. The gentleman will continue. Sir? And, sir, you, you, you invoked, sir, you invoked Mr. Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, can you rule on my point of order that he's badgering the witness? Because he's doing that. Recognizable. Sir, you, you, inv you invoked that Mr. Not, that is not a cognizable motion. It does not call for a ruling, and the time belongs to the gentleman. A point sir, of order the committee is not an order, and the chairman is not an order. That is not a point of order. The committee is in order. The well, would you rule on my original point of order? You, the original point of order was not cognizable and does not necessitate a the, ruling. That the chairman, lawyer is badgering the witness? The we have to have some chairman, decorum in here, and you chairman, have your rules of decorum, which aren't comporting with everybody else's rules of I will decorum. say that sharp cross-examination of a witness is not badgering the witness. The gentleman will continue. Mr. Chairman. It is if the it's by another continue. witness. No one, the gentleman has the time. Mr. Chairman, oh. point of order. The gentleman will state a point of order. Under uh, Resolution 660, we're supposed to follow the federal rules of evidence. Is that right? No. What is it? What is it? No, it is not correct. What are the rules? What are the objections that we're able to make? Not a, that is not a point of order. The it is a point of order. There's no it rules. It is not a point of order. The gentleman will continue. Where's the list of rules? The gentleman will continue. Thank are we you, thank to you Mr. Chairman. Anything, then? The gentleman will continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Castor, you just invoked Tim Morrison. Mm -hmm. He was someone on the call, too, correct? Yep. Um, and. Uh, let me put up slide nine of Mr. Morrison's testimony on page 38 of his public testimony. And Mr. Morrison said, well, the question was, question by Mr. Goldman. You heard the call. You recognized that President Trump was not discussing the talking points that the NSC had prepared based on official U.S. policy and was instead talking about the investigations that Fiona Hill had warned you about. And then you reported it immediately to the NSC legal advisor. Is that the correct claim of events here? And Mr. Morrison said, that's correct. Before I ask you, Mr. Castor, let me ask you, Mr. Goldman, earlier before your presentation, we showed a testimony of Ms. Hill where she referred to what President Trump was trying to do as running a domestic political errand. Is that what you understand? Is that what you intended to ask Mr. Morrison about in your question to him? Yes, it was about these two specific investigations that President Trump ultimately did discuss and ask President Zelensky to do. Uh, these are the same two investigations that uh, were discussed and were the only two investigations that were at issue throughout the entirety of the scheme. And so what our evidence found was that any time there was a reference to investigations, it referenced the Biden investigation and the 2016 election investigation. And in fact, Ambassador Volcker actually said that whenever he was saying, using the term corruption, what he meant was those specific two investigations. And what was the significance to you that Mr. Morrison, who Mr. Castor himself has relied on and invoked twice today, where he said that he understood these were the investigations that Fiona Hill had warned him about, warned him about. What did you understand that to mean? When um, Dr. Hill left and Tim Morrison replaced her, they had um, transition meetings. And during one of those transition meetings, Dr. Hill told Tim Morrison about a, what she believed to be this irregular channel that Ambassador Sondland was operating, where they were pushing for Ukraine to do these investigations. And Dr. Hill in particular was very concerned because as she said, as you pointed out, that was a domestic political errand, and what she was working on and the National Security Council was working on related to na national security and foreign policy, and those were two entirely separate things. And was she expressing the view that President Trump had chose his own 
personal political interests over the foreign policy uh, positions that Ms. Hill was trying to pursue? At the time that she said that to Tim Morrison, she was not aware of whether uh, President Trump had actually endorsed these investigations. But she did testify that after she read the call transcript, which she only read after it was released like the rest of us, she said that she put two and two together and realized that that is exactly what he was talking about. And what was two and two again? Uh, it equals four. And what is four in this investigation, sir? Well, it was used by two witnesses, Ambassador Sondland and David Holmes, uh, as the only logical conclusion to explain why the security assistance had been withheld, was being withheld from Ukraine. And based on all of the various factors and their direct involvement in issues related to Ukraine, they concluded that the security assistance was being withheld to put pressure and as a condition on the initiation of the two investigations that are referenced here. Yep. Right, turning to you, Mr. I got to clear a couple turn, things turning, up here. Turn, turn, I got to I gotta clear a couple things up here, if I may. First of all, Morrison was concerned. Morrison didn't think the call. Sir, was you have no. There's no question. The gentleman has the time, not the witness. I mean, sir, let me. Morrison gentlemen. was concerned about leaks. Sir, let me ask you, sir. Sir, you said I. And by the way, Vol you, Volker sir, never meant. Gentleman has the time. The clock will stop if he's interrupted. All right. Thank Will this witness you. be able to cross-examine Mr. Burke like he's being able to cross-examine the opposing Gentlemen witness? That's a point of inquiry. Will not shout out in the middle of testimony. You the need to call balls and strikes the right way. He, you don't interrupt either one of them, Mr. Chairman. You're, the well, you're, you're questioner or the witness. Bang it harder. It still doesn't make the point the that you're not doing it right. The gentleman will continue. Sir, I believe it was your testimony. As I wrote it down, the Democrats are about blocking info when they should be seeking information. Oh, my goodness. That is absolutely right. Okay. And then you said that the Trump administration has, in fact, cooperated and facilitated congressional oversight investigations. Is that correct, sir? Am I just yes or no? Is that correct? Absolutely. The Trump administration has participated in oversight during the entire Congress until it got to this impeachment inquiry. So, so let me ask you about this call, sir. Robert Blair. The terms are just not fair. Robert Blair, who was on this call, yeah. the Trump administration, the president himself directed him not to appear and give testimony. Robert correct? Blair, let's, I'm glad you No, I'm asking you, did the president direct him not to appear and give testimony? Yes or no? I think he was allowed to come if agency counsel. He was not allowed to come under the term set by the House Intelligence Committee, correct? I, I think he would have come with agency counsel. The Trump administration directed him not to come, correct? He would have provide a testimony, I think, if, if agency counsel could have come. I mean, it's really there, expensive to hire these outside lawyers. John Eisenberg was directed not to come, correct? The lawyer. Eisenberg presents another set of But he was, he was directed not to come, the lawyer who Lieutenant Colonel Vinman went to, correct? Okay, Eisenberg is a, um, he may have been able to come with agency counsel, but he presents some complexities. I mean, he's the chief legal advisor for Ambassador Bolton. So he was directed not to come, correct? Um, he, he may have been able to come with, with agency counsel, but his testimony does present complexities. Sir, let me ask you this. Was it U.S. policy on July 26th to request that Ukraine investigate former Vice President Joe Biden? Um, you know, I, I think you're reading a little too much into, you know, some of the eight lines. I don't think the president was requesting an investigation into, into Joe Biden. He just mentions an offhand comment. Um, Sir, is that a no? It was not U.S. policy to look into Joe Biden? Yeah, but you're, you're, you're presuming that it then at some point became U.S. policy to investigate Joe Biden, and I don't think that's the case. Sir, let me show you what slide 10, testimony of, all, again, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. And he was asked, are you aware of any written product from the National Security Council suggesting that investigations in the 2020 election, the Bidens or Burisma, are part of the official policy of the United States. No, I'm not. Now let me go also to Tim Morrison, who you invoked. If we could go to slide 11. Mr. Morrison was asked by our own uh, Congressman Swalwell, who was also on the Intelligence Committee, and said, just to, going to pick up in the middle of that long question, it said, you listened to the, the one call that you listened to between the President of the United States and the President of Ukraine, the President of the United States prior, priorities were to investigate the Bidens. And I'm asking you, sir, why didn't you follow up on the President's priorities when you talked to the Ukraine, Ukrainians? Mr. Morrison said, sir, I did not understand it as a policy objective. Mr. Goldman, let me ask you, there was 
uh, a package prepared before that call of what President Trump was uh, supposed to talk about with, the, with President Zelensky, correct? Yes. And am I correct, sir, that one of the things that he was supposed to talk about and was in his prepared remarks was the anti-corruption platform of President Zelensky that he ran and won on, correct? Yes, the witnesses testified that that is a consistent and persistent um, policy objective for the United States. Did President Trump mention corruption once in his call with, President, with Mr. Zelensky? No, he did not. Did he mention looking into anything other than the two investigations that were politically helpful to him, the 2016 election investigation and the investigation of his political rival, former Vice President Joe Biden? No, he did not. May, may Mr. I, Castro, may I add something there? No, you can't. Mr. Castro, Does, let me ask you a President question. Trump did mention, are you going to let him answer? He did mention no. that there's some very bad no, people there. Yell. The, the, gentleman, let him answer. the gentleman, yeah. said, the time yeah. is the questioners, and he can ask the questions Thank whoever he wants. And, when and, you question, you'll have the same rules. And Mr. Castro, in fairness, you'll be, at, you'll be able to answer questions okay. asked by minority counsel when it's their turn. Okay, but, I have 45 minutes, so let, fairness, me ask, you, let me ask you. Come on, Barry. In fairness here, he, President Trump talks about very bad people. Mr. Mr. Castor, if I can finish, and that was, oh, let me finish, sir. It's, let, me, let me ask you this, sir. Sir, there were two lawyers mentioned on the call. Mr. We've heard testimony, we've heard testimony already. Mr. Trump said to mm -hmm. President, President, President Trump said to President Zelensky that he should speak to two people, his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and the Attorney General yeah. Barr, correct? Yep. Okay. Immediately after this call memorandum was released, isn't it the case that Attorney General Barr and the Department of, Ju uh, of Justice issued a statement about his role in all this? He did. Let's put up the statement. Slide 13, please. The Department of Justice. The President has not spoken with the Attorney General about having Ukraine investigate anything relating to former Vice President Biden or his son. The President has not asked the Attorney General to contact Ukraine on this or any other matter. The Attorney General has not communicated with Ukraine on this or any other subject. So, Mr. Goldman, is it fair to say that the Attorney General didn't want anything to do with these investigations that President Trump had raised with uh, President Zelensky on the call? I think it goes actually even a little further. I think it, it, the attorney, whether the attorney general wanted anything to do or not is um, in addition to the fact that the attorney general said he had nothing to do with Ukraine. And in fact, that there were no ongoing investigations at the time of this call or in August. And that became, a, 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 became an issue in the investigation. There is a formal channel that the Department of Justice has and the United States government has to obtain evidence related to an ongoing investigation. And that is generally the proper way to engage a foreign country through treaties to get in information. Uh, but several of the witnesses testified that they looked into that at the urging of the Ukrainians and they determined that there was no formal ongoing investigation nor any formal request on these topics. Now, the, the other lawyer on the call, Rudy Giuliani, he, however, he was more than happy to continue to be involved in trying to get Ukraine to investigate President Trump's political rival, Joe Biden, correct? Mr. Giuliani was um, very active and involved in pushing for these investigations for several months before the July 25th call and then for a couple, several months after, including apparently three days ago. And, and sir, Mr. Castro, you would agree you wrote in your report that Rudy Giuliani, that the Ukrainians themselves knew that Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, was a conduit to convince President Trump of uh, that President Zelensky was a serious reformer, correct? Well, the Ukrainians knew that... Uh, That's what he said. Sir, isn't that what you said in your report? Rudy had the president's ear. And he was a conduit. The Ukraine, let me put up uh, slide 14, if I may, and we actually have your report here. And it says the Ukrainians knew that he, meaning Rudy Giuliani, was a conduit to convince President Trump that President Zelensky was serious about reform. Isn't that what you wrote in your yeah. report, sir? Okay. And, and in fact, during the call, President Trump asked President Zelensky to speak directly to his personal lawyer about Ukrainian matters that President Trump was interested in, correct? You referred him to Rudy, yeah. Yes. And in fact, 
President Zelensky said, oh, we already knew that, and, and he's been in touch with my aides, correct? That's right. In fact, I mean, the Ukrainians are the ones that first, President Zelensky is the one who first brings up Mr. Giuliani on the call. Right, because they knew that Mr. Giuliani was a conduit to the president. And if they made Mr. Giuliani happy, they'd make the President Trump and, happy. Uh, Ambassador correct? Volker testified, though, that Mr. Giuliani had a negative uh, impression of Ukraine and that he was possibly fueling um, the president's views. And so they had, uh, there were some discussions about, hey, if you can convince Rudy that President Zelensky is a true reformer, the real deal, that that would be a beneficial, um, a beneficial link. Well, sir, you agree that President Giuliani, before July 20, the July 25th call and after, was pushing for the Ukrainians to investigate Vice, former Vice President Joe Biden. Isn't that correct? Yes um, or no? Yeah, I mean, the, the record is somewhat spotty with Giuliani. I mean, I know the New York Times reported in May, but Ambassador Volker gave a pretty detailed account of his meeting on July 19th. Well, let's, let's take and a look. If we could put up slide 16, the New York Times article you referred to. Yeah. Right, and the article says, I'll read it. Mr. Giuliani, and this is dated May 9th, 2019, before the call, Mr. Giuliani said he plans to travel to Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, in the coming days and wants to meet with the nation's president-elect to urge him to pursue inquiries that, and then it continues, that allies of the White House contend could yield new information about two matters of intense interest to Mr. Trump. One is the origin of the special counsel's investigation, goes on to describe it, new sentence. The other is the involvement of former Vice President Joe Biden's son. Okay. And now... That was in the New York Times article. And can we talk about we, the breakfast with Volcker? If we could, if we could, not yet. If we could continue the rest of the article to the next slide, which is uh, slide 17. This is the same article. And Mr. Giuliani was very explicit when he was interviewed. He said, and this isn't foreign policy. I'm now quoting the words that are highlighted. It says, it'll be very, very helpful to my client. My only client is the President of the United States. He's the one I have an obligation to report to, to him what happened regarding the Ukraine. Now, sir, were you aware on that same day Mr. Giuliani gave an interview about what he intended to do? And let's go to slide 18. This is from Real, Real, uh, Real Clear Politics, and it should be in the screen in front of you as well. And what, he, what Mr. Giuliani said about the Ukraine, he said, it's a big story, it's a dramatic story, and I guarantee you Joe Biden will not get to election day without this being investigated. Not because I want to see him investigated, the collateral to what I was doing. So, sorry, and you agree, election day refers to the 2020 election where President Trump will be running against, will be running for re-election, correct? I don't know what Julian you're talking know. about, but I guess you're right. The, okay, well, the, let me, um, so that was my only question to you. You'll have a chance to answer questions okay. to the Minority Council. Um, now, and President Trump, let me show you seven, uh, slide so We're, we're going to sidestep the Volcker meeting on July 19th? Sir, you'll have an opportunity to talk about that when, when Minority Council okay. questions you. Let me go to slide 19, please. And the President says he's being interviewed now the same day in a Politico, and he's asked about Mr. Uh, Giuliani. He's leaving soon, I think in the next couple days. Mr. Trump says, I see. Well, I will speak to him about it before he leaves. Now, let me go to slide 20, because President, excuse me, Mr. Giuliani continued his pressure on President Zelensky. In this one, it's actually a tweet that he put out um, on June 21st, the, uh, 2019, roughly a month before the call. He says, new president of Ukraine, still silent on investigation of Ukrainian interference in 2016 election and alleged Biden bribery of the prior president. And again, sir, as you said, the Ukrainians knew that Mr. Giuliani had the ear of his client, President Trump. Isn't that correct, sir? Is uh, that correct, sir? Yes or no? The, uh, you know, Giuliani was doing some things in, you know, out here, and then he became involved with the official channel, with Volker, with Sondland, and at that meeting on July 19th, Volcker, you know, counseled against the perspective Giuliani was taking. So my question to you, sir, is this tweet, what they're talking about, well, let me ask you, Mr. Goldman, you hadn't had a chance at all. This tweet, is that referring to a personal political issue of President Trump or official U.S. policy? 
that's a that's a personal political issue. And if, if you don't mind, I'll just take a moment to respond to Mr. Castor because please do on that July 19th meeting between Ambassador Volker and Rudy Giuliani. Ambassador Volker told Mr. Giuliani that the allegations about Joe Biden were completely uh, bogus and wrong. And Mr. Giuliani actually told, according to Ambassador Volker's testimony, Mr. Giuliani said that he knew that. And yet, for the next two months, he continued to push for that same investigation at the direction of President Trump, who had also directed President Zelensky to contact Mr. Giuliani. So that, that July 19th meeting that Mr. Castor brought up is actually quite important to this investigation. And, sir, you, you already explained that on May 23rd, when the official folks who went to the inauguration of President Zelensky came back to tell the president how impressed they were, the only thing he had to say to them was, talk to Rudy. He was taking his official government people responsible for Ukraine and handing them over to Rudy Giuliani so that they could work with him for the issues that he was focused on for the president as evidence in the tweet. Is that fair? I agree with Mr. Castor. I think that's, that's what the evidence shows, that at that May 23rd meeting, President Trump directed and delegated authority over Ukraine matters to Ambassador Sondland, Volker, and Secretary Perry, and told them to work with Rudy. And then over the next three months, that's exactly what happened at the president's direction. Okay. And in fact, let me show you um, what is slide uh, 22, if I may, that you understood the Ukrainians recognized how important Rudy Giuliani was and satisfying him in order to stay on good terms with President Trump? Yes. they they quickly realized it, I think, from their own um, internal conversations, because Mr. Giuliani had back channels to getting to, um, to the Ukrainian officials. And um, Ambassador Volker told the Ukrainians as well um, that there was this, quote, Giuliani factor that President Zelensky, he actually told it to President Zelensky, that there was this Giuliani factor that uh, they needed to deal with with the president. And in fact, this is the senior aide to President Zelensky saying to Ambassador Volker on August 13th, which is obviously after the July 25th call, thank you for meeting in your clear and very logical position. It will be great meet with you before my departure and discuss. I feel that the key for many things is Rudy, and I'm ready to talk to him with him at any point. Please let me know when you can meet. Audrey. And again, that's Rudy, the, the, am I right, that's the Ukrainians recognize that Rudy Giuliani, who's demanding the investigation of Mr. Trump's political rival, was key to getting yeah, anything done. I, I don't mean to be a stickler, but I believe this text was actually July 10th. Um, and this was a critical text uh, because what it is saying is Mr. Yermak, after having spoken to Mr. Volker a week before and learning about the importance of Giuliani, requested to Ambassador Volker to meet, to set up a meeting with Mr. Giuliani. That then proceeded to this July 19th breakfast that Mr. Castor said, and then a July 22nd phone call, and then ultimately they met in Madrid on August 2nd. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Further evidence of the meticulous investigation that uh, Chairman Schiff and his staff with you directed. Uh, we will stand corrected. Thank you. And I will take that and ask that the record reflect that, that that is the correct date. In either, either case, Rudy was key whenever it was said, correct? Certainly. And now let me ask, sir, let me put up slide 24. And Mr. Goldman, am I correct that there came a point in time when President Trump, through his chief of staff, Mr. Mulvol uh, Mick Mulva Mulvaney, ordered that the approved military aid to Ukraine be withheld, as you previously indicated, correct? Yes. And this is the testimony of the people who were involved. Mr. Kent said, when this happened, there was great confusion among the rest of us because we didn't understand why that had happened. Since there was unanimity that this aid was in our national interest, it just surprised us all. Mr. Holmes, and then you had the additional hold of the security assistance with no explanation whatsoever, and we still have an explanation, and we still have, don't have an explanation for why that happened or in the way that happened. Ms. Croft, the only reason given was that the order came at the direction of the president. So, Sir, let me ask you a question. Did all the agencies involved believe that the aid should be given? Yes, it was the unanimous view of all of the agencies, Secretary of State, uh, Department of State, Department of Defense, National Security Council, literally every one of the interagency um, uh, agencies um, that, that believed that the aid was vital and had already been approved and should be released immediately.
And um, in the minority staff report and in Mr. Castor's testimony earlier, he said the U.S. government did not convey the pause to the Ukrainians. Well, that wasn't correct, was it? Didn't Mr. Sondland uh, convey that? according to Mr. Sondland's affidavit and testimony? Mr. Sondland ultimately conveyed that the um, release of the aid was conditioned on the annou public announcement of the investigations. And if we could put up slide 26 from the affidavit. Zoom that, though, is what he said. Well, if, if I may, just in response we'll, we'll to put, We'll put up the slide. Sure. We could put up the actual affidavit that Mr. Ambassador Sondland, the President Trump's ambassador to the European Union, that he swore to under penalties of perjury. And he says, if we read the highlighted, which is also in front of you, I now recall speaking individually with Mr. Yermak, where I said that, where I said to Mr. Yermak, the Ukrainian aid, that, going back to the quote, that resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine provided the public anti-corruption statement that we have been discussing for many weeks. Is that correct, sir? Yes, he said that on, on, uh, at a meeting on September 1st with Mr. Yermak in Warsaw. And the statement that they had been talking about, let me put up a slide that we put together, slide 27. And you recall, sir, that in the draft statement that the Ukrainians were going to have President Zelensky give so they could, and was that statement on their mind so they could get a White House meeting and satisfy President Trump and have the aid released? Yes, Ambassador Sondland testified to that, and Ambassador Volker also testified to that. And am I correct that Mr. Yermak gave a statement where he did not make any reference to Vice President Biden, correct? Correct. And then was that Rudy Giuliani who said in the second one that it had to include a reference that they were going to investigate Burisma in the 2016 election? That's right. And what did Burisma stand for? That was, was that, did you, did all your witnesses say they had an understanding of what that meant? Or did the witnesses say that? So every single witness said after reading the phone call on July 25th that it was clear Burisma equaled Biden, that they were one and the same. Um, there were only two witnesses who said that they did not know that until that time. And there was ample testimony. There was a lot of testimony from people involved in all aspects of Ukraine policy. Uh, who indicated that it was completely unrealistic and unlikely that anyone who had anything to do with Ukraine did not, would not know that the Burisma investigation related to the Bidens. And is that why, and that's how Mr. Giuliani publicly referred to it often as Burisma and Vice President Biden, correct? Correct, yes. And did the Ukrainians complain repeatedly, we talked a little bit about it, that they didn't want to be a pawn in U.S. democratic politics by helping President Trump's reelection campaign by making such a statement? They, they said that in, in July and in August, ultimately they didn't give the statement in large part because they had reservations given that President Zelensky was an anti-corruption reformer, they had reservations about engaging in U.S. domestic politics. That's right. Okay. I want to go back to you, Mr. Castor. You said that when President Trump said to Mr. So Ambassador Sondland on September 17th that he had no quid pro quo, you said he had no September reason. 9th. You September said 9th. September 9th. You said he had no reason to be any less than candid. That's what you said. No reason to be any less than candid. Let me show you, sir, what happened, though, on September 5th. Let me show you slide 52. Days before he made that statement, the Washington Post printed a, an article that says, Trump tries to force Ukraine to meddle in the 2020 elections, and goes on to describe some of those efforts. And, sir, let me show you whether President Trump was aware of that article before he volunteered no quid pro quo as a defense. Let me show you a tweet by President Trump on slide 53. Now, and again, this is, he is putting out a tweet that is essentially saying the Democrats, based on following up the article, that they are pursuing uh, impeachment. Um, again, showing awareness that this has now been reported on. So, Mr. Goldman, is it fair to say what Mr. Castor said, that Mr. Trump, President Trump had no reason to be any less than candid about saying no quid pro quo? No, no I think uh, President Trump had uh, every reason to try to put out that message at that point. As Ambassador Sondland said, even when he, even if you credit Ambassador Sondland's version of the testimony, which is 
contradicted by other witnesses who took contemporaneous notes and are, were far more credible than Mr. Sondland, who had to amend his testimony a couple times. He said even in that comment, he said no quid pro quo out of the blue without, without any uh, question about whether or not there was a quid pro quo. There you go. There you go. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member first, for his first round of questions. Pursuant to House Resolution 660, the ranking member or his counsel have 45 minutes to question the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it's, it's become very evident why this hearing is here and why the, uh, the craziness of this hearing, especially not having Mr. Schiff here. But please put back up the last slide. I have no idea what number it is. Not as good a counsel as 53. 53. Yep. <laughs> Did we cut it off after they got through? It was 11 seconds. 11 seconds. Okay, well, while we're doing this, I mean, I think it's just the most amazing statement came out there. We're, we're proofing the tweet that said that he thought that he was the Democrats were concerned about impeachment. There's nothing the Democrats have not been concerned about for two and a half years. Since August, I mean, since November 2016, the president is saying nothing new in that tweet. There's now back up. He's known that they have been after impeachment. That's why Mr. Goldman is here. That's why Mr. Burke is here. That's why we're going through this charade of staff having to answer staff questions. And basically, when we don't like how it's going, we start asking staff on staff and getting into a staff argument. Where's Adam? Where's Adam? It's his report, his name. Mr. Goldman, you're a great attorney, but you're not Adam Schiff, and you don't wear a pen. That's true. We got a problem here. And the problem is developing this. You said you were an attorney. You're a very good prosecutor. I believe it. I've read your bio. You're a good attorney. You understand what quid pro quo is, correct? I do. You understand what asking for something in exchange for something actually means, correct? I do. You know about the conversation of Mr. Biden when he asked and he said, I'm not going to give you the billion dollars. You know about that conversation, correct? The, you, you want me to read it to you or do you know it? One second. Are you talking about in 2015? No, I'm talking about the one from the national uh, where he did the, I'll read it to you since you're having trouble. As I remember going over to the Ukraine, convincing our team, our leaders, convincing them that we should provide for loan guarantees. As I went over, I guess the 12th or 13th time to Kiev, I was supposed to announce that there was a billion dollar loan guarantee. And I got a commitment from Poroshenko and they said that I would take action against, that they would take action against the state prosecutor. They didn't. So they, so they said they had, they were walking out to the press conference. I said, nah, I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have authority, you have no authority, you're not the president. The president said, I said, call him, laughter. I said, I'm telling you, you're, getting, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion dollars. I'm getting, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting ready to be leaving here, and I think about six hours, I looked at them and said, I'm leaving here in six hours. If the prosecutor is not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch, he got fired. Did he ask for something, request something, and hold something of value? He did. George Kent testified that that I was... I think I'll do what you did. George Kent testified this. I'm asking about not George Kent. I'm asking about this question. Right, but it, it's important context. It's not. Answer this question. Did he or did he not? He's a, either Joe Biden's a liar, telling a story to make people impressed, or he actually did this. Which is it? He did it pursuant to U.S. official policy. So he did it in holding, withholding, Actual dollars, actual thing, holding this out there. So Joe Biden, of everybody that we discussed about, is the only one that's done a quid pro quo. He's the only one that's used taxpayer dollars to actually threaten a foreign government. And yet we're sitting here pretending that this is not happening? We're sitting here pretending that a president of the United States now would not be concerned? Look, you look at it this way. Joe Biden's a terrible candidate. He can destroy himself on the campaign trail, but he can't get by this. And it doesn't matter who brings it up. It doesn't matter who does it, because this is what happened. And you can whitewash it all you want, you can go over whatever you want, but that's what he did. He's either a liar or he did it, and he did it. I want to continue on. Question is a question that you had earlier. You rely on how many, approximately how many times do you rely on Gordon Sondland's testimony in your report? Oh, I, I, it's a nearly a 300-page report. Would I you be amazed count. if it was 600 times or better? I, 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 you wouldn't have any idea or not? I have no idea. Okay? You did. It's over 600 times. Would you also understand if you do a simple check of your report that over 158 times Mr. Sondland said, instead of knowing, not knowing something, to the best of my knowledge, or I don't know. Would that surprise you? Are, are you talking about the report or his deposition? The, the deposition and the closed-door testimony. 
Yes, and over time, he remembered a lot more as he was refreshed by other yeah, people's testimony. It is. The question we're having here, though, is Mr. Sondland also said, and many times he said he presumed what actually happened. Let's go back to something else. We're going to continue this in just a moment. According to your report, HIPSI, and we'll classify that and we'll determine that to be the Intelligence Committee and the other investigation with the other two committees. We okay with that? Certainly. Okay. Issued dozens of subpoenas, is that right? Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm certainly over a dozen, yes. Some of the subpoenas were not publicly reported until the HIPSI issued its majority report, correct? Uh, most of the subpoenas were Answer not the question is Mr. Burke had so much free reign, let's go at it. Either answer the question or elaborate, one or the other. Sir, I'm trying to answer the question. Uh, did you or didn't you? Is, did it come out or not? Did what come out? I'll read it again. Some of the subpoenas were not publicly reported until the HIPSI issued its majority report, correct? Yes, they were given to the minority, but not pub the public, yes. Putting aside the witnesses who have publicly been identified, did you issue any other subpoenas for testimony other than the ones publicly identified? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think okay. so, Thank you. but I'm not sure. How many subpoenas were issued for records? Well, we issued an, uh, a number of subpoenas for records. We, we did issue six subpoenas to um, executive branch agencies and they all defied our subpoenas. In this, moving on to other uh, issues here, the Wall Street Journal reported that the committee issued at least four subpoenas to Verizon and AT&T for call records, is that correct? The, um, we... Are we wondering? Ye yes, we are because um, there are multiple numbers. Um, it's, we, we only issued subpoenas for call records for people who were involved in the investigation and who had already been subpoenaed by the committee for documents and testimony of their own. Absolutely wonderful uh, uh, stuff, but answer my question. Four? Well, I am trying to answer your question. D was it at least four? Yes. Thank you. Could have saved us a lot of time there. How many subpoenas were issued at and I, I don't know off the top Can of my Can you check your records? I, this I, is I, important, because we just found out about this over the weekend. We got a massive document dump over the weekend preparing for this hearing in which the chairman admitted and the staff admitted they're not going to be able to read it all anyway. So for all of you writing reports about this, all that massive document dump, we're just simply going on a Schiff report which Schiff refuses to come testify about but sends his staff. So this is important stuff. We just found out about this. So how many subpoenas were issued to AT&T? I, I don't know. If you'd like me to find That's out fine. the break, you don't know, I'd be happy then, to. Then again, maybe your chairman could be here to actually answer this. Was it targeted at a single telephone number or numbers? We, we subpoenaed for call records multiple numbers. How many? I, I don't know. None, none of, uh, this okay, is very important though. Here, none of members of Congress, none of staff of Congress. Oh, we're getting to that. None of journalists. We're getting to that. We only did it to the subjects who were involved in the investigation, which is a very routine and standard investigative and, practice. Sir. And you're not going to hear anything from me about a subpoena and the legality of a subpoena. My problem is this. Who asked? Who on the committee asked that those numbers that you actually did put into the run, into for a subpoena and get those numbers back? Who was it that asked that they be cross-checked for members of the media and, and members of the Congress? Who ordered that? I don't think that's how we did it, sir. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. You came out with a report that actually showed these people, such as Mr. Chairman Nunez and others, were actually on these calls. Yes. Now, someone, and you and I, we're not going to play cute here. Somebody took the four records that you asked for, or at least four, took those numbers and then said, hey, let's play uh, match game. Who ordered the match game for members of Congress and the press? Was it you? I don't, I don't think anyone did, sir. Then how did you get, yeah, okay, come on, that's the most ridiculous item I've ever heard. You don't just all of a sudden pick up numbers in which you have to match those numbers to actually show where they are and you don't come up with them. Who ordered them to actually match for members of Congress and the press? That's actually what you just described is exactly how it happens. You ha you pick who an event. ordered to find out if Nunez's number was on those calls? If I could just explain, sir. You pick an event of significance in the investigation, and you look for sequencing and patterns surrounding that event. You look then at the numbers, and you try to identify what those numbers are, and then you start to build the circumstantial case. At this point, that's a wonderful explanation, but not an answer to my question. 
Those are you looking for the four numbers you asked for and to see how they're connected. I understand the subpoena that you issued. My question directly, was it you or was it Chairman Schiff that said, while we're doing this, let's see if this matches Chairman Nunez's number. Let's see if this matches a member of the press's number. Somebody along the way just didn't all of a sudden have an epiphany, unless you're getting ready to throw a low-level staffer under the bus, that these numbers might match. So who did it? Was it Chairman Schiff or was it you? Um, Be careful, you're under oath. I know I'm under oath, sir. Then answer the question. Matter. And I, I will answer the question if you give me a second here. It's not a simple answer. The same answer. second that was not afforded to my witness, by the way. Well, well I think he was allowed to Who decided to, to leak question? it, by the way? If you're not going to tell me the other story, while you're thinking about how you're going to answer that question, who decided to leak it, the information? Why did you include it in the report? That's not a leak, sir. Why did you include it in the report? After not saying anything else about this, not publicly known. So two questions are hanging out that everybody's looking for an answer for, including me. Who ordered it? Was it you or was it Chairman Schiff? And then why was it decided, except for nothing but smear purposes, to be included in the Schiff report? Well, I, I'm not going to get into the deliberations of our investigation with you. And I will tell you the reason it was included in the report is because it, it, the calls were surrounding important evidence to our investigation. And I think that your question is, frankly, not better directed not at me, but at the people who were having conversations. Oh, no, no, no. We're not going to play that game. No, we're not going to play that game. You're, you're as good as Mr. Burke. You're not going to play that game. You're not answering the question. And every member of the media, everybody here, when you start going into the decorum of this House, when you start looking at members' telephone numbers, you start looking at reporters' telephone numbers, which they ought to be scared about, you took a subpoena for four. And then you decided to play match game. You found numbers that you thought were like it. Some of them actually didn't exist because you, they claimed that they were for the White House Budget Office, and they were not. So we're throwing stories out there because nobody was, nobody was out there acting. So I go back to my question. Are you going to go on record in front of everybody here today and say that you will not tell who ordered this, you or Mr. Goldman? Mr. Goldman, you or Mr. Schiff? I am going to go on record and tell you that I'm not going to reveal how we conducted this investigation. And that's the problem we have with this entire thing. Mr. Schiff said behind closed doors. I can doors tell you what the importance time. is. I'm done it. with you for right now. We're done. Right. You're not answering the question. You're not being honest about this answer because you know who it is. You're just not answering. Mr. Castor. I have some information on the subpoenas. Let's go. We did receive copies of the subpoenas, and we, we, we tracked this. There were six, as I understand it. And, and let me just say at the outset, our, our members have concerns about this exercise for three reasons. You're, the, the subpoenas yielded information about members of Congress. Whether they're subpoenaed, the members' phone records or not, it's a concern when the information yields member of Congress's phone records, and then the information is publicized. Second is with journalists. It's just generally a very tricky area to start investigating journalists' call records. And the third is, is with regard to Mr. Giuliani, who was serving as the president's personal attorney. But there's six subpoenas, as we understand it. Um, the first went to AT&T for the Giuliani numbers. The second was uh, in regard to Igor Fruman to a company, uh, CSC Holdings. The third w uh, related to Mr. Sondland. That was off to Verizon. The fourth was back to AT&T, uh, seeking information uh, on a certain number. The fifth was back to AT&T. And the sixth was seeking subscriber information, um, which impacted the, the veteran journalist John Solomon, and also involved with these are, are some, you know, some of the attorneys involved, such Mr. as Castor, can I ask you a question? Ms. Tunsing and G G Geneva. Mr. Castor, you've been a, a veteran of the Hill investigation for 15 years, and this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. You never have either. Would it be interesting to note, because Mr. Uh, Goldman chooses not to answer because he doesn't want to incriminate, I believe, either himself or the chairman or somebody else. Would it be interesting to you to find, as you've dealt with uh, committee staff for a long time, somebody to just have a, an epiphany just to do those match records on their own, or were they under direction by somebody to do that? Well, it, it's obviously they were trying to figure something out. That's it. All right, one last, uh, well, I'm getting ready to try. Wait, wait, I have one thing for Mr. Goldman. Mr. Goldman, we're used to committees and people and witnesses coming, taking gratuitous shots at people they don't like. And earlier today, in your testimony, you made a comment that really goes with an interesting thing, and I'll even go back to the chairman questioning motive. 
when your testimony you said as you were discussing Mr. Sondland, you made a very snide comment, your, actually your facial expression showed, that he was a million dollar donor to the president. The implication being he either got his job because he bought it or his implication was he was loyal to the president and say anything about it. Be very careful about how you throw around dollars in, in giving because you and Mr. Burke are real heavy donors to the Democratic Party. And I'm not going to say it questions your motive or your position here today, but we need to make sure that this thing is already blown out of proportion. We're already not answering questions. And you are here without a pen because your chairman will not testify. That says all we need to hear. He don't even stand behind his own report, and he sends you. I hope it works out for you. I'm done. At this point, I turn it over to Ashley. Could I, could I, could I respond? Are you, are you trying to say that, that I uh, – what are you trying to say? What is the implication here? But by the way, I didn't give anything close to a million dollars remotely. So I don't no, know. The implication 30. is we yeah. want Schiff in that chair, not you. The implication is the person that wrote the report is the person that should come yeah. and present it. And you weren't elected by anybody, and you're here giving gentlemen this testimony not, in place of the chairman. Have, I hope that clears up the implication. The gentleman does not have the time, and the gentleman has been warned before. He cannot simply yell out and disrupt the committee. The gentleman, Mr. Collins, has the yeah, time. Please. I think you understand exactly what you did. And I called it out for just the way you did. You thought you were going to get by with it, and you didn't. That's all I'm saying, Ms. Ash, Ms. Callan. Well, I would like to just say one other thing. Yeah, I, I, have, I am done. Point of order. There's I am no done. question it, before the, the, the to, to, I mean, you're stop, you're you're, stop. you're casting to, you're to, casting to, aspersions. No, as you did, Mr. As you did, Mr. Goldman. Point of order. As you did, Ms. Mr. Sunland. Now, according to the chairman's own ruling, just a few minutes ago. I'm done asking questions, and I'm not asking you to elaborate, because I'm not asking you any more questions. I've asked all. You won't answer the question on who told the committee to actually check these numbers. You won't say if it's you or if it's Mr. Schiff. You won't answer my questions, so we're done. We're going to Ms. Cowan. You're, you have, as, as was Mr. Burke said, you'll have plenty of time with helpful majority counsel. Does the will. gentleman yield his time to Ms. Cowan? Yes. Gen the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Callan, if I may. I'm yes, so certainly. Sorry. I have a I have a number of things I think I, I need to clear up, if I may. Yes, certainly. Um, and you don't have to bear with me because I, I have a, a number of them here. Um, first of all, on the on the call, Tim Morrison, General Kellogg, I have a totally different view of the call than. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and Jennifer Williams, going to the point that the call is ambiguous. So that, that's the first thing. Tim Morrison testified that he went to the National Security Council lawyers for a very different reason. He, he did not say he went to the NSC lawyers because he was concerned about the call. He went to the National Security Council lawyers for two, for two reasons. Number one, they weren't on the call. So we wanted to update them about it. But number two, he was concerned about leaks. And he was concerned that if this call leaked out, how it would play in Washington's polarized environment, which is exactly what we have here. He was also concerned that if the call leaked, that it might affect bipartisan support in Congress. You, 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 you know, issues of Ukraine have traditionally been one of the, the few issues where Republicans and Democrats share um, interests. And the third reason was that he didn't, he didn't want the Ukrainians to get a distorted perception of what actually happened on the call, because on the call, and we're talking about eight lines of concern uh, and, and a lot of ambiguity. Um, this Oval Office meeting on May 23rd. There's this question, I guess it's ambiguous. I didn't think it was ambiguous, but there's a question about whether when the president referred the, dele the delegation goes to the inauguration May 20th. They come back, it's Sondland, it's Volcker, um, and, and it's, it's Secretary Perry and it's Senator Johnson. And they're, they're briefing the president and the president is having none of it. He says Ukraine is concerned or uh, corrupt and he, he doesn't want to invite Zelensky to the White House. Um, and the, the president, and Volcker testifies to this pretty definitively, the president essentially, he doesn't order anybody to do anything. The president says, talk to Rudy. And Volcker testified both at, at his deposition and in, at the public hearing 
that he didn't take it as a direction. It's just like, look, if you, if you guys, if you guys think this is important and you want to work it, go just go talk to Rudy. It's very different than a than a direction. It's very different than the president ordering a scheme. Um, and it's very very different from the president sort of collecting up a bunch of agents to go do something. Because he simply, according to Ambassador Volker, said, go talk to Rudy. Um, now, whether the Ukrainians knew of the aid pause, or the aid was paused for 55 days, right. whether the Ukrainians knew about it or not has been, uh, you know, Laura Cooper from DOD and, you know, some State Department witnesses testified about light queries that they had received. Um, there was an article on November 22nd in Bloomberg, and the Zelensky administration said they never knew about the hold in the aid until August 28th Politico article. And they said in, in the article, and Yarmak is the principal person they're relying on here, Yarmak says that they believe the embassy was keeping information from them. Another interesting thing Mr. Yarmak says in that November 22nd Bloomberg article is that he recounts the whole aside meeting with Sondland, which has become very significant, apparently. In the pull aside meeting, he says, he doesn't recall it the way Ambassador Sondland recalled it. Now, keep in mind, Ambassador, or, uh, Mr. Yarmak speaks uh, English, but it's not his first language. Um, and so he, he does not recall the pull aside meeting, which, by the way, happened on the way to an escalator um, after the meeting with the Vice President. So he recalls it very differently. So. The question and the facts of what happened between Ambassador Sondland and Mr. Yarmak on the way to the escalator remain in dispute. Yes. Now, turning attention to the, the Ron Johnson letter, if I may. Yes. On August 31st, Senator Johnson is getting ready to travel to Ukraine on September 5th with Sen Senator, um, with Murphy. And he, he wanted, Johnson wanted the aid release, so he calls the president, and he actually sought permission to be the bearer of good news. Right. The president said, I'm not ready to, to lift the aid. And they had this, Senator Johnson, I mean, he, he writes a 10-page ten, ten letter, very, um, very detailed, uh, and he, he gives some, some remarkable detail. Um, and I'd like to read it. It's on page six. I, I, this is Senator Johnson speaking. He said, I asked him whether there was some kind of arrangement where Ukraine would take some action and the hold would be lifted. Without hesitation, Senator Johnson says, President Trump immediately denied such an arrangement existed. And he started cursing. And he said, no way. President Trump said, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? Mm -hmm. And Senator Johnson goes on to say that, that President Trump's reaction here was adamant, vehement, and angry. Senator Johnson goes on to say that as of August 31st, the president told him, but I'm, you're gonna like my decision in the end. So I think that's very important context uh, on what the president's state of mind was, at least as of August 31st. Right. He fully expected, do you agree, uh, that yes. the aid would eventually be released after the 55-day pause? Yes. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I want to thank you all for your presentations. Uh, Mr. Castor, I believe you've been talking for approximately 75 minutes today, um, and I want to thank you for that. Um, my, my wife thanks you as well. She likes it when I do the talking when she's not around. <laughs> Um, time permitting today, I'd like to cover four or five areas, um, distinct areas. Um, there's a lot of facts that the American people have not heard. And there's a lot of contradictions in certain people's testimony. Is that fair to say, Mr. Castor? And I'd like to talk about some of the people in this story that have first-hand knowledge of the facts. We have Ambassador Volker, 
Ambassador Sondland, and Secretary Perry. You had the opportunity to talk to two of those three people. Is that correct? Yes. And the Democrats' report would like us to believe that these three individuals were engaged in some sort of cabal or some sort of nefarious venture. But that's not true, is it? No. In fact, these three people were at all relevant times, and even today, acting in the best interest of the American people. Is that true? That's right, and with the highest integrity. That's right. <laughs> I think everyone testified that Ambassador Volker is one of the most experienced diplomats in our foreign service. Is Across the correct? board, all the witnesses, okay. including Ambassador Yovanovitch, talked about the integrity that Ambassador Volker brings to the table. But there's a lot of people with firsthand knowledge that we didn't talk to. Is that correct? Yes. Um, now I want to talk about uh, the president's skepticism of foreign aid. The president is very skeptical of foreign aid. Is that correct? He is deeply skeptical of sending U.S. taxpayer dollars into an environment that is corrupt because it's as good as kissing it goodbye. And is that something new that he believes or is that something he ran on? This is something that he has ran on. It's something that he has implemented policies as soon as he became president. Ambassador Hale, the third ranking State Department official, told us about the over, you know, overall review of all foreign aid programs and he described it as almost a zero-based uh, evaluation. Right, and you had the opportunity to take the deposition of Mark Sandy, who is a career official at OMB, is that right? Correct. And he had some information about the reason for the pause. Is that true? I think that he had a conversation with an individual named Rob Blair, and Mr. Blair provided some insight into the reason for the pause. Yeah, Sandy was one of the few witnesses that we had that was able to give us a first-hand account inside of OMB, the, the reason for the, for, the, for the pause related to the president's concern about European burden, burden sharing right. in the region. And he, and really? in fact, Here. in his conversations, the president's conversations with that Senator that Johnson, that he mentions his concern about burden sharing. And I believe he referenced a conversation that he had with the Chancellor of Germany. Um, and in fact, the whole first part of the July 24th transcript, he's talking about burden sharing and wanting the Europeans to do more. Um, but yeah, I mean, Senator Johnson was, and President Trump were, they were pretty candid and, you know, they believed that allies like Germany were, were laughing at us because we were so willing to, to spend the aid. Right. Um, now I'd like, you know, there's been a lot of uh, allegations that President Zelensky is not being candid about feeling pressure from President Trump. And isn't it true that he stated over and over publicly that he felt no pressure from President Trump? Is that true? Yeah, he's, he said it consistently. He said it in the United Nations September 25th. He said it, um, you know, in three more news availabilities over the course of the period, including last week. I want to change subject, subjects and talk about something that Professor Turley raised last week and that is um, the partisan nature of this investigation. Uh, and you're an experienced congressional investigator. And, and Professor Turley, by the way, I mean, he's no Trump supporter. That's right. Oh. He is a Democrat. That's right. Um, and, but Professor Turley cautioned that a partisan inquiry is not what the founders envisioned. Is that correct? Correct. And the worst thing you can have with an impeachment is partisan rancor, right. because nobody's going to accept the result on the other side. 
and our Democrat friends have all of a sudden become originalists and are citing the founders and their intent routinely as part of this impeachment process. I think that goes to the, this, 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 whether this constitutes uh, br bribery. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's case law on bribery, and I'm no, I'm no Supreme Court scholar or lawyer or advocate, but, um, you know, there's new case law with the McDonald case about what constitutes an official act, and that certainly hasn't been, um, you know, addressed in this space, and I, th I think Professor Turley mentioned that. Right, and I think Professor Turley said that a meeting certainly does not constitute an official act. I think it's the McDonald case. Right. Um, goes to and that. And Professor Turley pointed that out for us last mm -hmm. week. Yes. Um, since this inquiry's unofficial and unsanctioned start in September, the process has been partisan, biased, unfair. Um, Republicans questioning has been curtailed routinely. Um, I think we saw that uh, in Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman's deposition. There were some, you know, yeah, we were barred from asking him questions about who he communicated his concerns to. Right, very basic things like who, what, when, where. And instead- And I would say too, this, this rapid, you know, we're in day 76, and it's almost impossible to do a sophisticated congressional investigation that quickly, especially when the stakes are this high, because any congressional investigation of any consequence, it, it, it does take a little bit of time for the two sides to stake out their, their interests and how they're going to respond to them. Right. Um, you know, we learned with the Goodlatte Gowdy probe, you know, the first letter I think went in October of um, 2017. And, you know, in December we finally got a witness. And it was the following spring with the, in the Goodlatte Gowdy probe, after a lot of pushing and pulling and a lot of tug of war, we, we reached a deal with DOJ where we went, we went down to DOJ and they gave us access to documents and they gave us access to, I think, you know, north of 800,000 pages. But they made us come down there. They made us go into a skiff and these documents weren't classified. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't until May and June of that year that we started this process when the investigation had been ongoing. And, and that is uh, disappointing. Obviously, we all wish there was an easy button, but congressional investigations of consequence uh, take time. Right. And it took, I think, six months before the first document was even produced. And like you said, you had to go down there mm -hmm. and review it in camera. Mm -hmm. And then going back even further to Fast and Furious, mm -hmm. the investigation of the death of a yeah. Border Patrol agent. Yeah. I mean, Fast and Furious, we issued subpoenas. Mr. Issa um, it had sent some subpoenas, I think, in February of 20, um, 2011. And we, we, we had a hearing in June with experts about proceeding to contempt. You know, what does it take to go to contempt? And that, that was the first time in June when we got any production. And the production was largely publicly available information. And we went, we spent most of the year trying to get information out of the Justice Department. At the time, we were also working um, with whistleblowers who, who were providing us documents. And uh, Chairman Issa at the time, then in October, issued another subpoena that was um, to the Justice Department. And so the, the investigation had been ongoing most of the year. We were talking to whistleblowers, we're doing interviews, and we're doing our best to get documents out of the Justice Department through that channel. But it, it, these things take time. Right. Certainly and you, not 76 days. Yes. And if you truly want to uncover every fact, as you should in an impeachment, do you agree? You have to go to court sometimes and enforce your subpoenas. And here, my understanding is we have a lot of requests for information, voluntary information. <laughs> you know, will you please provide us with documents on XYZ? And I think, and I think that's great. 
But you have to back it up with something. Isn't that correct? Well, there's a number of ways to enforce your requests. I mean, the, the fundamental rule of any congressional investigation is you, you, you rarely get what you're asking for unless and until the alternative is less palatable for the respondent. So, you know, you issue a subpoena and you're trying to get documents, you know, one technique you can use is try to talk to the, you know, a document custodian or somebody in, le you know, the ledge affairs function about what documents exist. Um, Chairman Chaffetz, during his era, had, uh, he used to have these document production status hearings where you'd bring, bring in ledge affairs officials and try to get the lay of the land. Because, you know, ledge affairs officials, at least nominally, are supposed to be um, directly responsible uh, serving the interests. Um, you can saber rattle, it's legal to saber rattle about uh, holding somebody in contempt. Uh, oftentimes, witnesses who are reluctant to cooperate and come forward, when you, when you, when you attach a contempt proceeding or a prospective contempt proceeding uh, to their name, uh, a lot of times that changes the outcome. Uh, and with, with a contempt proceeding, you've got a couple different steps along the way. You could raise the prospect of a contempt proceeding. You could schedule a contempt proceeding. Uh, after you schedule a contempt proceeding, you could you know, hold the door open for documents or interviews, and then you could push it off. Uh, you could go through at the committee level. And these are all sort of milestone events which historically are unpalatable or less palatable for the administration that sometimes starts to move the needle. And, and with these types of disputes, once you get the ball rolling, you know, with the good luck Gaudi probe, we didn't get a witness, and it was Deputy Director Andrew McCabe in for, you know, it was a couple months. But once we got Deputy Director McCabe in, a couple weeks later, we got uh, Director Comey's chief of staff. A couple weeks later, I mean, the witnesses start, once you get the ball rolling, um, and you, again, you don't always like 100% of the terms. Sometimes you got to deal with agency counsel. Sometimes you got to go look in, in camera. But once you get the ball rolling, usually it leads to positive results and, and historically has allowed the Congress to do its work. And were any of those things done here? No. In fact, they decided we're not going to we're not going to subpoena certain people that are important. Is that fair to say? And we're not going to go to court and enforce them. So these people have, you know, these folks that are caught mm -hmm. in an interbranch struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's an unfortunate position for any employee. Of the well, one of the concerning government. things is is Dr. Kupperman, who has been described uh, by Dr. Fiona Hill and a number of witnesses as a as a a solid citizen, a good witness, um, he, he filed a lawsuit in the, in, in the face of a subpoena, and um, a judge was assigned to a Judge Leon, uh, and the, the issues the government raised were slightly different than the Don McGahn issues, because, you know, Don McGahn is the personal, or the White House counsel. Kupperman, of course, is a national security official. Um, Kupperman, you know, filed the lawsuit seeking guidance. Kupperman wasn't asking the court to tell him not to come testify. To the contrary, Kupperman was seeking the court's guidance to facilitate his cooperation. And, and ultimately, um, this, the committee with, withdrew the subpoena, <laughs> um, yeah. which, which raises questions about whether the committee is really interested in getting to the bottom of some of these issues. Right. Instead, the committee's chosen the Intelligence Committee has chosen to rely on Ambassador Sondland and his testimony. I think they rely 600 times in their report. I'll tell you what I did. I, I, on this point, I, yesterday, I opened the Democrat report and I did a control F, yes. you know, control F. Yes. And Sondland's name shows up, I think, 611 times. Um, in, in fairness, it's, it's going to be double counted because, you know, if it's in a sentence and then it's in a footnote, that's two. Um, but in relative comparison to the other witnesses, um, Sondland's relied on big time. Yes. And I think Dr. Hill testified 
that she, at some point, confronted him about his actions. And yeah, the, 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 the record is mixed on this front. Um, Dr. Hill talks about raising concerns with Sondland, and Sondland in his deposition at least doesn't, you know, he didn't share the same view. And there's a lot of instances of that where Ambassador Sondland recalls one thing and other witnesses recall another. Is that correct? Sondland as a witness is a, uh, and he's a bit of an enigma. Let's just say it that way. Um, he was, you know, he was pretty certain in his deposition that the, the security assistance wasn't linked to anything. Um, and then he submitted a, he submitted an addendum. Yes, a, I call that the pretzel sentence. <laughs> and even in that addendum or supplement or whatever it's called, um, it, you know, it's talk to him and her and, and anyway, it, it, Sondland uh, ends with, you know, I presumed. Right. So, so it wasn't really any firsthand information. Right. We don't have a lot of firsthand information here. Is that correct? On certain facts, we, we don't. I mean, we have firsthand information on the May 23rd meeting in the Oval Office. We've got a lot of firsthand information, although all conflicting, <laughs> um, on the July 10th meeting. Um, there, there are, you know, episodes, I think, during the course of this investigation that we have been able to at least get everyone's account. Um, but the investigation hasn't, hasn't been able to reveal, you know, firsthand evidence relating to the president other than the, the call transcript. And I think we've already talked about this, that Ambassador Sondland would presume things, assume things, and form opinions based on what other people told him, and then he would use those as firsthand. Is that correct? Um, you know, it started with his role with the Ukraine portfolio. A lot of people at the State Department were wondering why the ambassador to the EU was so engaged in you know, issues relating to the Ukraine. And, you know, there are answers for that. You know, Ukraine is an aspirant to join the EU. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons, and Mr. Turner, I think, explored this really well at the, at the open hearing. Um, but we, we asked Ambassador Sondland, he said that he did a TV interview in Kyiv on, on the 26th of July, where he said the president's given me, you know, a lot of assignments, and he's, the president's assigned me Ukraine and so forth. But then when we asked him in his deposition, he conceded that he was, in fact, spinning that the president never assigned him to Ukraine, that he was just, uh, he was, you know, he's, he was exaggerating. Um, and I think at the public hearings, you pointed out that in contrast to other witnesses, Ambassador Sondland isn't a note taker. He, in fact, he said, I do not recall yeah. dozens of times in his deposition. Uh, let's say it this way, you know, Ambassador Taylor um, walked us through his, his um, standard operating procedure for taking notes. He told us about having a notebook on his desk and a notebook in his coat pocket of his suit, and he brought it with us and he, he showed us. So consequently, when Ambassador Taylor recounts to us you know, what happened, it's backed up by these contemporaneous notes. Um, Ambassador Sondland, on the other hand, was, was very clear that, you know, on the first hand, he said that he did not have access to his State Department records. While he said that at the public hearing, simultaneously, the State Department issued a tweet, I think, or a statement, at least, saying that wasn't true, that no, nobody is keeping Ambassador Sondland from his emails. You know, he's still a State Department employee. He's, he can go... Um, you, you know, he does have access to his records, but he stated he didn't. Um, and he stated that he doesn't have any notes because he doesn't take notes. Uh, and he conceded that he doesn't uh, have recollections of, on a lot of these issues. And, you know, we sort of made a list of them. And I, I think at the hearing I called it the, the trifecta of unreliability. Yes. And you're not the only person that has concerns about 
Ambassador Sondland's testimony, conduct. Um, I think other witnesses took issue with his conduct. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Tim Morrison um, talked about instances where an Ambassador Sondland uh, was sort of showing up uninvited. I, I, Morrison didn't understand why Sondland was trying to get into the Warsaw meeting September 1st. Um, and, and Dr. Hill, Fiona Hill, told us uh, about issues of that sort and a number of witnesses, uh, you're correct. And Ambassador Reeker and Ambassador Sondland too, correct? Yeah, I believe Ambassador Reeker said he was a problem. Said he was a problem, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Hill raised concerns about his behavior and said that he might be a intelligence risk. Is that correct? Uh, she, she did. She, she, she had issues with his uh, tendency to pull out his mobile device and make telephone calls. Right. And s which obviously can be monitored. Yes. By the bad guys. And we talked about how he was spinning that you know, certain things, and he admitted that, how he was spinning. Um, and he admitted he exaggerated. Yes. And he also, he, you know, when it comes to his communications with the president, we tried to get him to list all the communications with the president. I think he gave us six. And then when he was back, at, you know, he walked us through each communication with the president. And by the way, it was about a Christmas party. It was about when the president of Finland was here. And then... Um, uh, Congresswoman Speer asked him the same question in the open hearing, and he, he said that he had talked to the president like 20 times. So the, the record is mixed. I think my time's up. Thank you both. You'll back. You'll back. The gentleman, you Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. So there you have it. The questioning there of the councils Chairman, by the councils has been completed. Much as you would expect, the Democratic council is roughing up uh, the Republican council as witnesses, vice versa, the Republican council and ranking member roughing up the Democratic council. While they were going through those 45-minute round of questioning, breaking news on that inspector general's report into the origins of the FBI investigation uh, into the context between the Trump campaign and Russia. And there are the headlines right there. It finds Michael Horowitz, the inspector general, the independent inspector general inside the Justice Department, found that the FBI was justified in opening up the Russian investigation, that there was no evidence they launched the investigation with any kind of political bias, but that there were serious issues with the wiretap of Carter Page, who is, of course, a Trump campaign associate. I want to bring in our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, who has reviewed the report, also spoken with the FBI director, Christopher Wray. And, and, and Pierre, so this finds mistakes in the wiretapping, but it debunks President Trump's claim that this was some kind of an illegal spying campaign against his campaign, uh, marred by political bias. George, the inspector general makes very clear that the investigation was launched per DOJ department guidelines and the rule of law. Uh, he said basically that the threshold for launching such an investigation is pretty low, but that all those standards were met. Um, but as you said, George, he did find some significant problems with the pursuit of a FISA warrant, uh, a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Act warrant regarding a Trump associate, George. And, Pierre, you've had the chance now for the first exclusive interview with the FBI Director Christopher Wray in the wake of this, uh, of, of this investigation, this report on the investigation. And what is his response to the report and the re recommendations from the Inspector General? George, well, he's very clear that he does not believe that the FBI unfairly targeted the Trump campaign, that he believes that this was a uh, investigation that was warranted at its outset, but he does acknowledge that there were some serious problems with how that FISA warrant was handled. I think we have some sound from him. What's the biggest takeaway and the most important takeaway from the report for you? Well, I think there's a number of takeaways that are important. One, that we fully cooperated with the, this independent review. Two, that we fully accept its findings and recommendations. Uh, three, that the Inspector General did not find political bias or improper motivations impacting the opening of the investigation or the decision to use certain investigative tools during the investigations. Including FISA. Including FISA but that the Inspector General did find uh, a number of instances where employees uh, either failed to follow our policies, neglected to exercise appropriate diligence, or in some other way 
fell short of the standard of conduct and performance that we and that I as director expect of all of our employees. But again, we are and I am ordering 40, over 40 corrective actions to address all of those things uh, in a way that's robust and serious. Uh, and we're determined to learn the lessons from this report and make sure the FBI emerges from this even better and stronger. But well, George, I asked the FBI director point blank if he thought that the FBI had treated the Trump campaign unfairly. He said, quote, I do not. I also asked him a question about whether the FBI was part of some sort of deep state. He had a pretty strong answer about that, saying that that's basically an affront to the FBI employees currently working at the department. And, of course, we've seen that accusation from President Trump so many times. Meantime, Pierre, the, the FBI director has not given an interview really since these hearings have began, since all these questions about the Ukraine phone call have been raised as well. What is he saying right now about the crowd strike plot that has so often been mentioned uh, by President Trump and also Russian interference in our campaigns today? Two major points, George. He basically said in terms of the crowd strike, this notion that Ukrainian officials somehow had the DNC server, he basically says there's no evidence to support that. And on the issue of uh, Russia and the election, he says, as we speak, the Russians are targeting uh, U.S. elections and that they're the biggest threat going into 2020, George. And he's still vigilant about foreign interference in our campaigns? Uh, he's saying that they are taking steps to uh, mitigate this threat, but he was very clear that that threat is still active and ongoing, George. Okay, Pierre Thomas, thanks very much. I want to go to our chief White House correspondent, John Carlin. John, as I said, and I have some quotes here from the president over the course of this uh, investigation. He said that he was the victim of illegal spying, unprecedented spying, something that should never be allowed to happen in our country again, the greatest political scandal in the history, basically a coup against the White House. Debunked here by the inspector general, yet the president, I take it, is sending the same tune right now? Uh, it's really something, George. We just uh, heard from the president a short while ago. He said that this investigation is, quote, far worse far worse than what he thought. You just read what he has previously thought. He had said that they, basically this was an illegal spying operation uh, directed, sometimes he has suggested, by Barack Obama himself, senior leadership at the White House, uh, at, I'm sorry, at the FBI and the Justice Department. He has uh, suggested that this was an effort to undermine his campaign. Uh, and what we see here in this Inspector General report is some criticism of the way the FBI acted, but a very clear conclusion that you saw reiterated by uh, Director Ray there that the investigation was not launched with any political bias. There was no political bias behind the launching of the investigation. But the president is acting like this report has just confirmed all of those allegations that he has made over the past several John, months, really over the past couple of years. John, I don't know if you, I don't know if you were in the room at the time. Was the president, did the president, take any questions on this, or was this just simply a statement? Uh, this, he just came out with this. I was not in the room at the time. I haven't actually had a chance to see uh, to see this interaction. I've just read the reports from the uh, the pool reporters that were in the room. Okay, John Carl, thanks very much. I want to go, Mary Bruce on Capitol Hill? Democrats, the Democratic chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and other senior Democrats also responding to this report. Yeah, George, and Democrats are coming out saying that this decimates and demolishes the president's claim that this investigation was politically motivated. Those that we have talked to feel that this report completely undercuts the president's claims that he was spied on, that this amounts to treason, that this was a coup, as he has said in the past. But on the flip side, I've talked to some of the president's closest allies here. I was just speaking with Congressman Mark Meadows, who continues to stand with the president. He told me point blank that he does still believe that there is evidence that this was politically motivated and based on political bias. Even though that is clearly not uh, what the report has found. He did say he disagrees with the president that there's any treason here, but 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 Republicans are saying that this uh, is not a good day for the FBI, that, that, that their concerns were actually understated, not overstated, and they say that it's clear that, that the FBI is in need of a major overhaul of their policies and procedures. So no surprise here, George, both sides are, are spinning this report uh, to their political advantage. And Mary Horowitz, the inspector general, will be facing questioning on Wednesday from the Senate Judiciary Committee. 
Yes, so, so there will be a lot of questions here, uh, and you will, I suspect, continue to see some of this spin as both sides try to pick apart this report. Of course, Democrats claiming that it completely uh, uh, debunks the president's claims so far. Uh, Republicans, of course, arguing that there are some concerns here uh, based on questions about some policies and procedures uh, with the way that the FBI handled some of this. Okay, Mary Bruce, thanks very much. Dan Abrams here, our chief legal analyst as well. There are echoes today of uh, the, the release of the Mueller report, the initial yeah. Mueller report, and the reaction of the attorney general, and even more significantly, another U.S. attorney who the attorney general has tasked with investigating similar matters. Yeah, well, first of all, let's just say what a shame it is that a document like this is being viewed through political prisms, right? One of the things people say about Horowitz, the inspector general, again and again, is that he's nonpartisan, that he's a straight shooter, that people on both sides tend to rely on him. So this idea that people are taking it and saying, aha, aha, is, is, is really disappointing. Um, second point I'd make is that the document finds that there was no corruption. I mean, when you sort of take it back and you take a step back and you say, what was the key question that the public wanted to know? Is, was there corruption? And the answer, according to the inspector general, is no. There was no corruption. There were mistakes. There were problems. There are things that need to be fixed. And it sounds like um, uh, Director Ray is going to address some of those. But it is odd that now that you have this, this, this 470-something page report, that immediately a federal prosecutor, John Durham, who is doing a, a separate but related investigation, is making a public comment now that he doesn't agree with some of the report's findings, meaning typically a federal prosecutor will want to remain tight-lipped about what they're doing, how their investigation is proceeding, and in particular to sort of serve as the, the public response to the inspector general in an effort to clearly undermine the inspector general's finding is beyond unusual and I have to say very surprising. And at the same time, Attorney General Barr is also taking issue with the conclusions. But, but Attorney General Barr is a little bit different, meaning Attorney General Barr is sort of uh, taking pieces that he likes and incorporating that into his own assessment of what the situation is. Durham has been another one of these folks who we've said, like Horowitz, is supposed to be someone we can count on uh, for sort of nonpartisan assessment. And so I was surprised that Durham is weighing in now. That doesn't mean, well, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to return now to our regular programming. Live coverage of the hearing of the impeachment hearing is going to continue right now with Tom Yamas on ABC News Live. That's our 24 7 streaming channel. And of course, David Muir is going to have a full wrap up of all this breaking news tonight the Inspector General's report, the impeachment hearings, full wrap up tonight on World News. Have a good afternoon. All right, George, thank you for that. We continue our team coverage of the impeachment hearings today. A new phase for the Judiciary Committee, as we've seen weeks of testimony. Not sure if we've seen things get as hostile between Republicans and Democrats as we saw today. Throughout the hearings, Republicans relentless in their strategy of causing procedural tactics to stall and interrupt the hearings. Today, hearings at times felt like a trial, a bit of political theater, and a perfect example of how partisan the impeachment process has become. President Trump's persistent and continuing effort to coerce a foreign country to help him cheat to win an election is a clear and present danger to our free and fair elections and to our national security. This unfair process reflects the degree to which Democrats are obsessed with impeaching the president. Moment of the impeachment, our senior congressional reporter, Mary Bruce. Mary, Representative Nadler, as chairman, gets to hold the gavel, and today he was forced to use it time and time again. Tom, this is no, no doubt about it. Some of the most aggressive uh, responses that we have seen from Republicans in this impeachment process so far, they were intent on using every procedural tool available to try uh, and delay and interrupt these proceedings. And there's a political point to that. They are trying to make the argument and show that they feel that this process is unfair. So they were calling for point of orders for everything, uh, from, from, from trying to push back on what they felt was badgering of the witness to, to, to voicing complaints about the fact that they couldn't see the slides that were being presented uh, at this hearing. And, and of course, the, the issue with, with the House is that here are the majority rules, effectively. So they can try and delay, they can call for these point of orders, they can call for roll call votes on various procedural measures, but they can't really do much about it because they, in the end, are in the minority. But this is the Republicans trying to send a message. Uh, and a lot of cases, it was the president's top defenders here on the Hill, I suspect, trying to send a message uh, to an audience of one, uh, which would be the president, that they are being aggressive in trying to defend him and in trying to poke holes uh, in what they feel is the, the Democrats' argument uh, for impeachment. 
Mary, what do we know so far about the schedule moving forward, and what's the next move for Democrats at this point? Well, Democrats are moving extremely quickly here. And, and while they are having the hearing today to lay out the evidence, they, they're already preparing articles of impeachment. And that's because we are going to likely see those articles and see them vote on those articles at some point this week. Tom, that would then set up a, a possible vote in the House. The House could actually move to impeach the president sometime next week, right before the Christmas break. The big question here still remains, what's the scope of these charges against the president? We know that Democrats will likely charge the president on abuse of power, on obstruction, possibly on bribery. The question, of course, remains, will they broaden that beyond the Ukraine issue to also include obstruction of the Mueller probe? We did hear uh, that coming up quite a few times today uh, in the hearing as we all try to read the tea leaves here. But the argument on both sides is, on the one hand, uh, you we've talked with Democrats who say, look, there's a pattern of behavior here. You have to hold the president accountable for the entire scope of this. On the other hand, I've talked with many Democrats who say, look, don't, don't make this a kitchen sink. Don't throw everything you've got in it. Just fo focus on the articles of impeachment by looking at the areas where you have the strongest, most concrete evidence. And for many, they feel that is simply focusing on the Ukraine matter. Now, Speaker Pelosi is going to be the one who has to essentially make a call here in working with the chairman of the committee uh, looking at the evidence to figure out what's how do you walk that 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 tightrope right what what is the the center here where she can come up with articles of impeachment that that, that meet the standard for impeachment uh, to try and hold the president accountable for what they feel is his abuse of power while also at the same time satisfying all those differing views of her members and right now there is a very real debate in the democratic party and uh, given the fact they want to move quickly they're going to have to figure it out uh, sometime very soon tom Right, we could see a vote on impeachment even happen possibly this week. Mary Bruce, we thank you for all your reporting. I want to go to our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Jonathan, I'm going to let you call an audible here. I know the White House is dealing with two major stories, the yes. impeachment hearings, but also this inspector general report out of the Department of Justice about the 2016 Trump campaign and why the FBI was investigating that campaign. I understand the president responded a short time ago. What can you tell us? Uh, well, first of all, this inspector general report has been very eagerly anticipated, including by the president himself. Uh, not long ago, in an interview on Fox News, he said that this would be historic and even uh, e even worse than expected. Um, but what the, the report shows, this looks into the question of whether or not there was anything improper political bias that led to the launching of the investigation in the first place, the Russia investigation. And the report is quite definitive on this uh, point, Tom. It says that... Uh, uh, the inspector general, quote, did not find any documentary or testimonial evidence that political bias or improper motivation influenced uh, the decision to launch that investigation. Uh, it did find concerns at the lower level of the FBI with some of the uh, actions that were taken over the course of the report. But the big picture here, they found no political influence in the decision to launch the investigation into Russian interference and the Trump campaign. So the president, who has been uh, talking about this for some time, uh, was just uh, just meeting with uh, just just at an event before reporters here at the pool uh, here at the White House, where he said that the find the findings of this inspector general report are actually far worse than he thought they would be. He said it's a disgrace what's happened with the things that were done to our country. It's incredible, far worse than what I ever thought possible. Um, but Tom, if you remember what he had been accusing and what he had talked about po as being possible, uh, he had basically accused the senior level, uh, senior levels of the FBI uh, for launching an inv a political investigation into his campaign. He accused Barack Obama of directing the wiretap tapping of a Trump Tower and the surveillance of his campaign. And in this report, there's absolutely nothing nothing to corroborate those charges. In fact, it directly contradicts those charges. And, and John, even though this is the report from the inspector general on the exact matter that the president want, look, wanted to be looked at, and he's been talking about this since the 2016 campaign, even though this is the report and the report's out, there's no reason to believe that he's going to stop talking about this. And this likely will add more fuel to the fire that really energizes his base, that, that the election was rigged, that, that, that the, the government at the time was against him, and he somehow still came out on top. And that there's this deep state conspiracy that was directed at the highest levels of the uh, FBI. And, and, and again, he has said many times uh, he thought Barack Obama needed to be uh, directly involved in this. So he's talking about this report 
as if it confirms all those allegations that he has made over time, even though the report directly refutes those allegations. Uh, now, there is still another investigation underway uh, at the Justice Department, one uh, that was launched by Attorney General Barr. Uh, John Durham uh, is the investigator on that. So there is another investigation, and, and the White House will continue uh, to look towards that investigation. But uh, you're right, uh, Tom. They will continue to talk this way. We hear it directly from the president himself, uh, even though the report refutes the allegations he's been making over these last uh, two and a half, three years. John, before I go, I want to get your, your take real quick on the impeachment hearings today. Hours of testimony again as Democrats likely move forward, possibly with a vote at some time uh, this week. W where does the White House feel they are? Do they feel they've gained ground in this impeachment battle? The polls show, you know, th the numbers moving slightly in their favor, but it's still very early. And the president himself has said he never thought that that word impeachment would be tied to his legacy. Yes, but for some time they've realized that impeachment was uh, uh, inevitable, that the Democrats were going to move forward with this. I think that they feel that they have held the line here in terms of public opinion. Uh, nothing in these hearings, there's no evidence that public opinion has changed, changed dramatically in any direction. And more importantly, Tom, uh, not a single Republican in Congress uh, uh, appears to be moving against uh, the president on this, both in the House and in the Senate. So uh, they feel that although this is something that they wanted to avoid. Uh, the president personally uh, felt very strongly that he did not want to become an impeached president. Uh, they feel that, that this process has only hurt the Democratic cause, uh, helped the president. They will look forward to a trial in the Senate where they feel they are all uh, but certain to prevail. All right, Jonathan, Carl, we thank you for that update. From the White House, I want to bring in our Chief Justice Correspondent right now, Pierre Thomas, who has spent a lot of time and a lot of years working on the case and the story that the Inspector General just put out, why the FBI launched that investigation to the Trump campaign back in 2016 and the findings that have just come out. Pierre, for you, give me some of the, the three or four bullet points that jumped out to you, a reporter who's been on this case for so long. Well, Tom, I think the main headline, as John uh, pointed out, is that the launch, the origins of the Russia investigation, yeah. according to the inspector general, were uh, basically by the book. Uh, they met Justice Department guidelines and standards, standards of the rule of law, that that investigation was not as best as they can determine so far politically motivated or done for improper reasons. Uh, the investigation initially targeted four people. Paul Manafort, Carter Page, Michael Flynn, and uh, another a gentleman in connection with the Trump campaign. Uh, and the inspector general basically concludes that the investigation had legitimate reasons for being launched. The other major point, though, is the FISA warrant, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrant, that was used to target Carter Page. The inspector general found some significant issues with that, uh, the issuance of that warrant. Uh, number one, they found that there were lots of errors and omissions um, by FBI officials. Uh, when they questioned the FBI officials about those errors and uh, omissions, they didn't get what they thought were satisfactory answers about them. Um, the, uh, also, uh, it raised the question of whether the warrant would have actually gone through, whether DOJ officials would have been um, as eager to approve them uh, if they knew information was being omitted and there were errors in the information. Uh, that said, they found that they to date can find no clear evidence of political bias or uh, improper motivations for those errors and mistakes. But mind you, those were pretty serious and we may yet hear from the court on whether they think that these um, uh, FISA warrants were uh, received and authorized properly, Tom. And Pierre, you had that major interview today with the director of the FBI, Christopher Way, where you asked him very bluntly and very plainly about the genesis of this investigation. Let's take a listen. Was the launch the origination of the uh, FBI probe into Russian interference involving U.S. citizens lawfully authorized and pursued? Well, I think it's important for the American people to know that when the FBI opens an investigation, it does so with proper predication, uh, with proper authorization, uh, based on the law and the facts and nothing else. And I think uh, it's important that the Inspector General found that in this particular instance, the investigation was opened 
with appropriate predication and authorization. Well, Tom, as you can see, the FBI director is defending the launch of this investigation, at least at its, as its origins. And he was asked by me uh, about this whole question of whether the FBI unfairly targeted the Trump campaign. He was blunt. He said, I do not think that is the case. I asked him about whether the FBI was a participant in some kind of deep state. And he basically said that that was an affront to the people who work at the FBI, Tom. Pierre, I actually think that was a major moment. I'd like to roll that, that portion of the interview right now where you asked him about, you know, the, the conspiracies and, and, and the thinking about this deep state. Let's listen to it. As far as you know, based on the findings in the Inspector General report, is the FBI, was it part of some deep state? Well, I think that's the kind of label that is a disservice to the 37,000 men and women who work at the FBI who... I think tackle their jobs with, uh, with professionalism, with rigor, with objectivity, and with courage. Um, so that's not a term I would ever use to describe our workforce, and I think it's an affront to them. Having said that, having said that, there are a number of things in this report uh, that, in my view, fall well short of the standard of conduct and performance that we and that I expect of all our employees. And we're going to be taking a number of corrective steps uh, to address that. Now, Pierre, we just heard right there, he said he would never use the phrase deep state. You have sources within the FBI. You, you, you've worked this beat for so many years. What's your sense now of the agency at this point? Because, because essentially what just happened, the investigators were investigated. Uh, they were indeed. Uh, the FBI, many of those people who worked on uh, major parts of this case are no longer here. FBI Director James Comey, gone. Uh, the acting director after him, uh, Andrew McCabe, also no longer at the Bureau. Uh, I think that the FBI Director Chris Ray would have us all believe, and he believes, that he's moved the uh, FBI in the right direction in regard to some of these mistakes. Um, but clearly he thinks additional work needs to be done to make sure that there cannot be these kind of mistakes in the future. But on the underlying issue of whether the Russia investigation was launched properly, he believes that it was. And he also made clear today, Tom, that Russia is still up to trying to impact U.S. elections. He said they remain the biggest threat to the 2020 upcoming election. Pierre Thomas, who's tonight's big interview will air on World News Tonight with David Muir. Pierre, we thank you for reporting, and next time we promise to get you a bigger umbrella. We know it is very <laughs> ugly out there in Washington today. All right, Pierre, thank you for that. And uh, we want to thank our viewers all over the world watching on their phones and their computers. We're going to have some highlights from today's impeachment hearings you can watch throughout the day on ABC News Live. I'm Tom Yamas reporting today from Washington. Here are the highlights from today's hearings. The House Committee on the Judiciary will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee to Object. Objection noted. The quorum is present. We are conducting this hearing on the impeachment inquiry into President Donald J. Trump. Presentations from the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Judiciary Committee pursuant to House Resolution 660 and the Special Judiciary Committee procedures that are described in Section 4A of that resolution. Here is how the committee will proceed for this hearing. I will make an opening statement, and then I will recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. After that, we will hear two sets of presentations. We will hear 30-minute pre opening arguments from councils for the majority and the minority of this committee. Mary Bruce, you're there in the committee room. We couldn't quite make out what this protest is about. Any sense? No, George, uh, we also can't hear exactly what he's saying, but it's notable so far in all of these hearings, we have not seen actually any interruptions from inside the room like that. They have Obviously, been keeping uh, things pretty locked down here so far. Okay, let's turn back in. The audience is here. 
uh, to observe, but not to demonstrate, not to indicate agreement or disagreement with any witness or with any member of the committee. The audience is here to observe only, and uh, we will maintain decorum in the hearing room. And again, I will say, here is how the committee will proceed for this hearing. I will make an opening statement, and then I will recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. After that, we will hear two sets of presentations. We will hear 30-minute opening arguments from councils for the majority and the minority of this committee. Then we will hear 45-minute presentations of evidence from majority and minority council from the Permanent Select okay. Committee on Intelligence, followed by 45 minutes of questioning by the chair and ranking member, who may yield to counsel for questioning during this period. Finally, all of our members will have the opportunity to question the presenters from the Intelligence Committee under the five-minute rule. I would note that the President's counsel was given the opportunity to participate today, but the White House has declined the invitation. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. No matter his party or his politics, if the President places his own interests above those of the country, he betrays his oath of office. The President of the United States, the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader of the Senate, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the Chairman and Ranking Members of the House Committee on the Judiciary all have one important thing in common. We have each taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. If the President puts himself before the country, he violates the President's most basic responsibility. He breaks his oath to the American people. If he puts himself before the country in a manner that threatens our democracy, then our oath, our promise to the American people, requires us to come to the defense of the nation. That oath stands even when it is politically inconvenient, even when it might bring us under criticism, even when it might cost us our jobs as members of Congress. And even if the President is unwilling to honor his oath, I am compelled to honor mine. As we heard in our last hearing, the framers of the Constitution were careful students of history and clear in their vision for the new nation. They knew that threats from, to democracy can take many forms, that we must protect against them. They warned us against the dangers of would-be monarchs, fake populists, and charismatic demagogues. They knew that the most dangerous threat to our country might come from within, in the form of a corrupt executive who put his private interests above the interests of the nation. They also knew that they could not anticipate every threat a president might someday pose, so they adopted the phrase treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors <coughs> to capture the full spectrum of possible presidential misconduct. George Mason, who proposed this standard, said that it was meant to capture all manner of great and dangerous offenses against the Constitution. The debates around the framing make clear that the most serious such offenses include abuse of power, betrayal of the nation through foreign entanglements, and corruption of public office. Any one of these violations of the public trust would compel the members of this committee to take action. When combined in a single course of action, they state the strongest possible case for impeachment and removal from office. President Trump put himself before country. Despite the political partisanship that seems to punctuate our hearings these days, <coughs> I believe that there is common ground around some of these ideas, common ground in this hearing room and common ground across the country at large. We agree, for example, that impeachment is a solemn, serious undertaking. We agree that it is meant to address serious threats to democratic institutions like our free and fair elections. We agree that when the elections themselves are threatened by enemies foreign or domestic, we cannot wait until the next election to address the threat. We surely agree that no public official, including and especially the President of the United States, should use his public office for private gain. And we agree that no President may put himself before the country. The Constitution and his oath of office, his promise to America's citizens, require the President to put the country first. If we could drop our blinders for just one moment 
I think we would agree on a common set of facts as well. <coughs> on July 25th, President Trump called President Zelensky of Ukraine and asked him for a favor. That call was part of a concerted effort by President Trump to compel the government of Ukraine to announce an investigation, not an investigation of corruption writ large, but an investigation of President Trump's political rivals, and only his political rivals. President Trump put himself before country. The record shows that President Trump withheld military aid allocated by the United States Congress from Ukraine. It also shows that he withheld a White House meeting from President Zelensky. Multiple witnesses, including respected diplomats, national security professionals, and decorated war veterans, all testified to the same basic fact. President Trump withheld the aid and the meeting in order to pressure a foreign government to do him that favor. President Trump put himself before country. <coughs> and when the president got caught, when Congress discovered that the aid had been withheld from Ukraine, the president took extraordinary and unprecedented steps to conceal evidence from Congress and from the American people. These facts are not in dispute. In fact, most of the arguments about these facts appear to be beside the point. As we review the evidence today, I expect we will hear much about the whistleblower who brought his concerns about the July 25th call to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. Let me be clear. Every fact alleged by the whistleblower has been substantiated by multiple witnesses, again and again, each of whom has been questioned extensively by Democrats and Republicans alike. The allegations also match up with the President's own words, as released by the White House, words that he still says were perfect. I also expect to hear complaints about the term quid pro quo, as if a person needs to verbally acknowledge the name of a crime while he is committing it for it to be a crime at all. The record on this point is also clear. Multiple officials testified that the president's demand for an investigation into his rivals was a part of his personal political agenda and not related to the foreign policy objectives of the United States. Multiple officials testified that the president intended to withhold the aid until, intended to withhold the aid until Ukraine announced the investigations. And yes, multiple officials testified that they understood this arrangement to be a quid pro quo for the president's personal <coughs> political benefit. President Trump put himself before country. The president's supporters are going to argue that this whole process is unfair. The record before us is clear on this point as well. We invited the president to participate in this hearing, to question witnesses, and to present evidence that might explain the charges against him. President Trump chose not to show. He may not have much to say in his own defense, but he cannot claim that he did not have an opportunity to be heard. Finally, as we proceed today, we will hear a great deal about the speed with which the House is addressing the President's actions. To the members of the committee, to the members of the House, and to my fellow citizens, I want to be absolutely clear. The integrity of our next election is at stake. Nothing could be more urgent. The President welcomed into foreign interference in our elections in 2016. He demanded it for 2020. Then he got caught. If you do not believe that he will do it again, let me remind you that the President's personal lawyer spent last week back in Ukraine meeting with government officials in an apparent attempt to gin up the same so-called favors that brought us here today and forced Congress to consider the impeachment of a sitting president. This pattern of conduct represents a continuing risk to the country. The evidence shows that Donald J. Trump, the President of the United States, has put himself before his country. He has violated his most basic responsibilities to the people. He has broken his oath. I will honor mine. If you would honor yours, then I would urge you to do your duty. Let us, re let us review the record here in full view of the American people, and let, uh, then let us move swiftly to defend our country. We promised that we would.
now that the chairman is recognized and we've got that point. You know, there have been famous moments in impeachment. There have been famous moments in impeachment as we've gone forward. There are famous lines from Nixon like, what did the president know and when did he know it? From the Clinton impeachment, there was, I did not have sex with that woman. What would be known about this one is probably, where's the impeachable offense? Why are we here? I tell you, this may be, though, become known as the focus group impeachment. Because we don't have a crime, we don't have anything we can actually pin, and nobody understands really what the majority is trying to do, except that interfere and basically make sure that they believe the president can't win next year if he's impeached. The focus group impeachment takes words and then takes them to people and say, how can we explain this better? Because we don't have the facts to match it. A focus group impeachment says, you know, we really aren't working with good facts, but we need a good PR move. That's why we're here today. This is, this is all about, as I said last week, a clock and a calendar. And it really became evident to me that this was true because last Wednesday, after we had a long day of hearing here, the next morning, before anything else could get started, the Speaker of the House walked up to the podium and said, go write articles of impeachment. She just quit. She just stopped. Go write articles of impeachment. I appreciate that the majority practiced for two days this weekend on this hearing. I appreciate that the fact that you've got to try and get it right to try and convince the American people of your problem, but your speaker's already undercut you. She took the, the, the thrill out of the room. You're writing articles of impeachment. Why couldn't we just save that time today, and if you're going to write the articles of impeachment, go ahead and write them? Well, there's probably a reason for that. Because the chairman laid out some amazing claims none of which I think after this hearing today, the American people can honestly look at and see that there is overwhelming evidence, there is a proper reason he abused this power because as the speaker, another statement she said, that to do impeachment you have to be so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, all of which we are not. So why not? Why are we here? Well, I think we can do this. Let's look at, let's look at the three things that typically are associated with making your case or a crime. Let's do it against what the majority has said. I think they have motive, they have means, and they have opportunity. What's their motive? It's November 2020. It's been said over and over and over again. The chairman said it again this morning. It's been said all along that we have to do this because if we don't impeach him, he'll win again next year. The reason is shown as clearly as last week on the jobs report in the economy. And as I had a, a man come up to me in the grocery store this weekend, he said, keep doing what you're doing. He said, I've never seen an economy this good. He said, Our, he said people are working, people are being taken care of. And Thank you very much. The IG report just came out, and I was just briefed on it. And uh, it's a disgrace what's happened uh, with respect to the things that were done to our country. It should never again happen to another president. President. It is uh, incredible, far worse than I would have ever thought possible. And it's, uh, it's an embarrassment to our country. It's dishonest. It's, it's everything that a lot of people thought it would be, except far worse. So I'm going to get some very detailed briefing, but briefings, but they, uh, they are, uh, it's a very sad, it's a very sad day when I see that. Very sad day when a lot of people see that. They have known nothing. It was concocted. And you say what you want. That was a, a probably something that's never happened in the history of our country. Uh, Pam Bondi, I think you were able to look at some of the report and can address a little bit of it very well. If you might say a few words, I'd like to ask Kellyanne. I know you've looked at it also. Please. Sure, President. You know, so many of us um, who are career law enforcement today are outraged. And I think the American people really should be terrified that this could happen to you. Um, we're supposed to live in a society of integrity and honesty. And this happened to the president, not just to the president. You know, this should be a good day, but it's not. It's a horrible day for the country. That this could happen to the president of the United States. That they could fabricate, falsify emails, lie, and omit exculpatory evidence in order to continue this witch hunt against the President of the United States. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now we have the Durham investigation. Thank you very much. Uh, Kellyanne, please. Mr. President, thank you. I was the campaign manager during that time, and I would ask a simple question. 
why no defend the briefing? Why not contact the Trump campaign? Why not contact candidate Trump or Governor Pence or Governor Christie, who at the time was arranging for the intelligence briefings for candidate Trump and was a public servant government official at that time as governor of New Jersey with a full intelligence uh, security clearance to receive that type of information. So you can't blame people for feeling that it was unfair and that the fix was in. And to think that perhaps people lied and spied and tried to subvert democracy just because they wanted someone else to win or just because they have a different political point of view. That is not the way the world's greatest democracy has been formed and can survive at a time such as this. I will just uh, repeat something that General Barr said today, Mr. President, that this was an intrusive investigation of a U.S. presidential campaign on the thinness of suspicions. And that is chilling language for any of us who want our government to work for us and not against us. I only wish they'd come and informed us, Mr. President, and we could have had the knowledge and the wherewithal to act at that time and not put the taxpayers through two plus protracted years of nonsense. Thank you, sir. Well, they fabricated evidence and they lied to the courts and they did all sorts of things to have it go their way. And this was something that uh, we can never allow ha to happen again. The report actually, and especially when you look into it and the details of the report are far worse than anything I would have even imagined. What they were doing and what they would have done if I didn't make a certain move, a certain move that was a very important move, because it would have been even worse if that's possible. And they might have been able to succeed. This was an overthrow of government. This was an attempted overthrow. And a lot of people were in on it. And they got caught. They got caught red-handed. And I look forward to the Durham report, which is coming out in the not-too-distant future. Uh, it's got his own information, which is this information, plus, plus, plus. And it's an incredible thing that happened, and we're lucky we caught him. I think I'm going to put this down as one of our great achievements, because what we found and what we saw, uh, never, ever should this happen again in our country. All right, with that, today we gather to discuss the urgent national priority that we've been working on so long and so hard expanding education freedom through school choice so that every American child can get a great education. We're grateful to be joined by Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary Betsy DeVos, Senators Ted Cruz and Mike Lee, Representative Bradley Byrne, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Pennsylvania House Speaker Mike Terzai, Tennessee State Representative John DeBarry and students, parents, and teachers from across the nation. Some wonderful, brilliant students are with us. And we're going to be having a big session in a little while. As president, I'm fighting every day for the forgotten American. We are looking past criminal justice reform. We got that done, criminal justice reform. They could have never done it without me. It was done by us. It wasn't done by anybody else. They came to me. They've been trying to get it for many years. President Obama wouldn't do it or couldn't get it done. Maybe that means the same thing. Uh, but I got criminal justice reform done. The press doesn't want to mention that. But we got it done. And we got it done soundly and good. And we had a lot of help, including from Mike Lee. Mike, that was uh, something. When I heard Mike was in favor, I said, can I have a unanimous consent request before we start? The gentleman will state his unanimous consent request. I would request that we re enter into the record the FISA applications and other aspects of the FBI's crossfire hurricane. I reserve a point of order. I think if we're going to continue. Mrs. Z, reserving, what are you entering here? Reserving your the FISA report that just came up. Oh, the, we need. Uh, the Inspector General's report. We'll, we'll, the we'll, genesis we'll, of this whole thing. We'll, we'll, we'll take. Uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to follow up on the two series of questions that the ranking member, Mr. Collins, uh, directed at Mr. Goldman uh, relative to the telephone company subpoenas and the inclusion of certain information uh, in the majority report from the Intelligence Committee. Uh, let me say that uh, there are two issues involved. One that is not involved is the legality of the subpoena. 
Uh, I believe that uh, that was a subpoena that is fully authorized under the law and under congressional uh, procedures. Where I do have a problem, and a really big problem, however, is the fact that somebody made a decision to match certain data, megadata, metadata that had been uh, collected through the subpoena with phone numbers of journalists and members of Congress. And that is the beginning of a surveillance state, which I think is outrageous, particularly since with the Freedom Act in 2013, we curtailed the NSA's ability about, about that. Now, had Chairman Schiff decided to man up and come here and talk, rather than hiding behind Mr. Goldman, his chief investigator, uh, as his surrogate or legate, if you will, I think we could have gotten to the bottom of this and we could have taken action to make sure that this never happens again. You know, I do not want to see members of Congress, through their subpoena power, being able to subpoena the telephone records of private citizens willy-nilly without any kind of cause or to match the numbers up with somebody else to see who they were talking to and then going the next step and publishing the results of that match uh, in a report that the minority hadn't seen until it was released. That, I think, is an abuse of power. We're talking a lot about abuses of power here in the White House and in the executive branch. Here we see a clear abuse of power on the part of the people who are prosecuting this impeachment against the President of the United States. They should be ashamed of themselves. Now, I come from the state where Joe McCarthy came from. Uh, I met Joe McCarthy twice when I was first getting into politics as a teenager. Folks, you have made Joe McCarthy look like a piker uh, with what you've done with the electronic uh, surveillance involved. It is something that has to be put a stop to now. It is something that has to be fessed up to now, whether it's you, Mr. Goldman, that authorized the matching and the publication, or whether it was Chairman Schiff. I would have loved to put Chairman Schiff under oath so that he could be required to answer the same way you have uh, Mr. Golden on how this all happened. But uh, as one who has spent quite a bit of time uh, curtailing the excesses of the Patriot Act, which I authored, with the Freedom Act, which I al also authored, you know, the surveillance state can get out of control. This is a major step in the surveillance state getting out of control in the hands of the Congress and in the hands of a majority party that wants to influence political decisions relative to politicians, in this case, President Donald Trump, that they don't like. And they haven't liked him from the beginning of his term. They have tried to talk about impeachment since the beginning of his term. They thought that the Mueller report was going to be the smoking gun. It ended up being uh, a cap pistol. Now they're working on this. And the steps that they have gone, the violation of common sense, the precedent that they have started, and looking at the way the chairman has conducted this hearing today and in the previous hearings, not even to allow Mr. Getz to make a point of order that he can't see what you put on the screen, I think goes against the entire fabric you know, of American democracy. Shame on those who have done it. And if we want to get back to something objective, maybe it's time to push the recess button. I yield back. Chairman Adler, could I just respond quickly on the uh, phone records? Respond. Only because it's uh, now Mr. Chairman, up. I yielded back. No, 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 no. I didn't ask him a question. I made a gentleman, statement. The gentleman yielded back. The uh, uh, gentleman yielded back. Uh, Ms. Jackson, please. So, Mr. Goldman, uh, let's uh, get to the facts again. During the phone conversation on July 25th with President Zelensky, President Trump was narrowly focusing on his own political survival using his public office for private and political gain. The truth matters. 
Then we heard counsel for the Republicans say the president's concerned about par foreign aid because you could kiss it goodbye, assuming that's referring to anti-corruption. But let's look at the facts of the July 25th call. I happen to have read it just recently, which sharply illustrates the president's willingness to abuse the power of his office for his own personal benefit. The memorandum of that call is on the screen in front of you, and it shows that President Trump says, and by the way, right after President Zelensky spoke about defense support and the javelins, I would like you to do us a favor, though. So this is a president's own behavior and words. <coughs> Mr. Goldman, what was that favor? The favor was to investigate a debunked conspiracy theory related to Ukraine interference in the 2016 election. And so Mr. Later, Goldman, the investigative committees received evidence from multiple witnesses who testified that President Trump was provided specific talking points in preparation for the July 25th call geared toward protecting the American people's national security. Is that correct? The talking points certainly uh, were the part of the official U.S. policy, and they included anti-corruption efforts and national security efforts, yes. And those talking points were provided to help the president effectively communicate official U.S. policy interests during calls with foreign leaders. Is that right? Um, that is correct. It's a routine process that the National Security Council does, but the, the president generally is able to use them or not use them. Witnesses said the president's not required to use them. What was so startling here is that he not only veered off Thank from you. them, but that he went to his own personal interests. And it is fair to say such talking points signal the purpose of a given call, correct? Yes. Uh, witnesses testified that the talking points for the July 25th call included recommendations to encourage President Zelensky to continue to promote anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine, which has a focus of American foreign policy in Eastern Europe. Is that correct? Yes. So to be clear, the talking points created for the president or other principals to discuss specific matters that really protect the American people. Is that accurate? Yes, generally. But witnesses such as Tim Morrison, the deputy assistant to the president and senior director for Europe, uh, testified about what was not in those talking points. Now, Mr. Morrison, were these references to CrowdStrike, the server in 2016 election, uh, and to Vice President Biden and his son, were they included in the president's talking points? They were not. Are you aware of any witness who testified that investigating the Bidens was an objective of official U.S. policy? No, it was not before and it was not after this call. And anything ever found of those investigations that might have occurred? I'm sorry, can you repeat the anything question? Anything ever found of those investigations that may have occurred with respect to the former vice president? Every single witness said there's no factual basis for either of the investigations. So Mr. Trump did not use official talking points? Correct. Uh, and there were fact witnesses who confirmed that? That's right. When you hear those words, do you hear the president requesting a thoughtful and well-calibrated anti-corruption program consistent with U.S. policy? So, Mr. Goldman. I do not. We were hoping, uh, we recommended the president um, very clearly support what uh, President Zelensky had run on in his own election and what his servant of the People Party uh, had run on in its election where it received a majority mandate. But that didn't come up in the call, did it? No, sir. So, Mr. Goldman, did the evidence prove that Mr. Trump utilized his position of public trust in order to accomplish uh, these goals, his goals, in order to hurt his domestic political opponent? Yes, that's what the evidence showed. I've come to understand that America's values of democracy and justice must have the vital pillars of truth, factual truth, and trust. As a former judge and one who sat on this committee during impeachment in 1998, the truth matters. It's clear that the president really cared about, did not really care about fighting corruption in Ukraine, but wanted his own personal interests to be considered. That kind of puts in perspective, Ambassador Sondland, uh, that they didn't care whether uh, Ukraine actually investigated, but really whether they just announced it. It is certainly well known that it is our duty, uh, as the president poses a continuing threat, to, under the Constitution, pursue the truth. That is our duty. We are now proceeding to do our duty to find the truth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. The uh, gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a second hearing on impeachment that this committee uh, has held in the last week. 
Well, I would submit that you're investigating the wrong guy. Uh, let's look at the facts. Mr. Castor, uh, Ukraine, uh, that's been at the center of attention in this impeachment hearing, uh, has historically been one of the world's most corrupt nations. Is that correct? That's correct. And under legislation that Congress passed, the National Defense Authorization Act, it was President Trump's responsibility, his duty, to see that U.S. tax dollars did not go to Ukraine unless they were making progress in reducing corruption. Is that also right? Yes, that's right. And isn't it true that Joe Biden's son, Hunter, had placed himself right smack dab in the middle of that corruption? Yes, he did. Burisma was one of the most corrupt companies in Ukraine. And contrary to what House Democrats and many in the media would have you believe, the concerns about Hunter Biden's involvement in Ukrainian corruption, uh, they're not some sort of vast right-wing conspiracy concocted by supporters of the president, are they? In fact, the concerns about Hunter Biden were first raised by the Obama administration. Is that right? That's right. And also um, Washington Post, a lot of publications, and uh, the State Department. And the Obama administration's concerns about Obama uh, didn't end there, did they? The former ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Marie Yovanovitch, said she was coached by the Obama administration on how to answer pesky questions related to Hunter Biden and Burisma uh, that might arise during her Senate confirmation process. Is that right? The State Department was so concerned about this, they gave her a mock Q&A on this question. And nearly every single witness who testified at the Intelligence Committee impeachment inquiry agreed that Hunter Biden's Burisma deal created, at the very least, the appearance of conflict of interest. Is that correct? That's correct. And, you know, De Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent testified that there was an investigation into Burisma, into their, their head, Zochevsky, and they were trying to track down 23 million that he had he had taken out of the country. They were working with the United Kingdom. They were working, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, U Ukraine was working on tracking this money down. And there was an investigation, an active investigation going on and a bribe was paid. And that bribe was paid. It allowed Zolchevsky to, to get off scot-free. Right around that time is when Burisma went about uh, sprucing up their board, shall we say. And, and yet, with all that evidence, the Democrats on the Intelligence Committee under Chairman Schiff and now the Democrats here are determined to sweep the Biden corruption under the rug, ignore it, uh, not let us call witnesses on it, and instead rush to impeach the president, all to satisfy, I would argue, their radical left-wing base. What a disservice uh, to the country. Imagine this. You've got the Vice President, Joe Biden, in charge of overseeing our Ukrainian policy, and his son, Hunter Biden, receiving 50 grand a month with no identifiable expertise in either energy or Ukraine, yet the Democrats won't let us present witnesses on that. So let's do the next best thing since we can't bring the witnesses here. Uh, let's watch a couple of videos. You didn't have any extensive knowledge about natural gas or Ukraine itself, though? Uh, no. The list that you gave me of the reasons why you're on that board, you did not list the fact that you were the son of the vice president. Of course, president. yeah, no. I, what I, role do you think that played? I think that it is impossible for me to be on any of the boards that I just mentioned without saying that I'm the son of the vice president of the United States. If your last name wasn't Biden, do you think you would have been asked to be on the board of Burisma? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. You know, Joe Biden got a little testy with a voter at one of his events in Iowa last week, calling the man a liar, challenging him to a push-up contest, among other things, and falsely, falsely stating once again that nobody said there was anything wrong with his son's deal in Ukraine. Well, you know what? That's a lot of malarkey. A lot of people have been saying that for quite a while now, and they're right. And what's worse is that first the Intelligence Committee and now this committee are conducting an impeachment investigation against President Trump based on, as Professor Turley put it last week, wafer-thin evidence and ignoring evidence of a high-level U.S. official who actually did engage in a quid pro quo with the Ukrainian government, in fact, confessed to it in this video. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here, and I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> Got fired.
You're investigating the wrong guy, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Goldman, I'd like to bring us back to the next president, not uh, to this president, not the next president, uh, and stay focused on the July 25 call and the president's abuse of office for his benefit and no one else's. Now, as my colleague, Ms. Jackson Lee, confirmed, the president's request for these investigations was not an objective of U.S. foreign policy, correct? That's right. Is there any evidence that the National Security Council wanted an investigation into the Bidens, Burisma, or any alleged Ukrainian interference in 2016? No. Any evidence about the State Department wanting them? No. How about the DOD? Did the DOD want those investigations? No evidence of that. Did any witness tell you that they wanted Ukraine to investigate the Bidens of the 2016 election? No. And we certainly know now that the Ukrainians did not want it either. In fact, they made it very clear they did not want to be an instrument, this is a quote, an instrument in Washington domestic re-election politics. So the only person who was a beneficiary from that investigation is President Trump. And that's why everyone on the July 25 call knew it was wrong. They knew it was wrong. The investigative committee heard testimony from three witnesses who participated in that call. Is that correct? Yes. Well, listen to that call. Right. Mr. Mr. Goldman, even in real time, the witnesses who listened on that call testified they were concerned by the call. Is that correct? Yes. And in fact, both Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and Mr. Morrison immediately reported the call to legal counsel. Is that right? That's right. And why did they do so? Uh, they did it for separate reasons. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman w was uh, concerned about the substance of the call, that it was improper. Um, Mr. Morrison was concerned about the potential political ramifications if the call was released because of the substance of the call and the political nature of the call. And they reported the call, that they actually reported that to the internal legal channels. Uh, Mr. Goldman, I've placed Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's testimony about why he reported the call on the screen. Am I correct his concern was based on the fact that the president was asking a foreign power to investigate a U.S. citizen? Yes, and he was not the only witness to express that concern. Am I also correct that he reported this concern because he thought it was a sense of duty, a duty that he felt something was wrong? Yes, sir. As, as you probably know, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is a Purple Heart Award winner from, uh, or medal winner from uh, Iraq, and, and he has been in the Department of Defense for 20 years and has a great sense of duty and a great patriotism to this country and uh, felt that he compelled to follow that sense of duty and report it. And Ms. Williams, Vice President of Pence's aide, was present for the call, and she testified, as you brought out, or was brought out earlier, that it was unusual and inappropriate. Is that correct? That's right. Now, when Mr. Vice President Biden got involved with the European Union and the IMF and Germany and France and said, you've got to do something about corruption, that was okay because they were doing something for the common good of a bunch of people, as distinguished from what's going on here, where somebody's doing it for their personal good. Is that not correct? Right. There's a distinction between doing an official act for an official purpose and doing an official act for a personal purpose. And if, if I could just uh, respond to something Mr. Castor said, when he said that the, um, there were problems because Zlochewski paid a bribe, the head of Burisma, in order to get out from under the prosecution, that was exactly the type of conduct that Vice President Biden w wanted to shut down in Ukraine. That was exactly the type of non-anti-corruption non policies that Vice President Biden was objecting to using the official policy. So that's one of the reasons that he, I mean, I don't know if that was one, but that's the type of thing that he uh, based, he and the Americans and the Europeans based That's the issue on. we've got to get in this committee, to understand the difference between doing something for the national good, for the international good, for the common good, and for your own good. That's the difference. Got to get that across. And those witnesses, many career nonpartisan officials, were clear they thought it was wrong to ask a foreign government to investigate a political rival. Video. To investigate uh, the Vice President of the United States or someone who is a U.S. official, I don't think we should be asking foreign governments to do that. Uh, I would also say that's true of a political rival. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. It was improper and it was inappropriate, and we said that in the time, in real time. Again, um, our holding up of security systems that would go to a country that is fighting aggression from Russia um, for no 
good policy reason, no good substantive reason, no good for national security reason is wrong. And we are going to check that type of conduct. We are the people's house. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Gomert. Well, I had some questions for the witness, Mr. Burke, but he has absconded. Uh, so I'm going to use my five minutes, but not to ask questions. It is interesting, though, to have heard Mr. Goldman refuse to answer question about the investigation, yet he comes in here, and the very reason that he wants to see the president for the first time any president's ever been removed from office, why he's been obstructing. He didn't answer our question. So perhaps if we're going to apply his sense of justice to him, it would be time to have him removed from his position. But that's only if we apply his his own standards. And as Chris Plant says, if it weren't for double standards, some of these folks wouldn't have standards at all. But we were told also at the beginning that we would hear lawyers present evidence. Lawyers are going to come in here. Now, what normally happens, and I, I've been in some kangaroo hearings in courts, not my own when I was there, but I have been mistreated in hearings before, but I have never seen anything like this where we don't allow the fact witnesses to come in here. We have the lawyers come in and tell us what we're supposed to know about those witnesses and about their testimony and about their impression and what the law is. This is outrageous. My friend uh, Jim Sensenbrenner said in 41 years, he's never seen anything like what we have going on here to try to oust a sitting president. And it's also outrageous to hear people say, well, this man thought he was a king because he said he could do anything he wanted when they know that that statement was in the context of whether or not he could fire Mueller. And of course he could fire Mueller. He could fire or not fire Mueller. He could appoint a special prosecutor to invest Mueller and Weissman. I think he should have. But that's his parodic prerogative and he could have done anything about that he wanted to take that out of context say he thinks he's a king let me tell you what a king is a king is someone who says over 20 times i can't do that congress has to change the law on immigration and then he decides you know what i got a pen i got a phone i'll do whatever i want and by golly he does he makes new law with a pen and a phone. Now, that is more like a monarchy, not somebody saying they can fire a special prosecutor if they want to. And regarding treason, the Constitution itself says you got to have two witnesses. And that's, that's not hearsay witnesses, none of this stuff that wouldn't be admissible in any decent court. No, that's two direct evidence witnesses that can come in and positively identify themselves, not something they overheard or something, but actually be witnesses to treason. And yet this group comes in here, they toss treason out in a report like it's no big deal. We can bring in a bunch of hearsay witnesses and then we'll have the lawyers testify and then throw a president out of office. This is, is so absurd. It's so absurd. Now, we have a witness come in and we're told he's going to be a witness. That's why he doesn't have to follow under the rules of decorum. And then I've never seen this. He gets to come up and grill his opposing adversary witness. I feel like, to be fair, if we were going to make this thing fair, Mr. Castor would be able to come up and grill Mr. Burke. But this isn't about being fair. It's not about due process. This is about a kangaroo system. And let me tell you, those that think you've done something special here, you have set the bar so low, I'm afraid it's irreparable. I mean, just think, we've had people already mention, you know, the next president, Joe Biden, we're told, you know, gee, he may be the next president. Well, we've already got the forms. All we have to do is eliminate Donald Trump's name and put Joe Biden's name in there because he's on video, he and his son. He basically has admitted to the crime that's being hoisted on the president improperly. So... I'm scared for my country. 
because I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is supposed to be the Congress. I came up here from a court where we had order and we had rules, and I've seen nothing of the kind in here today, and it's outrageous that we're trying to remove a president with a kangaroo court like this. I yield back. Chairman, if I could just clarify, treason is not in our report. I just want General, to... The gentleman, the, yielded, the gentleman yielded back. Yeah, and it is mentioned in the report we got. Thank you very much. The gentleman yielded back. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to get us back to the undisputed facts of the president's abuse of power. Mr. Goldman, as a prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, when you prosecuted drug conspiracy cases, was it standard practice for drug kingpins to try to beat the case by distancing themselves from the conspiracy and blaming their accomplices for the crime? All the time. Uh, conspiracies have different layers, and the top layers make the bottom layers do the work so that they're further removed from the actual conduct. Okay. I'd like to ask some questions about the president's role in what Ambassador Bolton referred to as a drug deal. Did the testimony and evidence compiled by the Intelligence Committee establish the fact that, with respect to Ukraine, Rudy Giuliani was at all times working on behalf of President Trump? Yes, uh, Mr. Giuliani said that. President Trump said that to a number of uh, other individuals. And then those individuals, Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volcker, also said that. Thank you. And on May 9th, 2019, Rudy Giuliani on behalf of his client, President Trump, spoke with a New York Times reporter about his planned trip to Ukraine. And on that trip, he planned to meet with President Zelensky, he said, and urged, uh, and urged him to pursue investigations relating to the Bidens and to the debunked theory that Ukraine and not Russia interfered in the 2016 collect, uh, election. Isn't that correct? That's right. And Mr. Giuliani told the reporter that his trip was not about official U.S. foreign policy and that the information he sought would be very, very helpful to his client, client meaning it would be helpful to President Trump. Is that correct? Yes, and if it's not official foreign policy, it would be helpful to President Trump's personal interests. That's correct. And there is no doubt, Mr. Goldman, that investigations of the Bidens and the 2016 election meddling were in fact not about U.S. policy, but were about benefiting Trump's re-election, correct? Yes, and even the Ukrainians realized that. And on July 25th, President Trump placed that fateful phone call to President Zelensky, and he asked President Zelensky to uh, investigate the Bidens, correct? Yes. And on that call, President Trump told Zelensky, quote, I will have Mr. Giuliani to give you a call, correct? That's right. And on October 2nd and October 3rd, President Trump once again made explicit that he and Mr. Giuliani were intent on making these investigations happen, correct? Yes. And just so you know, and Mr. we've been investigating on a personal basis through Rudy and others, lawyers, corruption in the 2016 election. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. Mr. Goldman, the evidence shows a course of conduct by President Trump and his agents. Does it not? It does, and clearly it continued long after our investigation began. It shows a common plan, correct? That's right, yes. It shows a common goal. Correct. And the goal was to get foreign help for the 2020 election, correct? That is, that's what all the witnesses said. And Mr. Goldman, who was the kingpin of that plan? President Trump. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Uh, Ambassador Bolton called it a drug deal. As a kingpin, President Trump tried to force a foreign government to interfere in the upcoming presidential election. The evidence is undisputed and overwhelming that Rudy Giuliani acted as part of a conspiracy with President Trump to obtain Ukrainian <coughs> help for President Trump in the 2020 election. This was not just a hurtful drug deal, 
This was an attempt to undermine the very fabric of our democracy. The framers feared most how foreign influence could turn a president into a despot. So they adopted impeachment as a backstop to protect our democracy. The facts, ladies and gentlemen, demand that we use that remedy today. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Castor, I want to go to the document that started it all, the August 12th whistleblower complaint. Bullet point one on page one of the whistleblower's complaint, he says this, over the past four months, more than half a dozen U.S. officials have informed me of the various facts related to this effort. Mr. Castor, who are these half a dozen U.S. officials? We don't know. We don't know, do we? We had no chance to know for sure who these people were because we never got to talk to the whistleblower. Is that right, Mr. Castor? That's right. We needed to talk to the, to the guy who started it all. We needed to talk to him to figure out who these more than half a dozen people were who formed the basis of his complaint, and we never got to. Adam Schiff's staff got to. Adam Schiff knows who he is, but we don't get to know, and therefore we don't get to know the original people, the six people who formed the basis of this entire thing we've been going through now for three months. But we did talk to 17 people, right, Mr. Castor? That's right. 17 depositions, and you were in every single one. You were the lawyer doing the work for the Republicans in every single one. Is that right? Yes, sir. And there is one witness who they relied on and built their report around. One witness. Who would that witness be? As I read their, their report, it's, it's obviously one witness. Who's that witness, Mr. Ambassador Castor? Sondland. Ambassador Sondland. I think you said earlier his name was mentioned, I don't know, six, what did you say? 611 times. 611 times. More than Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, the guy who was on the call. More than Ambassador Taylor, their first witness, their star witness, the very first hearing in the Intelligence Committee, they relied on, not the whistleblower, not the more than half a dozen people who informed the whistleblower, they relied on Ambassador Sondland. Why'd they pick Sondland, Mr. Castor? That's probably the best they got. Because that's, that's the best they got, the guy who had to file an addendum to his testimony, the guy that had, had to file the clarification, the guy who said two weeks ago, sitting in the same chair you're sitting in, Mr. Castor, in his 23-page opening statement, he said this, unless President Zelensky announces an investigation into Burisma and the Bidens, there would be no call with President Trump, there'd be no meeting with President Trump, there'd be no security assistance money going to Ukraine. That's what Ambassador Sondland said. Mr. Castor, was there an announcement by President Zelensky about investigating the Bidens or Burisma? No. No announcement? No. Did President Zelensky get a call from President Trump? Yes. Did President Zelensky get a meeting with President Trump? Yes. Did President Zelensky get the money from the United States? Yes. They got the call on July 25th. They got the money on September 11th. They got the meeting on September 25th. Is that right? Yes. But the guy who said none of that was going to happen is the guy they build their case around. Yes. Is that right, Mr. Solon? Yep. Let me, let me go to one other thing they built their case around. They built their case around a lot of hearsay, didn't they? And the best example of the hearsay, surprisingly enough, is Ambassador Sondland. It's amazing. They built their case around this ambassador, and they built their case around hearsay. And the best example of both is Mr. Sondland, Ambassador Sondland, because he filed his addendum, his clarification, where he says this. We read this a couple weeks ago. We pointed this out a couple weeks ago. He says this in bullet point number two. In his clarification, he says, Ambassador Taylor recalls that Mr. Morrison told Ambassador Taylor that I told Mr. Morrison that I conveyed this message to Mr. Yarmock on a September 1st, 2019 in connection with Vice President Pence's visit to Warsaw and a meeting with President Zelensky. That's his clarification. Amazing. Six people, as I said before, having four conversations in one sentence. Ambassador Taylor recalls that Mr. Morrison told Ambassador Taylor that I told Mr. Morrison that I conveyed this message to Mr. Yarmack on September 1st, 2019, in connection with Vice President Pence's visit to Warsaw and a meeting with President Zelensky. That's the clarification. That's their star witness who they built their case around. So-and-so tells so-and-so what somebody said to someone else, and there you have it. That's their case. They, they forget the four key facts. They forget the fact that we have the call transcript and there was no quid pro quo. They forget the fact the two guys on the call, President Trump and President Zelensky, have said repeatedly there was no pressure, no linkage, no pushing. They forget the fact Ukraine didn't even know aid was held at the time of the call. And they forget the fact, most important, they did nothing to get the aid released, no announcement of any type of investigation whatsoever. They forget all that, those, those key facts. And they build their case around the guy who had to clarify his testimony with that amazing sentence. Mr. Goldman. Mr. Goldman, the Democrats, did the Democrats publish phone records of the president's attorney? Uh, Mr. Giuliani, yes. Did the Democrats pr uh, publish phone records of a member of the press? Yes, who was also involved in this. Did the Democrats publish phone records of a member of Congress? 
Yes, who was talking to people involved. Did the Democrats, is that member of Congress also happens to be your boss's political opponent that those phone records were published up? So the Democrats, they, do, they run this kind of investigation, ignoring the facts, not letting the whistleblower come in, and therefore not letting us know if we've talked to the more than half a dozen original sources for the whistleblower's complaint in the first place. The guy has to file an addendum with that clarification sentence. But one thing they did do, one thing they did do in their report is they published the phone records of the president's personal lawyer, the phone records of a member of the press, and the phone records of the chairman of the Intelligence Committee's political opponent, Representative Nunes. That's what these guys did. And that's their effort to impeach the president of the United States 11 months before an election. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I have Deitch. unanimous Mr. consent. Deitch. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to focus on the facts Sir, surrounding the President's abuse of gentlemen, power. Gentlemen, you, gentlemen will state his unanimous consent request. I'd ask unanimous consent that the report by the majority staff of the House Committee on the Judiciary Constitutional Grounds for Presidential Impeachment that talks about treason and bribery be admitted for the record. Be what? Be made part of our record. Majority, majority report without objection. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you. Getting back to the facts surrounding the president's abuse of power using the White House meeting as leverage for helping his political campaign, Mr. Goldman, President Trump offered Ukrainian President Zelensky a meeting in the White House. But first, he wanted investigations into the Bidens and a conspiracy theory about meddling in the 2016 election. You testified that the committees found evidence that President Trump worked to exchange official actions for personal benefit, and I want to talk about that. On May 23rd, 2019, a delegation of officials returned from Zelensky's inauguration and they briefed the president. In that briefing, President Trump directed government officials to work with his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Isn't that correct? Yes. And Trump's hand-picked Ukraine operator, Gordon Sunland, testified that they faced a choice, either work with Giuliani or abandon the goal of a White House meeting. What choice did they make, Mr. Goldman? They decided to work with Mr. Giuliani. Right. And six days later, on May 29th, President Trump sent the new Ukrainian president a letter that said America stood with Ukraine and invited President Zelensky to visit the White House. Isn't that correct? Yes, that was the second time that he invited him to the White right, House. So at this point, the Ukrainian president expected that meeting. Correct. But then they learn that they've got to do something more for the president. Sondland testified that there was a prerequisite of investigations. Isn't that right? Yes. And NSC staffer Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testified that Sondland told the Ukrainians in a July 10th meeting that investigation of the Bidens was a deliverable necessary to get that meeting. Isn't that right? Yes, and if I could just take a second to correct what Mr. Castor said about that meeting, there really is no inconsistent statements about whether or not Ambassador Sondland raised the issue of investigations in connection to the White House. Even Ambassador Volker, in his public testimony, was forced to admit that he did hear that, and he said it was inappropriate. And, and in fact, on July 19th, Sondland told President Zelensky directly that President Trump wanted to hear a commitment to the investigations on the July 25th call, correct? That's right. And th that same day, Sondland updated senior multiple Trump administration officials that Zelensky was, quote, prepared to receive POTUS's call and would offer assurances about the investigations. Isn't that right? Yes. And on that same day, State Department official Volker had breakfast with Rudy Giuliani, and he reported to Sondland by text message, most important is for Zelensky to say he will help investigation, right? Yes, and address any specific personnel issues. Right. And later that day, after Giuliani spoke with Yermak, evidence suggested Giuliani gave a green light to that July 25th call. Then on the morning of the call, Volker texted Zelensky aide Yermak, and that text to his aide said, and I quote, heard from White House, assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down a visit, a date for visit to Washington. And the transcript released by President Trump shows Trump requests investigations and Zelensky agrees. Isn't that correct? Yes, and that text message was actually a direction, a message relayed from President Trump himself. 
And then after the July 25th call, members of the administration continued to follow up with the Ukrainian counterparts to prepare for the announcement of investigations. Sondland texted Volcker about efforts to schedule a White House visit, noting that POTUS really wants the deliverable. And that was just one of many messages during a flurry of follow-up activity. There were meetings and calls and texts on July 26th and July 27th and August 2nd, 4th, 5th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, August 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 15th. Mr. Goldman, August 16th, 17th, and August 19th, isn't that correct? Yes, including to Secretary Pompeo as I, well. Here's the point. These are our government officials who work for us. Instead, they were working hard to help the president advance his personal political <coughs> interests. Isn't that what you found, Mr. Goldman? That's right. This isn't a close call. We had a Ukrainian president at war with Russia desperate for a White House meeting. The president promised a White House meeting, but then he blocked the Oval Office. He blocked it and said, I need a favor. Not a favor to help America, a favor to help me get reelected. Our framers feared one day we would face a moment like this. They gave us an impeachment, and they gave us impeachment as a safety valve not to punish the president but to defend our elections and our Constitution, and that's what we must do. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Castor, I want to direct your attention to page three of the telephone call dated July 25th between President Trump and President Zelensky. Uh, on page three, President Trump states, I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. Later, he says, I would like to have the attorney general call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. The majority report on page 13 says, the U.S. intelligence community had unanimously determined that Russia, not Ukraine, interfered in the 2016 election to help the candidacy of President Trump. Mr. Castor, there appears to be uh, a conflict there. President Trump is asking the Ukraine to investigate something. Uh, the majority has decided that it's an illegitimate request because there was no uh, uh, interference in an election by the Ukraine. Is that how you read this? Yes. And. The press release from the majority on their report says, as part of this scheme, President Trump acting in his official capacity and using his position of public trust personally and directly requested that the president of Ukraine, that the government of Ukraine publicly announce investigations into subsection two, a baseless theory promoted by Russia alleging that Ukraine, rather than Russia, interfered in the 2016 U.S. election. Is that true? Uh, yes. And. Mr. Castro, I want to ask you something. Have you uh, seen this article um, from Politico dated January 11, 2017? Uh, yes, I have. And the title of that article is Ukrainian Efforts to Sabotage Trump Backfire. Is that correct? Yes. I want to read you the second paragraph. Ukrainian government officials tried to help Hillary Clinton and undermine Trump by publicly questioning his fitness for office. They also disseminated documents implicating a top Trump aide in corruption and suggested they were investigating the matter only to back away after the election. And they helped Clinton's allies research damaging information on Trump and his advisors, a Politico investigation found. Isn't it true that President Trump had a legitimate reason to request help from the Ukraine about the 2016 election? And I'm not suggesting for a minute that Russia didn't interfere. Of course they interfered. But the, in, the Ukraine officials tried to influence the election. Yes. Let's move on to Ambassador Sondland. I only have 10 fingers and 10 toes, so I can't count above 20, Mr. Castor. But you know how many times Ambassador Sondland said that he did not know, did not recall, had no recollection, had limited memory, or failed to remember something in his October 17th testimony? You know how many times? 325. Does that surprise you? 325. Big number. And then he files a clarifying statement, and he clarifies a few things, I guess. 
But did you have any influence, do you have any contact with Ambassador Sondland between the time uh, of his deposition and the time of his clarifying statement? No. Did, you, did, the, did the majority? I have no idea. You have no idea? So they may have had influence uh, on, on his testimony. I did. And that would be evidence of bias. That would be evidence of uh, credibility. That would be evidence that, that we should take into account before. But we'll never know, will we? Because the majority counsel has a right to assert a privilege as to information that's relevant to this committee's decision. The majority counsel has a right to assert a privilege in any communications he has with uh, the chairman, Adam Schiff, doesn't he? Um, as does minority counsel. That's a privilege that we've reserved here in Congress, isn't it? Yeah. And the same thing is true of FOIA. The Freedom of Information Act does not apply to memos that majority counsel writes. Isn't that true? Correct. So we've, we've demanded that of the executive branch, but we have uh, uh, allowed ourselves not to be part of FOIA, correct? Correct. Okay, so the majority has a privilege. The president also has a privilege. It's called executive privilege. He can meet with the secretary of state, and that's a privileged conversation. He can meet with the secretary of defense. That's a privileged conversation. He can meet with the secretary of energy. That's a privileged conversation. Now, when the majority has subpoenaed those witnesses, and the president has refused to produce those witnesses or relevant documents, or what they consider relevant documents, they are charging him with an article of impeachment for obstruction. In fact, their report says, president obstructed the impeachment inquiry by instructing witnesses to ignore subpoenas. Why? Uh, Ms. Bass. Mr. Goldman, I want to pick up on the president using the powers of his office, in this case, in a meeting at the White House, to pressure a foreign country to investigate his political rival. Now that you've had time to step back from the investigation, is there any doubt that the president did, in fact, use a White House visit to pressure President Zelensky to announce investigations of his political rival to benefit his re-election campaign? Um, I will answer that question in a minute, but I, I would like just to comment to Mr. Buck that uh, the majority staff and no one had any contact with Ambassador Sondland after his deposition. Um, but the answer to your question is yes, uh, Ms. Bass. My colleague, Mr. Deutsch, mostly focused on the period prior to the July 25th call. I'd like to focus on the period after. Following the call, did President Zelensky come to the White House for a meeting? Uh, no, he's never come to the White House, and several witnesses, multiple witnesses, said that there's a huge distinction between a White House meeting and a meeting on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly where they did meet on September 25th. So has a White House meeting been scheduled? No. So did the President and his associates essentially continue to withhold the White House meeting? And if so, why did they do that? Well, the evidence found that um, the White House meeting was conditioned on the announcement of these investigations. And so once in mid-August, when um, the Ukrainians, Mr. Yermak and President Zelensky, uh, decided that they were not going to issue that statement that Rudy Giuliani wanted to include Burisma in the 2016 elections, there was no White House meeting. It soon became clear to them that the security assistance was also at risk and that took on a, a renewed importance for them. Well, following the 25th call, the July 25th call, Ambassador Sunlin and Volker works, worked closely with Mr. Giuliani and the Ukrainians to help draft a statement that the president could make, President Zelensky. Wasn't that right? Yes, and, and the, the report say they work closely, and then there were also phone calls with the White House around the same time that they were working closely. Do you know what that statement was supposed to say, according to Mr. Giuliani and the U.S. officials? Well, the key difference is that it had to include that Ukraine would do the investigations of Burisma, which equaled the Biden investigation, and the 2016 uh, Ukraine interference. But was there concern about doing the investigations, or...? What, were they just supposed to make a statement about it? What? Ambassador Sondland very clearly testified that all he ever heard Mr. Giuliani or anyone say is that they only needed the public announcement of the investigations. And so did the committee find that without that public statement that there would be no White House meeting? Yes. So I was struck by how clear the evidence seems to be on this point, and I'd like to play another example. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, 
With regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. Everyone was in the loop. Mr. Goldman, did the investigative committees find that Mr. Giuliani played a role in the White House visit being conditioned on investigations? The evidence showed that Mr. Giuliani not only played a role, but that he was essentially the president's agent. He was acting on behalf of the president, expressing the president's wishes, desires. So, so what evidence did the committee find that corroborated the quote, everyone was in the loop? Well, um, Ambassador Sondland produced for his public testimony, and I, I think it's very important in light of um, the testimony from Mr. Castor a minute ago with Mr. Buck as to how many times that Mr. Sondland did not remember in his deposition, because we agree it was egregious. But the, the advantage of doing closed depositions is that Mr. Sondland could not match up his testimony. So as other witnesses came in, mm -hmm. then he realized that he had to actually admit you know, to uh, more and more stuff. I, I, so I, he did admit to, uh, to an email that included Secretary Pompeo, I, I do want I do want to make a point before my time goes out. Um, we have to think about what is going on today. So President Zelensky is meeting with Putin today. And because of President Trump's actions, <laughs> Zelensky is in a weakened position to negotiate with the leader of the nation that invaded his country. If our military assistance had been provided as Congress ordered it and the White House meeting, President Zelensky would be meeting with Putin from a position of strength. If you want the support, uh, well, we have to realize that the message that this sends to our allies is to end to this, our standing in the world. If you want the support of the United States, be prepared to help with President Trump's reelection. President Trump's abuse of power has injured our nation. Thank the chairman. The 299-page Democratic Majority Report mentions the Intelligence Community Inspector General Michael Atkinson on pages 26, 33, 138, 140, and 143. Mr. Goldman, you were present for the October 4, 2019 transcribed interview of the Inspector General Michael Atkinson, correct? Yes. On pages 53 to 73 of that transcribed interview, the Inspector General's testimony confirms the following, that the whistleblower made statements to the Inspector General under penalty of perjury that were not true and correct that the whistleblower first made statements in writing under penalty of perjury that were not true and correct. The whistleblower then made statements under penalty of perjury that were not true and correct in his or her verbal responses to the Inspector General's investigative team. Because of the whistleblower's statements in writing and verbally to the Inspector General that were neither true, correct, or accurate, Pages 53 to 73 of that sworn testimony reveal that the Inspector General was not able to answer any questions, none from me, about the whistleblower's contact or communication with Chairman Schiff's staff, of which Mr. Goldman is a member. Mr. Castor, do you remember anywhere in this 299-page report that makes reference to the fact that when the whistleblower started this inquiry, he or she did so by making statements under penalty of perjury that were neither true or correct in writing and then did so again verbally. I don't remember that. After the Inspector General testified on October 4th and after media reports revealed that the whistleblower and Chairman Schiff did not disclose their prior contacts or communications with one another, the whistleblower contacted the, the Inspector General to explain why he or she made statements under penalty of perjury in writing and verbally that were not true, correct, and accurate. Mr. Castor, is that communication from the whistleblower, uh, from the whistleblower to the Inspector General to explain prior inconsistent statements reflected anywhere in the 299-page report? No. On October 2nd, Chairman Schiff's spokesman, Patrick Bolin, acknowledged publicly that the outlines of the whistleblower's accusations against the president had been disclosed to the House Intelligence staff and shared with Chairman Schiff. Mr. Castor, is that disclosure and Mr. Uh, Bolin's admission of that disclosure anywhere in this report? I don't remember saying it. It's not. I think all members of Congress should be held accountable during this impeachment process. And to that end, if I have made any false statements, about the whistleblower or the Inspector General's testimony today, then I should be held accountable. 
The way to do that would be to release the Inspector General's testimony, or even just pages 53 to 73. I would add that there's nothing in those pages that would in any way identify or place at risk the whistleblower's identity, nor would it reveal any information that in any way relates to, much less jeopardizes national security. Look, maybe there's a believable explanation for why the whistleblower made statements that weren't true or accurate about his contact or her contact with Chairman Schiff in writing and then again verbally. Maybe there's a good explanation for why the words Congress or Congressional Committee was confusing or not clear to the whistleblower. Maybe there's a good explanation for why the whistleblower also misled the Inspector General in writing on August 12th by stating, I reserve the option to exercise my legal right to contact the committees directly when the whistleblower had in fact already contacted Chairman Schiff's committee two weeks before he or she wrote that. Maybe there's a believable reason why Chairman Schiff was not initially truthful about his staff's communications with the whistleblower. Maybe there's a good reason that explains all of these statements in writing and verbally that just weren't true and correct. Maybe there is, but there is no good reason for voting to impeach and remove from office an American president without allowing a single question to be asked of a single witness to get an explanation for why the Inspector General was not told the truth about contacts between the whistleblower and Chairman Schiff. The bottom line is we should all be held accountable, and next November, every member of the House will be asked this question. Did you vote to impeach the President without allowing any investigation into why the whistleblower that started it all did so by making statements in writing and verbally under penalty of perjury that were not true. Democrats may not care if that question ever gets answered, but the voters will. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goldman, I want to uh, start off with facts and that you all uncovered uh, through the course of your investigation. And I want to pick up where my colleagues, Mr. Deutsch and Ms. Bass, left off. They walked us through how the president used the White House visit to apply pressure on Ukraine to do his personal bidding. I want to talk about how the president did the same thing with almost 400 million taxpayer dollars to pressure Ukraine to do his personal bidding. So I'd like to start with turning back to the July 25th call. It's a fact that in the president's own words and the transcript submitted by him, uh, reveals that after Ukraine asked for military aid, Trump says, I would like you to do us a favor, though. Right after President Zelensky thanks President Trump for the military assistance, then President Trump asked for a favor. And of course, by this point, President Trump had already placed the hold on the security assistance. Now, my Republican colleagues have suggested that the Ukrainians did not even know about the military aid being withheld. Is that true? Uh, no, there, there was uh, significant evidence that even as early as July 25th, at the time of this call, that Ukrainian officials had suspected that um, the aid was being withheld. And there was a New York Times article actually last week that wasn't included in our report, but from the former foreign, or uh, deputy foreign minister who said that they, that Ukraine, the uh, President Zelensky's office received a diplomatic cable from the embassy here the week of July 25th saying that the aid had been held. Correct. And what I also show you on the screen is that it was on July 25th also, the same day of the call, that the State Department emailed the Department of Defense noting that the Ukrainian embassy was asking about the withheld military aid. Yes, that's what I was referring to. I'd like to into, let's go back. There was also discussion earlier during the minority questioning that Mr. Sandy from OMB said that the reason for the security assistance hold was related to the president's concerns about burden sharing with Europe. Is that consistent with the evidence that you all uncovered? So it's a, it's a good question because Mr. Sandy did say that, but notably Mr. Sandy said that he only heard that in early September, that that reason was never provided to him or anybody else before early September for the first two months of the hold. And of course it was given at that point as this, uh, the gig was up, so to speak. So that was after everything came out to light? 
it was, he wasn't sure of the timing, but he was ultimately told that the reason for the hold after it was lifted was for that reason. But that's, you know, a, uh, I think an after the fact excuse based on our evidence because no other witnesses were ever told for the, of that reason during the entire time that it was held. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record evidence uncovered by the committee from the House Budget and Appropriations Committees that documents OMB placing a hold on the Ukrainian security assistance on July 25th. Without objection. So let's review. On July 18th, OMB announced to all relevant agencies that the military aid would be withheld from Ukraine. On a call with Ukraine on July 25th, President Trump says, do us a favor, though, and ask Ukraine to investigate his political rival. Also on July 25th, in the hours following that call, both the Ukrainians and the Americans took action specifically related to that military aid. The, Ukraini the Ukrainians began asking about the status of their military aid, and OMB took its first official action to withhold that aid. Mr. Goldman, I'm placing on the screen in front of you an email from Ambassador Sondland to members of the White House administration, in which Ambassador Sondland says, I would ask Zelensky to look him in the eye and tell him that once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place, Zelensky should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to the President and the United States. Hopefully, that will break the log jam. Did the investigative committees uncover any evidence on what Ambassador Sondland meant when he suggested that President Zelensky would have to move forward publicly on, quote, issues of importance to the President to receive military aid? Ambassador Sondland said those were the two investigations that President Trump mentioned on the July 25th call, which Secretary Pompeo, who received that email, listened into. So the President was concerned about the two investigations and though that was the predicate for releasing military aid to our ally. At the time of that email, yes. Thank you, and I yield back. A little earlier, uh, Mr. Armstrong had asked uh, a unanimous consent request to insert into the record the IG report uh, uh, released today about FISA, and I had uh, said we would take it under advisement. We have reviewed it, and without objection, it will be entered into the record. Uh, Ms. Roby. I'm actually stunned by the process or lack thereof that is taking place in this institution. I have many Democratic friends that I know to be thoughtful, deliberative members of Congress, even though we may disagree vehemently on policy. But these proceedings being led by the majority, like I said, it's stunning. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out why the majority would approach this in such a way that will forever cast doubt on why and how they chose to affect history with the impeachment of a president of the United States. And now to what has taken place here today. This is just bizarre. As a member of Congress serving on the House Judiciary Committee, I'm asking questions to staff as witnesses before us in an impeachment evidentiary hearing. I mean, no disrespect to staff. Uh, we have the most dedicated, hardworking staff, and without these individuals, uh, we most certainly couldn't do our jobs effectively. Uh, but we have not, and we will not, hear from any fact witnesses. Whether you identify as a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent, whether you agree or disagree with a President, whether you like or dislike a President, the American people should be cheated, should feel cheated by the way this is all taking place. This process is more than incomplete, and the American people deserve better. Today, history is being made, and I too believe it is a dangerous precedent for the future of our republic. It is worth a deeper explanation of the issue of a minority hearing. The minority members of this committee have frequently asked the chairman for a minority day hearing, and all members on this side have signed onto a letter to the chairman asking for a minority day hearing. I'd like to quote House Rule 11, Clause 2, whenever a hearing is conducted by a committee on a measure or a matter, the minority members of the committee shall be entitled upon the request to the chair by a majority of them before the completion of the hearing 
to call witnesses selected by the minority to testify with respect to that measure or matter during at least one day of hearing thereon. The wording here is that the minority shall be entitled, not if the chairman deems the minority worthy, but shall be entitled. Mr. Castor, with all of your experience in investigations here in the Congress, is it your belief, based on that experience, that ignoring the minority's stated rights for a hearing under the rules of the House severely undermines the future of this institution? Yes. I'd like to quote um, what we heard from the Democratic staff, Mr. Burke, in his opening comments. It is the hope that in these discussions, we can put aside political rancor, disagreements, and have a fair discussion. That is far from what has happened here today or the days leading up to this. The American people deserve better than this. And I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Collins. Thank you. Um, Mr. Castor, we've heard a lot. This is always a good time, I think, to go back and remind people that there are four things that really haven't changed. Would you like to at least remind us about everything that's been discussed? Um, well, there's four things that will never change, and that is the, the transcript is complete and accurate. It shows no quid pro quo, no conditionality. Uh, that's number one. Number two, there was no pressure. Both Zelensky and Trump have said that repeatedly. Uh, President Zelensky said that at uh, the United Nations on September 25th. He said it in subsequent news articles on October 6th and October 10th and uh, December 1st. Um, number three, the Ukrainians and Zelensky did not know about the pause in aid, at the very least at the time of the call. Um, and number four, no investigations were announced. The aid was released. And the White House, uh, you know, afforded a meeting, and, and President Trump met with uh, Zelensky in New York. Do you find it amazing that the majority is one of their key prongs of this whole thing is that they're making the elected leader of the Ukraine out to be a liar? Um, because if he says that there's no pressure, he's done it on many, many occasions since then, that undoubtedly they believe him not to be truthful. So is it, doesn't that strike you as a little strange, especially in this circumstance? It's unfortunate. It is. It's just sad that we're calling an elected leader who is actually working on corruption and other things like that, we're calling him a liar simply because they don't agree with the Democrats' theory of a partisan impeachment. Mm -hmm. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Jeffries. Let's focus on the aid to Ukraine. Mr. Goldman, uh, Congress allocated on a bipartisan basis $391 million in military aid to the Ukraine. Is that correct? Yes, and it was signed by President Trump into law. Does the record establish that the military aid to Ukraine is in the national security interests of the United States? Absolutely. The investigation concluded that President Trump compromised U.S. national security by withholding vital military assistance and diplomatic support. Is that true? Yes. President Trump and his defenders claim that he withheld military aid out of alleged concern with corruption in Ukraine. Let's explore this phony justification. Donald Trump first spoke to the president of Ukraine on an April 21st call, correct? That's right. President Trump never used the word corruption on that April 21st call, true? That is true, and the readout from the White House after the call did say that President Trump talked about corruption. That readout was inaccurate. In a May 23rd letter, Trump's Department of Defense concluded that Ukraine met the anti-corruption benchmarks required to receive military aid from the United States, true? Yes, and if I could just take a, a second to talk about that, because that's very important. And this goes back to what uh, Mr. Collins was talking about with Vice President Biden. There is absolutely conditionality on aid in routinely in all sorts of different ways, but it's done through official policy. And these anti-corruption benchmarks that you're referencing here was a condition of Ukraine getting the aid. But in May, the Department of Defense, in conjunction with the other interagencies, certified that Ukraine was making the necessary progress on anti-corruption efforts to merit the aid. And yet the aid was not released, correct? The aid was subsequently held. It, it was supposed to be released. DOD announced the release, and then President Trump held the aid uh, without explanation. Uh, Mr. Goldman, based on the evidence and testimony that you have reviewed, is there any reason to believe that the president cared about corruption in Ukraine? 
No, the, the evidence uh, really supports the fact that President Trump views corruption in Ukraine to be synonymous with the two investigations that he wants. But what the president did care about was a political favor from the Ukrainian government, and that is why he withheld the military aid. True? That, he told Ambassador Sondland himself that that is the only thing that he cares about. Now, several witnesses testified as to the real motivation connected to the withheld military aid, including Ambassador Bill Taylor. Here is what he said in his testimony. To withhold that assistance for no good reason other than help with the political campaign made no sense. It was, it was counterproductive to all of what we had been trying to do. Uh, it was illogical. It could not be explained. It was crazy. Illogical, unexplainable, crazy. Mr. Goldman, according to the testimony from Ambassador Taylor, the only explanation for the withheld aid that made sense is that the president was seeking help with a political campaign, correct? That, that is the only uh, logical explanation, as multiple witnesses said. Ambassador Sondland is a Trump appointee who gave a million dollars to the president's inauguration. And he testified that he came to believe that the resumption of security aid would not occur until there was a public statement from Ukraine committing to the investigations, correct? Yes, and that was subsequently confirmed in a conversation with President Trump himself. Lieutenant Colonel Vinman is a decorated Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and member of the White House National Security Council. And he testified that it is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent, correct? Yeah, that, that, that was the pretty much unanimous view of all 17 uh, witnesses that, that came in to testify in, before the Intelligence Committee. The evidence shows that President Trump withheld military aid from Ukraine as part of a scheme to extract a political favor and solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election. True? Yes, and, and that, the scheme part is very important because the minority wants to focus on these four very narrow facts that, that ignore the vast majority of the evidence. And so the fact that you use scheme is, is actually critical to the whole, the whole case here. The president abused his power. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Gates. The last public opinion poll I saw showed Congress had an approval rating at about 9 percent. By contrast, Muammar Gaddafi had an approval rating at 13 percent, and his own people dragged him in the streets and killed him. This impeachment process demonstrates the worst in us, and it is depriving us the opportunity to raise our gaze and meet the needs of the American people. Unless you have bipartisan consensus, impeachment is a divisive issue in the country. Many people would think it's being done for political reasons. Nancy Pelosi, May 2018. And here we are in the most partisan presidential impeachment in American history. Matter of fact, when we opened the inquiry, no Republicans voted with the Democrats. And you even had Democrats voting with us in the only bipartisan vote to shut down this impeachment. And that brings us to your role, Mr. Goldman. Are you here as a partisan advocate for the Democrat position, or are you here as a nonpartisan investigator of the facts? I'm here to present the report that we did on our investigation, which was totally and completely reliant on the actual evidence that we uncovered, the witness testimony, and the documents. Are you a partisan? I am not a partisan. Mr. Castro, how long have you worked for the House? Since 2005. And same question, Mr. Golden. For the House? Uh, since uh, earlier this year. Mr. Castro, do you make political donations? I don't remember any. Uh, Mr. Goldman, same question. Do you make political donations? I do, sir. I think it's very important. Matter of fact, you've, support, you've um, given tens of thousands of dollars to Democrats, right? Sir, I, I think it's very important to support candidates for office. I think our free Have you given fair, over 100,000? Do you mind if I, I just want to know the number. I don't really care the basis. Have you given more than 100,000 to Democrats? You don't care about it? The basis, I just want the number. So it's tens of, I, I think Mr. Burke, number, do you know how much money Mr. Burke has given Democrats? I, I don't know and I Would don't Would it surprise you if it's more than 100,000? Mr. Gates, I'm here to talk about this report. So, so you gave tens I'm of thousands to to and Mr. Burke report. gave hundreds of, or more than 100,000. Do you think if you'd given more money, you might have been able to ask questions and answer them like Mr. Burke did? 
I guess it's something you're still pondering. Uh, Mr. Castor, have you ever tweeted anything at the president? No. Mr. Goldman, same question. Um, I have made a number of tweets in my private capacity before I came to this job when I was working in the media, yes. Matter of fact, this is one of those tweets, right? It, and you said, nothing in the dossier is proven false, but in fact, the dossier said that there was a Russian consulate in Miami when there isn't. The dossier said that Michael Pro Cohen had a meeting in Prague when he didn't. The dossier said that Michael Cohen's wife was Russian. She's, in fact, Ukrainian. And so, as we sit here today, where you've, I guess, got a tweet mentioning a P-tape, presenting yourself not as a partisan, hired by the Democrats to pursue the president, do you regret this tweet? Sir, I would be happy to put my this investigation up with any of the nonpartisan investigations. I just want to know if you regret the tweet, Mr. Goldman. During my 10 years as a federal prosecutor. Do you regret it? I hope you read the evidence, and I think you can judge you for You either regret it or you don't regret it, Mr. Goldman. I guess you don't want to answer it's the question. You know what, Mr. Chairman? Earlier in this hearing, you said in your opening statement that there is nothing more urgent than impeachment right now. This is the most urgent thing we could possibly do. Well, you know what, if you're a senior right now and you can't afford your prescription drugs, that's more urgent than this. If you're a manufacturer wanting to dominate the Western Hemisphere with the passage of the USMCA, that is more urgent. If you're a farmer who wants to open markets so that your family can survive and thrive, that is a lot more urgent than this partisan process. If you're a desperate family member watching someone succumb to addiction, solving the opioid problem, probably more urgent than this partisan impeachment. If you're a member of the next generation, dealing with the challenges of extinction and climate change, a budget that's out of control, driving up the credit card of young people in this country and what they'll have to pay back as a consequence of our poor decisions, likely more urgent. But House Democrats have failed at all of these things. Matter of fact, I'd say the only thing under the Christmas tree for most Americans would be a lump of coal, but I think they're against coal, too. The only thing under the Christmas tree for Americans would be impeachment and investigations. I've heard over and over Democrats say that this is all about the president's personal interest and that he abandoned the national interest. And it begs an analysis of how the nation is doing. In November, 266,000 jobs created, 80,000 over the average, half a million more manufacturing jobs in the Trump presidency, 700,000 construction jobs. We are doing better than ever before. The American people are thriving. Why won't you help us move along the critical issues that are far more important than your partisan impeachment? The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Cicilline. Uh, let me begin by dispelling the claim that Mr. Gates just made. This has been one of the most productive Congresses in modern history. We've passed nearly 400 pieces of legislation that respond to the urgent priorities of the American people, driving down health care costs, raising wages for the American worker, responding to gun violence, providing equal pay for equal work, responding to the climate crisis. 275 of those bills are fully bipartisan, and 80 percent of those bills are sitting on the Senate Majority Leader's desk awaiting action. So we, have, we will continue to deliver on the important priorities of the American people. But we were also elected to hold this president accountable. And we took an oath of office that said to protect and defend the Constitution. And that's what we're engaged in today. And so I want to return, Mr. Goldman, to uh, the military aid. Uh, did the investigating committees receive evidence about why the United States military aid to Ukraine was necessary? What was it advancing? Because a lot of Americans who are watching don't know a lot about Ukraine, don't know about the geopolitical significance. Like, why does it matter? In, in, the witnesses were quite clear about this, and, and they say it mattered for multiple reasons. The, the first is that Russia invaded Ukraine to take over part of their, uh, of their country, and that this was the first military incursion in Europe since World War II. And this is Russia, who's an adversary, uh, actually trying to encroach on another democracy. So just from a broad democratic viewpoint, it was essential not only to Ukraine's national security, but to America's national security to make sure that democracy remains worldwide. And what, when that, prior to the call on July 25th, Congress had approved the aid, correct? Congress had approved the aid, and then the president had and held the, the aid. And the Defense Department had even publicly announced its intention to deliver the aid, correct? That's right. The Trump administration had already certified that Ukraine had taken substantial steps to combat corruption, correct? Correct. And that normally leads to the release of the aid. 
It uh, they announced the release of the aid, yes. And the investigative committees questioned witnesses from the Defense Department, the State Department, OMB, the White House, and the National Security Council about the President's decision to withhold aid, correct? Correct. And I'd like to play a clip of some of that evidence. From what you witnessed, did anybody in the national security community support withholding the assistance? No. I never heard anyone advocate for holding the aid. And the entire interagency supported the continuation of the security assistance, isn't that right? That is correct. I and others sat in astonishment. The Ukrainians were fighting Russians and counted on not only the training and weapons, but also the assurance of U.S. support. Am I correct that the witnesses that appeared before your committee confirmed that there was no credible explanation for withholding the military aid and that it was, in fact, against our national security interest to do so? Everyone agreed it was against our national security interest to do so. The only explanation that any witness provided was Mr. Sandy, who said that he had heard from uh, Rob Blair, I believe, the uh, assistant to Mick Mulvaney, that the reason was because of other countries' uh, donations or, or uh, contributions to Ukraine. But that was only in September, and of course, there were no further commitments from any other country. And as we heard from Bill Taylor, who's a graduate of West Point and a decorated combat veteran who served in Vietnam, Ukraine then and now is in an active war with the Russians. Russia stole part of their country in Crimea and has killed more than 10,000 Ukrainians, and weakening Ukraine would only benefit Russia. Here's what Ambassador Taylor said. After our meeting with President Zelensky, Ambassador Volker and I traveled to the front line in northern Donbas to receive a briefing from the commander of the forces on the line of contact. Arriving for the briefing in the military headquarters, the commander thanked us for the security assistance. But I was aware that this assistance was on hold, which made me uncomfortable. Ambassador Volker and I could see the armed and hostile Rus Russian-led forces on the other side of the damaged bridge across the line of contact. Russian-led forces continue to kill Ukrainians in the war one or two a week. More Ukrainians would undoubtedly die without the U.S. assistance. Against the consensus of his own agencies and national security experts, the president used congressionally appropriated funds to advance his own political interests at the expense of our national security. This action is a threat to the integrity of our elections and the sanctity of our democracy. President Trump must not get away with this. No one in this country, no one, including the president of the United States, is above the law. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been a truly extraordinary and historically unprecedented hearing. It has frankly been an outrageous uh, violation of due process, a series of violations of due process, in fact. Let me review the past seven and a half hours. In the beginning of our proceedings today, I asked Chairman Nadler if Mr. Burke was appearing here as a staff member or as a witness, but the chairman gave strangely conflicting answers to that important question. When I objected under House Rule 17 that Mr. Burke was repeatedly and brazenly steamrolling over House decorum rules and using language that impugned the motives of the President of the United States and suggested he is disloyal to his country, Chairman Nadler insisted that those words could not be taken down and stricken from the record, saying, quote, the rules don't apply here because Mr. Burke is merely appearing as a staffer. But later, Chairman Nadler stated the opposite and declared that Mr. Burke was appearing to present the Democrat member's report as their representative, which would of course mean that the member rules should apply. Then Mr. Burke was allowed to switch places and turn from witness to questioner. That's extraordinarily bizarre, of course, but it's entirely consistent with this whole impeachment circus. As everybody knows, Intel Chairman Adam Schiff was allowed in the opening act of this circus to serve as the judge, jury, prosecutor, witness coach, and case strategy chief all in one. So much for due process. Under the Democrats haphazardly drawn special parameters for these special hearings, House Resolution 660, Mr. Burke was then allowed to join the elected members of Congress on this dais and ask 45 minutes of questions of his fellow witness, Mr. Castor. When he was argumentative, assumed critical facts not in evidence, engaged in speculation, and committed countless other violations of regular House rules and the federal rules of civil procedure, I objected, but was then ruled out of order by Chairman Nadler, who informed all of us that while House Resolution 660 specifically provides for objections, it lists none of them, and the Democrats have ignored every request of ours to obtain a list of what rules and objections would be enforced and applicable today. Again, so much for due process and fairness. 
A month ago, listen, a month ago, the Republican members of this committee formally requested all documents related to the impeachment investigation, but Chairman Nadler and Schiff withheld everything until, you know when? Saturday afternoon. That's right, less than 48 hours before this hearing, they dumped approximately 8,000 pages of documentation on us while we were back home in our districts. They intentionally made it literally impossible for us to review all material in any meaningful way, mere hours before this fateful hearing. What's worse is that the documents they decided to dump on us are not all of the underlying records we need to review, but rather only a partial redacted and biased subset of information that they think will advance their false narrative. And has been mentioned, as has been mentioned here, we're being allowed no minority day hearing, which is required by regular House rules. Now, I'd love to cross-examine Mr. Burke himself, but Chairman Nadler's special and still mysterious rules for this hearing won't allow it. I notice he's disappeared from the hearing room. I would love to ask him uh, under oath about his own biases. Because, you know, he hammered here over and over today the importance of fairness and objectivity and accuracy, and he insisted that everything here has to be unbiased. But if he was under oath here, he would be forced to admit that FEC records show that he has personally donated approximately $99,000 to Democrat candidates over the years, including sizable donations to Hillary Clinton for president, and also donated to past Trump opponents, including Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and Kirsten Gillibrand. Mr. Burke appeared here as a fact witness and a finder of fact, but in our system, a finder of fact is supposed to be fair and impartial. He's supposed to be an umpire. The problem with all this, and the problem that everybody at home can see with their own eyes, is that the umpires in this high-stakes game are parading around the field on the, in the majority team's jerseys. The report of evidence released by Republican committee staff on December 2nd carefully documents that in the hearings that led us to this point today, Chairman Schiff directed witnesses called by the Democrats not to answer Republican questions. He rejected witnesses identified Republicans who would have injected some semblance of fairness and objectivity. And he denied Republican subpoenas for testimony and documents, violating the Democrats' own rules to vote down those subpoenas with no notice to Republicans. Chairman Schiff also publicly fabricated evidence about President Trump's July 25th phone call, and he misled the American public about his interactions with the anonymous whistleblower to selectively seek information to paint misleading public narratives. The anonymous whistleblower reportedly acknowledged having a professional relationship with Vice President Biden, and obviously his motives, biases, and credibility are essential to this case, but we can't question it. This is not due process, this is not the rule of law, and this is not how to impeach an American president, and this is not how we're supposed to run a country. It can't be. 17 out of 24 of our colleagues over there already voted to proceed with impeachments before we started all this. They've already made up their minds. They, they, were, uh, they were prejudiced before we walked in, but the American people are not. Fairness still matters, truth matters, and the people can see clearly that this is a sham. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Goldman, would you welcome the problem of having 8,000 documents given to you from the White House? Uh, it would be a wonderful problem to have. How many have they given you? Zero. Mr. Castor, you said earlier that they got the aid. They got the aid. No harm, no foul, they got the aid. But you would agree that although Mr. Sandy said that the presidential concern was European contributions, nothing changed from when that concern was expressed to when they actually got the aid, right? You agree on that? Europe didn't kick in a bunch of new money. Oh, but they did a study. I mean, they... Oh, a study. Okay. Yeah. But they didn't kick in new money. Ambassador, you agree on that? Ambassador Taylor discussed that... They, okay. they so you talked a lot about the anti-corruption president that we have in Donald Trump, the person who had a fraud settlement relating to Trump University, the person who just recently, with his own charity, had a settlement related to fraud. Let's talk about that anti-corruption president of ours. Take a wild guess, Mr. Castor. How many times has President Trump met with Vladimir Putin or talked to him? I don't know the number. It's, it's 16. Okay. How many times has President Trump met at the White House with President Zelensky? Um, it's zero. And who is President Trump meeting with at the White House tomorrow? Do you know? Um, I'm, not, I'm not. It's Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. Okay. Now, Mr. Goldman, withholding aid from Ukraine obviously hurts Ukraine. It hurts the United States. Does it help any country? Um, the witnesses said that that would help Russia. Did you also hear testimony that these acts by the president, while being wrong and an abuse of power, also harmed U.S. national security? Yes. 
did you hear anything about how it would harm our credibility? And I would turn you to a conversation Ambassador Volker had on September 14 of this year with a senior Ukrainian official, where Ambassador Volker is impressing upon that official that President Zelensky should not investigate his own political opponents. What was thrown back in the face of Ambassador Volker? After Ambassador Volker suggested to Mr. Yermak again, who's here, that they should not investigate the prior president of Ukraine, Mr. Yermak sent back, oh, said back to him, oh, like, we sh we, you're encouraging us to investigate Bidens and Clintons. During Watergate, the famous phrase from Senator Howard Baker was asked, what did the president know and when did he know it? There's a reason that no one here has repeated those questions during these hearings. We know what the president did, and we know when he knew it. Mr. Goldman, who sent Rudy Giuliani to Ukraine to smear Joe Biden? Uh, president Trump. Who fired the anti-corruption ambassador in Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich? President Trump. Who told Ambassador Sondland and Ambassador Volker to, to work with Rudy Giuliani on Ukraine? President Trump. Who told Vice President Pence to not go to President Zelensky's inauguration? President Trump. Who ordered his own chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, to withhold critical military assistance for Ukraine? President Trump. Who refused to meet with President Zelensky in the Oval Office? President Trump. Who ignored, on July 25, his own National Security Council's anti-corruption talking points? President Trump. Who asked President Zelensky for a favor? President Trump. Who personally asked President Zelensky to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden? President Trump. Who stood on the White House lawn and confirmed that he wanted Ukraine to investigate Vice President Biden? President Trump. Who stood on that same lawn and said that China should also investigate Vice President Biden? President Trump. As to anything that we do not know in this investigation, who has blocked us from knowing it? President Trump in the White House. So as it relates to President Trump, is he an incidental player or a central player in this scheme? President Trump is the central player in this scheme. There's a reason that no one has said, what did the president know and when did he know it? From the evidence that you have presented, Mr. Goldman, and in the Intelligence Committee's findings, we know one thing and one thing is clear. As it related to this scheme, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, knew everything. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Biggs. Mr. Castor, what's direct evidence? Uh, when, when a witness personally observes a fact and testifies to it. And what's hearsay evidence? Well, I think the out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted is something that you learn in law school. Right. And then the federal rules of evidence adopted by most states, hearsay is inadmissible unless the testimony falls under a defined exception. Is that right? That's right. There's about 23, plus the residual exception. And I believe you were present uh, when every witness testified, including Mr. Solomon, right? Mm hmm. And much of, and that's a yes? Yes. And much of Dem the Democrats' report and impeachment narrative is based on the Solomon testimony. Is that a fair characterization? A lot of it is, yes. Um, how many times uh, Mr. Sondland mentioned in the Intel Committee's report? Like I said, I did a search just to control F and the name Sondland shows up 611 times. Yeah, and, and just to refresh your mind, Sondland himself told the world that, uh, that basically nobody else on the planet told him that Donald Trump was trying to tie aid to investigations. In fact, he also said everything that he'd been testifying to is simply his presumptions. Is that right? That is correct. And so when we consider what a presumption is, it's not direct, it's not circumstantial, it's not even hearsay. In fact, we typically, when we're trying a case, we consider it as speculation. Is that right? That's right. Do courts allow speculation in? No. Why not? Because it's not reliable. It's inherently unreliable. Um, so can you name any Democrat witness who asserted that he or she had direct evidence of those 17 that we've been hearing, that we heard from? We had some direct evidence on certain things. We had some direct evidence on the May 23rd meeting, um, and Sondland gave some direct evidence. Um, but a how, lot of what we've obtained has been circumstantial. How about with regard to a personal knowledge of the quid pro quo allegation? Well, we have not gotten to the bottom of that from a direct evidence standpoint. How about tying aid to investigations? That's correct, too. How about political motives in asking for investigations? Um, the facts surrounding that are ambiguous. 
In, in the non-legalistic world, when we, when we talk about speculation, we typically think, use words like gossip, rumor, innuendo. Is that right? Yep. And isn't it true that the only direct evidence that we have is that Ukraine received the aid without giving anything in return? President Zelensky had, has repeatedly stated no pressure, no problem with a, with a phone call in the relationship with Mr. Trump, and that the president had a legitimate concern about Ukraine, Ukraine corruption. He did, and the burden sharing of European allies. So much has been made about the alleged desire for an announcement of an investigation. But again, there is no direct evidence that supports the allegation that President Trump wanted at merely the announcement of an investigation. But like I said, there's eight lines in the call transcript that go to what President Trump said about the investigations. Eight lines. And everything else is hearsay, innuendo, rumor, gossip, it's right? inconclusive, certainly. Yeah. So when we get into this, this event today in the process, we start talking about the process. Um, were you surprised to see Mr. Burke get out of his chair, move to the seat and sit down next to the chairman and start asking you questions? <laughs> I don't know if I was surprised or not. Yeah, well, I tell you, I was, and it looks like Mr. Burke has been disappeared. And so that's one of the outrageous things about this process, and it's been outrageous from start to finish. We've seen prejudice and bias against the president from start to finish. We have the lion's share, almost two-thirds of the members of, of the Democrats have already voted to impeach at least once, and that's before anything with regard to this uh, July 25th telephone conversation ever took place. And we're, we're left with a constant view that as on, on November 9th, 2016, Representative Green from Texas wanted to begin impeachment proceedings at that point. Is that correct? Yes. January 20th, 2017, Washington Post, headline, let the impeachment begin. Is that correct? Yes. Ten days later, Mr. Zaid, who is the attorney for the whistleblower, tweeted out, let the impeachment begin, let the coup begin, and victory to the lawyers. Is that right? Yes, I've seen that. Yeah. We had people who on this committee came out today and said that they had meant, they, they, they went on TV and said, we wanted to start impeachment earlier, but the speaker held us back. Did you see that? I haven't seen that, no. Yeah. I you wouldn't be news reports today. Yeah, you wouldn't be surprised about that, though, would you? No. No, nobody should be surprised about that because this is a, a sham hearing, three years that they've been trying to remove this president, and this is the culmination of a predetermined outcome. That's where we are today. And so with that, we, can, we bring it back to those same points. No pressure, no conditionality, and all of the aid, meetings, calls were received by the Ukraines. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Adler. Let's just cut through all the Republican arguments today and make things very simple. No one else in America could do what Donald Trump did and get away with it. No American elected official can call up a foreign government official and ask for an investigation of a political opponent. No one sitting on this Judiciary Committee can call up a foreign government official and ask for help in a re-election campaign. If we did that and got caught, we would likely be indicted. Now let's focus on the president's abuse of power in this case, because it's actually worse than examples I just gave. And I know that I first swore an oath to the Constitution when I joined the United States Air Force on active duty. And the three core values I learned were integrity first, service before self, excellence, and all we do. I'd like to focus on the first two, integrity first and service before self, because it's ingrained in all military members that we cannot mix official duties with personal private gain. So Mr. Goldman, in this case, the $391 million at issue, that wasn't Donald Trump's money. That was U.S. taxpayer funds. Is that right? Yes. And certainly the president should not use our taxpayer money for his own personal benefit, and especially not to leverage it for his own re-election campaign. Isn't that right? That's correct. The president's abuse of power is even worse in this case than just using official duties for private gain. It's also just flat out illegal. You cannot solicit foreign assistance for a re-election campaign. That is a violation of Federal Election Campaign Act. Multiple people have gone to prison for violating various sections of that act. A reasonable person could also conclude that the president violated the Empowerment Control Act of 1974, which Congress passed as a response to President Nixon's abuse of power. 
So I'd like to explore that a little further with you, Mr. Goldman. In this case, Congress, with bipartisan support, had appropriated taxpayer funds for the specific purpose of aiding Ukraine in its war against Russia. Is that right? Yes. And not only had that uh, money been appropriated, the money had actually been released to the Department of Defense. Is that right? They were about to uh, release it, yes. Okay. And then, suddenly, without explanation, the President demanded that those taxpayer funds be withheld from an ally who desperately needed the aid. Mr. Right. Goldman, uh, did the President notify Congress about his decision to withhold the aid? No, he did not. Okay. So the Empowerment Control Act was designed to prevent the President from secretly taking congressionally appropriated funds and doing whatever he wants with them. So is it true that in your intelligence report, you found the following in your findings of fact? President Trump ordered the suspension of $391 million in vital military assistance urgently needed by Ukraine, and the President did so despite his obligations under the Impoundment Control Act. Did you find that? Yes. All right. So not only did the President abuse his powers for personal gain, and not only was it illegal, his actions also harmed U.S. national security. So it's a fundamental tenet of U.S. national security to push back against Russian aggression. Ukraine's at the tip of the spear, pushing back against Russian aggression. Is it true, Mr. Goldman, that harming the Ukrainian military also harms U.S. national security? That's what pretty much every witness said. Last week, Professor Carlin confirmed that it is an impeachable offense to sacrifice the national interest for his own private ends. A slide shows uh, what she said. Uh, Mr. Goldman, uh, based on the evidence that you found in your report, is it fair to conclude that the President's actions both leverage taxpayer funds for his own private gain and sacrifice the national interests for his own private ends? That is what we found. I was also personally struck by Mr. Holmes' testimony, because it makes it clear that the President did not care about our foreign policy or U.S. national security. He only cared about investigating his political opponent. Here's what Mr. Holmes said. Ambassador Sondland stated that the President only cares about big stuff. I noted there was big stuff going on in, in Ukraine, like a war with Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the President, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. Look, here's the thing. If any military member used official acts for personal gain, that member would no longer be part of the military. And in fact, last year, a Navy commander was convicted for taking things of value in exchange for official acts. The U.S. attorney who prosecuted the case said that the commander, quote, put his own selfish interests ahead of the Navy and of our nation, unquote. We should not hold the commander in chief to a lower standard than regular military members. We should not hold the president to a different standard than any other elected official. No one is above the law. I yield back. The gentleman yields. The gentleman yields back, Mr. McClintock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in every election, one side wins and the other loses. Democracy only works because the losing side always respects the will of the voters. The moment that social compact breaks down, democracy collapses into chaos. Now, that's only happened twice in our nation's history. It happened in 1860, when the Democrats refused to accept the legitimate election of Abraham Lincoln. And it happened again in 2016, when the Democrats refused to accept the legitimate election of Donald Trump. The issues before us today do indeed strike at the heart of our democracy. The first calls for impeachment began just days after the 2016 election, and ever since, the Democrats have been searching for a pretext. When the Mueller investigation found no evidence to support the monstrous lie that the President acted in collusion with Russia, the Democrats realized they were running out of time, and suddenly the Ukrainian phone call replaced collusion, Stormy Daniels, tax returns, emoluments, and even tweets as the reason to nullify the election just a year before the next one is to be held. Impeachment is one of the most serious powers with which Congress is entrusted. It requires an overwhelming case of high crime supported by clear evidence that a vast majority of the nation deems compelling. Our Constitution vests the executive authority, including the enforcement of our laws, with the President, and it gives him sole authority to conduct our foreign affairs. Clearly, this includes requesting a foreign government to cooperate in resolving potentially corrupt and illegal interactions between that government's officials and ours. 
Now, the sum total of the Democrats' case comes down to this. Not one of their hand-picked witnesses provided any first-hand knowledge of the President ordering a quid pro quo. And two witnesses, Sonderland by testimony and Senator Johnson by letter, provided first-hand testimony that the President specifically ordered no quid pro quo. No testimony was provided that the Ukrainian government believed that there was any quid pro quo, but there are ample public statements that its officials did not believe there was such a linkage. In fact, the testimony of their witnesses crumbled under questioning, and we were left with career bureaucrats who admitted that the only evidence they offered was presumption, speculation, and what they'd read in the New York Times. It's upon this flimsy evidence that the Democrats justify nullifying the 2016 presidential election. And it's so flimsy, the Democrats have had to turn our Bill of Rights on its head in order to make it. They've argued that hearsay evidence, better known as gossip, is better than direct testimony. They've argued that the burden of proof rests with the accused to prove his innocence, while at the same time denying the defense witnesses permission to testify. They've argued that the right to confront your accuser is an invasion of the accuser's privacy. They've argued that appealing to the courts to defend your constitutional rights, as the President has done, is ipso facto obstruction of justice and evidence of guilt. They've asserted the power to determine what witnesses the defense is allowed to call. And they've argued that a crime is not necessary to impeach, only impure motives in performing otherwise lawful acts, motives, of course, to be divined entirely by the accusers. These are the legal doctrines of despots, but they're the only ones that can accommodate the case before us today. This is a stunning abuse of power and a shameless travesty of justice that will stain the reputations of those responsible for generations to come. And God help our country if they should ever be given the power to replace our Bill of Rights with the doctrines that they have imposed in this process. The Democrats are fond of saying no one's, except, or no one's above the law, but they have one unspoken caveat, except for themselves. Now, the Speaker's already short-circuited what should be a solemn, painstaking, thorough, and above all, fair process by ordering her foot soldiers on this committee to draw up articles of impeachment without this committee hearing from a single fact witness. Despite the fact that Mr. Schiff doesn't dare to appear before this committee to defend his work, we're supposed to accept his report at face value and obediently follow the Speaker's orders. As the Red Queen declared, sentence first, verdict afterwards. We can only pray the Senate still adheres to the judicial principles of our founders. And if they do, perhaps then we can begin repairing the damage that this travesty has done to our democracy, our institutions, our principles of justice, our Constitution, and our country. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Raskin. Thank you. Why is impeachment in the Constitution? Well, the framers feared a president might corrupt our elections by dragging foreign powers into our politics in order to promote the personal political ambitions of the president above the rule of law and above the national security. The framers set against a potential tyrant's boundless thirst for power, the people's representatives here in Congress, and the people's own democratic ambitions, our self-respect, our love of freedom and the rule of law, our fierce constitutional patriotism. Now, it looked like President Trump might get, a, get, might get away with his Ukraine shakedown. After all, most Americans didn't know anything about it, and the few who learned of it would be too afraid, too intimidated to cross the most powerful man on earth. President Trump could rest easy. But if Donald Trump misjudged the American character, the framers of our Constitution did not. I count 17 honorable public servants who came forward to testify over the intimidation and disparagement of the President. Is that right, Mr. Goldman? Yes, there were 17. And I count a dozen career State Department and national security officials 
who served Republican and Democratic presidents alike over decades who came to testify. In fact, four of President Trump's own National Security Council staffers, Hill, Vindman, Morrison, and McGuire, came forward to report Trump's scheme to NSC lawyers as soon as they learned of it, didn't they, Mr. Goldman? Uh, Morrison and Vindman went to the lawyers as soon as they learned of it, yes. They went to the lawyers, and that moved me a lot because my father, was a staffer on the National Security Council under President Kennedy. And he said the most important thing you can bring to work with you every day is your conscience. And he devoted his career to the idea that people must speak truth to power when power becomes a clear and present danger to democracy and to the people. So I want to talk about two of the many honorable government witnesses who went under oath and stood up for the truth. Mr. Goldman, who is Dr. Fiona Hill? Uh, Dr. Fiona Hill was the senior director uh, for the Europe and Russia directorate at the National Security Council until July of this year. And she was President Trump's senior advisor on Russia? Correct. Uh, her family had fled both Nazi Germany and Soviet uh, Russia? I think her family actually came from England. It was uh, Marie Ivanovich who had... Uh, oh, that was Ambassador Ivanovich. Yes. Um, Dr. Hill voiced her concerns to the NSC's lawyers on July 10 and July 11th, long before anyone on this committee knew about it. Why was she, um, why did she go to report um, what she had learned? What motivated her? She was concerned that Ambassador Sondland and Mick Mulvaney were um, entering into essentially a transaction whereby the Ukrainians would uh, open up these investigations for President Trump's political interests in return for getting the White House meeting that President Trump had offered. And I want to talk about Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent, who served as a career Foreign Service officer for more than 27 years under five different presidents, Democrats and Republicans alike. And he wrote or updated notes to file on four different occasions to record his grave contemporaneous concerns about the president's conduct. Mr. Goldman, what were the events that led Mr. Kent to draft, draft these notes to his file? Um, there were several. There was a conversation at the end of June where uh, several American officials had uh, indicated to President Zelensky that he needed to go forward with these investigations. There was one on August 16th, I recall, that he talked about. But you bring up a very important point, which is, all of these State Department witnesses in particular, and frankly, almost all of the witnesses other than Ambassador Sondland, took unbelievable meticulous notes. I would have dreamed for a witness like that as a prosecutor. And it makes for a very clear and compelling record and clear and compelling evidence that's based on contemporaneous notes. So do we have Mr. Kent's notes in this process? We have no State Department records, including these memos to file, the notes, Ambassador Taylor's first person cable, and emails. There's so many documents that the few that we have gotten have been so helpful to the investigation. Well, why do we not have them? The State Department refused to provide them, uh, notwithstanding our subpoena, under the president's direction. You know, in authoritarian societies like Putin's Russia or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, people are terrified to speak out about the crimes of their political leaders. But in the United States, a lot of people are not afraid, even though President Trump has tried to intimidate or silence them. And he is trying to make our country more like Russia, and we can be thankful that you found a lot of heroes who stood up for the truth in our Constitution. I yield back. Gentlemen, gentlemen yields back. Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first two questions are for the American people. America, are you sick and tired yet of this impeachment sham? And America, would you like Congress to get back to work and actually get something done? Because I sure would. Mr. Castor, the rest of the questions are for you, and I would like yes or no answers if possible. Mr. Castor, my first question is important. Did any of the Democrats' fact witnesses establish that the president had committed bribery, extortion, or a high crime or misdemeanor? Good heavens, no. <laughs> Mr. Castor, the deputy assistant to the president of the national security, Mr. Morrison, listened in on the phone call. He testified that he was not concerned that anything discussed on the phone call was illegal or improper. Is that correct? Yeah, he was worried about leaks. 
Several Democrat witnesses testified that it is fairly common for foreign aid to be paused for various reasons, including concerns that the country is corrupt and taxpayer dollars may be misspent. Ambassador Volker testified that this hold on security assistance to Ukraine was not significant. Is that correct? Yes, a number of witnesses can also said the same thing. For, former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, testified that in Ukraine, and I quote, corruption is not just prevalent, but frankly is the system. Is that correct? Yes, all the witnesses confirmed the environment is uh, very corrupt. Mr. Castor, Ukraine energy company Burisma Holdings had a reputation in Ukraine as a corrupt company. Is that correct? Big time. According to New York Times, Hunter Biden was part of a broad effort by Burisma to bring in well-connected Democrats during a period when the company was facing investigations. Is that correct? Yeah, the New Yorker also had a pretty extensive report on that as well. Obama's Deputy Assistant, Se Obama's Deputy Assistant Secretary of State George Kent testified that he raised concerns directly to Vice President Biden's office about Hunter Biden's services on Burisma's board. Is that correct, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Castor, in the July 25th call, President Trump referenced Joe Biden bragging about how he stopped the prosecution. We all saw that video earlier today where J Joe Biden bragged about how he told Ukraine, if the prosecutor is not fired, you're not getting the money. Mr. Castor, is this the same prosecutor that looked into Burisma? It is. In a similar scheme, Obama Assistant Attorney General said, and I quote, awarding prestigious employment opportunities to unqualified individuals in order to influence government officials is corruption plain and simple. Mr. Castor, here is another key question. Given that, one, Burisma had a reputation of being a corrupt company, two, Obama's own State Department was concerned about Hunter Biden serving on Burisma's board at the same time that Vice President Biden was acting as the point person to Ukraine, and three, Obama's assistant attorney general said in a similar scheme what, that, that corruption, that there was corruption, plain and simple. Do you think then it is understandable, reasonable, and acceptable for President Trump to ask the Ukrainian president to look into the Hunter Biden Burisma potential corruption scheme? Yes, sir. Mr. Castor, there are four undisputable facts that will never change that prove there is no impeachable offense. There was no quid pro quo on the July 25th call. Ukraine leadership did not know the aid was held up at the time of the July 25th telephone call. Ukraine received the White House meeting, phone call, and aid, even though four, Ukraine didn't initiate any investigations. Do you agree? Uh, Ukraine received a meeting with Vice President Pence in Warsaw and a meeting not at the White House but at the, uh, in New York at the United Nations. Mr. Castor, did Mr. Turley testify in the past hearing that this impeachment inquiry has not passed Chairman Nadler's three-pronged test? He did. Thank you. Now I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Washington is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Goldman, let's focus on the Republican claim that President Trump withheld military aid to Ukraine because he was supposedly concerned about corruption rather than the fact that he abused his office for personal gain. And let me be clear, we actually do not have to read the president's mind on this. As your report notes on page 10, and as we will see on television, he told us himself exactly what his intent was. What is that? Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. So the first and best witness about the president's corrupt intent was Donald Trump. 
There is also plenty of corroborating evidence, so let's just review some of the basic facts that we've already established. First, President Trump does not even mention the word corruption during either of his calls with President Zelensky, and he disregards all of the talking points that were prepared for him on corruption by the National Security Council. Second, investigations of the Bidens and a debunked conspiracy theory about the 2016 election were not supported by official U.S. policy. And third, Congress authorized military aid to Ukraine. Ukraine passed all the checks that the United States established to ensure that it was taking appropriate actions to fight corruption. And there was unanimous consensus among the State Department, Department of Defense, and National Security Council that the president should release the military aid that Ukraine critically needed to fight Russian aggression. So, Mr. Goldman, between the time that President Trump put a hold on military aid to Ukraine and then released the aid, the president never conducted an actual review or corruption assessment on Ukraine, did he? That is correct. There was no witness testified that there was any review or any um, investigation of any sort related to the Ukraine aid. And isn't it also true that the Defense Department actually determined not to conduct a review on Ukraine after the president froze the military aid because Ukraine had already met all of the corruption benchmarks in May of 2019? Yes, and everyone involved in Ukraine policy uh, believed that they were on the right path, and President Zelensky in particular. And in addition to Ukraine having satisfied all the relevant corruption assessments prior to U.S. military aid being withheld, there is significant witness testimony that both the State Department and the Ukrainian embassy actually advised that a White House meeting with President Zelensky would help further an anti-corruption agenda, correct? Both the anti-corruption agenda and the uh, aggression, fighting the aggression uh, from Russia. And in fact, President Trump's budget actually cut funding for fighting corruption in Ukraine. Now, Mr. Castor argues that President Trump withheld military aid to Ukraine because he was skeptical of foreign assistance in general. But in both 2017 and 2018, didn't President Trump release military aid for Ukraine without any complaints about corruption? That's correct. So, Mr. Goldman, the president was perfectly fine giving military aid to Ukraine in 2017 and 2018, but somehow not in 2019. So what changed? Joe Biden started running for president. Pres Vice President Biden started running. So the sequence— And I would add the Mueller report came out, which did not—even um, though it did not charge the president, it indicated—it implicated the president and his campaign in welcoming the assistance from Russia and utilizing it. And the sequence of events and all the corroborating evidence makes it crystal clear that President Trump didn't care about corruption at all. In fact, as he told us himself on national television, he simply cared about his own politically motivated investigations into his political rival. And you saw the clip where Ambassador Sondland picked up the phone, called, the, called President Trump, and then Mr. Holmes asked him what the president thought about Ukraine, and quickly, what was Mr. Sondland's answer? Mr. Sondland said the president does not give a bleep about Ukraine. He only cares about the big stuff, meaning the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. And by so, the way, just to add, that is a direct evidence conversation between President Trump and Ambassador Sondland on that day. And there are many that we have not talked about on the minority So we know what President Trump was interested in based on his words, his actions, and witness testimony. The President of the United States wanted Ukraine to announce an investigation into a political rival for his own personal political benefit to interfere in our election. And he was willing to use U.S. military aid which is taxpayer dollars and an essential White House meeting as his leverage. That is unacceptable and a grave abuse of power. I yield back. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. You know, in the Navy, we had a saying, bluff, which is bottom line up front. Let me give everybody the bottom line. We're here because Democrats are terrified that President Trump is going to win re-election. That's really what this all comes down to. Let me get into the specifics. We are here dealing with impeachment because Democrats don't want to talk about the red-hot Trump economy. They don't want to talk about the fact that we have the lowest unemployment rates in 50 years. We are dealing with impeachment because Democrats 
don't want to talk about how the president has worked to protect American companies from Chinese aggression, how he's renegotiated trade deals to benefit American workers, how he's eliminated, eliminated burdensome regulations that hurt the economy and that help job creators. Congressional Democrats don't want to be reminded that the American people, that, their that the Democrat agenda includes such laughable ideas like banning airplanes, giving illegal immigrants taxpayer-funded health care, and taking private health insurance away from the American people. That's really, really why we're here. This whole process is just a distraction. It's an, an attempt to hide the far-left radical agenda. So let's talk about the facts. Schiff's report claims the administration froze military aid for Ukraine without explanation. Yet the facts are that President Trump gave more military aid to Ukraine than President Obama. President Ob Obama gave Ukraine well wishes and blankets. President Trump gave the Ukrainians javelin missiles. That's the difference, and those are the facts. Let's go over some more facts. House Democrats want to claim it's a conspiracy that Ukrainian officials attempted to interfere with the 2016 election. Yet Ukrainian attempts to interfere with the 2016 election are well documented by Politico, by Financial Times, and The Hill. There was an attempt to influence our elections. And that's troubling, and that's why President Trump brought it to the attention of President Zelensky. Again, those are the facts. But at the end of the day, those facts don't seem to matter to my Democrat colleagues. House Democrats don't care that President Zelensky has repeatedly said there was no pressure. It's not important that the call transcript was the best evidence we have. It is the best evidence we have. It's the actual primary document. And that transcript shows there was no quid pro quo, no bribery. I got to remember we're calling it bribery after an old Latin phrase didn't pull well or test well in a Democrat focus group. My Democrat colleagues seem to really care about focus groups and polling. Unfortunately, again, they don't care about the facts. Because the fact is the Democrats were calling for impeachment before this investigation even began. Representative Tlaib said in January, I don't even think we were sworn in yet. She said in January, impeach the mother. Representative Green said in May, and I quote, I'm concerned that if we don't impeach this president, he will get reelected. These proceedings, this entire process, is nothing more than a political hit job. Well, unlike my Democrat colleagues, I actually do care about the facts, which is why I'm troubled that our committee did not hear from a single fact witness this entire time. We should be here hearing, we should be here hearing from Hunter Biden. We should be hearing from Schiff's staff. We know that Schiff's staff coordinated with a whistleblower. And again, we need to hear from the whistleblower. Last week, I offered a motion to subpoena the whistleblower to testify in executive session, meaning that he or she could testify behind closed doors. My Democrat colleagues voted my motion down in a partisan fashion. Mr. Castor, can you walk us through the inaccuracies in the whistleblower's complaint? Well, the first thing about the complaint that troubles us is that it's clearly from an outsider who received information secondhand. The, the information presented in the complaint is clearly distorted. Um, and it, it's from a person who is, it seems to be making an, an, a case, like an advocate, about what happened on the call. Um, the, the whistleblower references a number of individuals inside the White House and at the State Department that he or she has spoken to to form the basis of the complaint. We have not been able to piece together all those people, and talking to all those people is important. Um, and there's a lot of, I'm running out of time here, but there's, you know, there's a reference to Lutsenko in the whistleblower complaint where witnesses have told us it's likely Shokin. Uh, Vindman and Morrison's testimony about why they went to talk to the lawyers, very different reasons. Um, Mr. Breck Buell. The uh, gentleman's time is expired. I don't believe he was on the call. But... I recognize the gentlewoman from Florida for five minutes. 
Mr. Goldman, as a member of the Intelligence Committee, I saw significant firsthand evidence that President Trump conditioned our military aid on Ukraine announcing investigations into the 2016 election and the Bidens and betrayed our national security interests in the process. For example, Ambassador Sondland told us that once the Ukrainians found out about the aid being withheld, it was made, and I quote, abundantly clear to them that if they wanted the aid, and I quote, they were going to have to make these statements. Mr. Goldman, beginning on and around the 25th of July call through September, would you agree that, consistent with the testimony we just reviewed, Ukraine was made aware that to receive our military aid and the White House visit, that they were going to have to make a statement announcing the investigations? Not only were they made aware, but they were made aware either by President Trump's proxy, Rudy Giuliani, or from President Trump himself through Ambassador Sondland, who spoke to President Zelensky and Andrei Yermak on September 7th and told them what President Trump had confirmed to him, that the aid was conditioned on the investigations. And by the end of August, President Zelensky did in fact commit to making that statement on CNN. Is that correct? That's right. Finally, President Zelensky relented after months of trying to not get involved in what he called the domestic uh, U.S. political process, and ultimately recognizing that uh, he had no choice to break the stalemate, as Ambassador Sondland told them, that he ultimately agreed to go on television before the uh, before President Trump got caught and released the aid. I'd like to direct your attention to the screen in front of you, which displays, again, a Washington Post article from September 5th. The headline says, Trump tries to force Ukraine to meddle in the 2020 elections, and the article reports that President Trump is, and I quote, attempting to force Zelensky to intervene in the 2020 U.S. presidential election by launching an investigation of the leading Democratic candidate, Joe Biden. Mr. Trump is not just soliciting Ukraine's help with his presidential campaign. He is using United States military aid the country desperately needs in an attempt to extort it. So am I correct, Mr. Goldman, that by September 25th, allegations that President Trump was using military aid to pressure Ukraine to announce investigation was being widely reported? I'm sorry, by what date? September 5th. Uh, yes. Well, widely reported. There's certainly the aid being withheld was, was widely reported. And by September 9th, our investigative committees formally announced a congressional investigation into the president of these issues, into the president about these issues. And Mr. Goldman, what day did President Trump release the military aid? Two days after the investigations were announced and two days after the IG, the Inspector General, told the Intelligence Committee that there was a complaint that was being withheld. So then am I correct that as the timeline on the screen in front of you shows, it wasn't until after the whistleblower complaint, after the Washington Post report, and after Congress launched the investigations that President Trump finally released the aid? That's right. And, and I would just add one thing briefly to the Congressman's point, that it is true that President Trump has given more military assistance than President Obama. And so one would wonder, if he does support military assistance so much, why then is he holding it up for more than two months? And matter of fact, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testified that people at the NSC, in fact, discussed that Congress's investigation, quote, might have the effect of releasing the hold on Ukraine's military aid because it would be potentially politically challenging to justify the aid. Is that correct, Mr. Goldman? That was the testimony, yes. In other words, the aid was released after the president got caught. And what makes me angry is that this president, President Trump, thinks he can get away with it. But he got caught, and he tried to cover it up. But we won't let him do that. And we thank God, Mr. Goldman, for the true, courageous public servants who came forward in spite of intimidation and obstruction from the White House. You see, everybody counts. But everybody is accountable, up to and including the president 
of the United States. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair. Okay. The chair recognizes um, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Correa. I'm sorry, California. A lot of people are moving from California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Goldman, my colleagues keep talking about the fact that the president apparently said, and I quote, no quid pro quo on September 7th in a call with Ambassador Sunland. Mr. Goldman, did you receive testimony about this September 7th call? Yes, we received testimony from three witnesses about it, and um, it gets a little complicated, but um, that, that, that was a consistent refrain through all of the witnesses, is that the president did say no quid pro quo. Well, let's try to clarify it a little bit. Uh, Ambassador Sunland described that call to Mr. Morrison that same day, correct? That's right. And Mr. Morrison then reported it to Ambassador Taylor, correct? That's correct, yes. And both Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor took notes of those discussions. They did. Were those notes produced to the committee? They were not produced to us, but the witnesses said that they relied on their notes to provide their testimony. They, that set of notes was blocked consistent with the president's direction? Correct. And in his recitation to Mr. Morrison, Ambassador Sunland said that President Trump himself brought up the words quid pro quo. Uh, that's right. Ambassador Sondland also said that too, yes. And Mr. Goldman, what did the committee make of this fact? Well, it was uh, quite odd that the president would volunteer in response to nothing about a quid pro quo that there was no quid pro quo. Let's but I think, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what's, what's even more important is that what he said immediately after that, which is effectively conduct that amounts to a quid pro quo. He said, there's no quid pro quo, but you have to go to the microphone and make this announcement. Well, let's talk about that. What did the committee make of the fact that according to Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison, right after President Trump said no quid pro quo, President Trump then told Ambassador Sunland that Ukrainian President Zelensky would have to go to the microphone and announce the investigations of Biden and the 2016 election interference and that President Zelensky should want to do that himself. That's right. We had a number of different accounts of this, and I, I think this is— They're up on the uh, boards here. Right. I see that. Yes. He, Ambassador Taylor said that. Ambassador uh, Mr. Morrison said something similar. Their understandings of that conversation is that there was a clear directive that there was a quid pro quo, factually, from the conduct, from the actions. And we've talked a lot today about the words and that Zelensky said no pressure and Trump said no pressure and no quid pro quo. But as an investigator, as a prosecutor, you need to look at the actions to understand what those words mean. And that's why this call in particular is so important. So let's go further. Uh, as we've discussed, multiple individuals reacted with concern to President Trump's call with Ambassador Sunland. Do you recall Mr. Morrison's reaction? Uh, Mr. M Mr. Morrison said that he was shocked, I think, and that he— Sinking feeling? Sinking feeling, correct, and that he went and then talked to the lawyers at the direction of Ambassador Bolton. Correct. Um, and Mr. Goldman, Ambassador Taylor also testified that he concluded that the military aid was conditioned on Zelensky announcing the investigations, and he testified that this was illogical, crazy, and wrong. Is that right? That was what Ambassador Taylor testified to, yes. Now, my colleagues have also pointed out that on September 9th, text message from Sunland reflecting that President has been crystal clear that there is no quid pro quo. <clears throat> Mr. Goldman, am I correct that Ambassador Sunland has now testified that prior to sending his text, he himself came to believe that the aid was conditioned on the announcement of investigations? Yes, Ambassador Sondland's subsequent public testimony revealed at least two things that were uh, precisely false, that were not true in that text message, including that there was no quid pro quo of any kind when he testified, and we saw the video earlier, that there absolutely assuredly was as it related to the White House meeting. And this September 7th call and the September 9th text occurred after the press reports that is, after the press reports that President Trump was conditioning military aid 
on investigations of his political rival. Is yes. that correct? Yes, and it also, this text occurred after Ambassador Sondland relayed President Trump's message to President Zelensky. Mr. Goldman, did the investigative committee receive any other evidence relevant to the credibility of the president's assertion that there was no quid pro quo? We received a, a lot of evidence, and all of the evidence points to the fact that there was a quid pro quo. Thank you. I yield. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. Or Madam can Chairman. You, can you please hold it until Madam after Chairman. I do my questions? Thank you. I just, it's just, it'll be very brief. It's just unanimous consent. You recognize yourself. I recognize myself for five minutes. <laughs> Mr. Goldman, uh, you talked about actions speaking louder than words. So I want to focus on why it was an abuse of power for President Trump to use the American government to pressure the Ukraine president to benefit his re-election campaign. Let's look at what the president said in his July 25th call to the president of Ukraine. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman listened to the president's call and testified that when President Trump asked Ukraine for a favor, it wasn't a friendly request, it was really a demand. I'm going to direct your attention to this slide about Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's testimony. Why did he say the president's favor was a demand? He said because the power disparity between the United States as the greatest power in the, in the world and Ukraine, which is so dependent on the United States, not just for the military assistance, but for all of its support, made such a request effectively a demand because President Zelensky could not, re in reality, say no. Am I correct that this vast power disparity exists in part because Ukraine has been at war with Russia since Russia invaded five years ago, and over 13,000 of the Ukraine people have died. Is that correct? Yes, and, and not only does the U.S. provide 10 percent of their military budget, but the United States is a critical um, ally in rallying other countries to support Ukraine. Europe actually gives four or five, the European Union gives, I think, four times as much money as the United States overall to Ukraine. So President Trump knew that the Ukrainian president's back was against the wall and President Zelensky needed U.S. validation and support. Is that right? Yes. Now, according to the U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine, and I've, we have Ambassador Taylor's testimony up there, it wasn't until after Ambassador Sondland told the Ukrainians that there would be a, quote, stalemate, end quote, on the aid that Zelensky agreed to announce the investigations that President Trump was demanding, correct? Um, that's right, yes. Okay. And furthermore, the committee heard testimony that the Ukrainians felt they had, quote, no choice but to, but to comply with President Trump's demands, correct? That's right, yes, even after the aid was released. Okay. In fact, when asked in front of President Trump in September whether he felt pressured, President Zelensky said, quote, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be involved to democratic open elections, elections of the USA, end quote. Is that right? That, that sounds right if you're reading the quote, yes. Okay. Now, the president and some of his defenders here have tried to excuse his misconduct by pointing to statements from the Ukraine president that he was not under pressure to give in to President Trump's demand. Did your investigative committees consider those statements by President Zelensky? We did, and we found that the statements of what is effectively a, an extortion victim are not particularly relevant to the actual truth of the matter, because President Zelensky cannot, in reality, for the same reasons that he's, he interpreted the request to be a demand, he can't go out and say that he did feel pressure because that would potentially upset President Trump, and they're so dependent on the relationship with President Trump and the United States. What one could almost say it's similar to a hostage testifying under duress. It is certainly a, a duress would be a good word. So when the president made these statements, and up to and including today, his country was still under attack by Russia, still hadn't gotten a meeting at the White House, and still needed aid from the United States, correct? That's right, and, and David Holmes testified very, I think, persuasively about the importance of the White House meeting and of the relationship to Ukraine even after the aid was lifted, including pointing to today when President Putin and President Zelensky met uh, to discuss the war in the, in the East. 
So the evidence is clear that President Trump knew he had the power to uh, force Ukraine's hand and took advantage of that desperation and abused the powers of his office by using our taxpayer dollars, basically, to get what he wanted, right? Yes, and what's really important here, and I think it has to be clarified, is that the president, the evidence showed that the president directly said to Ambassador Sondland that there was a quid pro quo with the security assistance. And there's been some debate and some discussion about that, but that is one thing that the evidence shows based on the Morrison testimony, the Taylor testimony, the Sondland testimony, and the texts. So that's very important to understand that whatever we want to say about hearsay or whatever, that is direct evidence. And that is precisely the kind of betrayal that our founders sought to prevent. I yield back to myself, and I'll recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Ma Klein. Madam Chair, uh, uh, you, you indicated to me that you would allow me to make my uniform consent after you had asked your question. So I'd ask for uniform consent, or you should be unanimous consent to introduce two the letters. The gentleman one. will suspend. Okay. The gentleman uh, uh, who, who is seeking unanimous consent? For what, are you consider for what are you seeking unanimous consent? Mr. Chairman, I have two letters addressed to you, one December 4, 2019, and one December 5, 2019. Without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Uh, Klein. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a, a brief parliamentary inquiry regarding scheduling. The gentleman uh, from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week, I expressed concern regarding the deeply flawed and partisan process the Democrat majority has been undertaking during this impeachment inquiry. Mr. Chairman, I'm particularly reminded of your quote. There must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment substantially supported by one of our major political parties and largely opposed by the other. Such an impeachment would lack legitimacy, would produce divisiveness and bitterness in our politics for years to come, and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. You made that statement back in 1998. Now, I'm glad we're moving on to presenting the quote-unquote evidence gathered in this report not to hear from direct fact witnesses, but a 300-page report that's built largely on hearsay, opinion, and speculation. And I'm especially outraged that the purported author of it, Chairman Schiff, is not here to answer our questions today. Now that we have the report and can discuss the facts within, or the lack thereof, there are four facts that will never change. Both President Trump and President Zelensky say there was no pressure. Second, the call transcript shows no conditionality between aid and an investigation. Three, Ukrainians were not aware that aid was withheld when the president spoke. And fourth, Ukraine didn't open an investigation but still received the aid and a meeting with President Trump. I want to move on to uh, the idea of hearsay and the fact that this report contains so much of it and relies on so much of it. Mr. Kasser, did the Democrats' uh, Im impeachment report rely on hearsay to support their assertions? Uh, yes, it did. How many times were you able to find assertions based on hearsay? Um, we, we went through and, and counted over 50 instances of, of key facts. Can you give us some of the examples of the hearsay being relied on by well, the majority to make their case? You know, one of the a lot of the information, for example, that Ambassador Taylor was communicating, um, you know, he, he very diligently recorded notes about what some of the, the various officials told him, but it was about, you know, it was one and two steps uh, removed from the actual fact. And that's, that's the problem with hearsay, is that it's a whisper down the lane situation. And if some of the people that are doing the whispering have a, um, are predisposed to not like President Trump, then, then what, what they're whispering down the lane becomes even more distorted. Did you also find instances where the Democrats' report used witnesses, speculations, and presumptions? Yeah, and the biggest one, of course, and this has sort of become the, the big daddy of the hearing, is, is, is Sondland presuming that, that the aid was tied to, to the investigations, because as he, he engaged in a back and forth with Mr. Turner, nobody on the planet Nobody on the planet told him that that was the case. Mr. Castro, I want to move on to uh, foreign policy and the idea that somehow the president was abusing foreign policy. Repeatedly, wit witnesses came before the Intelligence Committee and talked about how the president was operating outside the bounds of the process for using norms. 
The president sets foreign policy, correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> and from where does he derive that power? The Constitution. Article 2, Section 2, in fact. The people, yeah. Can you give us examples of these members of the foreign policy establishment who took issue with the president's foreign policy direction and choices? Well, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman testified that when he was listening to the call, he had prepared talking points and the call package, and he, he was visibly just completely deflated when he realized that his call notes weren't being referenced by the president. And a lot of the interagency officials, um, I, I think, became very sad that the president didn't revere uh, their policymaking. Uh, apparatus. Is it safe to say there's another reason the president's skeptical of relying on some of these individuals to carry out his foreign policy goals, like rooting out corruption in Ukraine? I think I think the president is is skeptical of of the interagency bureaucracy. Is that maybe why he instead relied on Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volker, Ambassador yeah. Sondland, and, and others? Yeah, correct. And by the way, all three of those officials are not that far outside of the chain of uh, the, the U.S. government. Would it be appropriate in any investigation of corruption in Ukraine to exempt or remove, say, a political supporter? Certainly would be. Would it be inappropriate to remove a political opponent? That's correct, yeah. Would it be inappropriate to remove the son of a political opponent from any investigation involving Ukrainian corruption? Absolutely. I mean, this all goes to the heart of bias. Thank you for those answers. Mr. Chairman, I, I go back to what you said this morning about the facts being undisputed. I would argue that the facts, in fact, are disputed. And what you contend are facts are, in fact, not. They are witness presumptions, hearsay, and speculation. And the facts here are, in fact, that this is the shortest impeachment in U.S. history, based on the thinnest of evidentiary records and on the narrowest grounds. Mr. Chairman, this impeachment process is a farce and a stain on the committee and on the House of Representatives, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we just heard, the President and his supporters have claimed that the investigating committees are relying on hearsay and that, that they have failed to obtain firsthand accounts of the President's conduct. Now, I'm a former judge, and you, Mr. Goldman, a former prosecutor. We know what direct evidence is. Mr. Goldman, my Republican colleagues have suggested there is no direct evidence. Is that true? No, there's, there's a lot of direct evidence, and a lot of the evidence that they say is hearsay is actually not hearsay. Indeed, it is not true. Now, I don't want to relive a law school evidence class. Instead, I'd like to go over some examples with you, and please tell me if they are direct or indirect evidence. Ambassador Sondland and Mr. Yoke Volker both testified that on May 23rd, 2019, President Trump told him to, quote, talk to Rudy about Ukraine. Is that direct evidence? Yes, technically. Well, not technically, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then we have the memorandum of the 20, July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky. Is that direct evidence? Yes, that is. So there is direct evidence that President Trump asked President Zelensky to look into these investigations and directed both President Zelensky and U.S. officials to talk to his per personal attorney about those investigations, correct? Yes, and, and if I could just jump in here on the 20, July 25th call, because these four facts that we keep hearing about that are not in dispute are, three of them are completely wrong. So one of them happens to be that there's no quid pro quo mentioned in the July 25th call. There is absolutely a quid pro quo when President Zelensky says, I also wanted to thank you for your invitation to visit the United States, specifically Washington, D.C. And then he says, on the other hand, I also want to ensure you that we will be very serious about the case and will work on the investigation. That is the quid pro quo that President Zelensky was informed of before the call. So that's wrong. It's also wrong that no Ukrainian knew about the aid being withheld at the time of the call, even though that doesn't even matter. But And then finally, there was no White House meeting ever provided. So the, the third or fourth uh, fact. So I, I do think that that just needs to be clarified, particularly as we're focusing on what direct evidence is. Well, let's, let's give some more examples. We also heard the testimony of three of the individuals who participated in the July 25 call. Is their testimony direct evidence of what happened during that call? 
Yes, although I would say the call record is better evidence than their... And the day after that call, David Holmes testified that in July 26, he overheard the president ask Ambassador Sondland whether President Zelensky was, quote, going to do the investigation. Is that direct evidence? That is direct evidence. And after the July 25 call record was released, the president got on the White House lawn and again declared that Ukraine should investigate a potential political opponent's family, the Bidens. Is that direct evidence? Yes, it is. His own words. Now, that seems to me like that's a lot of direct evidence. Mr. Goldman, was there other direct evidence that the committee relied on in addition to these? Well, there's a lot of, of evidence that I would call direct evidence um, because it's not hearsay. If any of the people involved in the scheme are talking to each other, and they relay what someone else said, that is not hearsay. That would be in court a co-conspirator statement, and that would be admissible. So uh, let's not get too far afield on talking about direct right. evidence. We don't want to relive that law. I understand, but, but it is very important because anything Mr. Giuliani says, anything Ambassador Sondland says, anything any of these people say is not hearsay and would be permitted under the federal rules of evidence. Of course, we don't follow the federal rules of evidence here, which is even right. more lenient, but that's an important point. Right. Well, is there anything wrong, Mr. Goldman, with drawing inferences from circumstances? Circumstances? Courts tell juries to draw inferences every single day in every single courtroom. That is how you determine what the evidence shows. So when Ambassador Sondland draws inferences from the fact that there is no explanation for the aid, the fact that the White House meeting has already been held up because of the investigations, and determines that that's the reason why the security assistance is also held up, that is a natural, logical inference that every jury draws across the country. Well, I agree with you. I'm just disappointed that rather than to respond to the serious, factual, direct, and undisputed evidence before us, my colleagues continue to make unfounded arguments about the process. What President Trump did here was wrong. It's unconstitutional. And if anyone else did this, they would be held accountable. I urge all my colleagues to face this evidence and uphold the oaths each of us have taken to protect our Constitution. Our democracy depends on ensuring that no one, not even the president, is above the law. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Mr. Neguse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as we approach the ninth hour of this hearing, I want to thank both Mr. Goldman and Mr. Castor for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not the facts in this matter are contested. I believe they are not contested. And so I'd like to level set here and, and give you both an opportunity to address some of the facts that I believe are not in dispute. And I want to begin by addressing something that I think we all know for certain, and that's that Russia interfered in our 2016 election. So, Mr. Goldman, after two years of investigation, the special counsel concluded that Russia interfered in our elections in, quote, sweeping and systemic fashion. Is that right? Yes. All right. Mr. Castor, is that right? Yes. And Mr. Goldman, am I correct that zero intelligence agencies have publicly stated that Ukraine attacked our elections in 2016? Is that right? That's right. I don't even think that the minority is alleging that the Ukrainian government systematically in any meaningful way interfered. I think this is just based on a couple of news articles. <laughs> Mr. Castor, correct? Um, the president had a good faith belief there were some significant Ukrainian officials. I hear you, and, and you've said that previously. I guess I'm asking you. We haven't question, said that the Ukrainian government. And there are no intelligence agencies in the United States that have publicly stated that Ukraine has attacked our elections, right? That's, you're not testifying that that's the case. I'm not, right, okay. correct. Right. And in fact, President Trump's former Homeland Security Advisor, Tom Bossert, said that the idea of Ukraine, for example, hacking the DNC server, was, quote, not only a conspiracy theory, it is completely debunked. That's President Trump's Homeland Security Advisor that said those words that you see on the screen to my right. Is that right, Mr. Goldman? Yes, I saw that interview. Mr. Castro, you saw that interview? I'm aware of it, yes. In fact, isn't it true that none of the witnesses that appeared before your committee testified in support of the theory that Ukraine somehow interfered in our elections. Is that right, Mr. Goldman? That is absolutely correct. Mr. Castor? That's correct, but again, Thank you. No you witnesses getting, testified getting, in support. I'll reclaim my time. No witnesses testified in support of that theory before your committee. Mr. Goldman, isn't it also true 
that your committee, in fact, received testimony indicating that there is evidence that Russia is, in part, perpetrating this false theory that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 elections because Russia wants to deflect blame for its own involvement. That is correct. We had evidence of that. And I think that it's very important to emphasize what is evidence and what is pure media reports or speculation, because there is no evidence in our investigation that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election. And in fact, I'd like to put some of the testimony that I believe you might be referencing, Mr. Goldman, on the screen in front of you, both from Mr. Holmes as well as Dr. Fiona Hill. And I will quote from her testimony, I am very confident based on all the analysis that has been done, and again, I don't want to start getting into intelligence matters, that the Ukraine government did not interfere in our election in 2016. This is a fictional narrative that is being perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services themselves. You recall that testimony, Mr. Goldman? I do. I also recall her testifying that in addition to the Ukrainian officials who made a couple of uh, disparaging comments about President Trump, there are officials from countries all around the world who also made disparaging comments about President Trump, and as Dr. Hill said, their military assistance was not put on hold. So given your testimony, and given yours as well, Mr. Castor, it strikes me that there are, in fact, four uncontested facts. First, Russia attacked our 2016 elections. Several intelligence agencies have independently confirmed that this is true. Second, Ukraine did not attack our 2016 elections. There's no, absolutely no evidence that this baseless of this baseless conspiracy theory. Third, there is evidence that Russia perpetrated the allegation that, you, that Ukraine interfered in our 2016 elections. And finally, that Russia benefits from the U.S. investigating Ukraine, which was made clear through public testimony before your committee. So, Mr. Goldman, is it fair to say that the intelligence community agrees with these four conclusions? Uh, the intelligence community definitely agrees with one and two. Uh, Dr. Hill testified uh, to three, uh, as well as there's a public statement from Mr. Putin, and yes, uh, certainly the witnesses emphasize four that Russia benefits from this, and we saw in, in my opening statement President Putin's comment that it's good now that Ukraine is, is all the talk. And if that is the case, it begs the question, why would President Trump perpetuate this conspiracy theory already disproven by the entirety of the intelligence community that actually helps our adversary, a country that is attacking our elections in real time? With that, I yield. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Chairman, brief parliamentary inquiry about the schedule. The uh, gentleman, for, uh, Mr. Stubbe, has already been recognized. He has the time. So are you going to recognize him after for his parliamentary inquiry after my question? I'll make an announcement about the schedule shortly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've never seen a more partisan spectacle than what I've witnessed here today. Democrats want the rules to apply when it benefits them and not to apply when Republicans invoke them. Nine hours ago now, Mr. Burke, a hired gun for the Democrats, got 30 minutes to spread his partisan rhetoric and then 45 minutes to cross-examine witnesses. That's 70 minutes more than most of the members of this committee who have been elected by their districts to serve in the United States Congress. And Mr. Burke is an unelected New York lawyer specifically brought in by the Democrats to give his opinion. A politically biased consultant who has given hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal elections to the likes of ActBlue, Hillary Clinton, Obama, and Biden. Mr. Burke gave over 5,000 alone to Hillary Clinton for her presidential race. No wonder why he has an ax to grind. Mr. Burke is a white-collar criminal defense lawyer who brags on his website of getting New York financial brokers deferred prosecution for tax fraud and fund managers off for insider trading charges. And Mr. Burke was able to say whatever he wanted to say without swearing an oath to his testimony that it would be truthful so he can sit before this committee not as a fact witness and directly lie to the American people without any threat of criminal prosecution. Makes sense. He's a white-collar criminal defense lawyer. I'm sure he didn't want to incriminate himself. This is the same Mr. Burke who authored a series of reports as early as October 2017, two years ago, on his opinion as to whether President Trump obstructed justice and colluded with Russia. He also represented Mayor Bill de Blasio in a federal investigation of de Blasio's fundraising activities. For my fellow Americans and Floridians watching this charade, 
This is who was sitting at the top of the dais next to the chairman acting like a member of this committee, a partisan New York lawyer with a written bias against President Trump who gave thousands to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. And all of this spectacle, all of it, not a single fact witness has appeared in front of this committee. We have been denied a minority hearing day, which I asked for the last hearing. All we have had testify are partisan lawyers giving their opinions. So let's talk about the facts that we do have before us. We heard from Mueller. No evidence of the Trump campaign colluded or conspired with Russia to influence the 2016 election. No obstruction of justice. After denying the president to call witnesses in closed-door secret proceedings and denying Republicans from calling all their witnesses in closed-door proceedings, denying the president's counsel to cross-examine witnesses in intel hearings, the facts are this. Sondland stated when questioned, did the president tell you about any preconditions for anything? His answer, no. For the aid to be refused, no. For a White House meeting, no. Ambassador Sondland also testified that President Trump wanted nothing from Ukraine. Tim Morrison, when questioned, and there was no quid pro quo, answered, correct. The aid was released. Four facts never change. Both President Trump and President Zelensky say there was no pressure. The call transcript shows no conditionality between aid and an investigation. No quid pro quo. Ukrainians were not aware that aid was withheld when the president spoke. Ukraine didn't open an investigation, but still received aid in a meeting with President Trump. Mr. Castro. Has any committee heard from the whistleblower, either in closed door hearings or in open hearings? No. Did Chairman Schiff state that he would call the whistleblower to testify? He did. Has that happened? It has not. Is it going to occur? I hope so. Have other countries' aid also been held up? Yes. Mr. Goldman, on October 2nd, the New York Times reported that the whistleblower, quote, approached a House Intelligence Committee aide with his concerns about Mr. Trump. Is that accurate? Sorry, say that again? <laughs> on October 2nd, the New York Times reported that the whistleblower approached a House Intelligence Committee aide with his concern about Mr. Trump. Is that accurate? I think uh, the whistleblower's concerns about President Trump are from the threats that. that no, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking from did, him, which is did why the whistleblower he hasn't been approach a House Intelligence Committee? Let me ask it a different way. Have you had any communications with the whistleblower? As I said earlier in response to questions from your colleagues, I, I'm not going to get into any So you're refusing to answer whether you've communicated with the whistleblower? The whistleblower is not relevant to this report. In He's the, the whole basis of the beginning of this investigation. He's acts absolutely relevant well, he's to this committee he's not to the American upon people. The whistleblower's complaints for the reasons that Mr. Castor said are not included. His allegations are not included in our report because the evidence has been outstripped and surpassed by the 17 witnesses that we have had come in to testify directly about the conduct that the whistleblower blew So the whistle as you about. sit here today, do you know the identity of the whistleblower? Sir, I'm not going to talk to you about the identity of the whistleblower. Because you're also refusing to answer whether no, you've that, had communications. That's my time, not yours. You're refusing to answer whether you had communications with the whistleblower. Has any other staff in the Intel Committee had communications with the whistleblower? Sir, in the Intelligence and you're Committee... you're refusing to answer that question. And the unfortunately, the American people want to know those answers, and unfortunately, my time Congress has a, Congress has a right time to, to the chairman. maintain the anonymity... Time of the, anonymity Mr. Chairman. The, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Time. Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous time consent. The, I have unanimous consent. The gentleman will suspend. The, ge the time of the gentleman... The, ge the gentleman... The time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous consent. The gentleman will state his unanimous consent request. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I ask for the mission of the document entitled Ukrainian Efforts to Sabotage Trump Backfire, dated January 11, 2017. Uh, we'll, we'll, if you give it to our, to our staff, we'll take a look at it and we'll, we'll make it. We'll, uh, should, should I make a motion to insert instead, Mr. Chairman? Part of their intern crew is political. I want to, before I recognize, before I recognize Ms. McBath, I want to announce that um, with respect to scheduling, that, that, that um, this hearing will proceed until the votes are called. Uh, it, may, it may end before votes are called, which would be nice. If it does not end before votes are called, then we will recess for the votes and we'll reconvene here as soon as the votes on the floor are over. Um, it's going to be a close call. Uh, we'll see. I will further announce that I'm not prepared to say anything further about the uh, schedule of the committee beyond uh, today's hearing. Point of order, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Who, Mr. Chairman, who, point who of has order. a, who Let's seeks count. recognition for a point of order? I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Who's I? Uh, to, your, to your right, Mr. Chairman. It's one of yours. The, the, uh, I, for what purposes, Mr. Deutsch, seek recognition? Uh, to ask, I, I, 
wanted to confirm a point of order is there are rules of decorum, and I don't believe that the gentleman from Florida meant to violate them, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but more than once he referred to a New York lawyer, and if he could just explain what he meant, then I'm prepared to withdraw my point of order. It's not a point of order. That's, that's, that's not a cognizable point of order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the point of order regarding the schedule. The, what, the point of order regarding the schedule? There's no yes. point of order regarding Well, on this case, there is, because there's no rules, point of order regarding the schedule. Then, then there's no, there's no Will you answer my question? It's a the gentleman point. will suspend. There is no cognizable point of order regarding the future schedule. Okay. A Mr. parliamentary Mr. inquiry. Will you recognize Ms. that? No. Ms. McBath is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goldman, I want to follow up on just one part of President Trump's conduct that, <clears throat> excuse me, I asked our constitutional scholars about last week. The investigative committees found evidence that President Trump intimidated, threatened, and tampered with prospective and actual witnesses in the impeachment inquiry, correct? Yes. And Mr. Goldman, it is a federal crime to intimidate or to seek to intimidate any witness appearing before Congress, is that right? Yes, there's a little bit more to it, but that's the gist of it, yes. Mr. Goldman, am I correct that President Trump publicly attacked witnesses before, after, and even during their testimony? That is correct. I'd like to quickly go through some examples. On Twitter, the president tried to smear Ambassador Bill Taylor, a former military officer who graduated at the top of his class at West Point, served as an infantry commander in Vietnam, and earned a bronze star and an air medal with a V device for valor. He was attacked for doing his duty to tell the truth to the American people, correct? He did his duty by testifying, yes. President Trump also attacked other Trump administration officials who testified before the Intelligence Committee, including Lieutenant Colonel Alexander S. Binman, who is the director for Ukraine on the National Security Council, and Jennifer Williams, the special advisor on Europe and Russia with the office of the vice president. Am I right? That is right, yes. Mr. Goldman, I think another troubling example of this is the president's treatment of Ambassador Yovanovitch. When you question Ambassador Yovanovitch, you asked her about the president's remark that she would, and I quote, go through some things. She told you that that remark sounded like a threat. Is that right? Yes, in the July 25th call, that's where, when President Trump said that. Ambassador Yovanovitch is a career professional who served in Republican and Democratic administrations. She was once caught in live crossfire during a coup attempt. And here's how she described that experience in her very own words. I later served in Moscow. In 1993, during the attempted coup in, Moscow, in Russia, I was caught in crossfire between presidential and parliamentary forces. It took us three tries, me without a helmet or body armor, to get into a vehicle to go to the embassy. We went because the ambassador asked us to come. And we went because it was our duty. It was our duty. Even under such duress, this is a public servant who did her duty. And as she testified before you and the Intelligence Committee, the President tweeted yet another attack against her. Is that correct? During the testimony, yes. At a rally, the President further attacked Ambassador Taylor and Deputy Assistant Secretary of the State George Kent, Foreign Affairs Commission official with decades of bipartisan service. I just have to say, I am so deeply saddened that our president has attacked our brave public servants. These attacks are an abuse of his power, and they betray our national interest. My Republican colleagues until now have agreed with me that this behavior is not okay. That in America, we protect witnesses and people who tell the truth. We want people to come forward. We protect witnesses in our community. I myself am no stranger to these kinds of attacks. They are not okay. 
I want to read a partial statement by Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who is a military officer and a public servant. In his opening statement to the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Vindman said, and I quote, I want to say that the character attacks on these distinguished and honorable public servants is reprehensible. I ran for Congress because I care urgently about health care, gun violence prevention, <coughs> and our veterans. Those are the urgent policies for me and many of my colleagues. But these witnesses, these public servants, stood up and courageously told the truth. And I must be courageous and stand up for them as well. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. A few minutes ago, Mr. Biggs asked unanimous consent to admit an article for, from Politico into the record. Without objection, uh, Mr. Stanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've heard today from some suggesting that this process has, has somehow been unfair. Mr. Goldman, let's clear up that record. Minority members on the investigative committees had access to all witness depositions. Is that correct? Yes, and all the documents. And were they allowed to ask questions of every witness? Uh, the minority was given equal time to the majority for every single interview, deposition, or hearing that we did. And the minority were allowed to call their own witnesses to the live hearings, is that correct? They were also, yes, and they, they did, they, and they got three witnesses. They were also allowed to call their own witnesses for the depositions. They chose not to do that. Uh, the only witness they requested for the deposition was Chairman Schiff, who is not a fact witness to this investigation. Mr. Goldman, why did the investigative committees decide to conduct initial depositions behind closed doors? The best investigative practice when you're doing a fact-finding mission is to keep the information um, closed. And the reason is exactly what I described earlier with Ambassador Sondland, who, first of all, the day before his deposition, he spoke with Secretary Perry about his testimony. That is the type of tailoring that can happen when people are engaged in misconduct and they try to line up their stories. So if you keep the information closed, they can't line up their stories. And I think, frankly, part of the reason why Ambassador uh, Volker and Ambassador Sondland's public hearing testimony was so different from their deposition testimony is because the, hear the initial depositions were in closed session before we then released all the transcripts to the public. And this isn't unprecedented because in both the Nixon and Clinton impeachment inquiries, there were either closed door depositions or grand jury proceedings at the beginning of the inquiries. That's correct, nor is it unprecedented in Congress. This is actually a rule in the House rules that was passed by Republican Congresses. It was used in Benghazi. It was used by a number of committees for the past decade or so. And for clarity, President Trump has received all procedural protections afforded to other presidents facing impeachment. Is that correct? That is right. In the Judiciary Committee, he's had all of the options. Our, our inquiry was not the Judiciary Committee's investigation. That is where the President's ability to present evidence. Of course, if the President wanted to present evidence in the Intelligence Committee, he could have provided documents, he could have provided the witnesses that we asked for him, but he obstructed rather than cooperated. And the President has been invited to participate in the House's impeachment inquiry, correct? Yes. And but the President declined denied. the invitation? That's my understanding, yes. Twice? Uh, twice thus far, yes. In fact, the President not only refused to participate, but he has also tried to stop Congress from obtaining evidence. Isn't it true that the President has refused to produce any documents in response to the impeachment inquiry's subpoena to the White House? Yes. Not a single one? Not a single document. The President also directed all of his agencies to refuse to, re to produce documents. Is that right? That is also true. Based on the President's order, federal agencies have ignored more than 70 specific requests or demands for records from the investigative committees. Is that correct? Yes, and if I could just add, this would, Quickly, please. this would ordinarily be a document case. If you were prosecuting this case, you'd be basing, basing it on the documents. So the fact that those documents are being withheld is quite significant, and it's, it's quite remarkable that we've built the record we have on the witnesses. The President's order to obstruct Congress didn't just extend to documents. At the President's direction, witnesses also refused to testify. Is that right? That's correct. And in total, more than a dozen members of the administration defied lawful subpoenas or requests for testimony or documents, as we see on the slide. Right. Between testimony and documents, that's correct. 
And isn't it also true that when witnesses chose to follow the laws and testify, the president denied those witnesses access to the documents they needed to properly prepare for their testimony? For some of them, that's correct. But I also must acknowledge that this process has been challenging and in many respects, less than fair. I have not had access to all of my phone records, State Department emails, and many, many other State Department documents. And I was told I could not work with my EU staff to pull together the relevant files and information. These documents are not classified, and in fairness, and in fairness, should have been made available. The State Department has collected all materials in response to the September 27th subpoena that may contain facts relevant to my testimony. I have no such documents or materials with me today. The President was not denied the right to participate, quite the opposite. The President has chosen not to participate, and he has consistently tried to obstruct the impeachment investigation to ensure no one testifies against him, that no one produces a document that may incriminate him, and to engage in a cover-up to prevent the American people from learning the truth. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, may gentleman I just say something for back. five seconds? Mr. Chairman, please. Gentlemen, for what purpose is the gentleman seeking? No, this is the witness. Can I just say something for five seconds? No. Mr. D uh, the general lady, uh, Ms. Dean is recognized. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goldman, some have argued that we should wait, that we're moving too fast, that we should try to get more evidence. Let's examine why these arguments are without merit. President Nixon stated during the Senate Watergate investigation, quote, all members of the White House staff will appear voluntarily when requested by the committee. They will testify under oath, and they will answer fully all proper questions, end quote. During the investigation of President Clinton, Ken Starr interviewed White House staff. President Clinton also provided written responses to 81 interrogatories from the House Judiciary Committee. Unlike his predecessors, President Trump has categorically stonewalled Congress's investigation at every turn. Indeed, as far back as April, the President expressed his intent to stonewall. Well, we're fighting all the subpoenas. More recently, on October the 8th, White House P Counsel Pat Cipollone echoed this sentiment in a letter reflecting the President's instruction that all executive branch officials not testify in this impeachment inquiry. Are you aware of that letter, Mr. Goldman? Yes, I am. And Mr. Gold Goldman, is it fair to say that President Trump is the only president in the history of our country to seek to completely obstruct an impeachment inquiry undertaken by this House? That is correct. It is unprecedented. And in fact, pursuant to President Trump's order, 12 executive branch officials refused to testify as part of the House impeachment inquiry, 10 of whom defied congressional subpoenas. Am I right? Yes. Given the President's sweeping directive not to cooperate with Congress, did the investigative committees believe that there was any chance that other administration officials would come forward if subpoenaed? No, it became clear that the president was trying to block everything um, and block everyone, and the, eventually they came up with an alternative reason to, um, to write an uh, opinion to prevent people from coming, um, which is quite a, uh, an aggressive view that, uh, that they took. But, but it was quite clear that they were trying to block every single witness. Some have said that uh, the investigative committee should have gone to court. Uh, did you decide not to go to court? We, th we thought about it a lot because obviously there are additional witnesses and we want this to be as thorough an investigation. But as you can see from the Deutsche Bank case or the McGahn case, it takes months and months to go through the appeals court. And that's effectively what the president wants, is just to delay this as long as possible let's, and to the next election. Let's take a look at that exact case, the McGahn case, because we're all intimately aware of it. On April 22nd, this Judiciary Committee served a subpoena for testimony. Uh, to White House Counsel Don McGahn. And after McGahn re refused to testify on May 21st, the committee filed a lawsuit on August the 7th to compel his testimony. And even though we did request expedited ruling, it was another three and a half months before Judge Jackson found the Constitution does not allow a president to kneecap congressional investigations because, as the judge wrote, and I put up on this screen, quote, presidents are not kings. As you know, McGahn has appealed, and a hearing is set for January the 3rd now of next year. 
as we sit here today, eight months since we issued that subpoena, would you agree it's likely we will not have an appeals court ruling for many months to come? It's quite possible that it could be several more months, and then there may be the Supreme Court. Exactly. McGahn may uh, appeal to the Supreme Court, and conceivably that could take another many months, year, more? Depends on whether it's this term or it gets pushed over to the next term, but yes. And given this delay illustrated by the McGahn example specifically, would you agree that if we go to court to enforce, uh, enforce the investigative committee subpoenas, we could face another months or years long delay to hear testimony? Absolutely, and there's an ongoing threat because the president is trying to cheat to win the next election. It's not, a, it's not something that happened in the past, it's continuing in the future. So we cannot delay and just wait for the courts to resolve this, when the reason why we would have to go to the courts is because the president is, is obstructing an investigation into himself. And the urgency is not just about our elections, but also our national security, am I right? That is a critical component to it. Let me end with this. What is plain is that we cannot wait. What is plain is that wait means never. We must not let this president disregard, defy, and delay justice. This president has shown that he repeatedly abuses the power entrusted to him by the people. Every moment we wait is another opportunity to chip away at the foundation of our Constitution, so carefully crafted by our founders. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Gentlelady yields back. I yield to uh, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee for the unanimous consent request. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Goldman, Mr. Castor. Uh, I'd like to submit or ask unanimous consent to insert in the record referred in my questioning statement of administration policy, Department of Defense appropriation. Without objection. August 5th. Without objection, Mr. And, Mr. McCarcel. Uh, and the, um, and the uh, call dated July 25th. Without 25. objection, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Castor, it's been a long day. It's been a long couple months. You've been in the middle of this, and I know previously you wanted to say something, so. Thank you. I've resisted my, res my um, uh, willingness to be athletic here um, in the afternoon. <laughs> But I, I want to say a few things. First of all, the, the Republicans on the Intelligence Committee submitted a number of subpoenas, and we never got a vote. And it was, there was a motion to table. It disposed of them. Uh, Ranking Member Nunes sent a letter on November 8th asking for witnesses. Um, Ranking Member Collins sent a, a letter on December 6th asking for witnesses. Some of these witnesses would have touched at the heart of the issue that our members are concerned about, and that is, uh, you know, were Ukrainians um, trying to interfere with our elections. I mean, this is a fact that is meritorious of investigation. It, the Ukrainians ought to investigate it, and to the extent it happened here in the U.S., we ought to be investigating it. And so, to the extent, um, you know, that hasn't happened, um, Republicans have attempted to, 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 to do that during this process. So, um, I'd like to say that. And I have a couple other things, Mr. Armstrong, if Go I ahead. may. Um, you know, Ambassador Sondland is, is, you know, relied on, and he went from a, a witness that was not very favorable to, to very favorable at his hearing. And one of, the, one of the remarkable statements at his hearing was that everyone was in the loop. And he, he types up this email to, to Pompeo, uh, to the secretary. Um, and the, the emails that he used to demonstrate that everyone was in the loop are, are not conclusive at all. Um, you know, he talks about this statement that was going back and forth during the, the early part of August. First of all, Volcker said all along that he didn't think the statement was a good idea. Volcker and Yarmack toyed around with the statement and ultimately both, both sides decided that it wasn't it wasn't a good plan, so they, they didn't do it. Um, and, and so the fact that Sondland is emailing the secretary talking about this statement and so forth, uh, it's just, this doesn't show that everyone's in the loop. Uh, Ambassador Hale testified to us that people at the State Department, they don't just email the secretary. I mean, the secretary gets email, of course, but it's not like, like this. Um, you know, there's a whole secretariat that filters his email, um, and, and so it's not, emailing the, the Secretary of State is not quite as, um, as simple as I think uh, Ambassador Sondland uh, made it seem here. Um, and so I just wanted to address that. Um, 
We talked a couple times about the reliability of George Kent's notes. Um, one of Ambassador Volker's assistants, uh, Catherine Croft, uh, testified, uh, and it was a rather startling piece of testimony. We, we, she was asked whether um, Kent's notes would be reliable. Sort of a typical question, and everyone expecting the answer to be yes, except she said, no, I don't think Kent's notes would be reliable. Um, so I think that's important to put on the record that, you know, that there is evidence that, you know, perhaps um, Mr. Kent, um, you know, felt uh, some emotions about, about some of these issues and his notes, at least according to one State Department official, uh, might not in fact be reliable. Uh, the CNN interview that there's been discussion about, okay, th th there was discussion about possibly doing a statement which was was canned. There was, you know, maybe there was discussion of a CNN interview, but that's fine. We, we did not really get to the bottom of that. That was sort of this amorphous fact that was out there. Ambassador Taylor testified that he was worried it would happen, but we didn't, we didn't really talk to anyone that, that could tell us precisely w what was going to occur you know, in the CNN interview and, and whether President Zelensky was actually going to do it. If you look back at the statement that Yarmak and Volker were talking about, Yarmak wasn't comfortable doing it. And so when it comes to the CNN interview, it's possible that Yarmak would have advised President Zelensky not to say what <coughs> people thought he was going to say. So anyway, I'm sorry, Mr. Armstrong, for taking No, this you've time. worked hard and you deserve it. I just want to end and summarize with this, that you can, and because you cannot prove a prime, and the chairman went on TV yesterday and said they get a conviction in three minutes. But my question is, for what crime? The Mueller conspiracy fell flat. The obstruction charge was abandoned when the public hearing was over. Campaign finance is a non-starter. The victim of conspiracy, or the victim of bribery and extortion says he's not a victim. Because you can't prove any of it does not mean you can use all of it. And that's no way to prosecute a case, and it is no way to proceed with impeachment. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McCarthy Powell. Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCarcel Powell is recognized. Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCarcel Powell is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Goldman, I want to come back and highlight what I think is the biggest national security threat, and that's foreign interference into our elections. And I can tell you that in Florida, we're extremely concerned about the security of our elections and the potential for election interference by foreign governments, especially Russia, because Florida, my home state, was a victim of Russian hacking in 2016. And there's every indication that they're trying to do the same thing right now. Our country was founded on the premise that our elected officials are elected by the people. But President Trump doesn't share these ideas. He has and continues to demand foreign interference into our elections. He doesn't want the American people to decide. He's inviting foreign interference, allowing foreign governments to decide that for us. Mr. Goldman, it's been confirmed that President Trump's campaign actively sought Russia's interference in our 2016 16 elections, correct? Um, what Special Counsel Mueller said is that President Trump did invite them and solicit them to hack Hillary Clinton's emails. Ultimately, the Trump campaign, I think, was welcomed, knew about the interference, welcomed it, and utilized it. Right. And in 2016, Trump said, Russia, if you're listening, and within five hours, Russian intelligence targeted the emails of Trump's opponent. Um, on, to on October 3rd, 2019, when asked what he hoped President Zelensky would do about the Bidens, this is what President Trump said. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Bidens. It's a very simple answer. Uh, they should investigate the Bidens, because how does a company that's newly formed, and all these companies, if you look at, and by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Biden. And let me just point out, the president doesn't mention corruption, does he, Mr. Goldman? No, he doesn't. As I said, it was, it became quite clear in all of his comments and all of the other witnesses that any mention of corruption or anti-corruption was really meant, and the evidence showed this, was really a euphemism for the investigations. Correct. And Trump is not only asking, President Trump, excuse me, is not only asking Ukraine, but he also says China should start investigating his political opponents. The president's pattern of behavior is incredibly disturbing. Russia, Ukraine, China, he's inviting three countries 
to help him in his re-election campaign. And Mr. Goldman, I don't see any reason to believe he wouldn't ask any other governments, for example, Venezuela, correct? Uh, he could, I mean, at this point, he has shown not only a willingness to do it multiple times, but I think more importantly for all of the members' consideration, he's also shown a lack of contrition, a lack of acknowledgement that what he is doing is wrong and that it is wrong. And if you don't recognize that it is wrong, then you, there is no reason why you won't do it again if you've already done it. Exactly. I mean, we saw Giuliani in Ukraine just three days ago. And last night, I want to point out that the Washington Post actually released an article saying that Rudy Giuliani has been now advising on how to open a back channel between President Trump and Maduro. So I'm very worried about that. Now, I don't think we have any time to wait to see if any countries are now going to take him up on the offer to help him in his re-election campaign. Mr. Goldman, did the investigative committees reach any conclusions about the ongoing threats, the continuing risk that the president poses? Yes, uh, for the same reasons that we just discussed. I mean, and, and I think the June of uh, television interview with George Stephanopoulos this year, where the president indicated that he would once again welcome foreign interference, is another data point to understand where it is. And I would just say to Mr. Reschenthaler, who was questioning, who was saying that he's got such a great record and that the Democrats just don't want him to win, um, the question is if that is the case, and that very well may be the case then why does he need to cheat to win the election? Why can't he just exactly. go on his own platform? I think the Constitution demands that the president follow the rule of law and fight to keep our elections fair, free of corruption, and free of Russian interference, excuse me, foreign interference. Now, I know that I was elected by the people of Florida, and I work only for the people of this country. I'm not going to let, while I'm in office, anyone interfere in our elections or threaten our democracy. The continuing pattern of behavior we've seen from this president should be a warning to the American people that it is a beginning of a dictatorship, which I have seen in Latin America. I've witnessed men in office abuse the power, inviting foreign interference, and also obstructing any checks on their power. The Constitution, the Constitution has no partisan allegiance. We cannot allow this behavior from this president or any future president. Our democracy depends on it. The gentlelady yields back. I recognize Mr. Jordan for the purpose of a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I recognize Mr. Jordan for the purpose of a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, uh, majority's witness was wrong when he said that we were able to subpoena people and get our witnesses consent here. Unanimous request. We were not. So I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the two letters sent to Chairman Nader and the other one to Without Chairman objection, Schiff. the material will be entered into the record. Ms. Escobar is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and many thanks to our witnesses who've spent the entire day with us. We're very grateful. Despite what our Republican colleagues have stated over and over again, their own witness, Mr. Castor, has agreed that these investigations have indeed produced direct evidence. Direct evidence which any objective observer, in my opinion, would regard as overwhelming. That evidence proves that the President solicited foreign interference in the 2020 election pressured Ukrainian President Zelensky to publicly announce unfounded investigations, conditioned a White House meeting, the President conditioned a White House meeting and $391 million on the announcement of the investigations, and then the President covered up his conduct and obstructed the investigation. Those findings reflect a serious abuse of power by the President. Yet we, we are being asked to ignore what we've seen with our own eyes and what we've heard with our own ears. So Mr. Goldman, I'd like your help in responding to some of the claims that my Republican colleagues have made today. Happily. The President and his allies say that there was no quid pro quo. In other words, they claim that the President wasn't withholding the aid in exchange for the manufactured political investigation. Isn't it true that the aid was withheld and that there has been no logical explanation for the withholding of that aid? There's common sense that, that leads one to conclude that the aid was withheld for the uh, investigations. And then there's also direct evidence in that the President's own words to Ambassador Sondland on September 7th said the same thing. 
Thank you. President Trump knew he had leverage over President Zelensky. And in fact, David Holmes testified that Ambassador Sondland told President Trump that President Zelensky will, quote, do anything you ask him. Is that correct? That is what, it, what Ambassador Sondland uh, said. Yeah, or actually, that's what President Trump, Ambassador Sondland said to President Trump. Apologies. You testified earlier that evidence shows that the Ukrainians, in fact, did know that the aid was being withheld. My colleagues continue to say, and their witness continue to say, that there couldn't be leverage because they had no idea that the aid was being withheld. Yet there has been evidence that shows that they knew. Is that correct? Well, I, I think it's important just for a second here to take a step back. It doesn't matter when they knew as long as they knew at some point. No. Then they, they realized at that point that the investigations were dependent on the aid. But there, in addition, there is a lot of evidence that they knew before it became public on August 28th. And you're right, it doesn't matter. If you're about to be held up at gunpoint by a burglar, it doesn't matter whether you know or not. The intent is still there by the criminal about to commit the act. My Republican colleagues also make much about the fact that the aid was finally released. But isn't it true that it wasn't released until the president got caught? It wasn't released until the president got caught and all of the money didn't actually get to Ukraine um, in, this, in that fiscal year and you all in Congress had to pass another law to allow for the money to get to Ukraine. Thank you. Earlier today, Mr. Castor attempted to explain away the president's request for foreign interference in our election by claiming that the president had three concerns. That number one, the president was concerned about Ukraine corruption. That number two, he was concerned about burden sharing with Europe. And number three, he brought up the debunked conspiracy theory about, the, about Ukraine election interference, which, by the way, uh, that last point we know is a Russian talking point. Mr. Goldman, did the investigative committees consider those three explanations? And if so, what did the evidence show about whether President Trump's request was actually motivated by those concerns? It's a very good question. There are two things to, that were discussed here today. One is evidence, and one are, is assertions and opinions. Based on the evidence, there is no evidence to support any of those three things that you just mentioned. There's no evidence to think that the president acted towards Ukraine because of his concerns about corruption, even if he held those concerns. That was not the motivating factor. There's no evidence that his concern about other European countries giving enough money motivated him. And there is certainly not a reasonable belief, given all of the evidence, that he believed that Ukraine interfered in our 2016 elections. Thank you. I'd like to close with what our scholars explained to us last week about why all of this is so important. Drawing a foreign government into our elections is an especially abu uh, serious abuse of power because it undermines democracy itself. Because if we cannot impeach a president who abuses his office for personal advantage, we no longer live in a democracy. We, we live in a monarchy no or we live under a dictatorship. If, this, what we're, if what we're talking about is not impeachable, then nothing is impeachable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. This May I respond to that? This concludes the five-minute round of questioning. I now recognize Mr. Raskin for the purpose of a unanimous consent request. Mr. Chairman, I'm seeking unanimous consent to introduce a statement by the late Chairman Elijah Cummings of the Oversight Committee in his first hearing in the new Congress, which was on examining prescription drug prices. His first hearing was not about Michael Cohen, as was asserted earlier. Without, without, without objection, I now recognize the ranking member for any concluding remarks he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one quick thing before we enter. It does matter when they knew and didn't know, because after they supposedly found out, it does matter, because after they two meetings with, with officials from the United States, it was never talked about and no linkage was made. So it does matter. And the reason it matters is because if, it, if there is no understanding that this is being withheld, there is no uh, threat, there is no quid pro quo. And it also goes to the state of mind of Mr. Zelensky, who says, I'm not being pressured. I'm not being, there's nothing here. And again, it goes back to the amazing thought of this majority who keeps calling the Ukrainian uh, leader a liar. It's just amazing that we continue to propagate that myth here tonight. But what did we learn today? Here's some things we did learn today. 
It's an unprecedented hearing uh, that Mr. Sensenbrenner and others talked about in which staff basically uh, not members gave testimony and questioned each other and got into uh, very heated uh, debates with each other. This is not what the Judiciary Committee uh, should be doing. It's not the way this should be held. Again, the reason it is, Mr. Goldman handled himself very well, but he's not Adam Schiff. He doesn't wear a member pin. This is ridiculous. We shouldn't be doing this. The Intel Committee also, what we did find out today, took phone records and went on a political endeavor against the ranking member and others, but no one will take responsibility for telling the staff for, to use Mr. Nunez's numbers or others, or who decided to put the smear job in the report. We'll just assume that's Mr. Schiff, since I do hold the member accountable. You know, also we found out today, which is really interesting, that staff can determine what's relevant or not, not members of Congress. It's interesting to me that staff told members of Congress that that wasn't relative or that wasn't relevant. Again, it goes back to the problem we don't have members here to actually talk about this. Also, it just is another thing we've learned today that the chairman continues to just disregard House rules. Just completely, blatantly disregarding House rules on not addressing the minority hearing today. And if I hear basically one more time, I'll address that when we're marking up impeachment articles. What is the use of a minority hearing day if you're going to have evidence about the markup if you get the uh, confirmation at the markup itself? Even your most heated debate on getting rid of this president does not show any way that can be fair. And in the end, both parties are in the minority. If you destroy the institutional integrity, which again, the staff have talked about today, if we destroy the institutional integrity, there's nothing else for us to do. But while we were here, there was something that did happen. And as we were sitting here discussing whether to impeach the president over a call he had with the Ukrainian president and President Zelensky, which took place on how look, there was a look at how it happened in 2016. Democrats are seeking to impeach the president over that, and we're seeing the problems with the Russia investigation play out again in front of our eyes. The fuss over the Ukraine is the same thing, using the same playbook. A select group of individuals colluding against the President Trump to ensure they get him, and they are blowing, out, blowing through every procedure and principle of fairness and honesty to ensure they get him in time. So what happened today while we were stuck here? The Inspector General report. The review of four FISA applications and other aspects of the FBI crossfire invest hurricane investigation. Here's some of the top findings. The FBI inclu included inaccurate information in the Carter Page FISA application. The FBI failed to ex include exculpatory information in the FISA. The FBI did not corroborate a huge amount of the information in the Page FISA. The FBI chose to defensively brief candidate Clinton, not candidate Trump. The FBI failed to disclose Bruce Orr's information that Steele reporting was going directly to the Clinton campaign. An FBI attorney altered another agency's email to mislead about whether Carter Page had actually been a utilis intelligent source. The bottom line, the report shows the Page FISA should have never been obtained. If you don't have the Page FISA, you don't have a Russia investigation. If you don't have a Russia investigation, you can't knock out the president as a candidate at the time of the 26th election, and you can't hamstring the president's first two years with a special counsel investigation. I could go on, but Mr. Durham, who has already weighed in, has the next batch of this, and we'll see where it goes. But I do want to take one last thing from our side, because this undoubtedly will be the last hearing because we have no desire to hear anything from our side, minority hearing or otherwise. I want to take the time to thank Mr. Castor and Ms. Callum. They're the top investigators in the Intelligence and Judiciary Committee, and they combined have 15 to 20 years' experience in the House conducting investigations to protect American interests and taxpayer dollars. What these public servants don't usually do as a part of their work is field questions from others who come before them, from Democrats, donors, and pundits. Ms. Castor and Ms. Callum usually work for and alongside members of Congress and fellow public servants. I'm sorry today that the majority chose to highlight their investigators and also the ones that have been brought in over these public servants. I'm sorry to choose that this is where we're at, but I would like to thank them for their work today. I'd like to thank them for their uh, work on our behalf, but also I think really for all the ones listening here. If you look around the room, this is what's happening to the American people. By the end of the day, most in the back left, most of the members of the media are begging to go somewhere else because at the end of the day, your case isn't made. And one thing that just keeps amazingly said from Mr. Goldman to the chairman and to others, that facts, these facts are undisputed. The very nature of the fact that I say I disagree and you say you don't is, an, is a disputed fact. These are disputed facts. It'll be the first impeachment that is partisan on facts that are not agreed to. That is the state in which the judiciary has become. We have become a rubber stamp, just as the chairman predicted almost 20 years ago, when we willingly accept from someone else a project or a report that we don't investigate ourselves. And with that, that is the problem we have, and that is the farce called the Judiciary Committee impeachment scam today. I yield back.
I now recognize myself for, for concluding remarks. After hearing the reports and the evidence today, we now know several things with certainty. We know that the President was at the center of a scheme to pressure Ukraine to announce an investigation of the President's political rivals. He applied that pressure by withholding both a White House meeting and vital military aid. He made that demand directly to President Zelensky and confirmed his personal involvement on the White House lawn. We know that there are no excuses for this conduct. It is no excuse that President Trump eventually released the aid after his scheme was revealed to the public. And it is no excuse that he insisted that there was no quid pro quo only after his scheme was revealed to the public. We know that his actions endangered our national security, putting our alliances, our reputation, and our safety at risk. We know that the President also compromised the integrity of our elections for a corrupt private political purpose. We know that President Trump, in an unprecedented act of obstruction, ordered everybody in the executive branch to defy all congressional subpoenas for documents and, sub and subpoenas related to the impeachment inquiry. And we know that his attempts to solicit a political favor from the government of Ukraine fit a pattern of conduct that the President established in 2016 when he solicited political assistance from the government of Russia. That pattern of misconduct undermines our national security and undermines free and fair elections. In abusing his office in this manner and in obstructing the investigation that followed, we know that President Trump has put himself before his country. I am struck by the fact that my Republican colleagues have offered no serious scrutiny of the evidence at hand. They have talked about everything else, but they have offered not one substantive word in the President's defense. I suspect that is because there is, at base, no real defense for the President's actions. President Trump put himself before his country. There is a constitutional remedy for a President who undermines our national security and our elections, who puts his own interests before those of the country. That remedy is impeachment. The facts are clear. The danger to our democracy is clear. And our duty is clear. President Trump violated his oath to the American people. He placed his own private interests ahead of our national security and the integrity of our elections and constitutes a continuing threat to the integrity of our elections and to our democratic system of government. Such conduct is clearly impeachable. This committee will proceed accordingly. This concludes today's hearing. We thank all of our presenters for participating. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the presenters or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. And that does it for today's impeachment hearings here on Capitol Hill. I'm Tom Yamas for ABC News Live. We leave you now with some of the highlights from all those hours of testimony. Order in the room. Order in the committee room. The president's supporters are going to argue that this whole process is unfair. The record before us is clear at this point as well. We invited the president to participate in this hearing to question witnesses, and to present evidence that might explain the charges against him. President Trump chose not to show. Would you agree that Joe Biden was a leading Democratic contender to face President Trump in 2020? I wouldn't agree with that. You disagree with it. So, sir, it's your testimony it's too early. that President Trump did not view President Biden to be a legitimate contender. I don't know right? what President Trump believed or didn't believe, but it's too early. May Mr. Castor, add something there. No, you can't, Mr. Castor. Let me ask you. President a Trump did chance. mention. Are you going to let him answer? He did mention oh. that there's some very bad oh, people there. Oh, I can yell. I got the gentleman. Let him answer. The gentleman. The time is the questioners, and he can ask the questions Thank whoever he wants. And when and, you question, you will have the same rules. And Mr. Castor, in fairness, you'll be at, you'll be able to answer questions asked by minority counsel when it's their turn. Okay, but I have 45 minutes, so let me fairness, ask. You, let me ask you. Come on, Barry. In fairness, here, he, President Trump talks about very bad people. Mr. Mr. Castor. Mr. Castor, you've been a, a veteran of the Hill investigation for 15 years, and this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. You never have either. 
Would it be interesting to know, because Mr. Uh, Goldman chooses not to answer because he doesn't want to incriminate, I believe, either himself or the chairman or somebody else. Would it be interesting to you to find, as you've dealt with uh, committee staff for a long time, somebody to just have a, an epiphany just to do those match records on their own, or were they under direction by somebody to do that? Well, it's obviously they were trying to figure something out. That's it. And I'm not going to say it questions your motive or your position here today, but we need to make sure that this thing is already blown out of proportion. We're already not answering questions, and you are here without a pen because your chairman will not testify. That says all we need to hear. He don't even stand behind his own report, and he sends you. I hope it works out for you. I'm done. At this point, I turn it over to Ashley. Could I, could I, could I respond? Are you, are you trying no. to say that, that I uh, – what are you trying to say? What is the implication here? But by the way, I didn't give anything close to a million dollars remotely, so I don't no, know. About the implication 30. is we want Schiff in that chair, not you. The implication is the person that wrote the report is the person that should come and present it, and you weren't allowed elected by anybody, and you're here giving this testimony in place of the chairman. Does not have I hope that clears up the implication. The gentleman does not have the time, and the gentleman has been warned before. He cannot simply yell out and disrupt the committee. The gentleman, Mr. Collins, has the time. That was exactly the type of conduct that Vice President Biden wanted to shut down in Ukraine. That was exactly the type of non-anti-corruption non policies that Vice President Biden was objecting to using the official policy. So that's one of the reasons that he, I mean, I don't know if that was one, but that's the type of thing that he uh, based, he and the Americans and the Europeans based. That's the issue we've got to get in this committee, to understand the difference between doing something for the national good, for the international good, for the common good, and for your own good. That's the difference. It is a reason to focus on the facts and what is in the country's best interest. History, future generations will be the judge. ABC News, straightforward. This is what being live is all about. I can see three pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Dire neighborhoods are underwater. 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. There goes. <laughs> Imagine an idea. breaking Thank news, you. live events as they happen, streaming live, nonstop, Building straight to you. Two. Imagine instant, incredible yeah. access to the most compelling.